Ah, you're here. Good. Uh, take the easy chair by the window. <laughs> Comfortable. Good. Uh, the book is, uh, on this shelf. Yes, here it is. Death Blew Out the Match. A very absorbing story of death and mystery on a small island. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It was an evening early in May, and the waters around the Cape, just off the coast of Massachusetts, were buried under a fog as thick and as massive as any you'd want to see. Moving cautiously, a small boat makes its way slowly toward one of the islands off the Cape. In the boat, there are Elisha McCumber and Anne Waldron. Well, this is something. I'm glad we're almost there. Yep. You been scared, Miss Walden? Oh, not scared, Elisha, but if I hadn't bumped into you in New Bedford, I'd have spent the night there. Not even Noah himself could have persuaded me to take a boat ride in this fog. What's new on the island? Oh, nothing much. Unless you're counting a mysterious stranger. Mysterious? Calls himself David Highland. Gets mail from New York, Washington, Boston, but near every day. Nobody knows what's in it. He don't talk. Maybe he's an ex-sailor with a sweetheart in every port. Uh, this could be. But I'm chairman of the Board of Selectmen, and it's my duty to keep the peace on that island. Well, you've always managed, Elisha. What else is new? Leonard Case is there, too. Leonard? Yeah. Four weeks now. Then Myra Van Wick must be there. She ain't. I guess Mr. Case will be mighty glad to see you, Miss Waldron. Why should he be glad? Well, I reckon the fella gets pretty lonesome with a plaster cast on each leg. Plaster cast, Leonard? Got both his legs broken in an automobile accident a few months ago. I figured you might know about it. No. No, I didn't know. Elisha, are you sure Myra isn't on the island? Mm-hmm. You're still sweet on the fella, ain't you? He doesn't mean a thing to me. Uh, maybe not. But summer of last year, when Mr. Case turned from you to that Van Wick woman, uh, yep, uh, I was mighty glad the season ended without a killing. Thanks very much, Elisha. I'll go the rest of the way alone. Oh, I don't mind taking your door, Miss Walden. You don't have to. I'll just follow this path around Myra Van Wick's house, and that'll take me right home. Good night, Elisha. And thanks for everything. Good night, Miss Walden. Be careful. Maybe I should have... Oh, well. Nothing ever happens here. <gasps> what? what was that? <coughs> what on earth? That Mara's house and it's closed tight. Someone's coming this way. Someone that... Hello. <gasps> Fancy meeting you here. Oh, who are you? What do you want? You sound like a native. Suppose I answer your first question first. Who am I? David Highland. Highland? Why don't you call me David? Then I can call you... Anne Waldron. Anne. Lovely. Your house is about 200 feet from here, isn't it? Yes. Do you expect to live there alone? What business is it of yours? Just this. You won't tell anyone that you met me tonight, will you? I won't. That's what I said. Because if you do, one of us will become very useless. Hey, Mr. Case, there's a dame here to see you. A dame? So we're in, sir. Okay, Tootsie. Help yourself to the boss. But don't make him nervous. He's in a very delicate condition. Anne! Oh, Anne, darling, I'm so glad to see you. Hello, Leonard. Oh, you look beautiful. I'm more beautiful hey, than Mr. I... Hey, Mr. Case, is it all right if I take the car and go for a drive into town? Yes, beat it, go any place. I'll pick up some chow for the icebox while I'm there. You got a couple of preferences, maybe? Buy anything you like, but for Pete's okay. sake... Okay. <laughs> oh, don't look so surprised, Anne. The guy saved my life. Pull me out of the wreck before the car went up in flames. Hang it if he doesn't turn out to be the best cook and butler this side of the Atlantic. I, uh... I was hoping you'd come, in. You were? Well, what do you mean? I knew you were on the island. Oh, Elisha told you. No, I saw you. From here? Hmm? But my house is... 
Leonard, what have you done to this room? You like? I had these walls ripped out and the glass put in their place. Ah, I don't miss a trick. I simply look through this telescope and the island has no secrets. I see. Leonard, when is Myra coming? She isn't. Too busy in New York? I hope so. The fact is, Myra and I are washed up. <laughs> Silly, isn't it? Is it? The crazy thing about it is that I really thought I loved her. Uh, I must have been out of my mind. Did you marry her? No, it wasn't that crazy, Anne. Here. Leonard! <laughs> Put that crawl on your bed. And I want you to meet Mabel, my little helpmate. <laughs> when Sam's away, Mabel does a little odd jobs that make me comfortable. Watch. Mabel! My pipe. <laughs> oh, you're slipping, old girl. You forgot my tobacco pouch. Thank you. Now you may go out and get your lunch. And don't dig up anyone's garden. For pity's sake, where did you pick that up? <laughs> Myra gave it to me. Wow. Well, everyone to his taste. I don't think I... What's that? What? On your bed. It... Oh, it's a buckle off a woman's shoe. Well, what do you know? I think that bird will bring home with her. Wait a minute, Leonard. I've seen this buckle before. Haven't you? Haven't I? Why, I don't remember. That's Myra's. What are you talking about? Myra's in New York. Oh, we'll soon find out. Uh, give me that telescope. But, uh... Hello? Yes, yes, she's here. Would you like to talk to her? Uh-huh. What? Good heavens, of course I'll tell her right away. Anne, you can stop looking. What is it, Leonard? Myra's here on the island. Lashing McComber just phoned. He wants you to go over to her house. She's been murdered. Elisha? Eh? Oh, Miss Waldron. Ah, you got here pretty quick, didn't you? I can't believe it. Myra dead. When did it happen? Sometime last night. Last night? The coroner says it must have took place between 11 and 12. That's impossible. Is it? Why? Well, it was close to 12 when I left you. I took the path that runs around this place. The house was locked up. Did you look to see? No, there, there was no reason for me to look. You yourself told me Myra wasn't on the island. I reckon I was wrong, Miss Waldron. Miss Van Wick must have got here while I was in New Bedford. Then that must have been it. Uh, what uh, was that, Miss Waldron? The door. As I was passing by here last night, I heard the door open and close. Twice. Uh, uh, of course, you didn't see anyone, did you? As a matter of fact, I... I, I, I didn't. It's too bad. Would you like to see the body? Must I? It can't hurt you. It's right there in the living room. Come along. There she is, just like I found her. Oh, her... Head's almost in the fireplace. Yep. She was just about to light the fire with that match when death blew it out. Oh. You got any idea what killed her? I? Well, why should I? I thought you might have. It was cyanide of potassium. Oh, how awful. Uh-huh. But there's one thing that puzzles me, Miss Waldron. How did the killer get her to take it? I... I don't know, Elisha. There ain't a sign of a struggle in the room, and there ain't a mark on her body. Cyanide works like lightning. That means she was killed right here in this room. But, Elisha, you keep talking about murder. How, how do you know it wasn't suicide? Of course, I, I ain't never seen a corpse that could get up and dispose of the evidence. Maybe she chewed it. Huh? Uh, how would you be knowing about that, Miss Walter? That piece of gum near the fireplace. Hmm. <laughs> I guess I must be slipping. Now, we'll see what the coroner has to say about this gum. It was suicide, Elisha. I'm sure of it now. Why? Ask Leonard Case. He can give you all the facts. I'm asking you, Miss Walton. I don't know them. Now, why did you send for me? I wanted to hear what you had to say in the presence of the corpse. But why me? To my way of thinking, Miss Van Wick was murdered. And I thought maybe I ought to have a talk with the one person that had both motive and opportunity. That's you, Miss Waldron. Well, are you 
trying to break down the door? I must see you, Mr. Highland. All right. Would you like to look at me here, or would you rather come in? I'll come in. Good. Sit down. No, thanks. Mr. Highland, what were you doing out in the fog last night? You won't call me David, will you? Will you answer my question, please? Sure. What were you doing out in the fog last night? I was going home. So was I. That makes us even, doesn't it? Not quite. Myra Van Wick's been murdered. What? You don't say. On this quiet, peaceful island? Did you tell anyone you met me? No. Good girl. Yes. Always play it smart. But I will, Mr. Highland. Will you? Would you like to hang for the murder of Myra Van Wick? What? Suppose I told Elisha that I saw you coming out of her house last night. But, but, but you didn't. How do you know I didn't? Well, I didn't go in after I left you. I, I went right home. Can you prove it? Can I... Now, look here, Mr. Highland. What are you trying to do? I don't want you to make any mistakes. You protect me, and I'll protect you. You killed Myra. Ah, uh-uh. Don't point, Miss Waldron. It's bad manners. Why did you do it? <laughs> All right. I'm going to find out, Mr. Highland. And what you came to this island for. And when I do... Yes? That... That letter on the desk. That's Myra's handwriting on the envelope. Put it down. Mail from New York yesterday. Give it to me. <laughs> didn't have to break my arm. I'm sorry. It's such a pretty arm, too. <sighs> and that's such a pretty neck. What? What are you going to do? Nothing. But if you say one word about this letter to anyone, I'm going to put a rope around that neck for keeps. <laughs> Leonard, what am I going to do? Elisha thinks I killed Myra. And I can't prove that I didn't. And I know you didn't, no matter what you thought of Myra. Oh, uh, Elisha was here. I told him that she wanted to marry me, but, well, I couldn't do it. Then she loved you? I'm afraid so. Leonard, it's possible then that Myra committed suicide. No. Just before you came in, Elisha phoned me. That piece of gum you found, there was no poison in it. Oh. oh, don't, don't worry, darling. We'll find a way to get you out of it. But, Leonard, who left that gun there? A killer, no doubt. Listen, Anne, what about David Highland? Who? Uh, don't pretend you don't know him. I saw you with him a little while ago. You saw me? Mm-hmm. This telescope. Oh. Why did you go to his house? I can't tell you. All right. Then maybe you can tell me what you and he were wrestling over. It was a letter, wasn't it? Leonard, please don't ask me. Wasn't it? I... <laughs> Yes, from Myra. Myra? Well, what's he got to do with me? I don't know. But, oh, promise you won't tell anyone. Leonard, you must promise. Why? Well, just promise, that's all. (laughs) All right, dear. But we've got to know what was in that letter. Yes, but how are we going to get it? I'll keep my telescope trained on his house. When David Highland goes out, I'll tell Sam... (laughs) Shut up, Mabel. Mabel? Leonard, that shoe buckle she brought in here this morning... Yes? That was Myra's. Oh, what a dunderhead I am. Why didn't I see it before? See what? Where did Mabel find that buckle? Certainly not in Myra's house. She must have found it outside somewhere. Don't you see what that means? Uh Uh-huh. That Myra wasn't killed in her own house. Say. Now all we have to do is find out where she was killed. Leonard, how well have you got that crow trained? Pretty well. Why? That buckle. If you told her to put it back where she found it, would she do it? Mm, I don't think so. She's not that smart. Uh Oh. Besides, it's been hours since she brought it here. All right. Then that letter from Myra might tell us what we want to know. I want to know the minute that man goes out. Now, let me see. The desk... Oh, he would keep it locked. I don't think he'd be so careless as to leave it under the chair cushions. No, that would be too obvious. Oh, oh. oh. Hello? Anne. Oh, what is it, Leonard? Is he coming back? I haven't seen him, but it's getting dark, and I'm afraid I won't be able to keep watch for you much longer. I can't leave now. I've got to find that letter. But it might be dangerous. Suppose he walks in on you. Well, I'll have to take that chance. Hold the wire. I'll go look some more. All right, but hurry. Chair cushions. Oh, no, of course not. That 
liquor cabinet. Who would think of looking in a liquor cabinet for a letter? Only it didn't get dark so fast. There. Hello, Leonard. Any luck, Ann? Plenty. I've got it. Bring it over here right away. Leonard. Well, what's the matter? Well, why don't you get out of there? I'm afraid it's too late. Well, Leonard, send for Elijah McComber, quick. Is it Highland? I can't see. It's dark. Get Elijah. Ann. <laughs> excitement about. And where do you think you're going? I'm not thinking, Your Honor. I'm going for a walk. Where's Miss Walter? Anne? She's supposed to be here? Yep. Let's go into your house. All right, if you like. While we're doing that little thing, would you mind telling me what this is all about? In time. Where is she? I don't know. When I left for the village, the house was empty. When I came back, it was still empty. She spoke to Mr. Case on the phone from here. Really? Well, perhaps I should lock my door when I go out. You think my neighbors would disapprove? Ain't none of my business. But this matter of Miss Waldron. Mr. Highland, would you be a gum chewing character? Gum chew? <laughs> Sometimes. When I want to get rid of a bad taste. Now, how did you get rid of the gum? Spit it out on the floor? What do you mean? Over there, by that table. But, well, I. Maybe be... you will a lot sooner than you'd be expecting. Are you ready to talk about Miss Waldron? Of course. Yes, I think she's beautiful. I think she's a charming girl. Now, if she were only a bit more friendly... Is that all you've got to say? No, but for the moment, it'll have to do. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe you'd better come with me. Where? To Miss Van Wick's house. Why there? Me and my boys have given that place a mighty fine once over. Somebody that done a killing could think that we'd have no more reason to go back there. But we have, Mr. Highland. Come on. <laughs> Well, are you satisfied, Elisha? There isn't a trace of Ann Waldron upstairs or even down here in the cellar. I ain't through looking yet, Mr. Hyland. Where do you expect to find her? In the coal bin? Maybe. Hand me that shovel. <laughs> All right, but I... On the other hand, uh, maybe you better do the shoveling. Hmm? I can keep an eye on you that way. Well, anything to make a select man happy, especially if he's the chairman of the board. <clears throat> You're a mighty calm young fellow, ain't you? Pretty sure of yourself. Uh, I was brought up right. What do you know about Miss Van Wick? She's dead. The postman mentioned that you got a letter from New York this afternoon. It was in a woman's handwriting. I get lots of letters. Uh, from dead people? And you can never tell about that, Elisha. Sometimes you can swear a person is alive, and then after you've known him for a while, you. But this change letter, your mind. Mr. Highland, the postman had an idea it was in Miss Van Wick's handwriting. Uh, from what he remembers of her handwriting. I didn't kill her. If that's what you're leading up to. Yep, that's what I'm leading up to. You got that letter? Nope. <laughs> I'll suit yourself, Mr. Highland. You don't have to talk now. Uh, wait a minute, huh? That suitcase, it was buried in the coal. Well, I'll be swan. Open it. Jumping G. Hossafat. Jewel. Diamonds. Well, there must be a million dollars worth. Hmm, so that's it. That's why Miss Van Wick was killed. Uh-huh. She come back here too soon. Whoever was hiding this stuff here figured that she'd be in New York, maybe. And maybe not, Mr. Highland. No. Maybe that person knew she was coming back. Maybe him and Miss Van Wick were sort of partners in a business that wasn't legal. Does that make sense to you, Mr. Highland? I don't know. I don't go in for guesswork. How about cyanide of potassium? You're singing way off key, Elisha. But you've got the right tune, ain't you? Put your hands up, Mr. Highland. <laughs> All right. Now, just you walk up them stairs. And no monkey business, my friend. I got an eye like an eagle. Operator, one, two, four. Hello. Elisha, this is Leonard Case. Have you found Ann Waldron? No. Oh, good heavens, what are you doing about it? 
I got searching parties out all over the island. But what about David Highland? It was from his house that she called for help. He'll talk, Mr. Case, about Miss Walden and about Miss Van Wick, too. You mean that he killed Myra? Yeah, well, oh, Mr. Case. Yes? The folks here in the village tell me your car's been parked all day by the general store. Uh, I know. My butler, Sam Ray, took it this morning. Send him back if you see him, will you? Ain't nobody seen him since 2 o'clock this afternoon. I reckon you'll have to be advertising for a new butler, Mr. Case. Oh, that's ridiculous. Sam wouldn't quit me without notice. Uh, maybe not, but he ain't on the island. <laughs> Okay, sister, on your feet. Shut up. They're going to take a ride now in the open sea. Fresh air and just enough fog to keep me and you out of sight. Nice, isn't it? The way that fog comes in over the water. Perfect hideout. Even better than this stinking old tool shed. <laughs> Tough, ain't it? You got so much to say, but that gag don't let you. Yeah. Okay, get going. Right down to the boat. Then maybe when we get way out in the ocean, I'll tell you a nice, interesting bedtime story. Okay, baby, this is it. Yeah, you're dying to talk, ain't you? Okay, I'll take off the gag. Yeah, you can scream, too. There ain't a soul around here to hear you, eight miles offshore. Sam Ray, when Leonard Case finds out about this, he... <laughs> What's he gonna do, fire me? He'll... What have you got against me? Why did you bring me out here to kill me? I don't like snoopers, baby. But I was only trying to protect myself. Elisha McComber suspected me of killing Myra Van Wick. I didn't do it. I had to find out who did. So you went after a letter. I thought it might give me a clue. Yeah. Did that letter contain any evidence, Sam? Plenty. What kind of evidence? <laughs> You're sure a dame, ain't you? Well, you can't be afraid to tell me now. I'll never have a chance to... Will I? How right you are. Well, are you going to tell me or aren't you? Baby, that letter meant the difference between a million bucks and zero. That Highland guy... Then he was mixed up with the death of Myra. Shut up. What's the matter? Listen. There's a boat out there. If you make one sound... You listen. <laughs> are you dirty little... I'm going to finish you off right now and get out of here. Get away from me, Miss Walden. Get down in that boat. Go ahead, Elijah. Go ahead. That's the whole story, Leonard. If it hadn't been for Elisha, I'd be at the bottom of the ocean now. Oh, Anne, darling, I don't know what to say to you. I feel as though it's all my fault. Nonsense. Oh, but Sam worked for me. I trusted him. How was I to know that he was a diamond thief and that he'd killed Myra? He did kill Myra, didn't he, Elisha? I reckon so. We got in a way of knowing now with him at the bottom of the ocean. Well, all I can say is thanks for saving Anne. Now, how about a party to celebrate? Sam gone, I guess we'll have to rely on Mabel to do the honors. Mabel! <coughs> candy! Candy, Mabel, for the lady. Oh, if she could only cook. <coughs> Mabel! She flew out the window. Leonard, she's flying toward Myra's house. Candy for the lady, eh, Mr. King? I don't understand what got into that bird. She's never disobeyed orders. And I reckon she ain't disobeying them now. She's flying to the only lady she knows. All right, Mr. Case, you can talk now. If you've got a mind to. But i got nothing to say. Well, that's your privilege. But you killed Myra Van Wick by sending that bird out last night with a piece of poison candy. 
And you done it because you knew the lady would take the candy from the bird, maybe as an omen of reconciliation. Miss Waldron, did you know that Mr. Case and Miss Van Wick was husband and wife? Married? Yep. I asked the police in New York to do a routine check on Miss Van Wick, and they come up with the dope. Leonard. All right, so what? I didn't want her around. I told her to stay away from the island, to leave me alone. And you had good reason to. She might have found them diamonds in her coal bin. That would have been too bad, wouldn't it, for you? David? Hmm? Uh, Anne. Well, what brings you down to the beach at this hour of night? You. And some of the things you can explain to me about Leonard. Oh. Well... Leonard Case was a smuggler. Sam Ray worked for him. So did a lot of others. It was my job to round up the gang from the top down. Your job? Mm Mm-hmm. I'm an agent of the Treasury Department. Oh. Well, that tells me a lot. Oh. Well, that's why I had to be so tough with you on occasions. I couldn't take the chance of being implicated in a murder. I would have had to explain my position to Elisha. But he's an officer of the law. Rounding up a gang of smugglers was my job. Finding a murderer was his. Yes. But what about that letter you received from Mara? That, my dear, was an authorization for me to enter her house and search it. Oh. Oh! What a... (laughs) What a little dope you are. Mr. Highland. David. (laughs) Come on, let's take a walk. So closes tonight's Crime Club book, Death Blew Out the Match, based on the story by Kathleen Moore Knight. Stedman Coles did the radio adaptation, Roger Bauer produced and directed. (laughs) Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the Crime Club. Well, I'm the librarian. Yes, yes. Ah, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have a very unusual story about a murderer who was revealed by postage stamps. It's called For the Hangman. In the meantime? Well, in the meantime, there's a new Crime Club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's available now. Quite all right. And we'll look for you next week. program came to you from New York. Mutual's Mystery Hour continues immediately after station identification with a casebook of Gregory Hood. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Fear came first. Yes, we have that crime club story for you. Come right over. chair by the window. Comfortable? 
The book is on this shelf. Here it is. Fear Came First by Vera Kelsey. The very intriguing story of a house that was divided by fear until united by death. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. Madrona Place was the real estate empire that Grandfather Wales had built and died building. A square mile of rolling fields and woodland and lakes. And yes, the huge gray house, the manor house, the gloomy headquarters of death. It was at this house that Thor Satteland arrived one blustering evening in March. And as he waited in the icy wind, he thought of the warm reception he knew he'd get. The door opened. Yes? Oh. Well, what do you want? Well, I'm sorry. I thought... Well, I was expecting... Speak up, will you? I'm freezing. I'm Thor Satterland. Well, I'm still freezing. Hilda Swenson's grandson. Oh. You see, I was expecting her to open the door, and I... Well, you'd better come in. Uh, yes, thank you. Well, quickly, if you don't mind. <sighs> That's better. How you Vikings can stand the cold. Now, let's take a good look at you. Oh, uh, couldn't you tell me about my grandmother mm, first? Pulchritude with muscles. About my grandmother, Miss, uh... Wales, honey. First cousin to Fleur. But you can call me... Who's that, Eileen? A man, Beulah. And he belongs. Hulda's grandson. What? Yes. Wouldn't you like to meet him? Thank you. I have other things to do. <laughs> Isn't she charming, Thor? My aunt, by marriage. An outsider who married a son of the late Grandfather Wales. Late? Oh, didn't you know? The Lord of the Manor was tucked away in his beloved real estate six weeks ago. That nice old man dead. Mm -hmm. Terrible, isn't it? And he was only 87. Uh, I, uh, I'm going to look for my grandmother. <laughs> Don't lose your wind doing it. What? She's dead, too. No. Three days ago. We buried her this morning. But she... Well, only last week she... Where's Fleur Wales? You can take my word for it. I want Fleur. All right. She's upstairs in her room. Do you know anything about this place? Yes, yes. Then you ought to know where the living room is. Wait there. I'll tell her you dropped in like the handsome plague. Thor, you know what we thought of Hulda, Grandfather Wales and I. She was more than a housekeeper to us. She was the mainstay of this house. Yes, I know that, Fleur. Everything revolved around her. I had no mother or father except for Hulda. And then... Please. I'm sorry. I've been trying so hard not to go to pieces. In six weeks, first grandfather... <laughs> would you... Would you rather not talk about it now? I must talk. You've got a right to know how Hulda died. And why she died. Why? Yes. It's very important. It might explain many things. After Grandfather Wales passed away, they came... You met Eileen. And Beulah. Well, there's another one, Ruby Devers. Hulda resented them. They treated her like a servant, and she wanted me to send them packing. Yes? But I couldn't. They're relatives, and every single one of them seems to think that she's got a claim to this property. Oh. Hulda wouldn't understand my position. She became sullen. And then four days ago, she disappeared. Oh, good grief. Oh. Wasn't that the day the big blizzard began? Saturday morning. Uh, uh, I was reading about it in Chicago when I... Uh, go on, Fleur. I thought she'd gone to her cottage at Cranford. The one my grandfather built for her birthday years ago. I drove there, Well, don't but... tell me she got lost in that storm. I don't know what happened, Thor. But she never reached Cranford. Oh, my Lord. Late Sunday afternoon, some men taking the shortcut through the woods found her. Ah, that poor old woman. <laughs> what did the doctor say it was? Well, the coroner told Sheriff LaRue that it was a heart attack. But there was a pretty bad bruise on her forehead. Bruise? She must have fallen against a tree. 
Oh, I wanted her to be patient. To wait until I could find out what those women really expected me to give them. If they had any rights to any part of Madrona Place. Fleur, was my grandmother afraid of these women? <laughs> afraid? Well, it's, it's just an idea. Would you know? Well, I'd say that she wasn't. Or she didn't seem to be. Well, how about you? Are you afraid of them? I don't know. There's nothing they can take away from me. This property is mine. Grandfather Wills left it to me in his will. But... Yes? In the event of my death, it goes to them in equal shares. Then you are afraid. All right. Are you going? Yes, I left my luggage at the bus stop in Laketon. Oh, then you're coming back. Well, I don't have to see Chicago again for a week. Good. I'll drive you to Laketon. No, I want to take that shortcut through the woods. Now? In the dark? <laughs> Don't worry. I'm not going to have any heart attack. Uh, just leave the front door unlocked. I might be a little late. Now, look, Sheriff LaRue, I, I don't like to say the coroner made a mistake. But you're saying it, Mr. Satterland. Maybe my grandmother did have a heart attack. It's possible. She was 73. But that bruise on her forehead... What are you trying to do? Make out a case of murder? Well, I'm just wondering about it, that's all. You got any reasons for wondering? Yes. She gave 50 years of her life to Madrona Place... She was nurse and housekeeper to the old man. She kept him alive. You don't have to tell me, Mr. Satterland. He was even too sick to walk. And you know what she did when Flora's father and mother were killed? Yeah, a couple of months after the girl was born. She brought her up like her own child. Uh, she wouldn't have left her. But she did. I don't believe it. That ain't evidence, Mr. Satterland. Well, well then, maybe this is. Huh? What's that? A letter I received from my grandmother two weeks ago. Yeah, read it. Okay. <clears throat> Things is very bad here at Madrona Place. I do not think I know what to do. You come and I will tell you what I see and what I know. Come right away. It is... <clears throat> What's this word? Dangerous. Oh, yeah. Did you uh, answer this letter? A week ago. Huh? And Hulda Swenson must have had your letter before she was... Before she died. And she was expecting me today. Who knows about this letter? Mm, just you and me, I think. You didn't show it to the ladies of Madrona Place? Not yet. Well, don't. And say nothing about it. All right. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to pay them ladies a visit. Maybe I'll find out which one of them knows more than the book says she ought to. I'm going upstairs to bed, Bueller. Good night, Eileen. But, but, Fleur, aren't you going to wait up for our handsome Viking? The housekeeper's grandson. An ex-housekeeper's grandson, Bueller. The class distinction was buried this morning. Eileen. Sorry if I've spoken disrespectfully about your sacred cow. But Thor, the god of thunder and lightning, what of all holla I could make with that guy? Good night. Uh, Fleur, what is it, Bueller? Look into Ruby's room, please. She went to bed with a sick headache. She might want something. You can do that yourself if you like. I've had enough of all of you. Well, one word about her precious holder. Oh, it isn't that, Eileen. Oh, no. It's that man, Thor Sutherland. Since he came here tonight... She's been full of vitamins. And very difficult. Why do you suppose she sent for him? I don't know. Did she send for him? Of course. She means to get rid of us. Oh. oh, leave it to her. She'll find a way. Nobody can get rid of us, Bula. We go with the land, like topsoil. I don't trust her, Eileen. You don't trust anyone, including Ruby and me. What? But that's all right. I don't trust you or Ruby either. Any day I expect to look in the mirror and find a knife in my back. How can you say that? I open my mouth and out it comes. Very well, if that's all you think of me. Oh, Beulah, let's not get sentimental. I'm thinking of my future, our future. We'll never make any progress until we learn to trust each other. <laughs> and all this because a man came to the house. He told Fleur he was going to Leighton to pick up his luggage. But that was more than three hours ago. He walked the woods path where Hulda's body was found. Why did you say that to me, that way? 
You're worried about something, aren't you? Oh, I don't want strangers meddling in our business. And that man... Is that all? He should have been back two hours ago. Beulah, you fascinate me. I really think you're frightened. Oh, nonsense. I I'm puzzled. You should be, too. I am. Oh? By only one thing. What's that, dear? Who killed Cock Robin? <laughs> What's the matter? Somebody. Oh, somebody. Oh, now, tell me. Oh, my throat. I, I couldn't breathe. Where's the fire? What is it, I mean? Who screamed? Keep your nightcap on, Beulah. I'm looking for that information myself. Oh, tell them to go away. Oh. Well, I shouldn't wonder. That man is with her under the same roof with me. Uh, good night, Eileen. Naughty, naughty. All right, Fleur. Those women... Ah, tell me what happened. Why did you scream? I was dreaming, Thor. That someone was strangling me with my silver necklace. Yes. I had to scream. I was screaming in my dream. I couldn't breathe. <laughs> you scared the living daylights out of me. I'm sorry. I feel so foolish now. <gasps> What's the matter? This reading lamp. I turned it off before I fell asleep. Are you sure? Yes. I remember. Uh, let me see your throat. But that's all. It was a dream. Uh, those two scratches aren't. What? Yeah. Fleur, where did you keep that necklace? I had dropped it on the dressing table. No place else? Isn't it there? No. Well, then look on the chest of drawers. All right. I know I didn't put it away. I took it off and I dropped it. I'll go, Fleur. But Thor, it must be. You mean it should be. Oh. Uh, you weren't dreaming, Fleur. Somebody tried to kill you. Oh, no. When you started to scream, she got scared and ran out with a necklace. Who? I'm going to ask Sheriff LaRue to answer that question tomorrow. Just keep your door locked tonight. <laughs> Oh, good morning, Sheriff. Hello, Thor. Oh, I got frost in my bones. The ladies up yet? Oh, they're in the dining room. Good. Yeah, take off your coat. No, thanks. I ain't staying any longer than I have to. Well, suit yourself. Always do. Well, good morning, ladies. Well, Sheriff LaRue, we're just having breakfast. Would you like to drop into a cup of coffee? Eileen, please. Beulah, my dried-up conscience. Uh, where's the other one, Fleur? The other one? He means Ruby, darling. She's still sleeping, Sheriff. Somebody wake her up and get her down here. Why, Sheriff? I want everybody present, Fleur. I, uh... I changed my idea about the way Holder Swenson died. Well, so I got evidence it might have been murder. Murder? But what evidence, Sheriff? Beulah, don't you know it's the law that asks all the questions? Eileen, when I want advice from That's you... That's all I... right, ma'am. You'd better go upstairs and get Ruby, Miss Eileen. I like you less every time you open your mouth. Now, see here, you bundled up Mackinac. Go ahead. I've got a jail with vacancies. Well, since you put it so nicely. All right, now. But Sheriff LaRue, why should anyone want to kill Holder? Because she had information. Detrimental to Fleur, of course. Now, uh, wait a minute, Beulah. You're going to say that she killed my grandmother. Young man, I had rather you wouldn't speak to me after what I saw last night. What's that? <laughs> He and... Oh, it was too disgraceful. Now, look, ma'am. I'm not going to talk about it, Sheriff. They can tell you if they want to. I've got something else to explain. Yeah. I suppose you've been wondering what Eileen and Ruby and I have been doing in this house. Sort of. Well, we've been trying to reestablish our claim to this property. Huh? Yeah. What about it, Frank? I don't know. Grandfather Wales left Madrona Place to me. It's in his will. Then they arrived with notions... Oh, don't believe her. The three of us are not crazy. Oh, please, I didn't say you were. But nothing has ever been said to me about any of you. I'm willing to let you prove your claims. 
I haven't tried to stop you. No, you haven't. I let you examine my grandfather's papers, his files. I've exposed the entire house to you. I could have put you out any time I wanted, but I didn't. I didn't even suggest it, did I, Beulah? Oh, well, you were not doing it out of kindness, Fleur. No. I wanted to be fair with you and the others. Hulda didn't agree with me. And she's dead. And last night, one of you tried to kill me. What? She's lying, Sheriff. With my silver necklace while I was sleeping. You could still see the marks on my throat. Look. Yeah. I was going to tell you about it, Sheriff. Well... And all because of some real estate. That's worth about a half million dollars. Oh, it's you again. Now, where's... But you haven't heard the whole story, Sheriff. Old man Wales was my grandfather, too. But I didn't live here with him. I couldn't spin his top when it came to making a will. That's what I've been having to put up with, Sheriff. But it wasn't because you loved it. It was because you knew our grandfather had no right to leave all this property to you. He didn't buy it with his own money. You tell him, Beulah. His three sons and Ruby paid for half of it. And one of his sons was my husband. And one was my father. You get the idea, Sheriff? The kids chipped in to make a home for the old man, but only on a promissory basis. Yes. When Grandpapa died, and he did, his sons, or their leftovers, would get what they're entitled to. And that's all we want. But surely if that was the understanding, your grandfather would have kept records. That, my sinewy Viking, is what we contend, but we haven't been able to prove as yet. Well, that's not my department, unless it adds up to murder. When's Ruby coming down? She isn't. Now, see here, you tell her... You tell her. I don't know where she is. Why? She's vamoosed. Bag and some of her baggage. Oh, my goodness. Are you thinking of last night, Beulah? Yes, after Fleur screamed. What about it, ma'am? Eileen and I came out of our rooms to see what was wrong, but Ruby didn't. And maybe she didn't have to. If she knew why Fleur was screaming... Eileen, are you suggesting... That Ruby tried to kill me? I'm not suggesting, Fleur. Wait till the law sees what I found. Uh, where are you going? To get something I left in the hall. Now, handle with care. And don't get any fingerprints on it. Now, look, miss, if I've got to listen to any more of your corny I jokes... I wrap the handkerchief and... Presto, a paperweight. There's blood on it. What a team. We can't lose the pennant. Where'd you get this? On the floor in Ruby's closet. She must have forgotten to take it. Yeah, I'll bet. Like she forgot to take herself. You must think I'm a fool. That's my paperweight, Sheriff. I don't care who it belongs to, Fleur. Ruby asked me if she might use it in her room. Huh? When? Several days ago. Before Hulda Swenson was killed? Yes, but Sheriff... This is what it was done with, Fleur. Huh. I'd better see about finding Ruby. But, Thor, why must we go to Cranford? I told you, Fleur, I want to see my grandmother's cottage. Yes, but why? Well, Ruby disappeared. She killed my grandmother, tried to kill you. Do you think she's hiding there? I don't know of a better place. Wouldn't it be slightly ridiculous? So close to Madrona Place? No one would think of looking for her there. You thought of it. So? So Sheriff LaRue most likely thought of it, too. But you're not going to Hulda's cottage to find Ruby. No. You believe them, Eileen and Beulah, about their claims to Madrona Place. Now, uh, wait a minute. You know that Hulda was very methodical. She used to keep records of everything. Yes, but that doesn't Please mean... Please don't deny it, Thor. You're going to the cottage to see if you can't find something to prove their claims. Don't you want them proved? Yes. If they can be. But if there's anything at the cottage, I'd rather the sheriff found it. Well, that's what I'm not... what I'm going there for. Oh? My grandmother was crazy about keeping diaries. I want to find out if she's left one of her little books at the cottage. Why? She knew something, Fleur. What? There's no case against Ruby or anyone else without it. Come on, Fleur. Yes. <laughs> you don't have to be so tense. I don't like what we're doing, Thor. Oh, now, if you're going to worry about what the sheriff will say. Good heavens. Look at this place. Cyclone couldn't have done a better job of tearing down. 
Everything except the walls. Let's get out of here, Thor. Yeah, and even they've been ripped wide open in places. Thor, what? I can't bear to look at it. I'll, I'll wait for you in the car. Ah, I'll go with you. Somebody with the same idea as mine beat me to it. Halder's cottage. Yeah, if there's any evidence in there, it's gone with a killer. I think we'll find Sheriff Oru and tell him about this. No, please take me home. You can tell him about it later. <laughs> Those men. What are they doing on my property? Oh, I don't... Oh, uh, there's Sheriff LaRue. Let's ask him. Sheriff! Sheriff LaRue! Huh? Oh. What's happening? Well, what are those men doing? What are they looking for? Oh, there's nothing to get excited about, Fleur. Those are some of my boys and some boys from the DA's office. Where you been? Uh, Cranford. My grandmother's cottage. Oh, yeah. Pretty messy, ain't it? Oh, you've been there? Not me. I sent one of my boys. He gave me a first-hand report. But those men, Sheriff, what are they looking for? Ruby Devers. What? Sheriff. It's just a hunch, kiddies. I've got an idea she never left this property. I don't get it. It's very simple. This is sparsely populated country. Once the people in these parts see a face, they never forget it. And nobody I talked to seen Ruby Devers' face today. But, Sheriff, that doesn't mean she... It could, Mr. Sadler. There's only a couple of places that lady could have gone to. Well, no one of them's the woods. She wouldn't have a chance in there against this kind of cold. Well, what about lakes and the bus stop? Well, she didn't get there, son. How do you know? The man at the station told me. He knows everybody that lives in this neck of the woods, even if they're only visiting. And he's seen no Ruby Devers. Hey, Sheriff. Huh? You better come here. I think we found something. Okay, be right there. Oh. Now you take her into the house, Mr. Satterland. I'll be along as soon as I've got something to tell you. Isn't anybody going to talk? Sure. Ask a question and we'll give you 20 answers. Eileen. There goes my conscience again. Well, this is no time to be flippant. With the sheriff expecting to find Ruby's dead body out there. Would you cut your throat if he did? Thor. Yes? Will you look out of the window, please? Oh, now, listen, Flo. Oh, go and look out of the window and be thankful she doesn't ask you to jump. Why don't you shut up for a change? I can. It's no hardship among friends. That must be the sheriff. Well? We've got her, Flo. Where was she? In the well. Good heavens. Pussy in the well. Who put her there? That's what I mean to find out, Miss Eileen. From the person who done it. You know? Yeah. She was already dead, Flair, when her body was thrown in there. How, Sheriff? I want the killer to tell me. Don't you know how she was killed? I know, Mr. Sutherland. Well, does anybody want to talk to me alone? Uh, would it help if I say I've known the killer since early this morning? What are you talking about, Sheriff? I knew Ruby Devers didn't kill Holder Swinch. What? I think you're bluffing. Why didn't you make an arrest? I wasn't ready, Miss Eileen. Ruby had to be found first. Are you ready now? Mm-hmm. Then make it, why don't you? Yeah. So am I going to have to do all the talking? Well, if you want a prisoner. How about it, Fleur? Well, I don't know, Sheriff. Is this your silver necklace? The one you were choked with last night? Yes. Where did you find it? The diver found it. In the well. Oh. It was used to kill Ruby Devers. One of them. No, Mr. Sutherland. Fleur. Oh, you're crazy. She was almost murdered herself. I think when she gets ready to talk, she'll tell a different story. What, those scratches on her, on her, her throat? Her own nails did that, didn't they, Fleur? Sheriff LaRue, you've never been so mistaken in your life. I've known you for a long time, young lady, as a neighbor. I thought you'd want to talk to me alone. If I had anything to say. You have. But I'll say it. You killed Holder Swenson. Oh, now, look. Here, Sheriff. Sit down, Mr. Satterland. I'm talking now. You killed her, Fleur, because she knew that you would kill your grandfather. Of course. It was your job to bring him his medicine. The last attack he had, you let him die without the medicine. You'll have to prove that, Sheriff. Holder knew it. She also knew that your grandfather left no will. No will? 
But the paper she told us about. The paper that was filed. A forgery, ma'am. Alda Swenson knew that, too. From the day of the old man's death, she lived in terror of the girl she had raised from the cradle. That's why she wrote to you, Mr. Satterman. Fleur, is that true? He hasn't proved it yet. But he can't be making it up. It's too much. Don't worry about the proof. I've got it. Hulda's diary. What? Where did you find it? In a safe deposit box in Cranford. And with it, Fleur, were memos of all the money the old man had received from his sons and Ruby Devers for the development of Madrona Place. All right. I killed Hulda. And I forged the will. I didn't want to divide this property with strangers. It was my home. A half million dollars worth. Why did you let the old man die? He was going to make out a will, giving them shares, 50%. I lived at Madrona Place all my life, and he was going to let them take over my home. What about Ruby Devers? She saw me strike, Alder, with that paperweight. And then she tried to force me to sign a paper, giving her half of this property. I had to kill her. Just as I had to kill Holder, because she was going to tell Paul what I'd done. Come on, Fred. Now they're going to take Madrona Place, my home. They're going to take away my home. Well, don't ever mention that word to me again, Beulah. What? That's better. Thor. Yes? Would you like to tell me a story? About what? You can go now, Beulah. You're making a crowd. And so closes tonight's Crime Club book, Fear Came First, based on a story by Vera Kelsey. Stedman Coles did the radio adaptation... Roger Bauer, produced and directed. Sidney Smith played Thor Sutherland. And Helen Shields was Fleur Wales. Grace Coppin was Eileen. Irene Hubbard was Beulah. And Cameron Poudon played Sheriff LaRue. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have a very unusual story about a dead man who captured a murderer. It's called Dead Man Control by Helen Riley. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there is a new crime club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we look for you next week. program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Dead man control. Yes, we have that crime club story for you. Come right over. Take the easy chair by the window. 
comfortable. The book is on this shelf. Here it is. Dead Man Control by Helen Riley. The very absorbing story of a murder in which Cupid held the hand of death. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It was late morning, and in the library of a mansion on East 67th Street, multimillionaire Fenimore Kingston was standing before the wall safe he had just opened. He smiled, and then as he reached in... Two hours later, Inspector Christopher McKee was in his office at police headquarters on Center Street when the telephone rang. Inspector McKee talking, Homicide Bureau. Good morning. This is Catherine Kingston. Yes? This is Fenimore Kingston. Oh, yes? My husband's been murdered. Can you come? Where? Our home is on East 67th Street. All right, I'll be there in 20 minutes. Yes, sir. Cassidy, order my car. We're going uptown. Yes, sir. And how are you... And don't stop to ask about anybody's health. I'm in a hurry. Please go on, Mrs. Kingston. Well, Inspector, as soon as I saw that open wall safe, I thought my husband had been killed by a burglar. Mm-hmm. So while I was waiting for you, I checked the contents. The money and the bonds were still there. But... Yes? The diamond ring that Fenimore gave me after our wedding three months ago. That's gone. That wouldn't be the well-publicized Kingston diamond, would it? It would, Inspector. And it's worth a half a million dollars. Yes, but the cash from those negotiable bonds... I can't understand why they weren't taken to... Very unusual thief, to say the least. Uh, where were you when the miracle happened? Out. I went out early this morning. I was restless. Why? I was tired of doing nothing. So I took the car and drove until I was tired of driving. Alone? Inspector McKee. Don't be a lie, Mrs. Kingston. I'm not insinuating... But your tone... Merely professional. Now, according to the medical examiner, your husband was shot in the back and death was instantaneous about two hours ago. Who was in the house with him then? I don't know. What about the servants? Did they go out driving too? We have no servants. In this big house? They quit last night. Oh? <laughs> don't let it surprise you, Inspector. Fenimore was not an easy person to get along with. Mrs. Kingston, for your special information, I don't let anything surprise me. Excuse me, sir. What is it, Cassidy? It's about the murder weapon. Did you find it? Uh, no, sir. There ain't a trace of it in the house. Uh, me and the boys have looked in every nook and... All right, Cassidy. Uh, All right. Yes, sir. Oh, my. What's the matter? Over there, Inspector. Peep it out from under that corner of the window drape. It shines like a diamond. It is a diamond. Well, if it is, then the saints preserve us. It must be as big as an eyeball. Yes. Well, Mrs. Kingston. My ring. No burglary, huh? It doesn't seem so, does it? But how did that ring get under the drape? The law of gravity. It fell when your husband fell, after he was shot. And it either rolled or bounced. You can take your pick. I'll take the ring, if you don't mind. Later. Right now, it's evidence. But it's mine. We'll take good care of it. Come on, Cassidy. I'll be finished here, sir. For the time being, goodbye, Mrs. Kingston. Goodbye, Inspector. Cassidy. Uh, Inspector McKee, if it's one question I might ask... Go ahead. Uh, what's the ring got to do with the cadaver we carried upstairs? I think it killed him. The devil, you say? Don't lead me on, Sergeant. I have no time to explain. Well, if you say so, Inspector. Going back to my office. I want you to go to the telephone company. Get a list of every call that's been made from or to this house in the last two days. Report to me at headquarters. Yes, sir. But there's one thing that... Now the... what? But it's that girl in there, Mrs. Kingston. Uh -huh. Now, I've been on the force for 32 years, and it's a fine education I've got about the good and the bad in Not people. Not now, Cassidy. When a girl, young and beautiful, marries a man twice her age and a millionaire, she didn't marry him for love. Is this Michael Dolger's apartment? Yes. Who is this? Amy Clarberson. Why? Oh, this is Catherine Kingston. Let me talk to Michael, please. 
might ask me how I'm feeling. Please, Amy. After all, you did get what I wanted. I want to speak to Michael. I'll ask him how he feels about it. Hold the wire. And don't wind it too tightly around your neck, dear. Hello, Kathy. What's she doing there? Oh, she just dropped in for a cocktail. Oh, it doesn't matter. I want you to meet me right away. Where? Central Park, inside the 72nd Street entrance. I'll pick you up in my car. All right. But what's the rumpus about? Fenimore's dead. What? what did you say? He was murdered this morning. Good grief. Maybe, uh, maybe I'd better come over. No. The police are here, dozens of them, all over the place. Meet me in half an hour. And come alone. <laughs> How'd you manage it? I didn't. What? I couldn't get out without being seen. Michael, I'm in trouble. But if the police followed you... Is that all you care about? Your precious hide? Well, it's the only one I've got. Well, you don't have to worry. I wasn't followed. Are you sure? Yes, look for yourself. Is there a police car behind us? No, but... Michael, really, I'm in serious trouble. How was Fenimore killed? He was shot. And the police think I did it. You? Have they said so? Well, not in words, they haven't. That Inspector McKee, he thinks he's very clever. Well, you should have left me alone, Kathy. I couldn't. I had to speak to you. Well, why didn't you do it on the phone? I didn't want to incriminate but... you. What? Suppose one of those policemen had been listening at the door. Well, suppose. He'd have heard me asking you about that appointment you had with Fenimore this morning. That I had? Just about the time he was killed. Now, wait a minute. I had no appointment with Fenimore. That's not the truth. He phoned you and asked you to come over. Did he tell you that? No. Then how do you know so much? I was listening in on the upstairs extension. Oh. How much did you hear? He wanted you to meet him at the house at 11 o'clock. It was very important. Anything else? No, I put the receiver down. It was half past ten, and I wanted to be out of the house before you arrived. Really? I didn't know what he was going to talk to you about. I was afraid it might be us. So you ran away. That's too bad. Why? Because if you'd stayed, you'd have learned something. Didn't he talk to you about us? No, dear. Well, then what did he? I don't know. I wasn't there. What? That's right. Fenimore wanted to see me, but I didn't want to see him, and I told him so. You told Fenimore? Yes, I did. <laughs> the great mammon. <laughs> well, wasn't it about time? I'd like to believe that, Michael. Then do. I got tired of being my cousin's errand boy and of running to him every time he beckoned. But your allowance. I told him what to do with that, too. But it doesn't make any difference now, does it? No. You're free. And we'll have all the money we both need. That's putting it very bluntly. Why not? He never cared for anyone, including you. You were the most beautiful thing he ever saw, and he wanted you. It's just as simple as that. I, I know all about all it, All right. Mark. All right. I'll shut up. Kathy. Yes? Did you really go out this morning? I said I did. Of course. But I was just thinking, what a wonderful opportunity you had, alone in that house with him. Yeah? Uh-huh. Good work, Gordon. Let me know when she gets back. Can I come in, Inspector? Help yourself, Cassidy. Well, I checked with the telephone company, sir, and it's big news if I don't mind saying it myself. Yes? Anything like Catherine Kingston going out to meet a man? A uh, uh, What? You've heard of the species, Cassidy. And I'm sure you've heard of Central Park. Is that where she went with him? Mm-hmm. In broad daylight? <laughs> There's no topping an Irishman, is there? <laughs> <laughs> well, not if he comes from the county cock, sir. <laughs> it, well, who's the man? We don't know yet, but he's being tailed. Now, what did you find out at the telephone company? Oh, wait, wait, wait. here's a list of all the cars that came and went from the Kingston house in the last couple of days. Right. Uh, but but uh, 
It's them last three that was made this morning. Yes, all outgoing. One at 10.30, one at 10.35. And Kingston was killed at about 11. And this one at 1.45. Oh, a few minutes after we left Mrs. Kingston. Yes, right. Who were these calls made to, Cassidy? Uh, oh, yeah, but I, I got that on another slip of paper. Now, where the... Dip- oh, yeah, here it is. Now, 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 the first one and the last one to Michael Dolge. So that's the man. Mm-hmm. Uh, go ahead, Cassidy. I'm just checking. Uh, he was the dead man's cousin. How do you know? Well, I remember seeing his name in the papers after the Kingston wedding. Seems to me he was either the best man or one of the ushers. But, but it's not him I'd be worrying about, sir. No? Why not? It's that woman. The one who got the call at 10.35. What woman? Amy Clowbertson. Ah, uh, no answer. Michael Doe's most likely out with Catherine Kingston. Yeah. Uh, what what did you say about a woman? No, uh, Amy Clowbertson. Well, what about her? Well, see, you know how I read the newspapers every day. I know. Well, after I get through with the spotting pages, I always turn to the society page. Mm. It's an old habit of mine. I acquired it 32 years ago when I was a rookie on that Fifth Avenue beat. <laughs> you know Fifth Avenue uptown where Central Park lies opposite them glorious mansions with the beautiful... Sit down, Cassidy. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. <laughs> oh, me, them were fine old days. Yep, people used to come from all over just to look at the Woolworth building. Don't let me interrupt you, but you were telling me about a woman. Uh, a woman? Yes, in connection with a murder. The, oh, oh, yes, yeah. you, uh, Amy Clarbertson. Well, sir, seeing her name again brought to mind a society page item of about five months ago. To the effect that Amy Clarbertson and Fanny Moore Kingston were engaged to be married. Cassidy, are you sure? Yes, I am, sir, because the diamond ring was mentioned in the same article. How? Where did she wore it at the formal reception? I see. And not two months later, Fanny Moore Kingston married Catherine. It's the old story, Inspector. Not another one, please. The woman scorns. There's no fury like a woman who expects to marry a millionaire Mm. and gets jilted. Yes. Yes. There's no doubt about it. All right, I'll pick it up on the way out. Well. Oh, bad news, Inspector. For someone, that was a lab just phoned. The ring we found is a phony. A perfect imitation. You mean it's made of glass? Not quite. Somebody had a good job done for a few hundred dollars, and the original, valued at half a million... Well, it would... might be somewhere in a vault, maybe. Uh, lots of people wear paste and keep their valuables yes, locked yes, up. Uh, oh, Cassidy. No, I... Yes, sir. Phone the Kingston house. Tell the men to turn that place inside out. Yes, sir. And when you get through, take as many men as you need and contact every diamond cutter in town, especially the ones around Maiden Lane. Yes, sir. Now, where's that slip of paper with the names on it? Uh, oh, 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 yeah, it's right here, sir. The address is too. Give it to me. I'm going out to pay Amy Culbertson a visit. Excuse me. I don't want any. Inspector McKee, police. I still don't want any, but you can come in. I have scotch on the table. Cigarettes, if you didn't bring your own. No, thanks. Sit yourself. What do you want? Sit down, please. If you're here to ask a lot of questions about Fenimore Kingston's murder, don't waste your breath because I don't know any of the answers. How do you know about his murder? Radio told me. Not today. Not today, Miss Lawson. Why don't you sit down? Maybe I don't want to. Would you have any reason to protect Catherine Kingston? Not one. Well, here's to you. Michael Dole? <coughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to catch you off guard. Why'd you mention his name to me? This pack of matches with his name on the cover. You're pretty smart, aren't you? I have a weakness for matches that are left on tables. All right, so he told me about Fenimore's death. I was at his apartment when Catherine phoned. She told him. Anything else you'd like to know? What time did you meet Fenimore Kingston this morning? I did what? He phoned you at 10.35. How'd you find out about that? You just told me. What? Why, you wheedling wheedle. Shall we talk now? Pitch curves and have me swing at him. I'd like to know about you and Fenimore Kingston. I'm through talking to you. Are you? Then suppose we go down to headquarters. What for? We're very lonesome. Now, wait a minute. Let me go. I haven't done anything. What about you and Kingston? We were engaged. And then he jilted me and married that... Yes? Catherine and I were in the same show. I met Fenimore at a party and he fell for me like a ton of diamonds. 
And then, like our fool, I introduced him to Catherine. Why did he phone you this morning? One to date. Now, look, Miss Blanton. That's the truth. He told me he was going to divorce Catherine. He found out about her and Michael. He thought I knew something, too. And, of course, you rushed over to Michael's apartment and told him. Oh, not exactly. I tried to make it casual. Three hours later? Mike and I were in the same boat. Both of us had been kicked around by Fenimore. That was a common bond. So you waited from 10.35 until almost 2. Mm, still pitching curves, aren't you? Was it because you tried to get his apartment in the morning and couldn't? No. Or didn't you even try? What do you want from me? I didn't kill anybody. Fenimore didn't call you to talk about his wife. Then I don't know what he did call me he for. He asked you about this ring. What? What you... You wore it for a while, didn't you? Yeah, but I gave it back. This one? Look, mister, there's only one of its kind in the world. Why did he call you about it? Because he thought... Yes? Nothing. He thought you'd know a good imitation from the real thing. You mean that diamond's a fake? We'll find out soon enough, if you're really surprised. Goodbye, for now. Oh, you're going? Sorry? Oh, I'm collapsing. Drop in again sometime. Anytime. Thanks. And let's hope I don't have to return that invitation. Hmm? Hello, Michael. Amy, what are you doing here? I figured she'd drive you home. She was always the lady... Get back in the car. Now see here, Get Amy. back or I'll make a scene that'll turn you both into mummies. Better do what she says, Michael. All right, Kathy. I'll be right behind you, kiddies, in the back seat. Now, Catherine, who told Inspector McKee about me? What? About Fenimore having phoned me this morning. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you know he phoned me, don't you? No. Oh, you couldn't tell the truth if you had a mouthful of it and it was choking. Wait a minute, Amy. She's trying to frame me. And she'll frame you, too. What was Fenimore talking to you about? Ask her. She was tuned into the extension. Were you, Kathy? No. She had to be. How else... She said no, Amy. All right, so she said no. How did Inspector McKee know that I talked to Fenimore and about the diamond, too? The diamond? Yes. Maybe you didn't know that beautiful thing was just a hunk of glass. What? That's a lie. Well, it wasn't when Fenimore asked me about it this morning. He wanted me to return the original. Oh, is that why you killed him? Oh, I knew that was coming out of you. You'd like the police to think that, wouldn't you? Maybe they already do. Well, that wouldn't put you in the clear, Kathy, darling. I returned the original to Fenimore. Can you prove it? Can you prove that I didn't? Wind her up, Michael. She seems to have run down. I think you've said enough, Amy. I'm through. And so is she. For good, I hope. <laughs> Inspector McKee, homicide. Cassidy talking, sir. Go ahead. I think I found him, Inspector. Who? The diamond cutting fella. Good. What does he say about the Kingston diamond? Well, sir, it might be the man and it might not. What? Well, I found him in a small room on the top floor of a small building just around the corner off Main and Lane. There was no name on the door, just the words diamond cutting. But I took a chance That's anyway. It's a good thing I did, Inspector. No. For there was that poor old fella stretched out on the floor, dead. Oh, no. A yeah, little fella he was, too. And beaten around the head unmerciful. What's the address? Uh, oh, oh yeah, but I, I, I got it written down on a piece of paper. Now, where did it... Oh, oh yeah, here it is. <laughs> It's up here, Inspector. All right, Cassidy. I'm doing the best I can. But I, I, I got some information, sir. I checked with some of the neighbors on this Where's floor. Where's the body? Uh, well, I'll take you to it, sir. Well, as I was saying, I checked. And the fellow's name was Rudolf Liebnitz. What else? Well, that's all, sir. He came over from the other side a few years ago. A victim of war and oppression. And to think that his only reward for minding his own How business... How do you know he was minding his own business? Well, his reputation in the trade, the inspector, was good. He was known to all his neighbors as an honest man, a good worker, and a fine, upstanding character. And and, and, and when your competitors have only Is praise this the room, Cassidy? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, there he is. Yeah. 
A little old fella. Why didn't you tell me his files had been opened and dumped? Well, I was going to, well, Chief. Well, it I doesn't did... matter. Somebody wanted a record and they took it. Uh, you uh, think this can be an outcome of the Kingston murder? Maybe, 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 maybe. Let's have a look at the body. Uh, he didn't have a chance. Struck on the back of the head and then beaten until he... Cassidy. Could... Uh, yes? This man's been dead since this morning. Late this morning. Would you be sure about that? Rigor mortis takes at least six hours to set in. It's just beginning. Ah, then it'll be about the time Fenimore Kingston was murdered. A little later, but not much. The killer came right from the Kingston house to this place and... All right, Cassidy, there's no point in searching the room. No, sir? We won't find anything. Oh. Hello. Hello, operator. Uh, give me police headquarters. Have you got a plan, sir? I hope so, Cassidy. I... Hello. Uh, give me Murphy and Homicide. Inspector McKee. I hope so, Cassidy. If it works, it'll be a miracle. It will talk of the miracles. Murph. There was a... I want you to have the following three parties picked up. All right? Catherine Kingston, Michael Dolge, and A.B. Clauberson. You'll find the addresses on my desk. And keep them in my office until I get there. Now, as for you, Cassidy. Yes, sir. You stay here. Phone the medical examiner's office and look after the usual details. I'm going out for a long walk. Yes, sir. Those people will wait, even if they don't like it. And let's hope they don't like it enough to burn. Inspector McKee. Well, company. How are you, Mrs. Kingston? Why did you have me brought here? And Miss Robertson? Did... I'm cheerful enough to break your neck. And taking two from three, you must be Michael Doe. We've been waiting for two hours, Inspector. Yes. Why have you had me arrested? It's a habit of mine, Mrs. Kingston, when a murder's been committed. Oh, then we are under arrest. For the time being, Miss Robertson. Now, if you'll excuse me for a moment, uh, I've been working on another case, and there's some papers on my desk that I... You've no right to keep us here. Please, Kathy. Well, he hasn't, Michael. Not without charges. Then wait and try to be calm. Hmm, very interesting. There's nothing incriminating in what I said, Inspector. Oh, no. I, I wasn't referring to that. It's this memo. Good news. Well, I'm not going to wait here and let you waste my time. Mrs. Gangston, this building is full of policemen. Pity sake, Kathy. Stop being so nervous. If he has anything to say to us, he I does... have. One of you killed Fenimore Kingston this morning. I wasn't home. You were out driving. But who saw you, Mrs. Kingston? What? It takes at least two to make an alibi. But surely you don't think that I... Well, you're out of your mind, Inspector. She married him only three months ago. And then she changed her mind. She thought how nice it would be to marry you. Inspector... It's all right, Kathy. He's just fishing. But that wasn't the reason Kingston was killed. What? Look out for him when he pitches curves. You know the reason, Miss Clubberson. Oh, now I'm it, huh? Kingston found out that his famous diamond had become an imitation. My ring? This morning, he took it out of the wall safe. The thief, the person who had made the substitution, was in the room with him. And Kingston was shot in the back and killed. Don't look at me, Inspector. I wasn't there. How about you, Mrs. Kingston? I told you. Yes, yes. And you, Mr. Dole? I didn't know anything about Fenimore's death until Catherine phoned me. Then you admit that she phoned me. Of course, it's no secret. I was Fenimore's cousin. And you were making sure that Catherine stayed in the family. Now look here, Inspector. Excuse me, please. Yes? All right. In a few minutes. I'll call you. Now, this memo becomes very important. May we go now? Don't rush me, Mrs. Kingston. But if you're going to work on another case... I'm not. An imitation of the Kingston diamond was made. And by a strange coincidence, shortly after Fenimore Kingston was murdered, the workroom of a diamond cutter was robbed. What's that got to do with us? Miss Clarbertson, tell me what you know about Rudolf Leibniz. What I know? Look, I may get around, Would but Would you that... like to see him? All right, if it'll make you happy. I'll ask him to come in. What? He's in a room down the hall, Mr. Doge. I had him brought here from the hospital. From the... The hospital? He wasn't dead. You're lying. Murphy, bring Leibniz in no. here. No. 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 Never mind. Send in a stenographer. We're going to take a confession. Hello. Inspector McKee 
Cassidy, I'm sorry to be bothering you at your home, but when I return to headquarters this evening... What is it, Cassidy? Well, it's about that fellow Michael Dolge. He killed his cousin, Fenimore Kingston. Well, that's what the boys told me, but I... He took the diamond and had the imitation put in. You don't say. Mm-hmm, about three weeks ago. How did he get hold of it? That was very simple. Catherine wore the ring at a house party. Dolge mentioned to Fenimore that the diamond needed cleaning and that he could take care of it for him. Oh! So he took the stone down to Leibniz and had an imitation made. That's right. It was so good that Fenimore didn't notice it right away. But this morning... Ah, yes, this morning. It's all in the confession, Cassidy. Ah. Oh, then Kingston knew right away who had stolen the real diamond, didn't he now? Yes, he did now. Oh, Inspector, get along with you. <laughs> Why did he bother to phone that Amy Clarkson girl? We'll never know, Cassidy. Maybe he was anxious to turn the clock back uh, to better times. And so closes tonight's Crime Club book, Dead Man Control, based on a story by Helen Riley. Stedman Coles did the radio adaptation. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Ted Osborne played Inspector McKee. Alice Frost was Catherine Kingston. Elspeth Eric was Amy. Sherling Oliver was Michael Dolge. And Barry Thompson played Cassidy. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. We have a very unusual story of a will that had the power to kill. It's called Silent Witnesses by John Stephen Strange. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there is a new crime club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. Oh, yes. The United States Merchant Marine is offering this opportunity to young men between the ages of 16 and a half and 21. If you are an American citizen and a high school graduate, you are qualified to take the test for enrollment in the Merchant Marine Cadet Corps. Graduates of the Corps are qualified for a license as deck or engineer officer in the Merchant Marine or to a commission as ensign in the Naval Reserve or in the Maritime Service. Discharged veterans of the armed services and the Merchant Marine are eligible for the test up to their 24th birthday. They are also allowed five additional points on the test. The test is competitive and will next be held on April 4th. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the Crime Club. I'm the librarian. Silent Witnesses. Yes, we have that crime club book for you. Come right over. Ah, you are here. Good. Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The book is on this shelf. Here it is, Silent Witnesses, by John Stephen Strange. The very unusual story of a letter that was registered by death. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It was early evening, and the blizzard that had been going all day gave no sign of blowing itself out. Mary Masterman didn't care. She was home in her upstairs apartment in the quaint two-story building in Greenwich Village. And she was comfortable. Too comfortable, as a matter of fact. Because in the midst of the mystery novel she was reading, 
The book dissolved on her lap. She dissolved on the sofa. And before long, she was sound asleep. <laughs> Murder. Murder. has happened. What? I don't know how to explain, but I think there's been a murder. You think? Yes. Please hurry. Where's the corpse, Mary? Corpse, dear? Well, you said something about a murder, didn't you? Yes. Well, where is it? Barney, are you going to be mad at me? Now, look. Precious... I'm not going to be. You're so sweet. I am hopping mad. Look, what's the idea of making me drive for an hour in that blizzard all the way from the Bronx? To Barney, I was frightened. By whom? The mysterious traveler? I thought I heard two shots. Huh? What's that? Two pistol shots. They seem to come from just below. Frank Vaughn's apartment? Mm Mm-hmm. But I didn't really hear them. What? I was dreaming. I was reading a mystery book and I fell asleep. And then... Bing, bang. But it was all a dream. (laughs) It must have been. Aren't you sure? Oh, yes. After I phoned you, I decided not to be a scary Mary, so I went down to Frank Vaughan's apartment. And there he was. Oh, how'd you do? And how are you? Oh, don't be silly. I didn't go in. Of course not. Why visit a live lawyer? I didn't even see him. Huh? I listened at his door, and I was satisfied. He wasn't moving around the apartment. How do you know? What? How do you know it was Frank Vaughan who was moving around? Oh, now look, Barney. Maybe it was a murderer. Oh, Mary, you're lucky. What do you mean? Suppose he opened the door and seen you. What then? Are you trying to frighten me all over again? (laughs) You scared me, didn't you? I thought you stepped down an author or something. (laughs) You idiot. (laughs) No, you idiot. Do you still love me? Mm. Well, as long as I'm here. (laughs) Oh, baby. Darling. Mm -hmm. (laughs) No sugar shortage here. All right. We've flirted long enough. Now. What? Fix me a drink. Then we'll go downstairs and tell Frank Vaughn about your dream. (laughs) It ought to kill him for sure. He must have gone out, Barney. Yeah. He's even crazier than I am. What are you doing? See? Barney. Am I surprised? Does he always keep his door unlocked? Well, how would I know? I didn't say you should, Mary. Then why did you ask? Just because Frank and I are the only tenants in this house doesn't mean... Look out for that table. I see it. Hmm. Imagine Frank keeping that window open as though it was summer. I better close it. No, no, let's go back upstairs. Wait a minute. We've got no right to be here. Frank isn't home, and besides, I'm cold. Mary, you said you heard two shots. Oh, not that again. I told you I was dreaming. You weren't. What? That's right, honey. Look at that wall. A hole. The kind a bullet makes. Where's my penknife? What are you going to do? Dig, baby. But you can't. Who says so? Now listen, Vaughn. Oh. What's the matter? Over here by the fireplace. Blood? A broken cocktail glass. Uh Uh-huh. Well, here it is, Princess. A bullet? From a twenty-five. Well, then I wasn't dreaming. Oh, Barney, what happened here tonight? I don't know, but I want you to do a little thinking. All right. Were there two shots or only one? I... I can't be sure. You've got to be. Well, it seemed like two, but... Yeah? But I was fast asleep, Barney, and if there were two, where's the other bullet? And where's... Oh! Oh, 
leading edge, Mary. It's only the telephone. Yes? Mr. Vaughn? Uh-huh. This is Mr. Masson, Thomas Masson. Yes? I expected to hear from you today about that offer I made. Oh, uh, did you? Now, see here, Mr. Vaughn, I think I've been very generous. You know my stepsister Hilda hasn't got a case against me. She can't possibly break Aunt Helen's last will and testament. It's qualified. Then why bother to make offers? As I told you the other day, I don't want the unpleasantness of a trial in court. And I'm not going to give Hilda the satisfaction of a cash settlement out of court. I'd rather do business with you, privately. Yes. Now, think it over. And you don't earn $100,000 every day. Goodbye. Ouch. Did you hear that, Mary? I don't believe it, Barney. You mean the 100000 I don't believe Frank Vaughn would sell out a client. He hasn't done it yet, Precious. He wouldn't even think of it. Such neighborly faith. Oh, Barney. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's go. By all means. We're going uptown to Ted Lasseter's nightclub. Well, what's there? Hilda. And when she opens her mouth, some call what comes out singing. I call it... Um, after you, sweetheart. <laughs> See Hilda around? No, but I see Ted Lasseter. Hmm? Where? That corner table. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, watch. <laughs> Doesn't look very gay, does he? Maybe you know what's wrong with him. Mm-hmm. What? Keep your eyebrows on. I'll show you. Ooh, tingling with excitement. Shh. I want to surprise him. You want to roll for the club, Ted? Huh? Who said that? How you tell? Well, what's the idea, Ronnie? Just trying me out, that's all. Well, don't do that again. You newspaper guys. Anything for a laugh, huh? Anything. <laughs> what's he got on you, Ted? Nothing. Who's been telling you things, Barney? Rumor has it, chum. And when rumor has it in this town, it's practically Winslow. Yeah. You're a nice kid, Barney. Thanks. So don't believe everything you hear. I'll make a note of that. And don't talk about what you don't believe. Sure. Would one of you mind telling me? Well, you heard what he just said, Mary. It's a lie. What's a lie? The blizzard we left outside. <laughs> Where's Hilda, Ted? She's in my office. Uh, mind if I go in there? Yeah, she's uh, on the phone. Oh, that's all right. I won't listen. Uh, that's what I said, Barney. She's talking to her lawyer. Frank Vaughn? What kind of drinks you want, kids? On the house. But, Barney, if she's talking to Frank... Uh, yeah. A scotch and soda, Ted. I'll get a waiter. Uh, how about you, Mary? Oh, I feel wonderful. How are you? <laughs> well, I... I, uh, Barney, uh, is she okay? Mm. Perfect. Then, uh... What is she you don't to understand, you? Ted. We had a terrible scare about Frank. You see, I was home alone, and around 7 o'clock I thought I heard two shots in Frank's apartment. You, uh, what? But it wasn't two shots. It was only one shot. Because after Barney came over, we went downstairs and investigated. Where was Frank? What? Oh, oh, Hilda. Was he there? No, but what's the difference? He's home now. Is he? You just spoke to him, didn't you? No, Mary. Those two shots Mary heard. Only one. He had that letter Aunt Helen sent me just before she died. He took it home with him tonight. He was going to have a handwriting expert check it. Maybe he didn't take it after all. I told you I saw him put it into his briefcase. I was with him in his office up to half past five, and I left the building with him. Okay, so the handwriting expert checked it, and Frank went out someplace. Now, what's there to worry about? He didn't phone me, and he said he would. Tom would do anything to get that letter. He'd, he'd kidnap or, or murder. What was in it, Hilda? Three million dollars worth of evidence, Barney. My whole case against Tom. How about some particulars? Sure, why not? About a week before Aunt Helen died, that slimy stepbrother of mine got her to sign a paper. A will? Yes. She was having one of her bad days, and she didn't know what she was doing. But a couple of days later, she remembered something. The butler and the cook had been present when Tom gave her that paper to sign. Witnesses? That's right. And she couldn't understand why. Tom wouldn't tell her, and the servants didn't know. But she was worried. So she wrote that letter telling what happened and got the doctor to mail it to me. Well, why didn't she give it to you? I was in Europe. I didn't even know she was dying. By the time I got back to New York, she was... Come on, take it easy, baby. The will was filed, and all I got was one dollar. One dollar! And Tom walked off with the millions. And now he's going to keep them. He's got that letter. You don't know, Hilda. He's got it, Ted. Not... So long, kiddies. Where are you going? Yes. Your stepbrother? Of course. It's the logical move. I'm going with you. Thanks, Ted, but I can frighten him all by myself. But just a minute, Hilda. What is it, Barney? Your aunt owned a mansion on West 84th Street, didn't she? Yes. She died there. Anybody using it now? Nobody. It's boarded up. Why? No reason. I was just thinking about the housing shortage. Let's go, Mary. And give my best to your stepbrother, Hilda. And don't shoot without counting the steps to the death house. You're absolutely crazy, Barney. Oh, Mary, you say the nicest things. You'd have to. 
to be to believe that Frank's hiding out in that house. I didn't say I believe it, did I? Then why are we going there? To do a routine check. Look, Precious, there's something rotten in this state of Masson versus Masson, and it might be Frank Vaughn. You're crazy. Well, okay by me, but where's Frank? I don't know. He might be dead. He might be. Who killed him? Tom Masson. Just like that, huh? Well, he had to get that letter, Barney, or lose three million dollars. There was only one shot, Precious, and we found the bullet in the wall. Mm, I'm not so sure about that now. Huh? The more I think of it, the more I... Of course, I was asleep. But, darling, even so, would I hear two shots if there'd only been one? Well, I... And that broken cocktail glass and the missing bullet, what do they mean? Those silent witnesses that something dreadful might have happened. Oh, Barney, I, I, I don't feel good about it. That's why we got to keep looking for Frank Vaughn. Oh, right, but why in that house? Because it's boarded up and out of circulation. If Tom Masson killed Frank, it'd be an ideal place to park the body. But if he didn't... Yes, he'd want people to think that Frank had disappeared. But if he didn't, Mary... Step on the gas, Barney, we've got to hurry. I hope you're not disappointed. <laughs> what was that? Hallelujah. And on a night like this... Reach into that glove compartment, Mary, and hand me my flashlight, please. A blowout? In more ways than one. Oh. Well. By the way, Barney. Yes, my adorable one. Why didn't you tell Hilda about that phone call Tom made? Is that all you got to offer, Precious? I just happened to think of it. Well, if it'll keep you comfortable, darling, it was because she already had murder in her heart, and I didn't want to put it in her hands. <laughs> Something we didn't think of, Barney. How do we get into a house that's boarded up? That's easy. Show me a keyhole and I'll show you a way to get in. And there it is, the front door. No boards. Mm, I still don't see how you're going to do it. Live and learn, honey. And there's so much to do about Watch now. I take this pass key, pass it into the keyhole, give a turn like this, and presto. Oh, full of tricks, aren't you? You can get into a lot of trouble doing such things. Not such things, honey. Come on. Let's get out of the store. Oh, hand me my flashlight. <laughs> Thanks. Hmm. Nice and warm in here. Yeah. Almost as though we were being lived in. That does smell like coal heat, doesn't it? Uh-huh. Let's look around. Uh, that room over there first. That should be the living room. I'm beginning not to like this very much, Barney. Oh, you'll get over it. Just as soon as we... Yeah, it is a living room. Mm -hmm. So this is how the 10% live. When they're living. <laughs> okay. Let's try the rest of the house. Barney! Barney! Hey! He's been locked in! Cut us off. We know you're here, Frank Vaughn. You'll never get away with this, you know. Don't wear yourself out, Barney. Yeah, but we're trapped to... Well, don't you care? You still have the pass key. Huh? Oh, sure. <laughs> I was just about to think of it myself. That precious little pass key. Well, Barney, open it. I can't. But don't be silly. You opened the outside door. Yes, honey, but it's not working on this one. Well, now what do we do? The window's boarded up and that door... Couldn't you break it down? That hunk of timber? Oh, I'm good, precious, but not that good. Yeah, Frank Vaughn's a nice guy. He wouldn't sell out a client. Huh, not much. That could have been Tom Masson out there, Barney. Sure, sure, he was just waiting for us to get here. Barney. What is this between you and Frank Vaughn? Barney, don't you smell something? You bet I do. I smell a rat, and I... Nothing like coal gas? Yeah. Well, where's it coming from? I'll let you know in a minute. That hot air vent... Somebody's trying to kill us. You're not kidding. And whoever's fooling around with that furnace isn't kidding either. Good night, Joseph. Good night, Mr. Madison, sir. Well, well turn a corner and look what you meet. Hello. Hello, Tom. What are you doing here? Cute, aren't you? Let's go to your apartment. I have nothing to say to you. Really? 
Now, look here, Hilda. After you, Tom. All right. But if you think you're going to bully me the way you... Step along, little man, or this gun will have something to say to you. I'm still after you. Very well. Hmm. You're so rich now, you can afford to go out and leave the lights on. It's not your money, Hilda. Where's the letter? Letter? The one Aunt Helen wrote me. I sent you a photostatic copy. So don't pretend to look as innocent as you look. Oh. You want that copy now? I want the original. No. Frank Vaughn had it and you took it. <laughs> this is too good to be true. So you've lost your case. The letter, Tom. I haven't got it. Don't lie to me. Somehow you found out that Frank was going to take it home and have it checked. Did I? You murdered him and stole that letter. Really, you're slightly out of your mind. I'm going to kill you, Tom. Now look here, Hilda. Frank Vaughn was your lawyer. I had nothing to do with him except through my lawyer. I never even spoke to the man. I want that letter, Tom. You don't believe me. Well, how can I convince you? Don't even try. You'd be a fool to shoot me, Hilda. Everyone knows how much you hate me. Nobody knows how much I really hate you. Even if you manage to get out of this building. You'll be arrested sooner or later. Neither of us will have the money. L Hilda, listen to me. What for? I'll make a deal with you. Give you $100,000. Of my money? Aunt Helen left it to me. It's in her will. Who do you think you're kidding? I don't care about that letter. You can't prove that Aunt Helen wrote it. No? Is that why you killed Frank Vaughn? I didn't. Didn't even know he was dead. Oh, a snake can take lessons from you. I'll give you a quarter of a million. All I want's the letter. But I told you... And I told you I don't believe it. Well? All right. Where is it? I'll get it for you. Uh, let's have a drink first. What for? To celebrate your victory. Won't take a minute. What would you like? Nothing. From you. Oh, come now, Hilda. How about some brandy and something? Now, you give me that gun. I'll give it to you. It was very oh, foolish, Hilda. What will the neighbors think? Oh, my, my wrist. That's better. Now, Hilda, you want to know about a letter? Oh, I haven't got it. And I'm awfully sorry I had to ruin that beautifully made-up face of yours. <laughs> Just another minute, Mary. I have to the boards off the window. Well, hurry, Barney. Get coal gas. Uh, there's some air coming in the window. It's a good thing you thought of that. Fireplace great. I've got a weapon. Uh, we're through. Oh. Come on, now, let's get out of here. Oh, you don't have to ask me quite. Oh, did you ever see such a lovely blizzard? Hop to it, kid. we got a lot of work to do. Oh, no. No, don't tell me we're going back into that house the first way. Not this team. There won't be anybody here to go back for. What do you mean? Whoever tried to kill us is far, far away by now. You didn't say it was Frank Vaughn, Barney. No? I must be slipping. You wouldn't be changing your mind about him, would you? Oh, look, honey, right now I'm too tired to change anything. What's the matter? Let's get back to Frank's apartment and see if he's taken anything... For a change. His toothbrush is here. Yeah, and the shaving things. Mary, th there's something funny to you here. Is there? Yeah, the brush is still damp. So? And the razor. There's soap on it. Hand me that towel, will you please? All right, but what's the rumpus about? It's dry. It's a fresh towel, too. Barney, would you mind telling me? I was me? just wondering, Mary. Frank was a pretty neat guy. Was? He wouldn't leave dirty stuff lying around. None of it wasn't his habit. Barney, if you're saying that Frank was murdered... I'm only thinking, precious. Let's go into the living room. Frank was expecting somebody tonight. Or why bother shaving? Well, Hilda told us, the handwriting expert. Uh-huh. But would I shave for a handwriting expert? No. I would shave if I were expecting a beautiful woman. Hilda? Why not? How do we know that she was really trying to get Frank Vaughn on the phone? We don't. Might have been an act to impress Ted Lassiter. Just in case she might need an alibi. I don't get it. Why should she kill her own lawyer? I didn't say she did, Mary, but suppose she found out that there was going to be a deal. That she was going to lose that letter. I don't believe it. I don't believe Frank... Yeah, I was... yeah, I know. He wouldn't sell out a client. But there's a possibility that he was going to. 
And Hilda came here and killed him out of sheer venom and took back her letter. And then what did she do with his body? Make a hocus-pocus until it evaporated? Yeah, uh, well, that's what I don't understand. Is Frank Vaughn alive and somewhere, or is he dead and... Mary. I'm listening. A little while ago, you said something about silent witnesses. Yes. The broken cocktail glass and the bullet in the wall and the missing second bullet. How about that open window? Well, what about it? This is a ground floor apartment and that window faces the backyard. It's possible, Mary. It's just possible. What are you doing? Climbing out. <laughs> Turn on all the lamps, will you, honey? I want plenty of light. But Barney! Mary, the lamp. All right, but I know you're crazy. I just know it. I'll never believe what you're thinking. We couldn't have been running all over town while he was... Barney? Barney! Stay away from the window, Mary. <gasps> yeah. Buried in the snow. In his own backyard. <laughs> Barney, of all the places to leave it. Maybe that... In snow. Well, maybe that's all the killer needed. But in a couple of weeks... Somebody had to make it look as though Frank had disappeared. Somebody who had a lot to do with a little time. Hello? Oh, hello, Mr. Thomas Manson. Yes? This is Frank Vaughn. What? I decided to make that deal with you. Uh, come down to my apartment and bring that... But, uh, Mr. Vaughn, I... You still don't want understand. that letter, don't you? Well, certainly, but I... All right, then. Bring the money. A hundred thousand dollars... That was the price, wasn't it? Well, uh, Have you changed your mind? I don't know what to say. Uh, but if you wish to talk to me, I'll, I'll pay you a visit. I'll, I'll be there in an hour. Thank you. Goodbye. That's that. You're a pretty cagey guy. He knows something. Is he coming? So he said. We'll see. If he doesn't show up, then we'll know he knows we know. Or somebody knows. Now for suspect number two... And such a cute little suspect. Hello. Ted Lasseter talking. Good evening, Mr. Lasseter. May I speak with Hilda Mason, please? Okay. Who's calling? Her attorney, Frank Vaughn. Who? Frank Vaughn. I promised to call Miss Mason about a certain report, but I was detained. Uh, will you put her on, please? Well, certainly, but she's doing a song number now. You want me to give her a message? If you don't mind. Uh, tell her to come to my apartment. It's very important. I'll do that. Thank you. Goodbye. Hmm, how lovely. Now all we've got to do is wait and worry. You stay here in the kitchen, Mary. But why, Barney? You said the killer wouldn't come. I've been fooled before, and I don't want to... Will you do as I say, please? I can't keep our visitor waiting. All right, but you're cheating. You're right with you. Sorry to have kept you... Hello, Barney. Ted. You thought you fooled me, didn't you? You ought to take lessons in voice disguise. Ted Lasseter. Uh, back away from that door, pal. Sure, but you don't have to point that gun right at me. I can have just as much respect for it if it were looking somewhere else. Yeah? Uh, where's the girl? Mary? She's upstairs in her apartment. You don't say. She was very tired, and tomorrow is just another working day, you know. You don't mind if I look around, do you? How can I mind? Uh, but she wouldn't be in that kitchen. She, she got a kitchen of her own upstairs, and, and it's very, very cute. Yeah. Well, I'd have to go up there and see it sometime. Okay, I'll search the rest of the apartment when I get through with you. Well, uh, sit down, Barney. Do I have to? Well, <laughs> I want you to be comfortable. You're a pal. You tip me off to things before the cops find out. How do you know the cops didn't find out? Where are they, Barney? Oh, well, uh, I... <laughs> They'd be all over the place if they knew, and they aren't. They're not even hiding. All right, Ted. You're going to kill me. You were a nice guy, Bob. Uh, wait. Every dying man is allowed one last request. Will you tell me... Why did I kill Frank Vaughn? No, I just figured that out for myself. Yeah? Well, that's good. You dropped $50,000 in a dice game. The boys gave you 30 days to pay up, but they wanted collateral. You've got a nose for news, Barney. It's too bad it's going to be cold. So you put up your nightclub. And then tonight, Hilda told you that Frank had taken that letter home to have it checked. You're not wrong. And that letter was worth a lot of blackmail money. So I took it. Is that all, pal? Uh, one last request. Did you collect on it? Not yet. Who are you going to talk to about it? Hilda or Tom Masson? Tom. He's got the dough. Why bother with outsiders? Then Hilda and Tom didn't know that you got it. No. But Tom's going to find out tomorrow. Oh. Well. 
Uh, by the way, Ted, how did you get that key to that house on 84th Street? I borrowed it from Hilda's dressing room. Well, any more questions? Yeah. Just one more. Uh, nice work, Mary. I knocked him cold. You catch me, Barney. I'm going to faint. Oh, well, you can't do that, honey. I-, I never hit a man with a bottle full of soda before. Well, you could have picked a better time, precious. Oh, you wonderful microbe. Where were you when Ted looked in the kitchen? I was under the table. What? <laughs> and Barney, that's where I want to be from now on. <laughs> And so closes tonight's Crime Club book, Silent Witnesses, based on a story by John Stephen Strange. Stedman Coles did the radio adaptation. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Chet Stratton played Barney Gant. Sharita Bauer was Mary Masterman. Arthur Vinton was Ted Lassiter. Julie Stevens was Hilda Masson. And Ted Osborne played Tom Masson. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have a very exciting story of a ghost that haunted like murder. It's called The Sun is a Witness by Aaron Mark Stein. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there is a new Crime Club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. Oh, yes. Do you know any young American who doesn't like to play ball and take hikes in the woods with a gang? Sure, they all like it. But what about the youngster in his wheelchair? He'd like it most of all. But it's not for him. He needs special teachers, medical care, and a camp planned for disabled kids. If he's to have his chance to grow into a useful citizen. You can give him this chance through Easter seals sent to you by your neighbors during the month before Easter. It's new life and hope for disabled children. Don't forget them. Don't neglect them. Buy and use Easter Seals. This program came from New York. I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. The sun is a witness. Yes, we have that crime club story for you. Come right over. by the window. Comfortable? The book is on this shelf. Here it is. The Sun is a Witness by Aaron Mark Stein. A very unusual story of a design for killing that couldn't succeed without murder. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It was Tim Mulligan's job as an archaeologist to find out about dead civilizations. And he was finding out about the Anatsazi, the Indian cliff dwellers who inhabited the great canyon walls of the southwest many centuries ago. It was late morning, June 22nd, the second day of summer. And Tim Mulligan was digging carefully in one of the caves high above the canyon floor when George Dillon, the owner of the property and Tim's benefactor, climbed slowly up from the camp cave 30 feet below. He stopped to catch his breath. George! What are you 
you doing out there? I, I wanted to see how you're getting along, Jim. You shouldn't have done it. You're hurt. Where's Tony Blake? Well, he's around somewhere. You're not going to snitch on me, are you, boy? You're his responsibility, Pop. He's your doctor. Yes, but he didn't join the outfit so he can take care of me. What do you mean? He wants me to take care of him. Oh, that. Yeah. And maybe I will, after he and my niece Marion get married. But right now, it's Indian history that's got all my attention. Oh, yeah. Well, I uh, dug up a grave, George. And it's Ozzy? I think so. I haven't unwrapped the mummy yet. Good. We can do that together. Come on, let's go. Mm. What's that? The wind. No, Tim. No wind ever made a sound like that. Sounds human. It is human. And it's coming from... Now, George, George, take it easy. It's a cave. There's no one in there. The open grave. The Anatazi mummy. Tim. This has got to be a trick. Tim. George. My, my heart. Where's the digitalis? In the, it's all right. I, I just lost my breath. Hmm? I'll be all right. Are you sure? Yes. Help me down to the camp cave. You bet. You bet. Uh, let me call for Tony first. I feel a lot better with him around. Tony! Tony Blake! I guess he's out of range. Let's go. How is he, Tony? He, uh, he just fell asleep. Hmm? Uh, let's get away from this cave opening. I don't want him disturbed. Okay. Now, uh, what about that ghost, Tim? Somebody's trying to kill your patient, Doctor. Hmm? Do you think he can be scared to death? Well, with his heart, anything can happen. That's what I mean. Where's Marion? Are you kidding? Not this trip. You, Marion, and I are the only ones here with George. The others... Well, that's where she went, to the others at the ranch house. When? This morning, while you were digging for your ghost. She was worried about her brother. Oh. Oh, of course. It's been four days since Fraser went back to the house with Matt Casey to get provisions. I didn't realize... Uh, now, look, Tim, i got to talk to you about something. Yeah? Give up this, pro- this crazy project. Yeah, but uh, it, It's not doing George any good. His heart can't take it. I'm not his doctor, Tony. And I am. So, what, he won't listen to me. As long as you're on the job, he wants to be with you. Don't you understand? Yes, I think I do. He's a fibrillator heart in a very bad shape, and the slightest stimulation... You're not worried about that, Tony, are you? What? You've got an axe of your own to grind, and it's beginning to look like a battle axe. Don't get dirty, Mulligan. I'll try not to. You can't cut me out, so you're trying to move me out. Anything to get George's mind off Indians and out of your sanitarium project. It's a darn sight more useful than digging for dried up bones. That depends on how much of a scientist you are. I told you not to get dirty, Mulligan. Stop waving those fists. You'll have to hit yourself in the face. Tim! Tony! George! Come in here, both of you. Uh, I, I thought you were sleeping. I heard every word you two said out there. When do you think I'm going to die, Tony? You continue to stay here, John. I'm going to stay here until Timothy finishes what he's doing. And there's no telling. There's nothing I can do about it. Are you quitting? No, I'll be around if you need me. You shouldn't have been so rough with him, Pop. Tim. Yeah, what, George? Tim, do you really think somebody's trying to scare me to death? It's possible. Hmm. That fellow? I... I don't know. I'd rather not believe your own doctor's out to kill you. He's the only one here with us, Tim. And if that sound we heard was not a ghost, but a rattlesnake. Where? In here someplace. Now, stay where you are, George, and don't get excited. I'll, uh, I'll look for it. Wait! Try not to get excited, George, and don't get off that cot. You'll never find it, Tim. If it's in this cave, I will. It isn't. What? It's in this wall next to me. Solid rock. And we can hear the rattle. Oh, wait a minute, George. I don't want to believe in ghosts, but nobody can make that sound come out of solid rock. Now, wait, wait. All right, Pop, it's gone. We can relax. <laughs> yeah, Tony's right. This is a bad place for you. I, 
I'm not afraid, Timothy. But I am. I'd uh, like to get you back to the ranch house where you might get an even break. I'm not running away. Good for you. I'm taking you away. Now, sit tight. I'll get Tony and we'll load this up into the car. Tim, does that mean you're giving up your work here? No, indeed, Pop. It means I'm going into another business. Ghost hunting. <laughs> Well, George, as soon as we get to the ranch house, you start taking things easy. I'll do nothing of the kind, Tony. Say, Tim. Yeah? How soon do you expect to go back to the camp? Right after we get you, sir. Good. I'll get Matt Casey to go back with you. He knows every inch of that canyon. And if someone's out there playing ghost, or was... Don't be surprised if it was one of the Indians from the reservation. Is that your theory, Tony? Well, they're very superstitious about their dead being dug up, Tim. Especially if they're going to be used as museum pieces. That's enough of that. Slow down. There's the ranch house. Oh, say, there's, uh, there's Fraser walking away from his car. Honk the horn, Tony. Ah, well, look who's here. He must have come out just behind me. Is the expedition over? Temporarily. Uh, give us a hand with the luggage, Fraser. Are you Uncle George anything? Where's the rest of the party? Well, who do you mean? Matt Casey and Marion, of course. Are you trying to kid me? Well, aren't they here? No. <laughs> Some joke, huh? Frazier, Marion left this camp this morning. She was coming to see how you and Matt were getting along. Matt and I? But Matt went back to camp two days ago. He took a truckload of provisions. Are you sure? Now, look, Tim, I was here when he left. You smell as though you might be foggy about things. I've had a few drinks, but I know what I'm talking about. I pick up the stuff in town, and Matt took it from here. Why didn't you come back with him, Frazier? I took a liking to civilization, Uncle George. So after Matt bounced off, I bounced back to town where the civilization is beautiful and lively. I got back a few minutes ago. You were there for two whole days? I couldn't help it. The attraction was magnetic. Can it be proved, Frazier? Don't be a comedian, Tim. What's mine is mine. What about Marion? I don't know, Tony. Sis might have been here... Say, maybe she hit for town. For some lively civilization? What does that mean, Mulligan? Nothing personal, Dr. Blake. Why don't you take care of your patient while I go back to the camp to find out if the spirit is still functioning? Hello? Hello? Anybody here? Anybody here? Oh, Tim. Hello, Mary. Where is everybody? Why didn't you answer me? Uh, one, one question at a time, please. I've been running around in circles all day. First the ranch house, nobody there. Then back to this. I, I'm a little winded. Just give me time. Where is everybody? Everybody but Matt Casey is at the ranch house. Why? They gave up the ghost. Huh? What are you doing up here on top of the canyon wall? Oh, this is going to be a national park someday. Uh-huh. Monument to Indian culture. Don't you feel proud of what Uncle George is going to do? I didn't see your car below, Marion. Always stick to the subject. You can't lose that way. My car isn't parked in the canyon. I came up the back way for a change. Mm-hmm. Bet you had a very good reason, too. Perfect. I got tired of the canyon road. Of course. Mad Casey must have had the same feeling about it. What? Well, look down there where my car is parked. His truck's there, too. So? Yes, and it's loaded to the hilt with provisions. I call that being very ruthless. Yeah. All that good food left down there to spoil, and I'm starving. Well, at least you've got a doctor who can feed you vitamins. Funny man. Unless you're a ghost and you don't need vitamins. What does that mean? Haunt me and find out. Are you crazy? Try it. Say... A high, a high. Come on, come on, say it in a very deep voice. You are crazy. As deep as you can make it. A high, a high. Yeah, I've always wondered about you archaeologists. Uh, excuse me, I have a date with a... Now, wait a minute. Now, listen, you... Look. What? Lying under that rock. Well, I don't... You must be seeing things. Yes, everything. And it's only the tail of a rattlesnake. Why, how wonderful. Another item for your collection? Do you mind if I picked it up? I wouldn't mind if you wore it on your nose. Thanks. I didn't know you cared. See? It still rattles. Yeah, I know something else that rattles. What? What was that? The ghost. I shook this rattle close to the rock. Yes, all I've got to do is get this rock out of the way like this. Now... Ahoy! What's happening there? Ahoy! Perfect 
chimney right through the canyon wall. Would you like to make a voice test, Marion? Uh, me? No, thank you. I don't like to hear myself talk. Not even in the interest of science? Goodbye, Tim. I'm going home. Oh, wait, wait. I'm going with you. There's so much I'd like to tell your uncle about a hole in the ground. <laughs> Uncle George, say, you had quite an experience up at the camp. Tony was just telling me about the ghost. Yes, and it's occurred to me with Matt Casey missing... Oh, he wouldn't try to kill me, Dr. Blake. I didn't say that he would, George. He's been working for me for 27 years. We're old friends. Frazier, I want you to organize a searching party for Matt. All right, but if you ask me, he's going on a bender. I don't think so. He's done it before. Why, there were times when he'd bust out for a whole week. He never did it when he had a special job to do. He knew we were waiting for those provisions at the camp. Yes, that's right, Fraser. Yes. And he knew that I was waiting for something else that was much more important to me. Something else? Yes. Well, you might as well know about it now, Fraser. You too, Tony. I sent Matt Casey back here to type up a new will. Oh? Yep, I've decided to give all this property to the government for a national park. Well, that's nothing new, if that's all you've decided. That's all, Fraser. The rest of my property and all my cash go to you and Marion. Uncle George. Yeah? <sighs> Nothing. You're just a swell guy. I'd better go out and organize that searching party. Yeah. And this for you, Tony. No sanitarium, huh? Yeah, that's up to Marion. If she wants to set one up for you after I'm dead, she can do it. With my blessing. <laughs> Still puzzles me. Oh, please, Tim. I'm tired of you being puzzled. Why did Matt Casey use this road instead of the canyon road? Why is an archaeologist? Would he have any reason for wanting to be heard but not seen? Oh, dear. Would you have any reason? Excuse me. It's the company I keep. <laughs> All right, Marion, you don't have to talk to me. I don't wear a badge. You don't know how pretty that makes you look. Yeah, I think I do. By the way, why don't you and Tony get married? There was no hurry. He's broke, isn't he? Da, da, dee, and a big da, sanitarium da, da, with his name da, all over it could um, solve an ugly problem. Uncle George is Tony's patient. By design. What do you mean by that? You brought Tony out here. Well, suppose I did. That doesn't mean... Now, look here, Mr. Mulligan. I don't like your insinuations. So there's one thing about the great Southwest that always fascinates me. Don't change the subject. Buzzards. What? Over there on that pile of rocks. Well, you're not stopping, are you? Of course. Where there are buzzards, there's death. And where there's death, uh, I'm an archaeologist, remember? Don't be ridiculous. I want to get back to the ranch house. You will. I'll just take the ignition key out to make sure you don't do it without me. Would you like to join this expedition? No. Oh, that's too bad. You don't know how cultural those things can... Marion. What is it? A pioneer? There's a body under those rocks. A human body. What? Timothy Mulligan, if you're kidding just me... Just a hand showing. Part of an arm. Good heavens. Looks like a man's. He must have been caught in a rock fall. Well, let's dig him out. He, he might still be alive. No, no, not with rigor mortis, Marion. Oh. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. His fingers. All right, Marion, we better start digging. It's going to take a little time. This one last rock. Now, come on, heave. Heave. Don't relax. Keep going. Come on. What? 
What was that? Uh, we'll look later. Let's get this rock off first. <laughs> oh, sit down, Tim. Yeah. Maybe it's better go back to the car. Right. What'd you pick up? Uh, this, uh, this roll of film must have been spread out under part of that rock. Well, Maybe when the pile hit him, it bounced out of his pocket. Oh, you. And when we moved that rock, it... Snap back on the roll. You would think that important, wouldn't you? What's a dead body to you? I'm sorry, Marion, but there's nothing we can do for Matt Casey except turn him over, face up. Yeah. There are things I don't understand about this. Matt being here, and his truck two miles up the road, and an old hand like Matt being caught in a rock fall. Oh, what was he doing in this cave? Oh, uh, Marion, Marion, oh, don't, don't look. Marion, for Pete's sake, get a grip on yourself. Here, let me take you back to the car. Lord, you leave me alone. Now, please, listen to me. I've known him practically all my life. He was my uncle's oldest friend. Then listen to me in trying to understand what I'm saying. How are we going to tell Uncle George about this? How can Marion, I... Marion. It was no accident. Well, Matt was not killed by a rockfall. Oh, what? What'd you say? He was murdered. Tim, I've had enough of you and listen. Your... Matt was clubbed to death and brought here. I don't want to hear anymore. Then look. He was lying in the sand, face down. His face was covered with blood. Oh. Dried blood. But the sand is clean. Tim. You see what I mean? Please. Take me back to the ranch house. I'm afraid I'm going to be very sick. Is that you, Frazier? No, George. It's Marion and Tim. Marion. Marion, darling, where have you been? Not now, Tony. We've got to talk to Uncle George. What's the matter? I thought it might be Frazier. You went out to organize a searching party for Matt Casey. Oh... Well... What is it, Marion? Tim, maybe you better do the talking. I don't feel up to it. What's wrong? Where's Matt? I'll tell you, George, but I want you to sit down. Take it easy. I'll do nothing of the kind. Where's Matt? I say nothing until you sit down. He... He's dead, isn't he? Huh? Oh, my Lord. Matt. Tony, it's all right, Tim. I'll know what to do. Where'd you find him? Under a rock fall on the county road. Matt? Under a rock fall? Did you bring him back with you? No. We left him there. We had to notify the sheriff. Sheriff? He was murdered, Uncle George. All the evidence is there. We didn't want to disturb a thing. Murdered? Matt, what the... Don't you get the... Where is it? In a bottle in the dresser in George's room. Quick. Marion, get me a glass of water and a spoon. George. Ah, George, it's going to be all right. It'll be all right. Can you hear, George? Tim, Marion. Here, yeah, Tony. Anything I can do? Yes, get Marion to hurry with that water. Marion! Oh, the cupboard door was stuck. I couldn't get it. Here, give me that spoon. This is the worst attack I've ever seen have. Now, if I could get him to swallow this stuff. Oh, he's spitting it out. Oh, squeeze. You've got to get it down. Marion, hold his head back. No, I can't. Hold it back, I tell you. Now, Tim, I want you to force his jaws apart and keep his mouth open. I've got to get this stuff down. There's no time to lose. All right. That's done. Now, I'll make sure. Yeah, the water will push it, push it down. There. Ah. Uh, now, let him relax. Here, Tim, take this bottle. Hmm. I'm going to check his pulse. What's oh, wrong? But the digitalis isn't working. Uh, Tim, Tim. Never acted like that after taking the medicine. George! Uncle George, please! It's all over, Marion. He's dead. <laughs> I didn't think, Tony. I, I just thought without thinking. Marion, there's no use blaming yourself anymore. It was bound to happen sooner or later. I didn't have to throw it at him. I, I didn't have to yell murder. I... Uncle George is dead. What? He had a heart attack. And it was my fault. Oh, no. <laughs> dead. Tim and I found Matt Casey's body under a rock fall of the county road. It looked like murder, and I... Like Sad. a fool. Like a stupid, hysterical fool. Like I couldn't keep it to myself. I... I wasn't going to tell him. I was going to let you, Tony, break it to him. Easy. What do you mean? Well, we found Matt's body. It was 
wrapped up in a blanket. I guess Tim must have done that to keep the buzzards off. But did you tell the sheriff? No, a couple of the men took the body to the mortician in town. We thought... Tony, how quick did he go? Uncle George. Too quick, Frazier. Even the digitalis couldn't help him. It couldn't help Nothing him. Nothing could, Frazier, when it's not you. Oh, what you mean, Tim? Here's the bottle with a digitalis but... label on it. I want you to taste its contents, Dr. Blake. What are you trying to say? I'm not trying. Go ahead, taste it. I put that label on there myself. I'm sure you did. And I'm sure you meant to do the right thing. Well, what's it taste like? Quinidine sulfate. Yes, that's what I thought. A powerful heart stimulant. When that gets into a fibrillator heart, it becomes a killer. Tim! I'm afraid so, Marion. No, Uncle George was not murdered. I'll never believe it. That bottle proves it, whether you believe it or not. How about it, Tony? Why, uh, I don't understand. Did you have quinidine sulfate in your collection of bottles? Yes, but that doesn't mean that I... Now, look here, Tim. I'm the only doctor for miles around. I keep a lot of medicines for emergency purposes. Of course, go Can't on. you two fight this out some other time and some other now, place? Now, wait a minute, Fraser. I don't want any more talk. Not right now, anyway. Okay. I'll say no more. Until the sheriff gets here. I'll send for him myself. Good, good. Later. I think Marion and I should have some time to ourselves, don't you? Before Uncle George becomes Exhibit A. Well, that's your privilege. Well, if anyone should want me, I'll be in my room wondering about things. Oh, hello, Marion. You've been in here so long, I thought you'd died. No mm, such luck. Like... What are you doing? I'm uh, developing. What? Not my muscles, honey. Not your personality, either. Touche. Did, uh... Treasure sent for the sheriff? I don't know. He's been hibernating in the study all afternoon. I looked him. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to believe a lot of things you've said about murder. That's so kind of you. But is it going to do anybody any good to make a fuss about it? Won't do the killer any good? Be reasonable. Treasure and I are very rich now. And, and I'm very much in love with Tony. Uh, I'm a stubborn cuss, Marion, when I'm right. And you haven't got enough money to make me think wrong. How much do you want? Nothing. Excuse me, Marion. I want to switch on the lights. Suppose I were to kill you. Huh? Oh, well, in that case, I'd be dead. No one would ever know. Frazier and Tony wouldn't tell. Think about it, Tim. Mm -hmm. This is the stuff. Come here, Marion. You'll disappear. It can be done, Timothy. There's a lot of open land out here. Places people don't go to. Well, think of the place you'd go to, Marion. Come here, come here. I want to show you something. Tim! Now listen, Marion. I've got a lot of friends in New York, and they know where I am. And if they don't hear from me, they're going to wonder and ask a lot of questions. So put down that gun and come over here. I'm not interested in a strip of film. But you should be. This is the film we uh, found next to Matt's body. And it tells an amazing story. What? Yeah. Uh, do you see those... Four dark streaks on the negative. Well, what about them? Now, they all start at one point and then spread like a fan. The first one is short. Second one's a little longer. The third one is the longest. And the fourth one is shorter. So what does it prove? It proves, Marion, that the sun is a witness. And right here on this negative, it's pointing four fingers at a murderer. What? Now, oh, hold that gun. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> a twist of the wrist and we're equals again. Shall we go now? I'd like to see the other members of your family, present and future. You'll never convince me, Mulligan, that four streaks on a negative mean murder. How about letting me try, Tony? You also said, Tim, that you know who killed Matt Casey. Oh, I did say that, didn't I, Fraser? Yes. I'll go a step further. The person who killed Matt also killed George. I've had enough of this. I want you to get out of here, Tim. In time. But whether you listen to me or not doesn't matter. I know you'll listen to the sheriff. All right, Tim. Prove your sunstreak theory. Thank you, Doctor. Well, Marion and I found this film next to Matt's body. He was lying at the entrance to a cave, and the rocks were piled high. So? No sun or light flooded that cave. The film wasn't ruined, but somehow one ray of sun 
got through between the rocks and left these marks on the film. But where's the murderer, Tim? In this room, Fraser. Today is the 22nd of June. Yesterday was the first day of summer, the longest day of the year. Do you see now what these streaks mean? That's still a lot of nonsense The to day me. before yesterday was shorter. And the day before that, still shorter. The position of the sun changes every day. As the days get longer, the sun rises higher. Anybody want to question that fact? Oh, I see what you mean, Tim. According to that evidence, Matt was killed four days ago. Yes, Tony. He didn't return to camp two days ago, as Fraser told us. <laughs> oh, what, what's the use? There's going to be fallout out sooner or later. Nobody believed Tony would deliberately give Uncle George the wrong medicine. Fraser! I, I didn't plan it that way when I started. I, I, I was going to frighten him to death, but it didn't work, so I came back here and switched labels on the bottles. The, the medicines looked alike, the same color. I would have done anything then to get Uncle George out of the way. Why, Fraser? Well, well up at the camp, I, I overheard him talking to Matt Casey about a new will. Yes? I, I didn't know what was going into it. But I was sure he was going to cut me out. He didn't like some of the people I've been fooling around with in town. So you killed Matt Casey to keep him from bringing back the new will? Yes. But but if I'd only read the thing before I burned it, Uncle George would be alive now. I'd have known. <laughs> Lord, help me. I'd have known. <laughs> That's right, Tim. George told us. This whole estate goes to Marion and Fraser except this property. Yes, the National Park. Fraser, why didn't you fix those bottles after you switched them? I'd have known. He told me and I'd forgotten what I'd done. I was too happy. Too happy. <laughs> And so closes tonight's Crime Club book, The Sun is a Witness, based on a story by Aaron Mark Stein. Stedman Coles did the radio adaptation. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Raymond Edward Johnson played Tim Mulligan. And Sidney Smith was Tony Blake. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the Crime Club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have a very exciting story of a boat ride that was planned by death. It's called The Grey Mist Murders by Constance and Gwynth Little. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there is a new crime club book available at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. This program came from New York. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. The Grey Mist Murders. Yes, we have that crime club story for you. Come right over. Ah, you're here. Good. Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The book is on this shelf. Here it is. The Grey Mist Murders by Constance and Gwynth Little. The very intriguing story of a pleasure cruise that became a floating horror. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It was late afternoon, and Robert Arnold's ocean-going yacht, The Grey Mist, was already eight hours out of San Francisco and traveling under full steam toward Honolulu. Two of his friends, Peter Condit and Phyllis Marsh, stood by the rail in the bow of the ship, absorbed as they watched the water go by. 
Then, a few moments later... Nothing to say, Peter? Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, Phyllis. I was just thinking. <laughs> what about? We ought to get married. What? All of us. A triple wedding. Carla Bray and Bob Arnold, you and Chet Gordon, and... And you and Kay Bailey? Uh-huh. Today, Bob could get the skipper to do the honors. You're slightly off the beam, Peter. I know it sounds crazy, but why not be crazy for a change? Not with my life. I believe in waiting and watching. What for? You're going to marry Chet anyway, aren't you? Maybe. Oh, aren't you sure? I don't know. But you're engaged. So? Peter? Huh? It's Kay. Now you can ask her how she feels about a, a double wedding. All right. Stand by and watch the reaction. Okay, darling, come over here. I've got something to ask you. After me, sweetheart. Oh, Kay! The... Well, Peter, wouldn't you like to know what that was for? What's the idea, Kay? Don't you ever try to make a fool of me again. What are you talking about? Your ex-heartthrob, Peter, Sally Grable. Huh? She's on this boat. And wherever what? she is, she's doing a good job of hiding. Oh, now, listen. We've been sailing for eight hours, and I haven't seen her. Now, where would she be, Peter? Now, she isn't. You must have had a bad dream. She is, and I didn't. But, Kate, you didn't see her. How do you know? This handkerchief was where it shouldn't be. Oh? Recognize it, darling? Let me see it. Be gentle, or you'll rub off the monogram. Where'd you get it, Kay? I found it on the other side of the deck. It was hugging the rail for dear life. Well, I'll be... Of course, dear. The sooner the better. Wait a minute. Yes? Where's the rest of the crowd? Your laugh, mate. Cut it out, Kay! Where's Bob and Chet and Carla? In the lounge, I suppose, giggling over their brandy. Then you showed them this handkerchief, huh? Oh, yes, and they were so surprised. Thanks. I'll see you later. We'll soon find out who's kidding whom. <laughs> oh, it's not really so funny, Kitty. You didn't mind laughing, Carla, did you? Oh, just to be sensible, Bob. Well, I've got things to do. Where are you going, Eddie? Down to my cabin. Got a notion I'd like to bathe. <laughs> she really means it, Chet. Oh, no, Bob, that's not what I'm laughing about. Every time I think of that look on Kay's face when she held up that <laughs> handkerchief. <laughs> oh, it was like murder. Yeah. Oh, poor Pete, what a beating he must be taking now. <laughs> Sorry for it. Chad, did you plant that handkerchief? Well, well, no, but I... I, I, well, I, I thought it was you. Oh, it wasn't. Carla? No, she doesn't go in for practical jokes. Well, neither does Phyllis. Hey. I don't believe it, Chet. She can't be on board the Grey Mist. Yeah, but if she is... Oh, if she is... Skipper, this is Mr. Arnold. Uh, did a young lady come on board this morning before I arrived at my party? What? Well, why didn't you tell me? Oh, very well. She's here, huh? Uh, he thought she was a guest. He told the steward about her. All right, you lugs. Where is she? The voice of doom. Now, now, listen, Pete. You and Chet have got Sally stored away on this boat someplace. Now, bring her out. All right, but we'll have to find her first. Oh, why did you do it? Oh, now, look, Pete. Shut up, Chet. I'm talking to the master now, the boy who handed out the invitation. Sally wasn't invited, Pete. I don't know how she found out about this trip, but she's here and we'll have to do something about it. Sure. Well, just do me one favor. Keep her out of sight. You hot-headed fool. Why don't you listen? Keep her in her cabin locked up until we get to Honolulu. Will you do that one little thing for me? Okay. Thanks. And after that, you can laugh yourself sick. Because Kay and I are checking out as soon as we dock. Well, how about a song, Bob? <laughs> Fool. Uh, something like Old Lang Syne. Should old acquaintance be forgot and... Shut up, Chet. Let's look for Sally. <laughs> I could do that with another song. Bob! Carla! Bob! Oh, what's the matter? Carla! She's in my cabin. In my cabin. Sally? Yes, in the closet on the floor. And there's a cord around her neck. What? I, I opened the closet to get a dress for tonight. And I... Chet. No. Chet, stay here with Carla. I'm going downstairs. <laughs> yes, yes, Dr. Lang. Come down here right away. Carla Bray's cabin. Bob, Chet, what are you doing here? Well, I thought I might be able to help. How's Carla? Oh, she's all right. Uh, Phyllis came into the lounge and I... Well... There's no doubt of that, is there? No. Oh, poor kid. To wind up like that. Who could have done it, Bob? 
You're asking me? Yeah, but why here? In Carla's room. Sally wasn't killed in here, Chet. What? She'd been dead for hours when she was planted in that closet. Hours? What are you talking about? Well, take a look at the body. Okay. Yeah. That could be rigor mortis. It is, Chet. I sent for Dr. Lang. He'll know more about the exact time she was killed. Yeah, uh, sure. But I got a few ideas of my own. Sally was dead before we before we pulled her out of the harbor. Say, wait a minute. You're going too fast for me. Uh, that's right, Chet. Somebody, one of our little crowds, saw Sally first, and uh, that was the end of our Sally. Yeah, but why? And why park the body here after keeping it hidden for a whole day? Say, Bob... Is somebody trying to frame Carla? It doesn't make sense. No, it's cockeyed. Why, everybody knows that Carla and Sally were the best of friends. It was Carla who tried to keep the big romance going between Pete and Sally. That's why it doesn't make sense. Well, hey. Huh? It, it, just an idea, so don't breathe fire. You didn't ask Sally to join the party. I said I didn't. All right, all right. But how do you know Carla didn't? Ah, see, here, yeah, Chad. All right, just, just to get her friend and Pete together again. Some people call it loyalty, you know. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. All right. Now, suppose Kay found out what Carla had done. And she had visions of losing Pete to Sally. You know how she worked to take him away from her. So she tied a cord around her neck, huh? Well, I don't like to be the one to say so, Bob. And then dragged the body from somewhere to this room? But there's nothing a woman likes less than being outsmarted by another woman. Okay, Chet. Will you ask Carla to meet me in the library in 20 minutes? All right, I'm sure. going to wait here for Dr. Lang. Then I'm going to find out who started this thing and why. Bob? Bob? Hey! What's up? Oh, 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 that's your brilliant. Who else would it be? Carla. Oh, Carla, baby, what's the matter? On the library floor, Jack. It's Bob. He's been killed. Holy... Uh, somebody run for a doctor, quick. Who did it, Carla? I don't know, Kay. I was going to meet him. Did you, sweetheart? Kay. It just occurred to me that Carla's quite a finder, Philip. Cut it out, Kay. This is no time for comedy. No, Peter, just for murder. You're a fool, Kay. What reason would Carla have for killing Bob? One never knows, dear. There are so many reasons why a woman should kill a man. And one of them can be another woman. Oh, why don't you shut up and dry up? I'm only thinking about Sally... I wonder who took her along for the ride. Was it Bob? Let's get out of here, Kay. The boyfriend of the best friend. <laughs> the oldest story in the world, you know. Pay no attention to her, Carla. Ever since she found Sally's handkerchief. Carla. I haven't heard a word she said, Phyllis. Uh -huh. If she only knew how little she means to me. Yeah. To pick on me at a time like Carla. this. Carla. It's all right. What? What's all right? Bob. Okay. Come here, honey. Bob. Oh, dear. Darling, you are all right. Well, not quite. I, I still have a headache. Oh, my darling, we've been so busy arguing about who killed you. I, I didn't think to look. That takes quite a lot to crack solid ivory, but somebody tried awful hard. Come on in, gang. You look pretty well, considering. Yeah, we might as well all be together, even though it's not going to be a week. What happened, Bob? Well, I'm glad to see you're interested, Pete. Now, look! I should have done that when I opened the door. Want to see who was waiting behind it with the Empire State Building in one hand. Kay seems to think it was Carla, Bob. So, so I heard and I was coming under the fog. The reasons were very interesting. Bob! Ah, relax, Carla. They were just interesting, not true. Well, shall we play 20 questions now? We shall. Chet, when you told Carla to meet me here in 20 minutes, who was present? Everybody? Yes. And then everybody disappeared. Yeah, I, I went to the billiard room. Alone, Bob? I went to my stateroom to rest. How about you, Pete? I, uh, I went for a walk on deck with Kay. Is that right, Kay? You don't think he's lying, do you? Well, it's possible that he isn't, but somebody is. How about you, Carla? You had 20 minutes to kill. I went to the game room, Kay. Why, of course. And the game room is right next to the lounge. Carla, were you able to see the stairway? I didn't see anyone go down, Bob. But then... Yeah? Well, I wasn't watching it. I was walking around. 
But the game room, dear, is where you play games. I've had enough of you, Kay. And everything that goes with you. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's going to be no hair pulling while I'm around. She's got no right to keep throwing mud at me, Chet. Yeah, I know. She I killed know. Sally and tried to kill Bob. And the more she tries to put the blame on me, the more I'm convinced all of it. All right. It's not all right at all. She's not going to call me a murderer. Stop it, Kay. Pete, get her out of here. Nobody has to get me out. I'll see you all later. That means around dinner time, if I know Kay. I'm sorry about the rumpus, Bob. Okay, Pete. I think I'll go up to the bar and start drowning myself in the best liquor you've got. Neither I'm crazy or this boat is jinxed. We start out on a cruise, the best of friends, and before the end of the day, we find that we're the worst enemies. Come on, Phyllis. Let's go up on deck and go haywire. I'm going to my cabin, Chet. Huh? I'm very tired. Oh. Okay. I'll go down to the boiler room and cool off. That's Kay. Ah, forget her, please. Carla, did you invite Sally on this trip? Did I what? <laughs> when you look surprised, honey, you're really beautiful. I'm not surprised, Bob. I'm angry. I had a lot of respect for Sally. You don't have to say another word. I'm convinced. But you thought of it. Oh, darling, I apologize. Now let's go and search all the cabins, including the empty ones. We might trip over something like a clue to the murderer. And then we'll know who's who and who paid her off. <laughs> Where have you been for the last hour, Kay? Around. Pull up a deck chair, Peter, and make believe we know each other. I've been looking for you. How nice. I hope you weren't too disappointed when you peeped in my cabin. What was the idea, Kay? Oh? Did I have an idea? That lousy scene you made outside the library. Why did you accuse Carla? I don't like her. It was the dirtiest thing I ever listened to. But I'm very fond of you, Peter. And I wouldn't like to lose you to the hangman. What's that? Oh, you're wonderful. Why don't we get married and end this beautiful romance? What did you mean, Kay, about the hangman? You killed Sally. Now listen. That's all right. I don't mind. I'm only sorry you didn't kill Bob Arnold, too. I don't know what you're talking about. But I do. After Chet told Carla to meet Bob in the library, we um, didn't go for a walk on the deck. You keep your mouth shut about that, Kay. But you said we did. And that wasn't the truth, was it, darling? If you say one word to Bob or anybody else... Well, you do. Kill me, too. Good grief! There, there. I'll keep your secret. But I tell you, Kay, I had nothing to do with this business today. I didn't know Sally was on board until you showed me that handkerchief. Your piccolo's out of tune. What are you trying to do? That's what I want to know. What are you trying to do? Sit down, sit down, and keep your temper. Because if I start screaming... <sighs> there, that's a good boy. I didn't kill Sally. No one will ever know from me. Would you like me to prove it? How? Well, a wife can't give evidence against her husband. You haven't got anything on me. Don't be silly. All I have to do is talk, and the only alibi you've got becomes a witness to the prosecution. Yes? Yes. Because whoever tried to kill Bob killed Sally. And for the sake of the record, the marriage record, I was with you on both occasions, protecting my future. Bob, we've been trotting around from cabin to cabin and I'm tired Only three more empties to go, Carla Sally must have been in one of them This is like hunting for a ghost And when it happens to be the ghost of your best friend This is it Luggage Sally's luggage It must be No one was checked into this room by me Bob What is it, Carla? I don't think I can go through with it Will you excuse me, please? Oh, sure, honey. I should have thought of it myself. You go up on deck and get some air. I'll look around here, and if I find anything interesting... What's the matter? A handbag on the dresser. It's a funny position to leave a handbag in. Standing on end. That's a tip-off, Carla. There's something in it that Sally wanted us to find. What do you mean? She's a very smart girl, and she might have left her handbag this way so it'd be noticed. Bob, just before she was killed? Maybe she didn't know she was going to be killed. But she was frightened. She did some quick thinking. What's that you're reading? Good Lord, this is one thing I didn't expect to find. Well, what is it? A letter to Sally. Read it. I've made up my mind, so let's not mess things up. Stay off the gray mist. Chet. Chet? Yeah, of all people. Chet and Sally? 
not a word to anybody. There's no doubt about it, Carla. That's his handwriting top to bottom. Uh, now, there's only one thing to do. But we won't do it now. What? Phyllis. Not now, will we? Please give me that letter. I'll do nothing of the kind. Carla, don't be foolish. You're an old friend. And I'm very fond of you. You wouldn't dare use that gun. I would. I'm engaged to marry Chet. And if I have to shoot you to get that letter, I'll shoot you. There's no use arguing, Carla. Give it to her. But she'll destroy it. There's nothing we can do about it now. Give it to her. Well, all right. Thanks. I'll explain some other time. Bob, has she gone out of her mind? I don't know. But if sticking by your man means that you're out of your mind, then she is. Why, you sound as if you admire her. <laughs> I don't even admire myself. Let's go upstairs. I'd like to have a chat with Chet. <laughs> you know, Bob, this is the nicest bar I've ever been in. It's the cleanest, too. You ought to get a medal for it. Snap out of it, Chet. If you're playing drunk. Sure, I'm playing. You and Carla say I'm a murderer. That, that makes me want to play some more. <laughs> Where's the letter I'm supposed to have written? Phyllis took it away from us. Phyllis, huh? <laughs> ah, she's some girl. She's one in a billion. <laughs> and you know, the days of the little millions are gone forever. <laughs> Goodbye forever. Goodbye forever. Bob, we'll never get anything tonight. Won't we? Give me that pitcher of ice water. Goodbye. 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 Here, goodbye. Bob. Goodbye. 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 <laughs> hey. That's cold. Not as cold as you're going to be if you don't start making sense. So what's, what's the big idea? We want to know about you and Sally. Me? Uh, what are you talking about? Don't you remember a thing we said to you? Well, you said it to... Oh, yeah. Yeah, a, a letter that Phyllis took. That you wrote to Sally, telling her to stay off this boat. Oh, no, Carla. I never wrote one word to Sally. Oh, you got to believe me. We found it in her handbag, Chet. And the handwriting was yours. Uh, you know what, Giddies? I think there's a lunatic on board. How about it, Chet? No, no, I mean it, Bob. Look, what happened? First, Sally's found in the closet of Carla's room. And then you're conked for no reason at all. And now then this letter of mine. Tell us about that, pal. Uh, but I didn't write it. I haven't seen it. But, but I can tell you it's a forgery. That's always convenient. No, Carla, I'm not lying honest. Look, Bob, you, you know me for a long time. You know my handwriting. Could you imitate it? That's not the point yet. Well, could you or couldn't you? Ooh, yes, if I wanted well, to. Well, so could Carla and so could anybody. It's the easiest handwriting in the world to imitate. It, it's like a schoolboy's. Well, will you get that letter from Phyllis? I'll try. If she's still got it. And I certainly hope she has. Bob, did he put one over on us? I don't know, Carla. I wonder. Hmm. Well, you want to be a detective. And you know, a good detective has to take lessons. Good lessons. Huh? Would you like to have a lemon fizz, darling? Or just a fizzle? Peter. Huh? Oh, Phyllis. Can you play billiards? I want to talk to you. All right. What about? I overheard what Kay said to you a little while ago. Snooping, huh? I didn't mean to, Peter. Let's go out on deck. I want you to understand one thing. When we get outside, Phyllis. Very well. Now, what do you want? The truth. You too. Bob and Carla found that letter in Sally's handbag. What letter? The one you wrote in Chet's handwriting after you killed Sally. Is this something new? There's no use denying it, Peter. You didn't want Sally to come on this boat. And when you found she was here, you killed her and tried to make it look as though Chet had done it. Who's got that letter now, Phyllis? I took it from Carla. I had to use force, but I took it. I'd like to see it. You can't. Why not? I destroyed it. Why, you dumb cook. What did you do a thing like that for? There was going to be no evidence against Chet. No evidence against Chet. Or against you. Have you got any idea what you've done? 
Only one person had a reason for killing Sally and wanting to kill Bob. It wasn't Chet. No, no, who's talking about him? It was Kay. Kay? She thought Bob had invited Sally to make this trip. You saw what she did when she found that handkerchief. But she's not as smart as she thinks. She put on the mad act, but, but Sally was already dead and she killed her. But tonight, when she tried to put the blame on me... Peter, do you know what you're saying? What she said about me. Only this is the truth. I know it. All Kay wants is money and I have it. She charmed me away from Sally, made me think she loved me. I fell for her like a ton of saplings. But all she was angling for was money. But I always thought that Kay was well off. She hasn't got a dime. For the last two months, she's been gambling with my money. And I was going to ask her to marry me. <laughs> Today. <laughs> a triple wedding. Oh, oh, stop it. Stop it. What's the matter with you? Don't you believe me? No. All right. Let's form a posse. We'll beat through this boat till we find Kay. And then I'll make her tell the truth about everything, including murder. She's got to be in her cabin, Phyllis. She's nowhere else on this boat. But she doesn't answer, Ah, uh, That's just her way of being cute. Well, I'm not waiting. See here, Kay. Oh! Oh, no. No! Just like Sally! we better get Bob. Remember, Phyllis, you were with me. Is she dead? Nobody ever looked like that and wasn't. Come on, let's get Bob. <laughs> I think that's all, Mr. Arnold. Thank you, Dr. Lang. Will you take care of the details? I'm going into the library to join my, uh, friends. If you want me to make any chemical tests... I'll call you, or I'll bring the murderer to you. I think we've got all the evidence we need. I hope so, Mr. Arnold. Yeah. Yeah. Paul. Sit down, Carla. Everybody sit down. Well, Kay's been dead about an hour. Anybody have an alibi? No? Well, that's good, because I don't care about alibis this time. All I want is a show of hands. Show of hands? Huh? What, do you well, what do you mean, Bob? I want to see everybody's hands, Chip. What for? Have you got any reason not to show me yours? Well, no. <laughs> Here, look at them. I just washed them 15 minutes ago. Both sides, Chip. Okay. Up. Down. <laughs> Do I pass? How about you, Pete? Well, I don't mind if this is a new way to tell fortunes. It is. The kind of fortune that ends with, I now pronounce sentence of death. You're next, Phyllis. May I see your hands, please? All right. I wish I knew why. Carla? Yes, Bob? Your hands. Here. Don't worry. You won't find any blood on mine. I wasn't looking for blood, exactly. What were you looking for? I don't understand. Someone in this room is a murderer, a strangler. And Dr. Lang found the evidence that should convict. What evidence, Bob? Pieces of skin, Pete, under two of Kay's fingernails. She scratched her killer and she... I reach for your neck, Phyllis. Well, no reason. I was just going to loosen my scarf. Why don't you take it off? Isn't it sort of warm in here? I'll just loosen it. What are you hiding? Dog! Hey, you got one heck of an herb. Give her back that scar. Okay, Chad, after she explains those two scratches on she the side of her neck... She doesn't have to explain anything to I'm you. I'm afraid she does to all of us. How did you get those scratches on your neck, Philip? Bob, leave her alone. You've got them while you were twisting the cord around Kay's neck, didn't you? She reached up while you were standing behind her and clawed at you, trying to get hold of your hair so she could pull your head down. Isn't that right, Phyllis? You've got no proof. So that's what you want. All right. Dr. Lang has the skin that came off that neck. He's ready to make any test he has to. He's not going to make any test, Bob. You're a lick, Phyllis. That gun can't help you now. Why doesn't somebody try to take it away from me? <laughs> Phyllis. Oh, no. Yes. Why doesn't somebody try? Because you all want to live. You too, Chet. <laughs> Even now. <laughs> oh, Phyllis, why did you do it? I hated them both. But Kay more than Sally, because she was going to marry Peter. What? Are you kidding? No, Chet. I never love you. You just pestered me. And I... Did you know I tried to get rid of you, too? I wrote that letter to Sally right after I killed her. And then I fixed everything so that it would be found. That was smart of me, wasn't it? Phyllis. <laughs> Don't be foolish, Bob. Don't come too close. I had everything planned. Kay was going to disappear tonight. And after a while, Peter, you wouldn't have cared. I was going to show you how much I loved you. <laughs> 
Oh, we've got to do something. She'll kill us all. <laughs> Sit tight, Pete. But I, I made a mistake. And it was just as well. Bob told me to take cabin G. I thought he said D. And there was Sally. Would you like to know what she told me? Of course, Phyllis. She said she came on board to take Peter away from Kay. Nobody knew she was there. I promised to keep her confidence. And when she turned round to unpack... Why did you put her body in my room? Sally couldn't be dead without being seen, Carla. And your room was so close. Just across the hall. Well, why did you try to frame me, Phyllis? I never did anything to you. Didn't you? You kissed me and I hated you. That was a mistake, too. I didn't realize it until I heard Kay talking to Peter. Accusing him of the murder. Then I knew that you had no reason to kill Sally. But Peter did. And if I could convince him, the way that Kay was trying to convince him, that he couldn't live without marrying me, I could... All right, Pete. Wait! Get the lights on! Sorry, get the lights on! What? Phyllis. She's killed herself. No, Carla. It's just a flesh wound. But she'll never have another chance to kill anybody, including herself. And so closes tonight's Crime Club book, The Grey Mist Murders, based on a story by Constance and Gwynth Little. Stedman Coles did the radio adaptation. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Sidney Smith played Robert Arnold. Helen Shields was Phyllis Marsh. Sherling Oliver was Peter Condit. Joan Alexander was Kay Bayliss. Elaine Kent played Carla Bray. And Chet Stratton was Chester Gordon. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very exciting story of a portrait in black that became a study in murder. It's called Death Cuts a Silhouette by D.B. Olson. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there is a new Crime Club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we look for you next week. One more thing. Cancer strikes on the average one of every two families. Help strike back. Support the American Cancer Society's programs of research, education, and service. Give generously today. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. The topaz flower. Yes, we have that crime club story for you. Come right over. the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The book is on this shelf. Here it is. The Topaz Flower by Charlotte M. Russell. The exciting story of a flower that was plucked by the hand of death. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It was a little after seven o'clock in the evening family and friends were scattered through the rather austere house, and Mr. Sloan was even more than usually indifferent to their comfort and his responsibility as host. 
Wally Kent was the only person there who did not fear the old man. He even admitted to himself that he liked him in a strange sort of way, and that was good, especially as the Sloanes were inclined to be clannish, and Wally intended to propose to Natalie, if he could find her. After having looked everywhere else for her, he finally decided to try Mr. Sloan's room. Perhaps she had been closeted with her uncle. Standing at the door, he hesitated. Then, squaring his shoulders, he knocked. Mr. Sloan! Mr. Sloan, is Natalie there? Mr. Sloan! Hey, Mr. Sloan! Nice light. Natalie! Mr. Sloan! Oh, Natalie, darling. I've been looking all over the house for you. The party... Well, honey, what's the matter? Let me go, Wally. Oh, but listen. Let me go, I tell you. Oh, what the... Mr. Sloan. Oh, my good gosh. Natalie, what were you doing? Did you call Mr. Sloan? Oh, Mr. Kent. Oh. Take it easy, Barbara. Oh, but he's murdered. Mr. Sloan's been murdered. Get to the phone, Barbara, right away. Call Captain Tom Vane of the Homicide Bureau. Tell him what's happened. He'll be here right away. Yes, sir. Oh, and Bauer, just see that nobody leaves until he gets here, will you? Well, well sir, I, I, I don't know, but I'll try, sir. Oh, poor Mr. Sloan. And if you see Miss Natalie, tell her to come up here, please. It's very important. <laughs> Captain Bain is here, Mr. Kent. Oh, thanks, Barr. Bring him right in here. Yes, sir. Uh, Come in, please, Captain. Thank you. Hello, Tom. Hello, Wally. Here, you got a murder here. Got a dead man anyway, Tom. Let's have a look. Right in here. Ah, he's dead, all right. Harry Sloan, huh? Yeah. Nobody saw it done, I suppose. As far as I know. Now, let's see... Two glasses, drinking with somebody. Looks like it. Wonder who? Search me. Anybody in here besides you? No. Oh, yes, there was, too. Young Raymond Sloan, his nephew, Hmm? came roaring in when the news got out that the old gentleman was dead. I kept the others out. Well, maybe we can get some prints off those glasses. Yeah. Oh, say, though, Raymond Sloan picked up one of the glasses. This one. Picked it up? What for? Well, he was kind of upset and he wanted a drink. So he just grabbed the glass, poured a shot into it. Yes, and, and smeared the prints all over the place. Darn the luck. I always get the tough jobs. Why couldn't he have picked up the old gentleman's glass? Well, how would he know which was which? Yeah, he got something there. Well, no, well, thanks anyway. Let's go see these folks, shall we? Sure. Uh, downstairs and to your right. Mm. I'll show you. The, uh... Old man had a lot of dough, didn't he? He was pretty well off. Ah. Is this the room? That's right. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you please. I'm Captain Tom Bain of the Homicide Bureau. I know Wally Kent here, but you others. Uh, will you please tell me who you are? You first, sir. I'm Bauer, the butler, sir. No? I'm Maria Sloan, Mr. Sloan's sister-in-law. And I'm his son. Raymond Sloan. Clarinda Bell, Mr. Sloan's secretary. And this gentleman here in the corner? Joe Bannister. I'm an old friend of Harry Sloan. Uh, shouldn't there be someone else? Well, Natalie. My daughter. Where's she? Well, I I think she... Sorry, I'm late. I'm Natalie Sloan. All right. Now sit down, please, everybody. Let's just check those names again so I know to whom I'm talking. Bauer the butler? Yes, sir. Mrs. Maria Sloan? Yes. And Miss Clarinda Bell? I'm right here. See, and you're Joe Bannister? I am. Miss Natalie Sloan? Yes. Have I forgotten anybody? Oh, yes. Raymond Sloan. Present. And me. Mm Mm-hmm. Wally Kent. Okay, here we go. We know that Mr. Sloan was shot about 7.15 by someone with a revolver with a silencer. He'd been drinking in his locked room with someone who uh, apparently killed him and took the, uh, 
Topaz flower. What, uh, what is the topaz flower? Topaz flower. It's a jewel, a cluster of jewels, a family heirloom. Easily recognizable, Miss Natalie? Oh, yes. The topaz flower is also a gold mine in Canada that Harry Sloan and I discovered. Oh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Bannister. You're welcome. Now, let's just check what each of you were doing when, uh, Wally Kent? I, I discovered the body, Captain. I, I was looking for Natalie and... Uh, where were you, Miss Natalie? I was dressing. But... What? Well, I didn't say anything. Okay. You, young man, Raymond Sloan. I was having a drink in the living room, down here. He's always having a drink, aren't you, Ray? What were you doing, Mr. Bannister? I don't remember. Oh, you don't remember? I see. I was downstairs here all the time. You're the secretary, Clarinda Bell. Yes. And may I go home? You may not. You, Mrs. Sloan? Me? I was dressing... You can ask my maid. <laughs> I will. And the butler? I, I, I was in the front hall all evening, sir. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Wally, you're supposed to be an amateur detective. What's your theory since you found the body? Was there um, anybody else in the room? Not when I found the body, Captain, no. Well, how'd you get in there if the door was locked? What? I said, how did you get in there if the door was locked? Oh, that. Yeah, that. Well, I, I, I never thought of that time. Oh, one minute the door was locked and, and then it was unlocked. Mm. <laughs> That's right, I never thought of that. There must have been somebody in there. There uh, sure must have been. And you didn't see anybody when you went in? No. No, I didn't see anybody. Well, perhaps whoever it was got out through the French doors that open on the terrace. Oh, they were locked, Mrs. Sloan. Were there any fingerprints on the glasses that they were drinking out of? Well, thanks to young Mr. Sloan here, no, he smeared his own prints all over him. Well, I was only trying to help. Oh, great help. Well, whoever killed Mr. Sloan took the topaz flower, I suppose. Oh, that couldn't have been the motive for the murder. It was only worth about $5,000. <laughs> Only 5000 Mrs. Sloan, you'd be surprised what people do for $5,000. Wait a minute. Young Mr. Sloan, how were you treated in your father's will? What? What do you mean? Do you mean... Uh, easy, easy, lad. Uh, do you come in to a lot of money? If he does, Captain, so does practically everybody in the room here. Mari Maria here is his sister-in-law. Natalie's his favorite niece. Bauer's been an employee of Sloan's for... Twenty-eight years, sir. I know I'm provided for in his will. Everybody here except Wally Kent stands to benefit by the will. How about you, Wally? You and Miss Natalie, I take it. Uh, Tom, uh, could it be that the murderer took the topaz flower to direct suspicions along another line? It certainly could be, Mr. Kent. Ah, Miss Clarinda Bell. Incidentally, you didn't say anything when Bannister was talking about people who might profit by... Uh, no. I stood to lose a great deal by Mr. Sloan's death. Oh, you mean he wasn't going to do the right thing by his secretary? By his first will, yes. First what? will? Why? What do you mean? There was only Now, hold one. it, hold it. What do you mean by that, Miss Bell? Mr. Sloan dictated a new will to me only a week ago. Why didn't you tell me this before? You didn't ask me, Captain. Well, well I don't believe I it. I don't either. Miss Natalie, what do you think? Well, I, I don't know oh, what... wait a minute. Let's find out about this new will. Huh? Yes, by all means. What did you mean about losing by the terms of the new will? Will you explain that, please? I will. Mr. Sloan and I were to be married. Well, oh, that's ah. ridiculous. And the new will named Clarinda Bell Sloan, his wife, as the principal beneficiary. However, since I'm still Clarinda Bell, probably always will be, you see... Where is this will, Miss In Bell? the safe, Mr. Sloan's office. So, Captain, now that I've demonstrated that I have no possible motive, do you suppose I might go home? Uh, sure. Sure, you can go home. I'll be in touch with you. Thank you. Good night. Oh, oh wait, wait, Linda, wait. Good night. Well, people, looks as if we're out of luck. No, we're not out of luck yet, Joe. That second will can't be probated, so the first one is still good. Oh, no, dear, my dear. The intent of the will is the thing. We're still out of luck. I didn't know there was another will. Uh, telephone, Captain Bain. Headquarters calling, sir. Oh, thanks. Uh, the rest of you clear out for a few minutes. Uh, Bauer, see that they don't run all over the place and get lost. Oh, yes, sir, yes. Uh, hello. Oh, you did, huh? No, hold it a minute till these people get out of here. All right, let's go, please. Let's go. Hmm? 
Natalie. What, Wally? Come in here a minute, will you? Where? Uh, here in this room. I want to ask you something. No, wait. Let's see if there's anybody in here. No. Come on. What do you want? Now, honey, look at me. What were you doing in your uncle's room when he was shot? I, I don't know what you mean. Matt, I... darling, this guy Bain is a sharp cop. Now, look, I can't cover up for you all the time. Do you mean you think I shot Uncle Harry? Darling, no, but I... I mean, you were in there with the door locked. You unlocked it yourself. I nearly got caught when Bain asked me how I got in. You're not going to tell him, Wally. Natalie, darling, listen, please, I... Oh, well, Wally, can't I? I've been looking all over. Excuse me. Wally, I want to see you. Oh, excuse me, Natalie. I I'll see you later, huh? Okay, Tom. What now? Sorry, Miss Natalie. Wally, we found the topaz flower. You, you what? Yeah. John Jarbo of the Hawk Shop Squad just called. That was the phone call. Uh, found it in the shop six blocks from here, and he's uh, bringing the owner in the topaz flower first thing tomorrow morning. Well, I'll be... Say, that's fast work, Tom. Yeah, it sure is, isn't it? Says uh, a woman hocked it. A woman? You suppose somebody could have gotten out of the house, run over to the hock shop, and... Uh... Well, what what did the woman look like, Tom? Well, the fellow said she was wearing a green hat, a purple scarf, and she had red hair. Uh, red hair? Huh? Oh, what? <laughs> Thank goodness there's no red-headed women in this house. I think again, Wally. Uh, maybe a red wig. <laughs> I got Miss Bell on the telephone, Captain. Mm -hmm. She's on the way over. I told her what you said about the woman pawning the topaz flower, sir. Well, where's Mr. Kent this morning? Well, well I... I was looking for Natalie, Tom. Mm. Where's the topaz flower? Be here any minute. Now, look here. You're supposed to be an amateur, Dick. This, uh, this look like an inside job to you? I... I don't know, Tom. Oh, it does to me. Who do you... Uh... I mean... Well, this son of his. Ray? Hmm? Well, he's kind of a young fellow they call a near-to-well in detective stories. Drinking, gambling, women, you know. Yeah, he knocked off the old man. He sure made a mistake. How'd they get along? Not good, I hear. That's right. But I doubt he's got the nerve to do such a thing. And that sister-in-law, Maria. Well, now, she's kind of malicious. But she's harmless. Mm-hmm. Well, you pick out the murderer. Oh, no, Tom. Not for me. Not me. I wondered if you would like some coffee, gentlemen. Oh, uh, no thanks. Uh, Bauer, that's your name, isn't it? Yes. But you can tell the rest of the people I want them in here now, please. Very good, sir. Very good. Hmm. The guy snoops. Oh, no. Not Bauer. Well, how do you know he wasn't listening at the door? Well, I... Yeah, when you've been in this game as long as I... Ah, doorbell. Bauer will get it. Must be nice to be so rich. And get murdered? Yeah. Yeah, that's right, too. A police officer, Captain, and another, uh, person. Hmm? Oh, hello, Jabo. Morning, Captain. Nice work, kid. Yeah. This here is Dorn, the hot shop fella. Oh, good. Uh, come on, we'll go in the other room where we have these people. There's more room in there. Everybody in there, Bauer? Yes, sir, they're waiting for you. Okay. In here, Jabo. Dorn. <clears throat> well, Dawn, either one of these two ladies? Uh, no, nope, not neither of them. You sure? Absolutely. I'd recognize that woman out of a million. Red hair, kind of deep voice, a green hat, purple scarf. Just what uh, is this, please, Captain Bain? Jabo, give us a stone. Yes, sir. <gasps> Why, it's the topaz flower. Where did it come from? Oh, where did you get it? Yeah. Huh? A woman with red hair. And a green hat and a purple scarf with a deep All right, voice. all right. It was hocked at this man's place last night. Uh, a woman with red hair and That's a green... That's enough. You say it wasn't either of these ladies now? Positively. I'd know her in a minute. Okay, okay. Take them back, Java. Okay. Come on, lad. Uh, is that all, Captain? <laughs> That's all. Much obliged. Uh, you're welcome. Well, I must say, Captain. Hush, Mother. Say, Captain, as long as this fellow's trying to identify women for you, and you better keep him here till Miss Bell gets here? Just to make it come out even, you know. Oh. Oh, yeah, sure. That's, uh... Hey, Captain. Hey, Captain. Captain. What's the matter with you now? Look, look. 
The green hat and the purple scarf. I found it. Where'd you get that? Well, that's my hat. And my scarf. Now, wait a minute. Let's see that. It was right there on that thing in the hall. I never noticed it when I come in, but when I went out, there it was. And I knew it right away. Look. Mm. Look, I bet there's maybe a red hair in it someplace. Look, huh? Well, what do you know? It is a red hair. Or am I colorblind, Ken? No. It's red, all right. Well, Aunt Maria, now who's in the suit? Well, I haven't seen that purple scarf in a week. Well, the lady that hocked the jewelry wore it. Natalie, and... when did you wear this hat last? Why, it was in my room. How'd you get down here? Young lady, I think we're going to have a lot of fun finding out. Yes, but I didn't... No, 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 it wasn't her. Not her. The hat and the scarf might have been lent to someone. You make another remark like that. Now, let him I... alone, please, Mrs. Sloan. Now, shut that door, Bob. Now, wait and see who that is. Yes, sir. Probably Miss Bell, Mr. Bannister. Now, see here, Captain. Hold it for a minute or two. Mr. Joseph Bannister. Ah. Come in. Come in. Bannister, we found the topaz flower. What? Yes. It was pawned at Mr. Dorn's shop last night. Uh, by a red-headed woman in this green hat. Uh-huh, uh-huh, and... uh-huh, yeah. Do uh, either of you know any red-haired women? I know one in Calgary, Captain. Hmm. Bauer. Yes, sir. Will you take the gentleman somewhere for a few minutes, please? I want to talk to these two ladies. Yes, sir. Uh, this way, gentlemen, if you please. What are you going to do? I'll call you when I want you, Mr. Sloan. Let's go, let's go. Want me to go, too? No. You stay here. Thanks. Sit down, Natalie. Thank you, Wally. How long before you'll want us? I'll call you. Nat, is that your hat, really? Yes, of course. I think that man must be crazy. Well, I think it's something the police have cooked up to try to scare us into... Scare you into what, Mrs. Sloan? What do you mean by that? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, sit down. Sit down, Mrs. Sloan. Now, are you sure you haven't lent that scarf to someone recently? Ridiculous. And you, Miss Sloan, your hat... The hat's been in my room for weeks. I haven't worn it in... I don't know when. I see. Well, Brother Kent, it was an inside job after all, wasn't it? It certainly looks like it, all right. But uh, I don't think... Mm -hmm. Go and ask the men to come back, will you? I'll go, if I may. I want to get a handkerchief in here. Uh, No, wait. Oh, never mind. Wally, you don't think... It doesn't make any difference what Mr. Kent thinks, Miss Sloan. I'm the one that... (gasps) Mother! Come on. Mother! Natalie, get back. It's Maria. And Clorinda Bell. They're dead. They're murdered. How is uh, Mrs. Sloan now? She'll be all right, Captain, but the shock... Yeah, I know. May I go up to her now, please? Uh, Sit down a moment, if you will. I uh, won't keep you long. But... Uh, Sit down, please. Here, let me help you, Natalie. How did Miss Bell get in the house? Why, she had a key. Hmm? She often came out here to work with Uncle Harry. I see. Do you know how she was murdered? She was stabbed, wasn't she? Yes. And when your mother saw her, she fainted. Well, what would you do? Uh, Faint, probably. Uh, Miss Sloan, this this pencil was lying under Miss Bell's body. You ever see it before? Well, that's my pencil. Oh, it is? Miss Sloan, belongings of yours seem to turn up everywhere. Your green hat, your pencil. But I was in here and I, I lost that pencil three weeks ago. Oh? No, see here, Ben. That'll do from you. Now, look, Natalie, I'm reasonably sure you didn't murder Miss Bell, but... You wouldn't have lent the pencil? Please. Stop it, Bane. I told you I lost it. This is a very odd pencil. You pull the end off, there's an eraser. I know that. It's got another trick, too. I don't know what you mean. Now, look. You pull the eraser off. <gasps> a knife. A little knife. Yeah, a little knife with blood on it. Miss Sloan, who murdered Clorinda Bell with your knife? Now, look here, Bane. Shut up. Take it easy, Kent. Answer my question, young lady. I tell you, I don't know anything about it. All right, all right. You can go up to your room. But stay there, will you? I'll take you up, Natalie. No, you stay here. I want to talk to you for a minute. Go ahead, Natalie. Captain Bailey. I'll see you later. All right. I don't get it. She didn't do it, Ben. No, I don't think so either. But who did? Well, 
Here's the stuff from Clorinda Bell's purse, keys, lipstick, cigarette case, address book, matches, comp... Papers? Well... What? Now, look at this card. Read it. Hmm. I remember the Christmas party six years ago, just as well as you do. Well, what is it? Christmas card or something? I wouldn't know. What? What's this? Uh Uh-huh. Last will and testament of Harrison Sloan. Yeah, but where's the rest of it? Somebody wanted that will badly enough to knock off the old girl for it. Now, just who could that be? We're just as badly off as we were yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. Except... Captain Bain, Mr. Bannister would like to speak to you. Sir. Oh, Bannister, send him in. Yes. Well, how you doing, Cap? Oh. All right. Don't kid me, Cap. Oh, yeah, you've been drinking. Sure. Makes me think. Well, what do you think you want? Makes me remember things. Oh, isn't that fine? Like what? Like things I see. Come on, come on. I was out in the garden for a breath of fresh air about the time Harry got killed. And? I looked up at Harry's room. French doors, you know. Know who was sitting there with him? Oh. Girl. What girl? You look around, you'll find out. Young girl. Bannister, are you insinuating... No, just telling you. Goodbye. Hey, wait a minute. Nope. Goodbye. Hmm. What do you think of that? Why, that old... Hold drunken. your horses. He's not so drunk. But, uh, why did he... Hey, wait a minute. Now what? He didn't see anybody in that room. What do you mean? Well, didn't you see those French windows? What do you mean? They're covered with frost all the way from the top to the bottom in this cold weather. Well, i be... That's right. Nobody could see in. Of course they couldn't. That's right. Now, what do you suppose... All I know is he couldn't have seen in that room... Bob, you've got the makings of a detective after all. But why would he want to throw suspicion on Natalie? I wonder. Say, maybe he meant Clorinda. No, nah, he said a young woman. He was a little drunk. Mm-mm. I don't think Clorinda did it. Anyway, the hock shop man said she wasn't the one that had the topaz flower. Yeah, that's right. What about that card, though? Hmm? The uh, Christmas card? Now, let's see it again. Yeah. I remember the Christmas Eve party six years ago just as well as you knew. Bain, I've got an idea. That's swell. Ring for Bauer. Hmm. Okay. You rang, sir? Yes, come in here, Bauer. Close the door. Yes, sir? Bauer, you've been here a long time. Yes, sir. Were you here at a Christmas party six years ago? Uh, That would be 1941. Yes, sir, of course. Who else of these people was here? Mrs. Sloan, Natalie? Mm, No, sir, they were in California. Let me see. Why, I think Mr. Sloan and Miss Bell and Mr. Bannister... Anything special happened that night? Special, sir? Something Miss Bell might remember, for instance. Uh, Let me think, sir... Why, yes, sir. (laughs) It's indeed, sir. Very funny. (laughs) What? It it was Mr. Bannister, sir. Bannister? What did he do? (laughs) Well, sir, he was rather uh, tight. And he came downstairs wearing a woman's dress and a red wig. A red wig? Oh, yes, sir. I remember perfectly. (laughs) Oh, he was a scream. Bower, go out and ask Mr. Bannister to step in here, will you? Uh, Yes, sir. I hope you won't tell him... Snappy, Bower, please. Uh, Yes, sir. Kent. Nice going. It it all seems so simple, Captain Bay. Yeah, sure, looking back on it. Sloan told him about the new will and about marrying Clorinda. Uh, What we didn't know, of course, was that Sloan had cut Bannister off in the new will. So Bannister figured he'd murder the old gentleman, take the will out of the wall safe in the room, and get away with it even if Clorinda did tell everyone about it. But it wasn't there, so he 
took the topaz flower to make it look like robbery. And when I came in the room, he locked yeah, me in. Yeah, that's right. Then he had to get rid of the topaz flower. So he dressed up in women's clothes. But he'd forgotten that Clorinda remembered the Christmas party and his act. And she was going to pass him the note when she came here. Yes, only he got here first. Well, see, at the trial, and if you ever want a job on the force, well... Oh, no, not me, Captain. I'm going to be pretty busy looking after the topaz flower. Hmm? Sure. Belongs to Natalie now. And... Oh. <laughs> yeah, I get it, I get it. Well, I look pretty good in soup and fish. What do you mean, Captain? Oh, pardon me. I just mean, um, in case you want somebody to guard the wedding presents. <laughs> well, goodbye for now. And so closes tonight's Crime Club book, The Topaz Flower, based on a story by Charlotte M. Russell. Willis Cooper did the radio adaptation. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Raymond Edward Johnson played Captain Bain. Chet Stratton was Wally. And Julie Stevens was Natalie. The cast included Eleanor Phelps, Reese Taylor, Barry Thompson, Irene Hubbard, Paul Hammond, and Ed Latimer. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have a very intriguing story of a missing person that was found by death. It's called Epitaph for Lydia by Virginia Roth. In the meantime, well, in the meantime, there is a new crime club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we look for you next week. This program came from New York. This is the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcast. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Epitaph for Lydia. Yes, we have that crime club story for you. Come right over. Ah, you're here. Good. Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The book is on this shelf. Here it is. Epitaph for Lydia, by Virginia Roth. The exciting story of a missing person who was found by death. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It is late evening in San Francisco, and in the spacious living room of an impressive house on Lombard Street, a party is in full swing. A tall, keen-eyed man, bored by the noisy music and the chattering people retreats to the comparative quiet of an adjoining room. Attracted by several modernistic paintings on the wall, he steps over to one for a closer look. Do you like it? Huh? You're Michael Dundas, the detective, aren't you? Well, I'm really an architect, but sometimes... You were pointed out to me when you came in. Oh? I'm Lydia Courtney. You don't know me. Well, no, but... uh... Do you like modernistic art? If it's art, yes. However, most of the moderns look like exercises in children's finger painting. Uh, This one, for instance, 
rooftops at sunset. Yes, at least that's what the artist calls it. To me, it looks like a hangover at sunrise. Now, there's one over here. Uh-huh. There's possibilities. Ah, here it is. Just a simple study of some sand dunes. <gasps> Why, what's the matter, Miss Courtney? Oh, I'm afraid I... I don't feel very well. Can I get you anything? No. No, I'll be all right. It's just that... That's a horrible picture. Miss Courtney, I think you'd better sit down. Uh, right over here on the sofa. No. no. I'll be all right, really. I... I'm feeling much better now. Fine. Miss Courtney. Margie. Oh, I... Miss Courtney. Oh, I knew she'd faint. <clears throat> Lucky I grabbed her before she fell. Now, onto the sofa. Uh, there we are. Lydia. Lydia, aren't you going to... Jo- oh, What's happened? She fainted. Uh, the sand dunes. Many a one for him shall moan, but none shall, shall know. Uh, I've forgotten. Hmm, that's Forgot- odd. What? That she should quote from that old ballad. She she was just delirious. She, she didn't know what she was saying. Hmm. And I guess Margie doesn't mean anything either. Margie? Yes. Uh, by the way, I think I know you from someplace, don't I? Yes, I uh, I run a bookstore, Mr. Dundas. I think you've been in it a few times. Oh, that's right. I bought some books and had them sent. Uh, your name is um, Bond, isn't it? Yes, Sally Bond. Uh-huh. Tell me, how'd you burn her, your wrist? Oh, well, that I... Uh, some, uh, some grease splattered on me. I see. Uh, uh, oh, Sally. Yes, Lydia. I... I didn't say anything, did I? No, no, dear. Now, you just lie still. That's right. Can I give you a lift home? That won't be necessary, Mr. Dundas. Our escorts are somewhere in the crowd. They'll drive us back. I see. Uh, Just a suggestion, Miss Bond. Yes? I think it'd be wise for you to stay at Miss Courtney's home tonight. I will. You see, we live together. Uh Oh? Don't worry about me, Mr. Dundas. After tonight, I, I think I'll be all right. Of course. Lydia's going to be just fine. I guess you're right, Mirabel. Puzzles seem to pursue me, don't they? I go to a party for relaxation and up bounces a prettier problems I've come across in years. A painting, a song, a woman who faints, and that poetry she quoted. Oh, am I boring you? Ah, uh, I get it. That look in your eyes. L'amour. Time for a rendezvous. Uh, oh, but it's one thirty in the morning. Uh, okay, okay. Stop pawing your whiskers, you roué. I'll let you out. Come on. Up we go. Margie, I'm always thinking of you, Margie. Da, not a bad night. Peaceful, nice moon. Okay, pal, I guess. Wait a minute. Those were gunshots. Come on. Should be, should be somewhere around here. Oh. So when I was telling you about me, Hittable, Lydia Courtney, and she's dead. But, Inspector, that's all I know. That's the whole story. Can't be. Doesn't make sense, Mike. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Crazy, but true. Oh. Uh, did your boys find anything that might help? No. No. Say, what do you think Lydia Courtney was doing around here? I think she was on her way to see me. Mm-hmm. You see, when she spoke to me at the party, I had the feeling she wanted to talk to me about something that worried her. Yeah. Then she fainted, and when she came to, the time for opening up had passed. Sally Bond was around. Anybody else? No, their escort, Sally's brother Bill, and a fellow named Jay Stanton were among the crowd in the living room. I was introduced to them before I left. I see. Well, we'll check them all, and we'll begin with Sally Bond. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
You don't seem very surprised to learn of your friend's death, Miss Bunn. Well, I, uh... I've already heard about it, Inspector. Oh. Neither the radio nor the papers have broken the story. My... my brother Bill here told me. Oh. Brother Bill told you. Yes. And how did you know, Brother Bill? Well, I'm a special feature writer for the Clarion. I'm doing a series on crime, and I happened to be at a nearby precinct when the flash came in. Uh-huh. Naturally, I rushed over to tell Sally. Naturally. Um, mind if I ask a few questions, Inspector? No, Mike. Go right ahead. And Sally, what time did you and Lydia get home last night? About 12. I thought you were going to keep your eye on her. Well, I, I was upset. I took a sleeping pill and gave one to Lydia. Apparently, she didn't take hers. She she must have slipped out after I fell asleep. I see. Do you know what was bothering her? No. All I can tell you is that for the past three days, ever since Tuesday night, she was just a bundle of nerves. What happened Tuesday night? I don't know. Lydia went out at 8 o'clock. I heard her take her car out of the garage and drive off. When she got back, I couldn't say I... I was asleep. And on Wednesday morning, you noticed something wrong. Yes, Lydia was very jumpy. I asked her where she'd been the night before. She wouldn't tell me. Do you know who might have been with her? No. It wasn't Brother Bill, was it? No, it wasn't. Well, where were you that night? Well, why, why, I, I was over at uh, Jay Stanton's house. We were, we were playing gin till about one o'clock. Then I went home. Oh. Sally, does anyone else live here with you? Well, our handyman, Al Kemper, occupies the room over the garage. Mm, well, perhaps he can tell us when Lydia returned Tuesday night. Will you take us to him, please? Yes, of course. Follow me. Uh, Inspector. Yeah? You mind if I run along? I have to check in early at the office. Okay, but just remember to stay within reach. You understand? Yes, sir. All right, Sally. Let's go. Is this Lydia's car, Sally? Yes, Mr. Dundas. How about calling the handyman? Certainly. Al! Oh, Al! He may still be asleep. Excuse me, I'll run up and get him. Inspector. Yeah? Take a look at the bumper and the front fender. They've both been straightened. And the fender's been painted quite recently. Mm. Inspector! Yes? Al Kemper is gone. Lydia, dead? Hard to believe, Bill. Sally, no? Yes, Jay. Poor kid, the police will probably hound the life out of her. Uh-huh. They were doing a good job of it when I left him. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jay. Yes? I, uh, I wonder if you'd do me a favor. Sure. What is it? Well, it, it, it seems that something happened Tuesday night. I mean, Lydia was out with someone, and that person may be the leading suspect. Well, I told the police that I was playing gin with you till one o'clock. What? They asked me where I was. I couldn't tell them I was just cruising around in my car that night. But, You've Bill... got to back me up, Jay. You've got to. You're putting me on an awful spot, Bill. I know, I know, but I, I, I just said the first thing that popped into my head. Now I've got to stick to it. I don't know. Not only for me, Jay, for Sally. Well... You will? Okay. Thanks, Jay. Thanks a lot. I'll never forget this. Never. Just one thing before you go, Bill. What's that? If I find out you're involved in Lydia's death, I'll hand you over to the police so fast it'll make your head spin. Well, here we are, Inspector. Yeah. Say, this is quite a house Stanton's got, Mike. Looks like it's all glass. Practically. Rather an extreme functional design. Plenty of light and air. Hmm. A regular goldfish bowl. <clears throat> yes? Oh, hello, Dunners. Come in. Thanks. Uh, Stanton, this is Inspector Prevost of the police. How do you do? How are you? I've uh, been rather expecting you. Yeah? How's Bill, that? Bill Bond called me a little while ago. He uh, told me of Lydia's death. Oh, he did, eh? 
I wonder if there's anyone he hasn't told. Well, I was a very close friend of Lydia's, as well as her attorney. I I guess he thought I should know. Uh Uh-huh. Stanton, we've been told by Sally Bond that Lydia had been acting queerly lately. Do you know why? No. We all commented on it, but she wouldn't tell anyone what was bothering her. I see. By the way, Stanton, where were you last Tuesday night? Oh, right here. Bill dropped in early in the evening, and we talked, played cards. He left about, uh, oh, one o'clock. Mm-hmm. Stanton, did Lydia make a will? Yes. Would you like to see it? You mean you have it with you? Well, not exactly. It's in my safe. You see, this is my office as well as my home. Oh, well, you probably remember the contents of the will. Tell me, who benefits by Lydia's death? Well, outside of certain small bequeaths, where the bulk of the estate goes to Sally Bond. <laughs> Hello? Hello, Mike. Inspector Prevost. Oh, what's the idea? I told you I wanted to catch a little shut eye. I'm dead. I know, I know, but listen. Is Sally Bond there? Huh? What is this, a gag? Of course not. After I left you, I decided to talk to that girl again. Well, I went over to her house and she wasn't there. Huh? I thought maybe she'd gone to see you. No. Inspector. Yes? There's a chance she went down to the bookstore she runs, and maybe... Yes? Better drive over here and pick me up. I want to go down there with you. That's funny, Mike. The door to the store is open, and yet nobody's here. Mm. Listen, wait. What was that? Quick, Inspector. The door behind the desk. There, Inspector. On the floor near the table. Sally. Oh, oh, oh. Mr. Dundas, Inspector. Take it easy, kid. Oh, oh, my head. What happened, Sally? I came down to the store. I'd just taken off my hat when I heard a noise in the stockroom. Yes. I opened the door. Someone standing behind it hit me over the head at... Th- that's all I can remember. I see. Probably got in through the rear window. Sally, why did you come down here? Well, on Wednesday, Lydia gave me a sealed envelope. She... She didn't tell me what was in it. All she said was that I should keep it for her down here. hmm If anything happened to her, I was to open it and read what was inside. Then I was to decide what to do. Where did you put it? In the top middle drawer of my desk. Inspector, will you see if it's there? Right. Well, it's gone, Mike. Uh Uh-huh. It would be. Sally, we've been informed that you are virtually the sole heir to Lydia's estate. Oh. You don't seem at all surprised. No, I'm not. You see, several years ago, I happened to save Lydia's life in an automobile accident. Well, Lydia was very grateful. She wanted me to give up my job and come to live with her. Uh Uh-huh. I told her I hated being... Being idle, so she loaned me some money and I bought this store. I I suppose she thought she hadn't done enough for me. and That's why she left me everything. Well, after all, you saved her life. Uh, one other thing. Yes? That burn on your wrist. You said some grease splattered on it. But it would hardly have happened like that. It's in one solid area, not spotted. You're right. On Wednesday morning at breakfast, Lydia was reading the newspaper. Just when I was handing her some coffee, she gave a start and jostled my hand. The coffee spilled on my wrist. Huh? You say she was reading the paper? Yes. Is that paper still in the house? Probably. We usually let them accumulate for a week before throwing them out. Come on, Inspector. I think this is the break we've been waiting for. Here they are, Mr. Dundas. The papers for the past week. Thanks, Sally. Uh, Now, let's see. Thursday, Monday. Here we are. Here we are, Inspector Wednesday. Good. Uh, now to find the page with the darkest and biggest coffee stain. Ah, ah, here it is. Not good to startle her. The United Nations and Special Session, Dry Goods Convention, Urge... Oh, this must be the one. 
Girl missing. Oh, what does it say, Mike? Mrs. Thomas Kaysen of 624A Flyshacker Avenue reported to the Bureau of Missing Persons that her niece, Margie, 14, left home last night and is missing. The girl left her house at about half past ten following a dispute with her aunt. A search has been instituted by the authorities. There's a picture, too, Margie Kaysen. Yeah, yeah, the missing Margie. But what do you think... Uh... Oh, wait a minute, Inspector. I've just had a brainstorm. Huh? That ballad Lydia quoted, it just came to me. It goes, Many a one for him shall moan, but none shall know where he is gone. Over his white bones when they are bare, the wind shall blow forevermore. Well, does, does that mean anything to you, Mike? You bet it does. It means that Margie's aunt is going to have two unexpected visitors. Come on, Inspector. Why don't you two guys beat it? Go on, let me alone. But, Mrs. Kaysen, we want to talk to you about your missing niece, Margie. Margie? She ain't missing. Go on, get out of here. I don't think she knows what she's talking about, Mike. Uh, maybe she does, and maybe... Wait a minute. Get a load of the stock of liquor on that table. Yeah. Scotch, rye, bourbon... That stuff must have cost a small fortune. Uh Uh-huh. And where did she get the money for it? This place makes tobacco road look like the Waldorf. Inspector. Yeah? Take a look at that purse she's holding. It's just bulging. Yeah. Mrs. Kaysan, may I look at your pocketbook? No. I shall let you look at it. Because I want to look inside. Hey, give me that purse! Uh, I thought so. It's stuffed with bills and big ones at that. Must be about a thousand dollars here. Yeah, that's right. Okay, Mrs. Kaysan, where'd you get it? Come on, come on, talk. Um, someone sent it to me. Who? I don't know. It came in the mail Thursday with a letter. Have you still got the letter? No, I tore it up and threw it away. Do you remember what the letter said? Yeah. It said I shouldn't worry about my niece. And if I didn't ask questions, I could keep the money. Oh, so you were smeared with some dough and you called off the search, huh? So what? The kid was nothing but a little tramp anyway. Why, you dirty... Easy, easy, Inspector. Miss Kaysen... What do you think Margie was going when she ran away? Uh, probably to her friend Betty's. It's where she always went when we had a fight. I see. And she never reached her friend's house, did she? No. Where does Betty live? Uh, over at 2142 Wawona Avenue, near the beach. Oh. There's a vacant sand lot on that block. Inspector, we've got a job to do. A job of digging. <laughs> They got a lot of men here, Mike, but they haven't found anything so far. Keep the at it, Inspector. I'm sure... Th- What's the matter? A bit of luck, I think. Look at that mongrel dog over at the corner. Yeah. He's digging in the sand like mad. Uh-huh. Come on. Right. Why, the mutt's run away, Mike. Uh, that's okay. I, I got my eye on where he was digging. Uh, here it is. You see the hole? Uh Uh-huh. Okay, give me your shovel. Right, here you are. Thanks. Now, pray. (coughs) Maybe it was only a bone the mutt was after. Uh, Maybe. Do you... Do you want me to take over, Mike? No. Guess I can... Inspector, look. Good Lord. Ah, the poor kid. Under the sand. Over her white bones when they are bare, the wind shall blow forevermore. Did you get the coroner's report on Margie, Inspector? Yeah, Mike, it was just as you figured. The kid was dead before she was buried. Uh Uh-huh. That's fairly easy now to reconstruct what happened. It is? Not for me. The only conclusion which fits all the facts is that Lydia's car hit Margie and killed her. Terrified, Lydia and whoever was with her... Buried the body in the sand. Why? After all, it certainly wasn't deliberate. It wasn't murder. True. But a conviction on at least a reckless driving charge is fairly probable. Okay, go on. Well, Lydia couldn't stand what she'd done. That's why she gave that sealed envelope to Sally. Probably contained a full account of what happened. Kind of a confession to lighten her guilt, huh? Yes. By the way, how did the killer know about it? Probably through Lydia herself. Lydia? Yes. She must have tried to forestall her murder by threatening the killer with disclosure by means of the envelope. But the killer was desperate and made sure Lydia would never talk. Exactly. 
Excuse me just a minute. Hello? Inspector Prevost speaking. What? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He has, eh? Why, of course. Certainly, certainly. Bring him down right away. Mike, a couple of the boys just picked up the handyman, Al Kemper. They did? Yeah, and get this. One of the men recognized him as an old con with a record as long as your arm. All right, Kemper, come on. Now, stop stalling. Why did you run away? Well, uh, early this morning when Miss Barnes' brother came to see her, I was out in the yard near the kitchen. Yeah? The window was open, and I heard him tell his sister about Miss Courtney being dead. I figured me with my record, it wasn't healthy to stick around. You're lying. I'm not, I tell you. You are. Just, uh, just a minute, Inspector. Kemper, where were you last Tuesday night? Well, I was in a neighborhood bar until about 11.30, and then I beat it home and hit the hay. Did you hear Miss Courtney come home? Yeah. When she drove in, she woke me up. Was there anyone with her? Yeah. Who was it? Well, I don't know. I heard Miss Courtney's voice, but whoever was with her was whispering. Did you hear what they said? Well, not much of it. Miss Courtney was scared. She kept saying something was all wrong. The other person kept telling her she had to keep her mouth shut about it. Anything else? No. Wait, 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 wait. There was just one other thing. Yes? The other person said something kind of funny. Let me see. Uh, yeah, yeah. I could never stand it. Never. I'd go insane in a month. That's just what was said. Oh, not very much to go on, is there, Mike? On the contrary, Inspector. I think it's the key to the whole case. The key? Yes. Get Sally Stanton and Bill down here right away. What for? I'm going to trap the murderer. Why did you call us down here? Okay, okay, quiet, please, quiet. All right, Mike. Thanks, Inspector. I called you all down here because there's been a new development in the case, and I'll need your help. Now... Will you follow me, please? Oh, oh, sure. I don't see any sense. Where are we going? Upstairs, Brother Bill. Hurry up. Come on. Get in the elevator. Okay. That's eh, a tight squeeze, but I think we can make it. There we are. All right, Inspector. Close the door and take us up. Right. You all right, Sally? Uh, yes, Jay. Oh, what's the matter, Inspector? I don't know, Mike. Hmm, funny. We we seem to be stuck. That's a fine how do you do between floors, too. Keep your shirt on, Brother Bill. Huh. That's funny. It won't start. Now, don't worry, folks. We'll probably get going in a minute. I, uh... I'd like to get out. Yeah, how about it? I said I'd like to get out, please. I can't stay in here. I can't. Please. You don't understand. You don't understand! I'm afraid I do, Stanton. You <laughs> murdered Lydia, didn't you? Yes. Yes. I killed her. I killed her. I killed her. All right, Inspector. You can take us down now. <laughs> You missed me, didn't you, Mahitabo? Mike, will you put that darn cat down? <laughs> relax, Inspector, relax. Relax, he says. Don't you think it's time that you answered a few questions? Uh, okay. Uh, excuse me, Mahitabo. What do you want to know, Inspector? How did you figure out Jay Stanton's claustrophobia? His fear of being hemmed in? Well, first of all, when we visited Stanton, his house seemed strange. It was almost all glass. You yourself called it a goldfish bowl. Yeah, that's right, so I did. Then he had his office in his home, knocked in a building where he'd have to take an elevator every day. Uh-huh. Well, of course, at the time we saw him, it didn't mean too much. It was just odd. Yeah, but when were you sure? When Kemper told us what he'd overheard. As you recall, the person with Lydia said, I could never stand it. Never. I'd go insane in a month. Yes, but how could you know what he referred to? Well, obviously, Lydia and Stanton were talking of what they had done to Margie. The only way Stanton could terrify her into silence was by pointing out a probable jail sentence if they were caught. Uh -huh. Thus, what Stanton said could only refer to what jail would mean to him. He would go insane because of his claustrophobia. 
I see. And when you tied that up to his glass house, having his office there, you had him all wrapped up. Yes. Oh, what's, what's the matter, my head of all? Ah, rubbing your whiskers again, huh? <laughs> you Casanova. Now, well, I'll let you out. Mike, will you stop bothering with that cat? Sorry, Inspector. There are some things which are much more important than crime. <laughs> And so closes tonight's Crime Club book, Epitaph for Lydia, based on a story by Virginia Rath. James Erthine did the radio adaptation, Roger Bauer produced and directed. Sidney Smith played Mike, Jack McBride was the inspector, Julie Stevens was Sally, Ted Osborne was heard as Jay, Mason Adams was Bill, Bryna Rayburn was Lydia, and Brad Barker was Mehita Bell, the... Uh, oh, I beg your pardon. Hello? I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the exciting story of a crown that rested easily on the head of death. It's called The Corpse Wore a Wig by George Bagby. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there is a new Crime Club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. <laughs> This program came from New York. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Murder on margin? Yes, we have that crime club story for you. Come right over. <laughs> Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The book is on this shelf. Here it is, Murder on Margin, by Robert George Dean. The very intriguing story of the stocks of passion and the bonds of death. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It is late evening in a room of a shabby hotel in Midtown Manhattan. A trim, slick-haired man is eyeing the blonde girl sitting near him on the sofa. He watches her carefully as she pours herself a drink. You're hitting the bottle tonight, ain't you, Joan? That's the fourth one you've had. So what? Nothing. Only when you start guzzling like that, it's a cinch something's eaten. I told you I was tired. Okay, baby, okay. Come here. Oh, please, Nick, don't. Yeah, you are tired, ain't you? Well, what do you expect? You know better than anyone else what a day I put in. <laughs> You've had tougher days. Maybe I have. Maybe I'm just getting sick of being a manicurist. Well, I can't blame you for that. I'm not crazy about being a barber, either. Joan. What? Maybe you'll be able to quit your job soon. How? You know Larry Carson, don't you? Who? Larry Carson, the stockbroker. You know, the guy in the brokerage house a couple of doors from my shop. Oh, Oh, yeah, I, uh, I think I've done his nails. Sure, sure, you have lots of times. Well? He's a smart trader. Knows the market inside out. Mm-hmm. Well, he's been giving some tips to Tony who cuts his hair. And Tony's made himself quite a bundle. So what? So I've been talking to Tony, and he's going to pass them tips on to me. Oh. I'm going to start right away. Uh, just as soon as Carson gets back. Gets back? Yeah. 
He told Tony today he was leaving town on a business trip. But he won't be gone long. What's the matter? Oh, uh... Oh, nothing. I, I, I think it's a swell idea, Nick. You bet it is. Pretty soon I'll have some real dough and then... Ah, uh, come here, baby. Don't, Nick. Ah, uh, just a little kiss, honey. Don't. Uh, hey, you act like I'm poison or something. I said come here. And I said let go of my wrist. Let go. Hey. <clears throat> you got a bracelet on under your sleeve. You're crazy. Am I? Come on, let me see it. No. Let me see it. Oh, oh, my arm. Oh. Just a minute, sweetheart. <clears throat> okay. Give me back that bracelet. Shut up. Diamonds, huh? Are you dirty two time in life? <gasps> who's the guy? I asked you, who's the guy? Larry Carson gave it to me. Carson? Yeah, it, it doesn't mean anything, Nick. I swear, I, I've been playing him for a sucker, that's all. Playing him for a sucker? Yeah, just, just getting all I could out of him for the two of us. <laughs> no, Nick, don't! For the two of us, huh? Come on, get up. Get up, I said. Joan. Joan. Oh. Uh -huh. Are you... Are you all right? Get out. Get out! Okay. I'm going. So long, sweetheart. <laughs> Larry. Yes, Ruth? It's rather late. I'm quite aware of that. Well, you mentioned that you wanted to turn in early. Still the dutiful wife, eh? Well, I have some market reports I want to study. Oh. Answer that, will you? Hello? Oh. Yes, just a minute. It's for you, Larry. For me? Yes. Hello? Hello, Larry. This is Joan Randall. I thought I told you never to call this number. I know what you told me, but I had to talk to you. Tried the other place and couldn't get you. I see. All right, what do you want? I, um, I heard you were taking a little trip tomorrow. Yes? I thought we had a date. Sorry, I meant to call you about that before I left. Oh, you meant to, huh? Yes, it came up suddenly. It's just a routine business trip. I'll be back in a few days. I don't like it. Oh, don't be silly. I'm not. I've had the feeling for some time now that you wanted to brush me off. What? I what? want to warn you, Larry. Don't do it. I shall do whatever I please. Yeah? Well, get this through your head, Mr. Carson. You'll pay off or else. Hello? Did you hear me? I said you'll... This one didn't like it either, did she? She'll learn. It's convenient to have a wife, isn't it, Larry? It must sound convincing when you tell them I won't give you a divorce. Yes, I guess it does. Larry, when are you going to set me free? Soon. You've been saying that for months now. Carl and I want to be married, and I want a clean start. That's why I haven't begun any action myself. Yes? We don't want to wait any longer. I want a divorce now. Very moving appeal, my dear. But I confess I don't understand it. You and Carl Hamill? Why, he's strictly a lightweight. Is he? Then why did you ask him to be a partner in your firm? Well, it's quite simple, Ruth. I needed some money. Now I'm sorry I took him in. So is Carl. I don't doubt it. Larry. Hmm? I heard you mention something about a... a business trip. Well? If you were to stay away a long time, it would delay my divorce. Hmm. That's quite an idea. Yes. I've got another idea, too, Larry. Oh? What is it? I'm afraid I'd better keep this one to myself. Oh, Mr. Hamill. Oh, good morning, sir. <clears throat> Can I help you? Well, yes, at least I hope so. I'd like to see Mr. Carson. Well, Mr. Carson is a very busy man. Oh, I know, Mr. Hamill. I've been waiting here outside his office since quarter to ten, and now it's twenty after. Oh, I see. Well, I was just going in to see Mr. Carson myself. I'll tell him that you're here. Oh, thank you. Oh, by the way, what's your name? Uh, Pat Barton. Pat Barton? The private detective? Oh, yes. I, I want to consult him about some stocks. Oh. 
I'll, uh, I'll be right back. Okay. Well, I beg your pardon, sir. Do you mind if I glance at the ticker? No. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Commercial Solutions, 31 and a half. Say, that looks like a pretty good start, doesn't it? Uh-huh. Yes, sir. Might go up to 32. Uh, yes, Larry, I will. Oh, is that last order 29 and a quarter? Right. Oh, Mr. Barton. Yes, Mr. Hamill. I told Mr. Carson you were waiting. He'll see you in 15 minutes. Oh, thank you. Uh, meanwhile, I'll just keep my eye on the ticker. Fine. See you later. Right. Uh, let's see. Salt preferred, 20 and a quarter. Elias. All right, Mr. Barton. I think we can go in now. Okay, Mr. Hamill. Oh, Larry, this is... Well, that's funny. He isn't here. You're wrong, Mr. Hamill. Look, on the floor near the desk. Good Lord. Someone put a rope around his neck and pulled it tight. Very tight. I swear I don't know how you do it, Pat, but every time there's a murder, you're right in the middle of it. Well, I'm sorry, Lieutenant Riley. It, it just happens. I don't arrange them. No, huh? Well, the way you solve them sometimes makes me wonder. Okay, forget it. Let's take another look at the late Mr. Carson. Okay. Uh, let's see here. After he was strangled, he must have slipped to the floor. Mm-hmm. But that would hardly account for his must-up appearance, though. What do you mean? Well, his shirt is half out, and his belt is twisted. Do you think that maybe he was just a sloppy dresser? No, Lieutenant. You can see his suit was obviously just pressed. And look at the shine on his shoes. Uh-huh. I think the killer must have searched him. For what? His wallet was still on him and nothing was missing from it. Yes, but there wasn't much money in it. Uh, uh, did the medical examiner give you the time of death? Yeah, probably between 10.15 and 10.30. Mm -hmm. mm. I suppose that tells you who the murderer is, sir. Well, not quite, Lieutenant, but it helps. Yeah, a lot. What gets me is how the killer got in and out. Now, there's Carson's private entrance leading to the hallway into the street, and that's locked. Uh-huh. And now, this door here to the main office, through which you entered. Now, you say that you were sitting right next to it from a quarter to ten on? Yes, and the only yeah. one who entered was Carl Hamill. Uh, I think I'll have a little talk with that guy. Mr. Uh, Hamill? Yes, Lieutenant. Would you mind stepping in here? Not at all. Mr. Hamill? According to Mr. Barton here, you were the only one to enter this office. Yes. And that was about 20 after 10, a time when Carson might have been killed. Now, what do you mean, you? You know that he was alive when I left the office. Do we? Well, of course, Mr. Barton. Well, you were sitting right at the door when I came out. You heard me turn around and, and ask him about that last quotation. Yes, I heard you, but I didn't hear him. Huh? Oh, that's right. I remember now. He didn't answer me. He just nodded. Oh, I see. Mr. Hamill, excluding Mr. Carson, who had a key to the private entrance of this office? Well, I... I believe Mrs. Carson had one. Oh, she did, eh? Yes, but surely you don't think that she had anything to do with this. Why, she couldn't... Take it easy, Mr. Hamill. Pat. Yes, Lieutenant? One of my men reported that in the hallway leading from Carson's private entrance to the street is a door of a private club. Oh. Yeah. Now, there's a doorman posted at that door from 9 o'clock on. He'll be able to tell us just who entered this office by way of that pi private entrance. Oh, good. Well, I get... Yeah, what's that? What is that? Supply closet, Lieutenant. Let me out. Oh, there she is, behind the filing cabinet. Oh. Hey, give me a hand, will you? I... I can't seem to get out of here by myself. All right, all right. We'll just get this cabinet out of the way a bit. There, there we are. Okay, come on out. Yeah, sure. Why, Miss Randall. You you know this girl, Mr. Hamill? Why, yeah, she's the manicurist at a barber shop a few doors down the street. Oh, okay, Miss Randall, talk. Huh? 
she seems to be pretty uh, drunk, Lieutenant. Yeah. What were you doing in that closet, sister? Who wants to know? I'm Lieutenant Riley of the police. Police? Yes. Take a look at the floor near the desk. Oh. Larry's dead, huh? Uh Uh-huh. You ought to know. Me? I didn't do it. No? How'd you get in here? I had a key. Larry gave it to me. Oh. The louse was going to run out on me. I wanted to have a little talk with him. Uh Uh-huh. And I got here early, before nine. Didn't want anybody to spot me coming in. I hid behind the cabinet in the closet. How come you're so boiled? Well, I knew it would be a long wait, so I took a flask along. I, I was nervous. And before I knew it, the flask was empty. And then I passed out. Uh-huh. Miss Randall, there's a keyhole in that closet door. Did you see or hear anything that might help us? No, not a thing. I see, I see, I see. Okay, sister. I'm going to send you home to sober up. But don't get any idea that you're out of this mess. I'm going to check on you all the way. Pat? Yes, Lieutenant? Get your hat. We'll start checking with the barber shop where she works. <laughs> Were you Carson's barber, Nick? No, Lieutenant. Uh, Tony took care of him. Oh, well, where, where is this Tony? Well, it's been raining all morning, and we were slow, and Tony and the others ducked out. They're probably chewing the fat in a cafeteria down the street. Uh-huh. You got a manicurist named Joan Randall? Uh, yeah. Sh- she didn't show up this morning. I don't think she'll be in today, Nick. Huh? Well, well, what do you mean, Mr. Barton? Why are you so nervous? Well, the... Uh, Joan and me, we've been kind of going around together, and if anything's happened to her... Well, nothing's happened to her yet. But she's in quite a spot. You see, we found her in Mr. Carson's closet. Yeah? She was pickled, Nick. Now, was that a habit of hers? Well, uh, when she's worried, uh, she likes a couple of shots. Uh Uh-huh. Nick, it seems that Joan and Mr. Carson were quite friendly... Did you know that? Yeah, yeah, it didn't mean anything. He had a lot of dough and, uh, well, you know, you know how it is. Yes, we know. You, you don't think she killed Carson, do you? We're not sure, Nick. But if you ask me, you're going to need a new manicurist. For me, Lieutenant, it is unbelievable. I simply refuse to believe it. I know, Sergeant, I know. But Carson's dead, and you've got to help us. Huh? Me help you? How? What time were you at your post this morning? What time? Why, nine o'clock. In all my 23 years as doorman to this club, I arrive at nine sharp. Not before, not later. Uh Uh-huh. And from your post, you can see anyone who enters the hallway to go to Mr. Carson's office. Absolutely. Sasha, do you know Joan Randall, the manicurist from the barber shop around the corner? You mean the blonde barishki? Sure, I know her. Did you see her enter the hallway this morning? No. Are you sure? Absolutely. Uh, she must have got here before nine, like she said. Did you see anyone else, Sasha? Yes. Just one person. Who was it? It was Mrs. Carson. Mrs. Carson, eh? What time was that? About a uh, quarter after... Uh, no. Twenty after ten. And she went down the hallway to Mr. Carson's office? Yes. Did you see her go in? No. The hallway turns to the left. You can't see the door. He's right, Lieutenant. Okay, okay. Now, I want you to be very careful about this next one, Sasha. When did she come out? I don't know. Uh Huh? You see, a little while after she came in, I had to call a cab for a member. Yeah? I was outside for a couple of minutes. In other words, she could have slipped out during that time. Correct. Oh, Sasha, would it have been possible for anyone else to have entered while you were outside? No, this could not happen. When I went out, I looked up and down the street. There was nobody near enough to sleep in. Oh, I see. Well, Lieutenant, what's next on the menu? The blue plate special, Mrs. Carson. Mrs. Carson, do you have any idea who might have murdered your husband? No, Lieutenant. I have. Yes? Who? You, Mrs. Carson. Me? Yes. Why, that's absurd. Utterly absurd. For your information, you were seen going down the hallway to your husband's office. What 
Oh, come, Mrs. Carson. The identification was positive. You were there, weren't you? Yes, Mr. Barton. But I didn't see Larry. Huh? Well, what do you mean? Well, I... I went up to the door of the office, and then I stopped. Why? The transom was open. I, I heard Carl, uh, Mr. Hamill, talking to Larry. I lost my nerve and left. What do you mean, you lost your nerve? Well, I guess I'd better tell you the whole story. Yes, I guess you'd better. I'd wanted a divorce from Larry for some time. Without going into it, I can assure you I had very good reasons. Yes, we met one of them. Hmm? Never mind, Mrs. Carson. Go on, please. Well, I... I met Carl Hamill, my husband's partner. We fell in love. I told Larry about it and asked him for a divorce so that Carl and I could be married. Mm-hmm. Larry kept putting me off. Then last night I learned that he was taking a, a trip out of town. He said he'd be gone for only a short time. Yes? I had the feeling that he was up to something. You see, he was very spiteful. I felt that he was going to stay away to delay my divorce. I made up my mind that he wasn't going to get away with it. Uh-huh. This morning, I set out for his office for a showdown. I... I took a gun along. A gun, huh? Yes, but when I stood outside Larry's door and... and heard Carl's voice, I... I realized how foolish I'd been. I knew that I, I could never kill Larry. Uh-huh. So I, I turned around and went home. Mrs. Carson, did you hear what Mr. Hamill and your husband were talking about? Uh, uh, yes. They, uh, they were discussing some stock quotations. Did Hamill mention the quotation on murder? What do you mean? You don't think that Carl... Oh, no. He didn't kill Larry. Of course not. He didn't. You didn't. Nobody did. Only the guy is dead and the commissioner wants to know why. Hello? Hello, Ruth. Oh, Carl. I was hoping that you'd call. You, uh, you heard about Larry? Yes. The police have just left. Oh. Carl, I'm afraid we're in trouble. What's the matter? I did something terribly foolish. I, I went to Larry's office this morning. What? But why did you... Wait, I I didn't see him. When I got to the door, I heard you talking to him. Oh. I, I heard you quarreling. Did you... Did you tell the police about it? No. No, I told them you were discussing stock quotations. Carl, is, is there anything you want to tell me? Ruth, you... You don't think I killed him, do you? No. But, darling, you sound as if... I love you, Carl. No matter what happened, remember that. I love you. Good evening, Lieutenant. I made it as fast as I could. What's up? I've got some more pieces for our puzzle. You have? Yes. Do you remember when we examined the corpse, you thought the killer had searched him? Yes. Yeah, you were right. And whoever it was made off with a hundred grand. What? I had a man go over the books at Carson's. There was a hundred thousand missing from the credit balances. Mm -hmm. Now, it looks like Carson was going to take it on the lamb, you see? And he figured on traveling light to throw everyone off guard. Yes, probably just an overnight bag and the money. From the appearance of his disarranged clothing, I'd say he had the cash in a money belt. Uh-huh. Did you speak to Hamill about this? Yes. Yes, and he was quite upset. Not only over the loss of the dough, he said. He was worried about the effect on the firm's business. Mm. Well, is, is there any way to trace that money? No, and I haven't got the ghost of an idea. Who can I... Wait a minute. Hmm? Joan Randall. I've had the feeling that dame was holding something back. You think she took it? Either that or she knows who did. Come on, Pat. Let's get to her before she puts away another quart. Maybe she's out, Lieutenant. Yeah, Pat, but not the way you mean. She's probably hit that bottle again. Oh, there's no use. The door's locked. I have a key, Lieutenant. Huh? 
a key that opens a lot of doors. Oh, well, go ahead. Make believe I'm not looking. Okay. There we are. Now, let's see. The light switch ought to be... There, here it is. Well, I, I don't smell any liquor, so maybe... Holy smoke. She really is out. Look, for good. Yes, whoever stabbed her wasn't kidding. She must have been lying on the bed. Well, that's odd. What is? Well, apparently, after she was stabbed, she still had enough strength to reach down and clutch one of her shoes from under the bed. Yeah, she probably rolled over and held on to whatever came into her hand. No, Lieutenant. Shoes are usually placed together on the floor. And from the position of the one still there, she would have had to strain to get the shoe she's holding. Uh, yeah, well, why do you think she grabbed it, Pat? I think it was an attempt to tell us who murdered her. Oh, well, it's a woman's shoe. And the only other woman in the case is Mrs. Carson. Mm. Or maybe... Yeah. Yeah. While I was talking to Hamlin about that money, he told me he used to be a, a shoe manufacturer. What? Yeah. Well, I guess that does it. Uh, I'm not sure. Huh? There's something that keeps buzzing at the back of my mind. Something that... I... Why, of course. Larry Carson's shoes. Larry Carson's shoes? Yes. Now, there's just one thing we ought to check, Lieutenant. And then I think you'll be able to wrap this case up. Better keep back out of sight, Lieutenant. Okay, Pat. I just wanted to make sure that Sasha is still sitting on that park bench. Oh, don't worry. I've got my eye on him every second. Are you certain your plan will work? I don't see how it can miss. A half hour ago, Sasha telephoned the killer. His message will force the murderer to meet Sasha here in the park. I see. Then you expect another knife and job, huh? Right. And we'll have to be on our toes to prevent it. Wait, Lieutenant. I think we're getting a bite. Hello, my friend. I was beginning to think you weren't coming. I thought maybe... Help! Get him, Lieutenant! Get him! Stop or I shoot! Good shot, Lieutenant! Are you all right, Sasha? Yes, Mr. Bart. Good. Is he alive, Lieutenant? Yeah, the bullet just creased his scalp. Oh, I... Okay, Nick, come on, come on. Up on your feet. As a barber, you usually stand behind a chair. Well, now, we're going to let you sit in one. Did Nick reveal where he hid the money, Lieutenant? Yes, it was under the floor in his room. Oh, good. Hmm. It's nice of you to give me a lift home, Lieutenant. Ah, that's all right, Pat. You deserve it. And Sasha, too. Ah, it was nothing. Nothing at all. Only don't ever ask me to do it again. <laughs> don't worry, we won't. Say, Pat, how did you tumble to Nick anyway? Uh, well, there was the fact of the shoes, Carson's and Jones. Uh-huh. Carson's shoes were shined, and that was peculiar. Why? Well, since it rained all morning, his shoes should have been spotted. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But I failed to see the importance of that fact until Joan was killed. She died in the act of reaching for her shoe. Uh-huh. And then it hit me. Someone had shined Carson's shoes. Obviously, he wouldn't have done it himself. So, the only other possibility was a shoeshine man. Yeah, but where in the world... Well, since there was no shoeshine man involved in this case, I turned to the only person who could have impersonated one. Nick the barber. Exactly. Oh. He was alone in his shop. Not only the barbers were gone, but also the shoeshine man. I see. So, Nick dressed up in the dark apron, carried the box, and got by. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How did he get into the Carson's office without Sasha seeing him? Well, you know, Lieutenant, there are some men who are invisible. Invisible? Yes. That is, they're taken for granted. Nobody observes them. Like a, well, a mailman, for instance. Oh. Well, a shoeshine man visiting the offices in a business building is exactly the same. You pay no attention to him, so he loses his identity. I see. Of course, when I brought the point up with Sasha, he remembered. Oh, what did you say, Sasha? Never again. For the rest of my life will I get a shoe shine. A 
program so closes tonight's crime club book, Murder on Margin, based on a story by Robert George Dean. James Erthine did the radio adaptation, Roger Bauer produced, and Jock McGregor directed. Jack McBride played Lieutenant Riley, Julie Stevens was Joan, Helen Shields was Ruth Carson, Danny Ocko played Sasha, Barry Thompson was Pat, Joe DeSantis was Nick, and Sherling Oliver was heard as Carl Hamill. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello? I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very exciting story of a package that was wrapped up by death. It's called Murder Make Some Mummy. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there is a new crime club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. This program came from New York. This is the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System. haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Murder on margin? Yes, we have that crime club story for you. Come right over. chair by the window. Comfortable? The book is on this shelf. Here it is, Murder on Margin, by Robert George Dean. The very intriguing story of the stocks of passion and the bonds of death. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It is late evening in a room of a shabby hotel in Midtown Manhattan. A trim, slick-haired man is eyeing the blonde girl sitting near him on the sofa. He watches her carefully as she pours herself a drink. You're hitting the bottle tonight, ain't you, Joan? That's the fourth one you've had. So what? Nothing. Only when you start guzzling like that, it's a cinch something's eaten. I told you I was tired. Okay, baby, okay. Come in. Oh, please, Nick, don't. Yeah, you are tired, ain't you? Well, what do you expect? You know better than anyone else what a day I put in. (laughs) You've had tougher days. Maybe I have. Maybe I'm just getting sick of being a manicurist. Well, I can't blame you for that. I'm not crazy about being a barber, either. Joan. What? Maybe you'll be able to quit your job soon. How? You know Larry Carson, don't you? Who? Larry Carson, the stockbroker. You know, the guy in the brokerage house a couple of doors from us, huh? Oh. Oh, yeah, I, uh, I think I've done his nails. Sure, sure, you have lots of times. Well? He's a smart trader. Knows the market inside out. Mm-hmm. Well, he's been giving some tips to Tony who cuts his hair. And Tony's made himself quite a bundle. So what? So I've been talking to Tony, and he's going to pass them tips on to me. Oh. I'm going to start right away. Uh, just as soon as Carson gets back. Gets back? Yeah. He told Tony today he was leaving town on a business trip. But he won't be gone long. What's the matter? Oh, uh... Oh, nothing. I, I, I think it's a swell idea, Nick. You bet it is. Pretty soon I'll have some real dough, and then... Uh, Come here, baby. Don't, Nick. Uh, just a little kiss, honey. Don't. Uh, hey, you act like I'm poison or something. I said, come here. And I said, let go of my wrist. Let go. Hey. You got a bracelet on under your sleeve. You're crazy. Am I? Come on, let me see it. No. Let me see it. Oh, my oh. Just a minute, sweetheart. Okay. Give me back that bracelet. Shut up. Diamonds, huh? Are you dirty, two-time in love? <gasps> Who's the guy? 
I asked you, who's the guy? Larry Carson gave it to me. Carson? Yeah, it, it doesn't mean anything, Nick. I swear, I, I've been playing him for a sucker, that's all. Playing him for a sucker? Yeah, just just getting all I could out of him for the two of us. <laughs> no, Nick, <they> don't! <laughs> for the two of us, huh? Come on, get up. Get up, I said. Joan. Joan. Oh, all right. Are you... Are you all right? Get out. Get out! Okay. I'm going. So long, sweetheart. Larry. Yes, Ruth? It's rather late. I'm quite aware of that. Well, you mentioned that you wanted to turn in early. Still the dutiful wife, eh? Well, I have some market reports I want to study. Oh. Answer that, will you? Hello? Oh. Yes, just a minute. It's for you, Larry. For me? Yes. Hello? Hello, Larry. This is Joan Randall. I thought I told you never to call this number. I know what you told me, but I had to talk to you. Tried the other place and couldn't get you. I see. All right, what do you want? I, um, I heard you were taking a little trip tomorrow. Yes? I thought we had a date. Sorry, I meant to call you about that before I left. Oh, you meant to, huh? Yes, it came up suddenly. It's just a routine business trip. I'll be back in a few days. I don't like it. Oh, don't be silly. I'm not. I've had the feeling for some time now that you wanted to brush me off. What? I want to warn you, Larry. Don't do it. I shall do whatever I please. Yeah? Well, get this through your head, Mr. Carson. You'll pay off or else. Hello? Did you hear me? I said you'll... This one didn't like it either, did she? She'll learn. It's convenient to have a wife, isn't it, Larry? It must sound convincing when you tell them I won't give you a divorce. Yes, I guess it does. Larry, when are you going to set me free? Soon. You've been saying that for months now. Carl and I want to be married. And I want a clean start. That's why I haven't begun any action myself. Yes? We don't want to wait any longer. I want a divorce now. Very moving appeal, my dear. But I confess I don't understand it. You and Carl Hamill. Why, he's strictly a lightweight. Is he? Then why did you ask him to be a partner in your firm? Well, it's quite simple, Ruth. I needed some money. No, I'm sorry I took him in. So is Carl. I don't doubt it. Larry. Hmm? I heard you mention something about a... a business trip. Well? If you were to stay away a long time, it would delay my divorce. Hmm. That's quite an idea. Yes. I've got another idea, too, Larry. Oh? What is it? I'm afraid I'd better keep this one. To myself. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Hamill. Oh, good morning, sir. Can I help you? Well, yes, at least I hope so. I'd like to see Mr. Carson. Well, Mr. Carson is a very busy man. Oh, I know, Mr. Hamill. I've been waiting here outside his office since quarter to ten, and now it's twenty after. Oh, I see. Well, I was just going in to see Mr. Carson myself. I'll tell him that you're here. Oh, thank you. Oh, by the way, what's your name? Uh, Pat Barton. Pat Barton? The private detective? Oh, yes. I, I want to consult him. Oh, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll be right back. Okay. Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. Do you mind if I glance at the ticker? No. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Commercial Solutions, 31 and a half. Say, that looks like a pretty good stock, doesn't it? Uh-huh. Yes, sir. Might go up to 32. Uh, yes, Larry, I will. Oh, was that last order 29 and a quarter? Right. Oh, Mr. Barton. Yes, Mr. Hamill. I told Mr. Carson you were waiting. He'll see you in 15 minutes. Oh, thank you. Uh, meanwhile, I'll just keep my eye on the ticker. Fine. See you later. Right. Uh, let's see. Salt preferred, 20 and a quarter. Alas. Oh, 
All right, Mr. Barton. I think we can go in now. Okay, Mr. Hell. Oh, Larry, this is... Well, that's funny. He isn't here. You're wrong, Mr. Hamill. Look, on the floor near the desk. Good Lord. Someone put a rope around his neck and pulled it tight. Very tight. I swear I don't know how you do it, Pat, but every time there's a murder, you're right in the middle of it. Lieutenant Riley, it just happens. The way you solve them sometimes makes me wonder. Okay, forget it. Let's take another look at the late Mr. Carson. Okay. Uh, let's see. After he was strangled, he must have slipped to the floor. Mm-hmm. But that would hardly account for his must-up appearance, though. What do you mean? Well, his shirt is half out, and his belt is twisted. Do you think that maybe he was just a sloppy dresser? No, Lieutenant. You can see his suit was obviously just pressed. And look at the shine on his shoes. Uh-huh. I think the killer must have searched him. For what? His wallet was still on him and nothing was missing from it. Yes, but there wasn't much money in it. Uh, uh, did the medical examiner give you the time of death? Yeah, probably between 10.15 and 10.30. Uh -huh. mm. I suppose that tells you who the murderer is, sir. Well, not quite, Lieutenant, but it helps. Yeah, a lot. What gets me is how the killer got in and out. Now, there's Carson's private entrance leading to the hallway into the street, and that's locked. Uh-huh. And now, this door here to the main office, through which you entered. Now, you say that you were sitting right next to it from a quarter to ten on? Yes, and the only uh, one who entered was Carl Hamill. Uh, I think I'll have a little talk with that guy. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hamill? Yes, Lieutenant. Would you mind stepping in here? Not at all. Mr. Hamill? According to Mr. Barton here, you were the only one to enter this office. Yes. And that was about 20 after 10, a time when Carson might have been killed. Now, what do you mean, you? You know that he was alive when I left the office. Do we? Well, of course, Mr. Barton. Well, you were sitting right at the door when I came out. You heard me turn around and, and ask him about that last quotation. Yes, I heard you, but I didn't hear him. Huh? Oh, that's right. I remember now. He didn't answer me. He just nodded. Oh, I see. Mr. Hamill, excluding Mr. Carson, who had a key to the private entrance of this office? Well, I... I believe Mrs. Carson had one. Oh, she did, eh? Yes, but surely you don't think that she had anything to do with this. Why, she couldn't... Take I... it easy, Mr. Hamill. Pat. Yes, Lieutenant? One of my men reported that in the hallway leading from Carson's private entrance to the street is a door of a private club. Oh. Yeah. Now, there's a doorman posted at that door from 9 o'clock on. He'll be able to tell us just who entered this office by way of that pi private entrance. Oh, good. Well, I get... It, what's that? What is that? Supply closet, Lieutenant. Let me out. Oh, there she is, behind the filing cabinet. Oh. Hey, give me a hand, will you? I can't seem to get out of here by myself. All right, all right. We'll just get this cabinet out of the way. There, there we are. Okay, come on up. Yeah, sure. Why, Miss Randall. You you know this girl, Mr. Hamill? Why, yeah, she's the manicurist at a barber shop a few doors down the street. Oh, okay, Miss Randall, talk. Huh? Uh, she seems to be pretty uh, drunk, Lieutenant. Yeah. What were you doing in that closet, sister? Who wants to know? I'm Lieutenant Riley of the police. Police? Yes. Take a look at the floor near the desk. Oh, Larry's dead, huh? Uh-huh. You ought to know. Me? I didn't do it. No? How'd you get in here? I had a key. Larry gave it to me. Oh. The louse was going to run out on me. I wanted to have a little talk with him. Uh-huh. And I got here early, before nine. Didn't want anybody to spot me coming in. I hid behind the cabinet in the closet. How come you're so boiled? Well, I knew it would be a long wait, so I took a flask along. I, I was nervous. Before I knew it, the flask was empty. And then I passed out. Uh-huh. Miss Randall, there's a keyhole in that closet door. Did you see or hear anything that might help us? No, not a thing. I see, I see, I see. Okay, sister. I'm going to send you home to sober up. 
But don't get any idea that you're out of this mess. I'm going to check on you all the way. Pat? Yes, Lieutenant. Get your hat. We'll start checking with the barber shop where she works. <laughs> Were you Carson's barber, Nick? No, Lieutenant. Uh, Tony took care of him. Oh, well, where, where is this Tony? Well, it's been raining all morning. We were slow, and Tony and the others ducked out. They're probably chewing the fat in a cafeteria down the street. Uh-huh. You got a manicurist named Joan Randall? Uh, yeah. Sh- she didn't show up this morning. I don't think she'll be in today, Nick. Huh? Well, well, what do you mean, Mr. Barton? Why are you so nervous? Well, well the... Joan and me, we've been kind of going around together, and if anything's happened to her... Well, nothing's happened to her yet. But she's in quite a spot. You see, we found her in Mr. Carson's closet. Yeah? She was pickled, Nick. Now, was that a habit of hers? Well, uh, when she's worried, uh, she likes a couple of shots. Uh Uh-huh. Nick, it seems that Joan and Mr. Carson were quite friendly. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah, it didn't mean anything. He had a lot of dough and... uh... Well, you know, you know how it is. Yes, we know. You you don't think she killed Carson, do you? We're not sure, Nick. But if you ask me, you're going to need a new manicurist. For me, Lieutenant, it is unbelievable. I simply refuse to believe it. I know, Sergeant, I know. But Carson's dead, and you've got to help us. Huh? Me help you? Oh, what time were you at your post this morning? What time? Why, nine o'clock. In all my 23 years as doorman to this club, I arrive at nine sharp. Not before, not later. Uh-huh. And from your post, you can see anyone who enters the hallway to go to Mr. Carson's office. Absolutely. Sasha, do you know Joan Randall, the manicurist from the barbershop around the corner? You mean the blonde barish kid? Sure I know her. Did you see her enter the hallway this morning? No. Are you sure? Absolutely. Mm, She must have got here before nine, like she said. Did you see anyone else, Sasha? Yes. Just one person. Who was it? It was Mrs. Carson. Mrs. Carson, eh? What time was that? About a quarter after... uh, No. Twenty after ten. And she went down the hallway to Mr. Carson's office? Yes. Did you see her go in? No. The hallway turns to the left. You can't see the door. He's right, Lieutenant. Okay, okay. Now, I want you to be very careful about this next one, Sasha. When did she come out? I don't know. Huh? You see, a little while after she came in, I had to call a cab for a member. Yeah? I was outside for a couple of minutes. In other words, she could have slipped out during that time. Correct. Oh. Sasha, would it have been possible for anyone else to have entered while you were outside? No, this could not happen. When I went out, I looked up and down the street. There was nobody near enough to sleep in. Oh, I see. Well, Lieutenant, what's next on the menu? A blue plate special. Mrs. Carson. Mrs. Carson, do you have any idea who might have murdered your husband? No, Lieutenant. I have. Yes, who? You, Mrs. Carson. Me? Yes. Oh, why, that's absurd. Utterly absurd. For your information, you were seen going down the hallway to your husband's office. What? Oh, come, Mrs. Carson. The identification was positive. You were there, weren't you? Yes, Mr. Barton. But I didn't see Larry. Huh? Oh, what do you mean? Well, I... I went up to the door of the office, and then I stopped. Why? The transom was open. I, I heard Carl... Uh, Mr. Hamill, talking to Larry, I lost my nerve and left. What do you mean, you lost your nerve? Well, I guess I'd better tell you the whole story. Yeah, I guess you'd better. I'd wanted a divorce from Larry for some time. Without going into it, I can assure you I had very good reasons. Yes, we met one of them. Hmm? Never mind, Mrs. Carson. Go on, please. Well, I, I met Carl Hamill, my husband's partner. We fell in love. I told Larry about it and asked him for a divorce so that Carl and I could be married. Mm Mm-hmm. Larry kept putting me off. Then last night, I learned that he was taking a a trip out of town. He said he'd be gone for only a short time. Yes? 
I had the feeling that he was up to something. You see, he was very spiteful. I felt that he was going to stay away to the day my divorce. I made up my mind that he wasn't going to get away with it. Uh-huh. This morning, I set out for his office for a showdown. I... I took a gun along. A gun, huh? Yes, but when I stood outside Larry's door and... and heard Carl's voice, I... I realized how foolish I'd been. I knew that I... I could never kill Larry. Uh-huh. I turned around and went home. Mrs. Carson, did you hear what Mr. Hamill and your husband were talking about? Uh, uh, yes. They, uh, they were discussing some stock quotations. Did Hamill mention the quotation on murder? What do you mean? You don't think that Carl... Oh, no. He didn't kill Larry. Of course not. He didn't. You didn't. Nobody did. Only the guy is dead and the commissioner wants to know why. Hello? Hello, Ruth. Oh, Carl. I was hoping that you'd call. You, uh, you heard about Larry? Yes. The police have just left. Oh. Carl, I'm afraid we're in trouble. What? What's the matter? I did something terribly foolish. I, I went to Larry's office this morning. What? But why did you... Wait, I... I didn't see him. When I got to the door, I heard you talking to him. Oh. I, I heard you quarreling. Did you... Did you tell the police about it? No. No, I told them you were discussing stock quotations. Carl, is, is there anything you want to tell me? Ruth, you... You don't think I killed him, do you? No. But, darling, you sound as if... I love you, Carl. No matter what happened, remember that. I love you. Good evening, Lieutenant. I made it as fast as I could. What's up? I've got some more pieces for our puzzle. You have? Yes. Do you remember when we examined the corpse, you thought the killer had searched him? Yes. Yeah, you were right. And whoever it was made off with a hundred grand. What? I had a man go over the books of Carson's. There was a hundred thousand missing from the credit balances. Mm -hmm. Now, it looks like Carson was going to take it on the lamb, you see? And he figured on traveling light to throw everyone off guard. Yes, probably just an overnight bag and the money. From the appearance of his disarranged clothing, I'd say he had the cash in a money belt. Uh-huh. Did you speak to Hamill about this? Yes. Yes, and he was quite upset. Not only over the loss of the dough, he said. He was worried about the effect on the firm's business. Mm. Now, is, is there any way to trace that money? No, and I haven't got the ghost of an idea. Who could have... Wait a minute. Hmm? Joan Randall. I've had the feeling that dame was holding something back. You think she took it? Either that or she knows who did. Come on, Pat. Let's get to her before she puts away another quart. Maybe she's out, Lieutenant. Yeah, Pat, but not the way you mean. She's probably hit that bottle again. Oh, there's no use. The door's locked. I have a key, Lieutenant. Huh? Huh? A key that opens a lot of doors. Oh, well, go ahead. Make believe I'm not looking. Okay. There we are. Now, let's see. The light switch ought to be... Yeah, here. Yeah. Well, I... I don't smell any liquor, so maybe... Holy smoke. She really is out. Look, for good... Yes, whoever stabbed her wasn't kidding. She must have been lying on the bed. Well, that's odd. What is? Well, apparently, after she was stabbed, she still had enough strength to reach down and clutch one of her shoes from under the bed. Yes, yeah, she probably rolled over and held on to whatever came into her hand. No, Lieutenant, shoes are usually placed together on the floor. And from the position of the one still there, she would have had to strain to get the shoe she's holding. Uh, yeah, well, why do you think she grabbed it, Pat? I think it was an attempt to tell us who murdered her. Oh, well, it, it's a woman's shoe. And the only other woman in the case is Mrs. Carson. Mm. Or maybe... Yeah. Yeah, while I was talking to Hamlin about that money, he told me he used to be a, a shoe manufacturer. What? Yeah. 
Well, I guess that does it. Uh, I'm not sure. Huh? There's something that keeps buzzing at the back of my mind. Something that... I... Why, of course. Larry Carson shoes. Larry Carson shoes? Yes. Now, there's just one thing we ought to check, Lieutenant. And then I think you'll be able to wrap this case up. Better keep back out of sight, Lieutenant. Okay, Pat. I just wanted to make sure that Sasha is still sitting on that park bench. Oh, don't worry. I've got... My friend, I was beginning to think you weren't coming. I thought maybe... Help! Get him, Lieutenant. Get him. Stop or I'll shoot. Good shot, Lieutenant. Are you all right, Sasha? Yes, Mr. Bart. Good. Is he alive, Lieutenant? Yeah, the bullet just creased his scalp. Oh. Okay, Nick, come on, come on. Up on your feet. As a barber, you usually stand behind a chair. Well, now we're going to let you sit in one. Did Nick reveal where he hid the money, Lieutenant? Yes, it was under the floor in his room. Oh, good. Hmm. It's nice of you to give me a lift home, Lieutenant. Ah, that's all right, Pat. You deserve it. And Sasha, too. Ah, it was nothing. Nothing at all. Only you don't ever ask me to do it again. <laughs> don't worry. We won't. Say, Pat, how did you tumble to Nick anyway? Uh, well, there was the fact of the shoes, Carson's and Jones. Uh-huh. Carson's shoes were shined. And that was peculiar. Why? Well, since it rained all morning, his shoes should have been spotted. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But I failed to see the importance of that fact until Joan was killed. She died in the act of reaching for her shoe. Uh-huh. And then it hit me. Someone had shined Carson's shoes. Obviously, he wouldn't have done it himself. So, the only other possibility was a shoe shine man. Yeah, but where in the world... Well, since there was no shoe shine man involved in this case, I turned to the only person who could have impersonated one. Nick the barber. Exactly. Oh. He was alone in his shop. Not only the barbers were gone, but also the shoe shine man. I see. So Nick dressed up in the dark apron, carried the box, and got by. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How did he get into the Carson's office without Sasha seeing him? Well, you know, Lieutenant, there are some men who are invisible. Invisible? Yes. That is, they're taken for granted. Nobody observes them. Like a, well, a mailman, for instance. Oh. Well, a shoeshine man visiting the offices in a business building is exactly the same. You pay no attention to him, so he loses his identity. I see. Of course, when I brought the point up with Sasha, he remembered. What did you say, Sasha? Never again. For the rest of my life will I get a shoeshine. And so closes tonight's crime club book, Murder on Margin, based on a story by Robert George Dean. James Erthine did the radio adaptation, Roger Bauer produced, and Jock McGregor directed. Jack McBride played Lieutenant Riley, Julie Stevens was Joan, Helen Shields was Ruth Carson, Danny Ocko played Sasha, Barry Thompson was Pat, Joe DeSantis was Nick, and Sherling Oliver was heard as Carl Hamill. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very exciting story of a package that was wrapped up by death. It's called Murder Make Some Mummy. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there is a new Crime Club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. This program came from New York. This is the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System.
Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Hearses don't hurry. Yes, we have that crime club story for you. Come right over. chair by the window. Comfortable? The book is on this shelf. Here it is. Curses Don't Hurry by Stephen Ransom. The very exciting story of a clean-up campaign that was messed up by murder. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. The city was small and clean and comfortable. Seen from a train window, it looked like many another American city. But something new had been added to this one that could not be seen from a train window. It was Christopher Chance, young special prosecutor, who's been appointed by the governor to investigate corruption in the office of Anthony Pierce, the district attorney. It was early evening when Christopher Chance left the courthouse after a long conference with his friend and political benefactor, Judge Rossiter. Main Street was deserted. And so was the little side street, two blocks away where his office was located. He walked slowly, but as he was about to step into the lobby of the small building, he turned just in time. Kid! Kid! I'm all right, Lee. Oh, I heard shots. Are you sure? You're not hurt? Not a scratch, darling. Oh, thank heavens. I've been so worried about you. There's nothing to worry about. Those gangsters had no intention of killing me. But they shot at you. Ooh, the strategy of terror, Lee, a la Tony Pierce. Let's go upstairs to the office. He'll do anything to make you resign now, won't he? I'm afraid so. Maybe I'm getting a lot closer to his neck than I think. I'd give anything to see this case closed. You don't know what it's doing to me, Kit. <laughs> it hasn't made you less beautiful, sweetheart. <laughs> Don't forget, Mr. Chance. I'm still only your secretary. From nine to five. And from five to nine. You've got a big job to do. Uh, is that why you're still here at seven o'clock? Because you're uh, only my secretary? I was cleaning my typewriter. Mm-hmm. I bought this bottle of cleaning fluid this afternoon, and I thought... Well, I didn't know how long you were going to be with Judge Rossiter. Uh-huh. I'm serious, Kit. What did he want? I've got to bring Tony Pierce to trial in two days. You, 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 you can't. I've got to. I've been on this job for three months, and the governor wants action. Oh. Are you sure it's the governor? What do you mean? It could be the judge for the sake of his daughter. What's Diane got to do with my case against Tony Pierce? Hmm? Nothing. But she would like to be Mrs. Christopher Chance. You're not making sense, Lee. Well, you and Diane were pretty thick before you got the appointment and hired me. Well, look, dear, I've known Diane since we were pups. We were good friends, that's all. Kid, wasn't it Judge Rossiter who got you this appointment? Yes. Why did he pick you? Because he thought I could do the job. Are you sure Diane didn't put him up to it? Well, suppose she did. This golden opportunity, the magic carpet of a political career, make good and you can go anywhere. All right. She wanted you to have it because she wanted you. But now I think she's out to break your political neck. <laughs> you don't know Diane. Hmm. She's very sweet, dear. But why is her father putting the pressure on you? He knows you're not ready to bring Tony Pierce to trial. I told him I have 18 witnesses who are ready to testify. Tony framed charges against them and settled for cash. He thinks that's enough. Did you tell him that Tony never took that money in person? Yeah. I even told him about Hope Schuyler, the mysterious lady who can't be found. Whom nobody even saw. Mm, he's got the whole story, Lee. About the abandoned warehouse on River Street, too? Where the money was left in envelopes addressed to Hope Schuyler? Yep. And still he wants you to be ready for trial in two days. Don't you think he realizes you have no case without Hope Schuyler? I'm not going to believe that Diane is knifing me. Well, suit yourself. I won't say another word. You don't seem to understand. These people wouldn't put me on the spot. They're the oldest friends I have. They... Hello? Special prosecutor's office. Is Mr. Chance there? Yes, he's here. Who's calling? Skates and Alley. Just a minute. It's for you, Kit. Skeets and Alley. Oh. Hello, Skeets. Where are you? I'm in a phone booth across the road from Art Gurney's flying school. There's a gas station here. Yes, I know. What's new? Plenty. The biggest break so far. 
But I ain't talking unless you're alone. All right, hold on a minute. I'll take this inside, Lee. Go ahead, Skeet. Listen, I got the dope on Hope Skyler. What? Yeah, I figured that she and that Tony Pierce guy must have been like mashed potatoes, so I done a little snooping. Go on, go on. Well, he's got a cabin in the woods near Bedminster, about a hundred miles from our town. Some of the folks up there remember seeing Tony Pierce driving through. Oh, what about Hope Skyler? She used to get there by plane. Did anybody see her? No, but lots of folks saw the plane. And what do you know, boss? There's a very small landing field right near the cabin. Very, very private. How do you know there's a woman in that plane? I checked the cabin. That's how I know. It's called Lark Lodge. And there was a woman's dressing gown in one of the closets. Great. Does that prove she was Hope Skyler? The plane that dame was using came out of the Art Gurney Flying School. How do you know? Because I've seen it. It's a two-seating job with the initials H.S. painted on the side. Well... I got a break, see? When the two gurneys, Art and his wife Phyllis, went up for a little stratosphere, they left the hangar door open. So what was I going to do? You did fine, Skeets. Stay where you are. I'll be there in 15 minutes. Okay. I guess the gurney should be able to give us a good description of Hope Skyler. <laughs> See you later, pal. <laughs> Lee! Lee, darling! Lee, come on in! Lee, we cracked the case. We've got... Lee. Chloroform. Operator, get me to police headquarters right away. I want to report a kidnapping. Hey, Mr. Chan. Skeets. He said he was going to meet me in 15 minutes. I waited two hours. Now he tried to get you on the phone. Lee Dale's been kidnapped. The gurneys came down from their flying... Huh? What did you say? Right out of my office while I was in the next room talking to you. Chloroform and carried out. Wow. Somebody took an awful chance. I've been scouring the town with the police. Every joint from the warehouse on River Street to the back rooms of the pool parlors. Tony Pierce got this job done. And if you ask me... I thought of Lark Lodge, too. Did you tell the cops? No, not yet. Well, I don't get it. I have got to be sure she's there before I do anything. Oh, okay. I'm expecting a phone call. That's why I came back to the office. Who's going to call you? One of Tony Pierce's gangsters. And I can tell you exactly what he'll say. Yeah? Resign as special prosecutor and kill the evidence you've got or you'll never see Lee Dale alive again. Suppose that happens. What'll you do? I don't know. Would you quit? I said I don't know. Okay, so you'll quit. Just when we've gotten Tony Pierce and Hope Skyler. Hello? Kev? Oh, Lee, Lee, darling, are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. Where are you? I don't know. Oh, just a minute. Uh, Skeet. I know. You want me to trace? Make it snappy. Lee, tell me what happened. Huh? I can't. What was it, Tony Pierce? I haven't seen him. Kit, I've got something to tell you. Naturally. These men want you to quit. Yes. They say that if you don't ki- quit, they'll kill me. I expected it, darling. I-, I don't want anything to happen to you. Tell them no, I... No, kid, I don't want you to resign. I don't. But... Uh, kid, listen to me. I don't care what they do to me. I don't want you to... Lee. Lee. Skeets. Skeets. Just got it, boss. The number's Bedminster 942. Lock Lodge. That's what the operator said, Mr. Chance. Are we going now or are you still quitting? We're going. There it is, boss. Lark Lodge. And there's somebody home. Yes. We should have took the cops along, Mr. Chance. Okay, so he didn't want no shooting, but what about us? We ain't even got guns. Shh, shh. We're going right in. What? Oh. Well, it's a special prosecutor. Come in, come in, won't you? And, uh, next time, don't bother to knock. Where is she, Pearson? Where is who, Mr. Special Prosecutor? Lee Dale. Lee Dale. Oh, oh, yes, yes, your charming secretary. <laughs> Has she uh, given you the wind? All right, Skeet, search the house. That's easy. There's only three rooms. Excuse me, Mr. Special Prosecutor. I uh, don't want to be picky on, but uh, have you a warrant? Go ahead, Skeet. I'm afraid I'll have to say no. Hey, he's loaded. <laughs> we uh, backwoodsmen always insist on our rights. We don't like intruders who uh, break in without warrant. Listen, Pierce. I'm not only going to send you to jail as a crook, I'm also going to send you to jail as a kidnapper. Really? Well, this is serious, But if you'd it? rather go to the chair as a murderer, put a bullet in my back because I'm going to search this house myself. You don't have to, kid. What? What on earth? Hey, Diane. <laughs> well, I uh, guess I won't need this gun now. You can search the place if you still want to. Diane Rossiter. I'm sorry about this, kid. I didn't think that Tony and I would ever be found out. Where's Lee Dale? My father mustn't know. It would kill him. He must never find Just out. Just tell me where I can find Lee Dale. 
I don't know. You're lying. I haven't seen her since this morning. She was here. She phoned me from here. Skeets traced the call. I haven't seen her since this morning, Kit. Where's she been moved to? I... All right, if that's how you want it. But listen to me and you two, Pierce. You've given me my case. I can drag Hope Schuyler into court now. You're wrong, Kit. I'm not Hope Schuyler. But I'll forget the whole thing if Lee's in her apartment by the time Skeets and I get back to town. Does that mean that you're going to resign? That you've got exactly three hours. Come on, Skeets. Kit? Leave him alone, Diane. He knows what he's doing. But Tony... It's a great sacrifice. I told him once that hearses don't hurry. The grave always waits. <laughs> it's too bad, Mr. Special Prosecutor. We had to dig such a deep one for you. What's the time, Mr. Chance? Hmm? Oh, uh, about half past two. Yeah. It's been a great day for the grave diggers. Mind if I turn on the radio? Feel like some slumber music. Uh, Skeets, I, I, I just can't get it through my head about Diane. She's Hope Skyler. Yeah. Well, a partner of that cheap, chiseling crook. A girl I've known practically all my life. Yeah, but that ain't no reason to quit. She's Judge Rossiter's daughter. Skeets, have you any idea what that man did for me? He got you appointed special prosecutor. He lent me money to go to law school with. Then he set me up in practice. How can I show up his own daughter as well, a... ain't easy, boss. But in this world, the guy's got to be practical. Friendship, okay. But when you got a chance to go places, you got to. We interrupt the early morning recital of organ music by Al Finelli to bring you the latest developments in the flying school murder. Hey, what's that? The police are now satisfied that Art Gurney, who operated the school in Landing Field with his wife, Phyllis, was shot and killed sometime between 10 and 11 o'clock last night. Did you hear that, Art Gurney? All indications point to a woman as the murderer. Phyllis Gurney, the murdered man's wife, has disappeared. And several motorists have come forth with information that a small, unidentified plane took off from the field at about the time Art Gurney was believed to have been killed. Several of these witnesses insist that the person at the controls was a woman. But when asked for a description... Turn it off, Skeet. ...they were not able to... Now you can't quit, boss. It's murder. Between 10 and 11 o'clock last night. Them two people was the only ones who could have told us what Hope Skyler looked like. Now one of them's dead. Hey, what's the idea of turning off the road? We're going to the Gurney Field. I want you to see if Hope Skyler's plane is missing. Sure, but I can tell you right now... Look, Mr. Chance, does that girl Diana Rossiter know how to fly? Yes, uh, she has a license. Okay. I go where you go, but between you and me, I'd rather go home. There's the hangar, boss. Door's open. Hey, do you have to run so fast? Hey, better save my breath, huh? I'll need it. The future. All right, Skeets. Phew. Where's the light switch? Should be, uh, right about here. I got it. What color was it, Skeets? Yellow. Two-seater? Yeah, and initials HS on the side. There's a yellow plane. Now, that ain't it, Mr. Chance. That's a single. Hope Skyler plane ain't here. Oh, well. You know, we wasn't made right. Two lungs ain't enough. Well, let's go, Skeets. I'll drive you home, and then I'll stop off at Lee's apartment. And she'd better be there. <laughs> Lee. Kid. Oh, kid. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, please. Not all at once. Oh, darling. Um, don't you think we ought to close the door? Oh, all right. Oh, you don't know what looking at you does to me. I'm a little glad to see you myself. Let's sit down. They didn't hurt you. Kid, they let me go. They drove me to the door downstairs. They even let me see their faces. Why, Kit? I'm resigning. No. I've got to, Lee. Tony Pierce hit me twice tonight. Once with you and I'm once... not letting you quit. I don't care what kind of a bargain you made with Tony Pierce about me. You don't... You don't have to keep it. He's a thief. Ah, there's more to it than that. Diane Rossiter is Hope Schuyler. What? Well, there's no doubt about it. I bring Tony to trial, I have to prosecute Diane for murder. Murder? Ah, what's the use? <laughs> I should have known I wasn't cut out for big things. I'm too sentimental. Who was murdered, kid? Art Gurney. He ran the flying school up Yes, there. I've seen it. But why him? <sighs> Look, dear, you've had a pretty eventful night. I'll tell you the whole story at the office tomorrow. You're going to tell me now. Why Diane Rossiter is so important that you've got to protect her. I I'm not protecting her, Lee. It's her... 
Well, who can that be at four o'clock in the morning? Oh, probably a wrong number. Don't move. I'll be back. Hello? Yes, yeah, speaking. Who? Oh. I just got in a few minutes ago. What? I see. Yes. Where can I reach you about 10 o'clock? Uh-huh. All right, phone me in the morning. No, here. I'll tell you where I can meet you. Yes. Goodbye. Who was it, Lee? Hmm? What? Uh, is something the matter? The matter? No. No, of course not. That was a friend of mine. She's at a party and she... It's nothing important. Nice people. Well, see you at the office. Yes. I'm going to be a little late. Uh, I got some business with Judge Rossiter first. All right, kid. I'll see you whenever you get there. When did you return to the fold? Kit, please. Yeah. Tell Judge Rossiter I'd like to see him. Kit, I tried to get you on the phone a few minutes ago. I'd like to speak to your father, Diane. He's at the courthouse. He left early this morning. All right. I'll speak to him then. Wait. What for? I want you to give me a chance to explain about last night. Some other time. No. You're not leaving here until you've let me explain. Now, look, Diane. Don't be a fool, Kit. I'm not Hope Skyler. I hate the living sight of Tony Pierce. Sure. You've got to believe me. I went a little crazy yesterday. I saw Lee Dale in the morning. And she told me that you were going to be married. She told you? I stopped thinking. Oh, kid, I've, I've been in love with you for years. I've never shown it, but I hoped. That... And then that girl, in less than three months... Now, what's that got to do with Tony Pierce? I hated you, kid. I wanted to hurt you. Anything, so long as it would destroy you. What about that crook, Diane? There was only one way. Your career. I knew you would never finish the case against Tony if, if it meant disgracing my father. So I called Tony, and I told him that I would be willing to let you suspect me of being Hope Skyler. And I told him why. But last night at Lock Lodge, you denied it. I lost my nerve. I realized what a vicious thing I was doing. And then when you asked Tony and me about Lee Dale... You knew I... she'd been kidnapped. No. No, all I knew was that Tony was sure you'd, you'd come there. I didn't know why. Yeah. You don't believe me. How did you get up to the lodge? In Tony's car. He called me a few minutes before eight and asked me to meet him near the lots. What about your plane? My what? The one you stored at the Gurney Flying Field. Kid, you know I've never owned a plane. Do I? I have a pilot's license, but... What are you talking about? The Art Gurney murder. I heard about it on the radio. The but... plane that took off between 10 and 11 and never came back belongs to Hope Schuyler. Oh. Art Gurney was killed between 10 and 11 last night. And you think that I... You've got nothing to worry about. I won't tell a soul. Kid, you're so wrong. You're so wrong. And it's all my fault. If I hadn't lost my head yesterday, if I hadn't been so, so selfish and stupid and cheap. Oh, Kit, forgive me, please. Forgive me. You don't know what it means to be in love with someone who doesn't love you. I didn't realize what I was doing. Hey, you'd better answer that phone, Diane. It might be your boyfriend. I, I can't. All right. Then I'll answer it. Hello. Is that you, Mr. Chance? What's the matter, Skeets? I've been trying to get you all over town. Your apartment, the office, no answer, no place. So I figured you... What do you problem. want? Listen, I spotted that Phyllis Gurney dame. She was driving right through the middle of town. What's that got to do with me? Well, listen, will you? So I get in the cab and I follow her. Guess where she went? Skeets, in case you've forgotten, I'm resigning. Yeah, yeah, I know. She went right to that old warehouse on River Street. What? You know, the place where Hope Skyler used to pick up the sucker dough for Tony Pierce? Where are you now? I'm in a phone booth a couple of blocks away, the ferry station. Wait for me. I'll be there in ten minutes. That's how I figured, boss. What's this dame want in this warehouse? Get out, Skeet. See? Sure. And then it hits me. Tony Pierce collected a lot of dough from those suckers he framed. But it don't show up in his bank books. 
And you checked all the safety boxes in town. So where's the dough? Is that our car over there? Yeah. Huh? Hey, that came from inside the warehouse. Come on. It's locked. We'll have to break it down. I'm ready. All right. Again. One Shoot. more. That does it. Now. What the? A car speeds. The back of the warehouse. Gone. Must have been parked in that open lot. Whoever was here with Phyllis Gurney got out through this open window. Maybe it was Phyllis. Uh, let's look around. That storage room over there. But a car's out front. Hey, there's a light in that room. Looks like something's on the floor. Burning. Come on. There's more than a light. There's... Step on the right, quick. Okay. She looks dead to me, boss. She is. First the husband gets knocked off, now it's Phyllis. Maybe I was wrong about her coming here for... Hey, I smell cleaning stuff. Her dress is saturated with the skeets. You mean that burning rag was meant to... Holy mackerel. Somebody was out to do a good job, huh? But didn't have time to finish it. The killer even forgot to take the empty bottle. What are you holding her like that for by the top of the neck? Uh, maybe fingerprints. You stay here, skeets. I'm going to put this bottle in my car... Then I'm going to make a couple of phone calls. One of them to the police. Oh, he's just come in, Judge Rossiter. I'm sorry I bothered you. Goodbye. Kid, where have you been? I surely thought you'd gone to resign. There's no hurry, Lee. I can do that an hour from now. You're not going to do it at all. Kit, you must listen. Uh, where were you about 40 minutes ago? Where? I called you here at the office several times. There's no answer. I was downstairs looking for the super. I forgot my keys and he had... I uh, noticed your car downstairs. What's the matter with you? I always leave my ignition key at the garage. I have my car delivered every morning. Oh, I'm sorry. There's been another murder. Oh? Who? Phyllis Gurney. Good heavens. When? About an hour ago. Well... I guess I'd better get cleaned up if I'm going to see Judge Rossiter. You're not resigning, Kit. I'm afraid there's nothing you can do about it, Lee. Uh, where's that bottle of cleaning fluid you bought yesterday? Listen to me, please. Uh, it was standing right there in your desk when I came in last night. You were using it to clean up your typewriter. That's not important now. Don't you realize what's going to happen to you? You'll be called a failure. Uh, look, honey, I want to get these grease spots out of my coat. Will you get me that cleaning fluid? Kit, don't I mean anything to you. Have you been just talking to me about love? Uh, Lee, haven't you got that bottle? Yes, I have it, if that's all you care about in the closet where I put it. You'll worry about grease spots, but I can talk myself sick. Here. Here's the bottle of cleaning fluid. Enjoy yourself. Thanks. I, uh, spoke to Tony Pierce on the phone before I came back here. Of course. You're his buddy now. He is at Locked Lodge. I'm not interested. He couldn't have been in town this morning and gotten back to the lodge so fast. I know he didn't fly. <laughs> Say, did you screw this cap on yourself? Yes. Oh, you must have hidden strength. Or would this be a new bottle that had never been opened before? What do you mean? Would you like to make the rounds of the hardware and department stores with me? There aren't too many in this town. I'd like to know what you meant by that, Kit. All right. You're Hope Schuyler. What? Have you gone out of your mind? You weren't kidnapped last night. You just walked out after you listened in on my conversation with Skeets. Isn't that right? No. You heard him tell me about Lark Lodge, the gurneys, and the plane that Hope Schuyler used. So you decided to get rid of the gurneys. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You had chloroform and you left the odor of it in this room. Then you got in touch with Tony and told him what Skeets had found out. Oh, for pity's sake. The arrest was Operation Framet. You flew to Lark Lodge and phoned me. You know I'd had the call traced. In the meantime, Tony was getting Diane ready for her grand entrance. You deliberately told her that you and I were going to be married. You knew how she'd react. You wanted to marry me, didn't you, Kit? Yes. But you never said you would to me. There's a good reason, wasn't there? You're already married to Tony Pierce. What? I found this marriage certificate in the bottom drawer of your dresser. Anthony Pierce, Hope Schuyler. Just one week before you came to work for me. A wedding deformed by a justice of the peace upstate. Big secret. Well, what are you going to do about it? Oh. Is that the gun that killed two gurneys? Mm-hmm. Two gurneys and one special prosecutor. Lee, uh, didn't you notice I left the door open when I came in? You what? Now, why do you suppose I did that? To create a draft? Oh. 
We have a peculiar police department in this town that likes to be in on everything. Ah, there's only one place in the world that feels like home. The old Rossiter living room. I'm glad you still think so, kid. It's all over, Diane. Lee confessed. Tony confessed. They're going to be tried for murder, and I'm prosecuting. But Tony didn't commit murder. Well, he certainly did. Lee did the shooting, but Tony helped her plan it. Kit, what made you suspect Lee? Up to this morning... A bottle. The fact she didn't answer the phone at the office. That's all? That's all a fellow needs, honey, to start thinking. After that, I remembered everything. How things began to move after Skeets phoned me about Hope Schuyler. Then the mysterious phone call Lee got at 4 o'clock in the morning. Who was it, really? Phyllis Gurney. You see... Tony and Lee had been paying the Gurneys to keep quiet about Hope Schuyler. But when Art Gurney was murdered, Phyllis decided it would take a lot of money to compensate her. A hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> well, we all do foolish things sometimes. Diane, would you do me a favor? Of course. After we're married, if I ever look at another woman, will Don't you please... Don't worry, darling. I'll never be selfish again. Oh, no. Be selfish. But if you're going to ruin me, dear, do it with a kiss, huh? <laughs> and so closes tonight's Crime Club book, Hearses Don't Hurry, based on a story by Stephen Ransom. Edmund Coles did the radio adaptation. Roger Bauer produced and directed. In tonight's cast, you heard Sidney Smith as Christopher Chase, Charlotte Lawrence as Lee Dale, Joseph Julian as Keats, Helen Shields was Diane Rossiter, and Larry Haynes was Anthony Pierce. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have a very exciting story of an image that was the reflection of death. It's called Death Never Doubles. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there's a new Crime Club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we look for you next week. Oh, yes. You've probably jotted down the birthdays and anniversaries to remember during June. Remember that June is Remember Disabled Veterans Month. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Death never doubles. Yes, we have that story for you. Come right over. Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is. Death Never Doubles. The very exciting story of a past present that had no future. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It was early evening, and Peter Woods, a young lawyer, was in his apartment getting dressed for his appointment with Hilda Ryan, his fiancée. He was not expecting a phone call, 
but when it came, he answered it as if it meant nothing at all. Then, five minutes and countless palpitations later... Oh, sure, Mr. Jackson. Don't worry, Mr. Jackson, I'll be there. Yes, I know, not later than a quarter to eight. Yes, I've got the address. Uh, 1052 West 52nd Street. All right, Mr. Jackson, thanks very much. Bye. Wow. Oh, boy, I'm lucky. I'll say I'm lucky. This is my lucky day. Oh. Hello? Hilda, honey. Yes? Oh, my sugar-coated Cupid doll. Guess what? You're going to be late again. <laughs> You're drunk. I'm delirious. I just fell into a pot of gold. Did you say gold? Uh-huh. Mr. Jackson just phoned me. Steve Jackson. Who's he? Oh, I don't know. But he's going to do a big operation and he needs a lawyer. He promised me $5,000. Five thousand? Who recommended him to you? Nobody. Just picked my name right out of the phone book. Uh-huh. Well, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. Now, you know I've gotten several clients that way. Did they pay you $5,000 fees? Oh, Hilda, now look, I know it's a lot, but it isn't fantastic. After all... Yes, honey. After all, he may be a nut with a bolt loose. He sounded perfectly all right to me. So do you, when you're not listening. What time will you pick me up? What? Uh, oh, well, honey, I'm afraid I can't make it tonight. Mr. Jackson? Yeah, quarter to eight. And i got to be on time. Of course. Would he mind if you brought your secretary along? Now, what's the idea, Hilda? You know I haven't got one. Oh, but you have, darling. An amanuensis from now on, who's going to keep an eye on her man. Well, Pete? Don't say it, Hilda. I couldn't stand it. Are you sure Mr. Jackson said 1052 West 52nd Street? Yes. It wasn't West 57th Street? No. I repeated the address to him. This is the place. But there's no building here. Just a hole in the ground. I don't get it. Why should anybody ask me... Wait a minute. Why? They're excavating here. That hole in the ground is where they're going to put a foundation of a building. So? Anybody can see that. All right. Now, suppose Steve Jackson is the guy... You know, the builder. He'd have an office, Pete. I'm going to find out. Come on. Darling, can't we forget the whole thing? There's a pool room on the second floor of this building next to the light. Pete, I'd rather have dinner and go to the movies. We'll go upstairs and we'll ask about Steve Jackson. Somebody ought to know him. I'm not going. What are you afraid of? Trouble. And I think the sooner we get away... Hey, you're blocking the doorway. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. We didn't see you. I walk like a cat. Now, if you don't mind, I'll just go inside. Duke. Duke Masters. What? Pete, is he talking to you? Gee, Duke, I didn't recognize you in this bad light. We wasn't expecting to see you for six months. Now, look, When did they let you out? I'm Peter Woods, and I'm looking for Steve Jackson. A new moniker, eh? Culture, too. Why, you're even talking like Park Avenue. Okay, maybe it's a good idea. We can all start from scratch. I'll change mine from Marty Green to... shall we go now? Wait a minute, sister. What's the rush? Marty, sister's name happens to be Hilda Ryan. I'm tickled. Hey, Duke, what are you going to say to Trixie about this doll? Trixie? Yeah, she's still... Hey, what goes here? Just a couple of the wrong people. Come on, Hilda. Did you know I was working all night in that dump upstairs, or did you come here by accident? Marty, now it's you who's blocking the doorway. We ain't taking no double cross, Duke. We've been having hard times for the last year and a half. Oh, that's too bad. What do you want me to do about it? Okay, so you took the rap for all of us. Me, Flip Morgan, and the rest of them on. You got two to five years in Leavenworth, and we didn't. But you got caught, and we didn't. Uh, now, listen, Marty. No, you listen. You got 200 grand soaked away someplace that's going to be split. You ain't setting yourself up as no millionaire in our dough. Marty, when was the last time you were pushed through a wall? Yeah. Okay, pal. But I'm telling Flip Morgan and Trixie I seen you. Yeah, I do that little thing. And, brother, if you got any real ideas about spending that dough yourself, you're going to give a big chunk of it to some undertaker. <laughs> Stop flipping that coin. You're driving me crazy. Well, what are you so nervous about, Trixie? I'm not nervous. All right. Will you stop it? Sure. You want me to go home to my mother? Don't be a dope. It's just that I'm... Oh, yeah, sure, I know. You'd like to see something green for a change. Flip. Well, it's my sickness, too. Duke, the wise guy. He don't trust nobody. Two hundred grand stacked away, and we got a scratch till he gets out of stir. I'm afraid of what's going to happen when he gets out. Now, what's that? He's got only six months to go, and leave it to Duke. He's behaving. Won't be two to five for him. He'll get the diploma at the end of two. Well, what's wrong with that? I can't help it if I'm scared, Flip. Ah, he's not going to do anything to you. I promised I'd wait for him. So what? You changed your mind. He'll kill me. <laughs> You're crazy. I know what I'm talking about. 
When Duke finds out, somebody hasn't tipped him off already. Relax. Duke's a dying duck. Huh? Only he don't know it yet. Nobody's going to tell him. What do you mean? You learned how to do arithmetic, didn't you? Flip. Uh Uh-huh. The more numbers you got to divide by, the less everybody gets. You're going to kill him. First, he brings the dough out of hiding. (laughs) I got a brain that gives me 24-hour service. But, Flip, suppose... What for? The day Duke steps out of Leavenworth, he's going to have an escort with him all the way to New York. And by the time we swing up Broadway, he's going to be all talked out. (laughs) And then we bury him. I'll get it, Flipsy. Yep. Hello, Flip. Yep. This is Marty. The Duke's out. What? Yeah, yeah, Duke Masters. I seen him. Hey, now listen, Marty, if this is a guy... I tell you, I seen him with my own eyes. I talked to him. And you should hear him, Flip. Like he went to college instead of living worse. Just a minute. Trixie. Yeah? Marty just saw the Duke in town. Wh- what? Yeah, what a break. Six months ahead of time. What are we going to do? Same thing. Uh, all right, Marty. What else? We're getting a double cross. Hey? Dude, the Duke says he ain't the Duke. He says he's a guy by the name of Peter Woods. Go on. And he's got some fancy dame with him, Hilda Ryan. A real cookie. Peter Woods and Hilda Ryan, hey? Where are they now? In the Bijou Club on 49th Street. Spending our dough. Okay, Marty. Keep an eye on them. But I gotta go to work. Keep an eye on them and your working days will be over. I didn't expect it, Flip. I never figured on time off for good behavior. Give me the phone book, Trixie. What are we gonna the do? The phone book, baby. I want to take a look at the odds. I've got an idea they're gonna favor a quick killing. I can't help it, Pete. I've got to say I told you so. Yeah. Going haywire because somebody picked your name out of the phone book and offered you $5,000. Couldn't you smell a plot? Can I help it if I look like Duke Masters? You're a lawyer. You're supposed to be smart. Hilda, you see any gangsters around? And that name, Steve Jackson. Yeah, it sure sounds like a phony. And now... Oh, well, I'm going to the powder room. All right. And then you're going to take me to the movies. All right. I'll be back in a minute. (laughs) I missed you, Duke. Huh? Why didn't you let me know you were coming home? Now, uh, now listen, Miss, uh, whatever your name is, I want you and your gang to get one thing straight. I'm not Duke Masters. So I heard. Is it on account of that girl? No, I'm warning you. If you don't leave me alone... What'll you do? Scream? Huh? Yeah. It shoots. Uh, the restaurant's full of people. There's nothing safer than a crowd. You ought to know that, Duke. Yeah. When you and the boys stuck up that mail truck, there was a big crowd all around didn't keep you from getting the money, did it? Oh, now listen, you got me all wrong. It won't keep me from pulling the trigger. I've got my identification card. Look, if you give me until tomorrow, I'll get you my birth certificate. Why the double cross, Duke? (laughs) What's the use? Is it because you heard some stories about me and Flip Morgan? I never even heard it. They're not true. I said I'd wait for you and I've been waiting. I don't care what anybody's been telling you, I've been on the level with you. Sure, I believe everything you say. Oh, Duke. Do, but let's keep it strictly impersonal. Okay, I can wait until we're alone. Listen, Duke, I got an idea. That 200 grand, if you don't want to split it with the gang... Why, Trixie. By the way, that's your name, isn't it? You'd rather be a clown, huh? Maybe we'd better go now. Where to? Your apartment, the one I never saw. Are you serious? You don't hear me laughing, do you? But I I can't leave now. Hilda wouldn't understand. Duke, did you ever see such a cute little gun? (sighs) A few minutes ago. It disappears in the palm of my hand, see? Trixie. Are you ready? No, and I'm not willing either. I'll overlook it, Duke. As long as you're able. All right, Duke. Stop fumbling and open the door. I can't help it, Trixie. I'm thinking of Hilda. When she finds me gone... The door, sweetheart. Careful how you poke that gun in my back. Get in there, Duke. All right, all right. You don't have to be so impatient. Hey, what's happened to my apartment? We gave it a thorough cleaning, pal. Huh? Who are you? Come in, Duke. Come in and stop kidding. Now, look. You've made a mistake. Give me a chance, will you? Yeah. Did you have to coax him much, Trixie? A little. He was pretty unreasonable, Flip. Oh, it's too bad. What's the matter, Duke? Don't you want to meet your old friends again? I never saw you before in my life. I've never been to prison, and I've never been in any holdup. Yeah, his memory's still bad, Trixie. It's awful. We might have to give him a treatment, huh? Remember the boys, Duke? Good grief. What can I do to make you understand? That's Tom, and that's Knuckles, and uh, (laughs) that's the bruiser. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
They're all waiting to put their hands on you. I'm not Duke you're, Masters. You're sure, I know. You're Peter Woods. You're even listed in the phone book. <laughs> nice going, Duke. You took this apart and hid the dough, then you took the rap, but not for us. Now, where is it? I give up. Two hundred grand, it's in one of these rooms. Now, you go and make an X on the spot. You've searched, haven't you? You didn't find any money. Well, maybe we're not as smart as you are. You pull the place apart. You're next, pal. Well, what can I do just because I happen to look like some guy who's double-crossing? I'll give you a break. Tell us where you stack the dough and we'll cut you in. We'll let bygones be bygones. You can't let something be that never existed. I, uh... Hmm? Ah. Oh. So you become a philosopher, too, huh? They do great things at Leavenworth these days. <laughs> Sit down, Duke. What for? We're going to give you something to think about. Come on, Trixie. The boys want to be left alone. Listen, Flip, don't uh, you think... There's nothing to worry about, sweetheart. They're going to see how many times they can bounce the punching bag off the wall. <laughs> Before the egg is out of it. Don't move, honey. Don't move, she says. As if I could. Oh, if I could only get my hands on the men who did this to you. It's no use, Hilda. I'll have to leave town. Oh, Pete, how could they have beaten you up like this? Your face. Sorry about that, lady. Huh? Oh, I'm not Duke Masters. No, no, Mr. Woods. I am. You? Why, yeah, you... Yeah, yeah, I know how you feel. It's tough. You got born with the wrong face. But it's not only the face. It's... You're not human, Duke. Okay. Maybe you'll change your mind when I pay you off. What? You, you mean you're going to... After all you've done to me already? I promised you 5,000 bucks, didn't I? What? Hilda! I know, Pete. That's Steve Jackson. Yeah. I, uh, hope you'll excuse the masquerade. It had to be done that way. Are you trying to make us understand? I don't want you to consider me a bad guy, lady. When I got expelled from Leavenworth last week, I never thought my luck was going to change, but it did. So did mine. A couple of days ago, I spotted Marty Green going into a pool room on West 52nd Street. I found out he works there. It was always a second story, Mark. You ought to know your friends, Duke. Yeah, I know. Well, yesterday was my big day. I was walking along Madison Avenue when who should I see coming out of an office building? You, Pete. So I followed you all day, my head spinning with ideas. Too bad it didn't spin Shut right Shut up, off. lady, and let me talk to my lawyer. I'm not your lawyer, Duke. Don't kid yourself. You're either my lawyer or you're going to be my corpse. Well, that doesn't give me much choice, does it? It doesn't give you any. Would you uh, like to know how I got your name? I'm sure you're going to tell me. The doorman of this house gave it to me. I walked in and he says, Good afternoon, Mr. Woods. What was I going to do? Well, I did it. I went right to a phone book and looked up Mr. Woods at this address until I found one with a Peter in front. That was you, pal. Duke, you're almost as smart as the devil. Smarter, Cookie. I get what I go after. But what do you want? You got $200,000. No, Pete. What? I had it. Sold it away in a little cabana I own at the beach, my own private get-away-from-it-all place. Nobody knew, not even Trixie. Were you planning to keep it all for yourself? I wasn't telling them where to find it, not until I got out of stir. I was taking no chances. <laughs> not much I wasn't. What do you mean? A couple of months ago, Trixie wrote me about tough times. What was I going to do, let her go hungry? So I told her to take a few grand and keep a trap shut about the rest, but she took the pile. And she never wrote again. Naturally. She's been too busy flipping with Morgan. She's double-crossing him, too. All right, all right. You don't have to get mad at me. I wasn't sure of it until tonight. Flip Morgan hasn't seen a dime of that 200 grand. How do you know? Take a look at your face in the mirror. Oh, you mean... You get the idea. I see. Well, Duke, as your lawyer, my advice get to you is to go to... Pete. Oh, no, 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 look, Duke, I, I was only kidding. Get him up, lady. He's got a lot of work to do. Not for you, he hasn't. You go and get yourself beaten up for a change. <sighs> we gonna have an argument? There's no shortage of guns, is there? We're going over to Trixie's apartment. She lives in a rooming house on West 49th Street. What are we going to do there? Not we, Cookie. Him. He's gonna persuade Trixie to part with 200 grand. Oh, no. I've had enough of that woman to last me for a lifetime. Oh, now, Pete, Pete, don't irritate me. You'll lose a good client. You don't say... That ought to kill me for sure. Yeah, for sure. All right, here's the key, Pete. Don't we knock first? Oh, you'll never get to first base with Trixie being formal. But suppose That's she's... That's her uh... tough luck. Go ahead. All right. But tell that gun to be gentleman with a spine. I, I gotta live with it. Duke, why don't you go in there? 
You're not afraid of Trixie, are you? Not if she's alone, chicken. Oh, so Pete's going to find out. Back in Leavenworth, we used to call that strategy. Pete. It's no use, Hilda. Well, here I come again, fellas. Trixie! Trixie! Pete! Duke, we Put can't on let your him... old brass knuckles with the corkscrew buckles, and then we'll have a little. Holy smoke. Duke! Hilda! What's the matter, Pete? <gasps> Flip Morgan. Is he dead? Nobody could look like that and be alive. He was shot. Say, Duke, did you know about this? What you. Well, hey, don't lock us in here! You... Well, what do you know? He did. <laughs> I'm sorry, Hilda. I can't get it up. Oh, dear. Of all the windows to be stuck, it has to be the fire escape window. What are we going to do? I don't know. Those guys knock me senseless. But I do. We can stick our heads out of the other window and yell. Honey, have you gone berserk? We've got to get out of here. Sure, but don't call for help. There's a dead body in this room. How are we going to explain it? There's no law against telling the truth, Pete. Who's going to believe us? Pete. Shh. There may be Duke coming back. What are you going to do with that chair? Come on, quick. Behind that door. Hey, you two. Trixie. Put on that chair, Duke. No, while you're still behind the door. Okay, you can close it now. But uh, how did you know we were... Look over there. Oh. I guess there's nothing like a well-placed mirror, is it? But, Pete, darling, there certainly is. What? Hilda, what are you talking about? A well-placed bullet. Have you forgotten? You know, in that corner. Flip. Never again, Trixie. Flip has flopped. You killed him, Duke. You and the dame. No, wait a minute. Let her rave, Pete. You sent me a phony telegram to get me out of here. Said you had something to talk to me about. I thought you wanted to make up. How did you get around Flip? He didn't see the wire. I read it in the hall. I told him I had... Hey, since when do I have to answer your questions? Where's the telegram, Trixie? I threw it away. I wasn't going to keep any messages from you to me. Uh-huh. I thought it was on the level, Duke. I was ready to go back to you any time you wanted me. But you don't want me. You killed Flip and you were waiting behind that door to brain me with a chair. We thought you were Duke. He was here. Sure, sure. You're still Peter Woods. You'll kill us one at a time and then you've got 200 grand and no partners. Well, it's not working, Duke. Not this trip. Duke says you have the money. Did you hear what I said? I'm not even listening. Well, what are you going to do? I'm calling the cops. You're through, Duke. All right. Call them. Let's sit down, Hilda. And... I don't mind. It'll be a pleasure to see a blue uniform. No. No, never mind, operator. What's the matter, Trixie? Cold feet? Duke, how was Flip Morgan killed? He was shot. Right through the heart. You know, Trixie. Don't you, dear? And you were going to let me... You didn't even try to... Hey, I'm getting out of here. Oh, wait a minute, Trixie. No. 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 I guess she means no, Pete. Yes. Well, let's call the police. They always like to be told when the murder has been committed. <laughs> Money ball inside pocket. Marty. Marty. Hiya, Trixie. I hear they gave Duke a facial. Did he come through? I've got to talk to you, Marty. Let's go someplace. Sure. How about the office here? It's built solid. All right. Hey, how come you're here alone? Where's Flip? In my apartment. The Duke, too? No. Who figured Duke would turn out to be a rat? The most honest guy in the mob. The guy that took the rap for all of us. He's dead, Marty. What's that? Who's dead? Flip. Oh, you're kidding, Trix. Then go see for yourself. Flip's in my apartment with a bullet in his chest. So that's how Duke's going to hold on to that. He would have killed me, too, but I wasn't there. Listen, Marty, we made a big mistake tonight. That man we thought was Duke Masters. What do you mean, thought? He isn't. Why? Now, don't tell me, Trixie. I've seen him with my own eyes. You saw, I saw, but we were wrong. Duke's around somewhere watching us. Well, what's the deal, Trixie? The... the What? Deal, a deal. You got any special reason for wanting us to think double? Marty, don't be a dope. I'm telling you, we haven't seen Duke yet. Flip saw him and he's dead. Would I tip you off if I was working with Duke? Yeah, you wouldn't, would you? But what makes you so sure about the other guy? When I came back to my apartment, he was there with his girlfriend. Then I saw Flip and I started to call the cops. Marty, he told me to go ahead. He didn't try to stop me. I... Duke! Yeah. What's the matter, Trixie? Aren't you glad to see me? Yes. Sure, Duke. Well, you might show it. Take a walk, Marty. Or anything you say, Duke. 
It's good to see you again. Don't go too far. I'll be here all night, Duke. That's the kind of a job I got. And don't send for any help. The boys are all downtown being questioned by the police about Flip Morgan. Huh? But, Duke, I wasn't going to do nothing like that. Yeah. It's amazing what protection a nickel will get you. Go on, beat it. Well, Juicy. Duke, what are you going to do? Oh, no, don't rush me, Cookie. I got a lot of looking to do first. Come here. Uh, you're still a knockout. Oh, Duke. I've been waiting for you. Uh -huh. You don't know what it was like, not knowing whether you'd be locked up for two years or five years. There were nights I couldn't sleep. I'll bet. I never dreamed you'd be out in a year and a half. Oh, Duke, darling. Hold me close. Like this? Closer. I want you to hurt me. Is that how Flip used to do it? Flip, what's the idea, Duke? You tell me, I'm the guy who wants to know. You're crazy, stir crazy. Like every man who goes to prison, all you can see is a woman cheating, lying, dancing around with other men. Oh, I said nothing about other men, chicken. I only named one. Well, suppose I did let him buy me a few meals. Did you leave me any money to live on? Didn't even answer my letter a couple of months ago. Didn't I? I begged you to let me know where you'd hidden the 200 grand. I promised I wouldn't take any more than I needed. Why didn't you answer my letter? That, uh, that cabana at the beach, Trixie. Nice place, huh? Cabana? What are you talking about? You must have thought it was beautiful when you found the dough there. Do I answered your letter, baby. I told you where to look. I told you what to do. But you had ideas of your own. Finders keepers. Why do a split when you can dance on a dime? Duke, I didn't know. You never told me about a cabana. I took the rap and kept my mouth shut. But you were going to close it for good. You knew what the mob would do if I didn't come up with the dough. So you waited and played dumb. I didn't have long to live, did I? Duke, listen to I me. I get knocked off for being a double crosser and you inherit 200 grand. Free and clear. Nobody knows. Okay, Trixie, I know. Now, where's the dough? I never saw it. I never got your letter. I'm not asking for comedy lines, Trixie. But I tell you, I... Hey, what are you trying to do? How do, you... How do I know you wrote a letter? Because you say so? Well, I say I never got one. Okay. Okay, from now on, the proceedings will settle down to a nice, quiet, round-table discussion. Let me see your palm, Trixie. What for? I want to read it. I want to find out if you have a future... Okay, buddy, you take table six. Table six, ready? Hello, Marty. Remember us? Huh? Sure. Gee, Mr. Woods, I'm sorry we topped you for skull and bones, but you know an honest mistake. That's quite all right now, Marty, as long as Pete can be himself again. We ain't going to bother him no more, lady. What brings you here? Want to shoot some pool? We're looking for Trixie. Oh, you're out of luck. Isn't she here? I left her and a duke in the office about an hour ago. You know, a long time no see. Are they still in there? What do you think? Come on, Hilda. Hey, wait a minute. You'd better leave him alone, Mr. Woods. The Duke gets awful mad. He won't hit me, Marty. It'll be almost like hitting himself. Now, take my advice and be smart. Now, don't... I'll try to stop him, Duke, but they... Save your breath, Marty. You're talking into a vacuum. P. Yeah. Strangled with a piece of cord. Holy smoke. Close that door, Marty. Sure, sure. We don't want no riot. Marty, you said the Duke was in here, too. Well, I didn't see him go out. If he had gone out, would you have seen him? Well, sure. I was out front all the time, near the door, where the counter is. Well, then, how did he get out of here? How? That's an open window, ain't it? Wide open. You mean Duke jumped out of there? Well, he didn't have to jump, lady. This is the second floor. He could have dropped down. It's only about 12 feet. Is it? No, I can drop down from that window myself. You work here nights, don't you? Yeah. So what? Take a look out that window. Something's been happening next door. Next door? There's an open lot. There was, Marty. Now there's a great big hole in it, about 30 feet. What? For the foundation of a new building. 30 feet? Mm-hmm. Steam shovels work during the day. You see Duke's body down there? Oh, I didn't see nothing. It's too dark. If Duke went out that window, he should still be down there. Want to take a trip? Not with you, mister. Pete! Don't be alarmed, Hilda. I've been facing guns all night. How's it feel to be rich, Marty? Great. And I'm going to stay rich, see? That 200 grand is mine. I worked for it. One hold up and two murders. So what? Duke's going to take the rap. It's no secret he used to be nuts about Trixie. It's no secret she was double-crossing him with Flip. Marty, how'd you get the money? I watched the mails at Trixie's house. I don't trust nobody. You watched the mails? For almost a year and a half. Trixie lived in a room in house. 
The mail used to be left on the table in the front hall. And then one day, a couple of months ago... Yeah, the payoff. A letter that told where two kid the dough. And it said, don't tell them up. I was in. You're smart, Marty. Yeah, but who are you going to tell it to? Marty, hasn't anybody told you that shooting makes a lot of noise? I got that figured out, too. Turn on that radio, pal, loud. <laughs> it's oh, hey, different let's go. now, Marty. You just oh, learn one go. thing. Never take your eyes off let's a moving go. target. Drop that gun. Drop it or I'll go. twist your arm out of shape. <laughs> now, you weasel. <laughs> Why, Pete, you knocked him out. <laughs> With one punch. Let me catch my breath. Who? Your bright girl, Hilda. You took an awful chance screaming that way. I had to, darling. It was now or never. And I figured if it had to be never, why not now? Oh, no. Uh, don't say now, Hilda. I need you. Hilda! Hilda. And so closes tonight's Crime Club story, Death Never Doubles. Stedman Coles wrote the radio script, Roger Bauer produced and directed. Tonight's cast included Chet Stratton as Peter Woods, Larry Haynes as Duke Masters, Julie Stevens was Trixie, Arthur Vinton played Flip Morgan, Phil Kramer was Marty, and Charlotte Lawrence was heard as Hilda Ryan. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting... Yes, this is the crime club. I am the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very unusual story of a flight into fancy that took off from murder. It's called Death at 710 by H.F.S. Moore. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there's a new crime club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. This program came from New York. This is the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Death at 710. Yes, we have that crime club book for you. Come right over. <laughs> Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The book is on this shelf. Here it is. Death at 710 by H.F.S. Moore. The very intriguing story of a beautiful woman who was in love with death. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. The train was due to leave at 710 in the evening. And at exactly eight minutes after seven, Mark Kent, a well-known mystery writer, was in drawing room B his own drawing room, when the door opened. And he was surprised to see a young, beautiful woman. He was even more surprised at the way she giggled. <laughs> Hello. Hello yourself and see how you like it. My name is Susan Ward Steele. Well, I'm flattered, but haven't you made a mistake? You're Mark Kent, the mystery writer. <laughs> I adore mystery writers. Mm. Mm. <laughs> well... Your pictures don't do you justice. <sighs> How about getting me a drink? Uh, don't you think you've had enough? Oh, be a good boy and get me a drink. I better get you back to your compartment. <sighs> I'm going to Reno. A long trip. I saw you come on the train. I knew it was going to be interesting. <laughs> I'm not going to Reno. 
You should have seen Gerald's face this morning when I said goodbye to him. He's my husband. Mm. Such a pain in the neck. Oh, uh, look, Susan, do you mind... And you should have seen Claire Ellis's face when I told her that I was going to marry Pierce Carlton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my stepbrother, Robert Ward's face, when I wouldn't let him have the money. Mm -hmm. So many faces... And all so long. <laughs> Will you do me a favor, please? Mm -hmm. Oh, Pierce will marry me. You just watch, Mark. In six weeks, when I come back from Wino, <laughs> he'll never tell me again he's not the marrying kind. Yeah, yeah. How about that drink you promised me? I didn't, Susan. I want a drink. I've got to have a drink. Uh, later, please. Anything. Water. Now, take it easy, kid. Take it. I've never been so thirsty, ma Please. Water. Ginger ale. All about Chicago and points with Susan. All the uh, stuff. All about No, no. Conductor! Conductor, hold the train. There's a dead woman on board. Four days later, Mark Kent was in a room at police headquarters with Captain McNair, his friend. They were comparing notes. The results of intensive investigation and some speculation. We start with the atropine, Cap. That's what killed her. Yeah, one pill. That's usually enough. Now, here's what the book says about atropine. Hmm. An organic alkaloid which causes death in humans without coarse anatomical change. No pain. That's right. Uh, symptoms include dryness of mouth and throat, giddiness, wild talk. Huh? Huh? Death usually takes place within eight hours. The coroner told me there's no set rule about that. It can happen in six hours, in four hours, in one hour. Mm -hmm. It can happen in ten hours. Well, we know from what Gerald Steele told us, Susan didn't get up until almost 11 o'clock. Mm. Cap, are you willing to do some speculating? If it doesn't mess up the facts. What facts? All right, go ahead. But remember... You're not writing a book. This was a real murder, and I'm a real policeman. Now, we've got a pretty good idea of the kind of man Gerald Steele is. There's no record that he ever had a job. His wife, Susan, was very rich. So? Okay. We know that she left a will, giving him half her estate. Mm. And we know that she was going to Reno to get a divorce. Another man, Pierce Carlton. Mm. Now, let's combine what Gerald told us about that morning four days ago and what, for reasons of uh, self-preservation, he might have forgotten to tell us. Go ahead. I'm listening. All right. It's 11 o'clock. Susan Ward Steele has just gotten out of bed, and after the usual routine, she goes into the kitchen where she finds her husband sitting before a big breakfast. She's a little annoyed. Good morning, Joe. Enjoying yourself? Any objections to my being hungry? Oh, no. I thought today you might have less of an appetite. I'm not responsible for today, Susan. Ham, eggs, toast, and coffee. Is that your first helping, dear? Oh, nuts. You don't say. You're so articulate. Where's Tommaso? I told him to take the day off. You told him? Yes. What's the matter with that? But, darling, you don't pay his salary. I had an idea that we wouldn't want any strangers around the house today. You're so sweet. But I'm not spending today with you. Oh? I'm having lunch with Robert, tea with Claire Ellis, and then... Mm, would you like to guess? Cocktails with Pierce Carlton, the great send-off. Don't be so bitter. He works for a living. Sure. Well, at least he has an office. Pour me some coffee, please. Yes. You want eggs, too? No. Just black coffee without sugar. A full cup. You must have had a big night. Where'd Pierce take you? Places. Lots of people. I heard you slept well last night. Susan. You were snoring when I came in. Oh, for pity's sakes. First I get it because I'm eating, now it's because I slept. <laughs> you don't think much of me. You're a parasite, Gerald. And you're beginning to look like one. You don't care what you say, do you? Oh, don't tell me that there's pride under that expanding waistline. Just one more word out of you and I'll... Yes? <sighs> What's the use? I can't take it. I don't want you to go. Really? I'm thrilled. If you go through with the divorce, I don't know what I'll do. I know one thing you'll have to do. Get a job. Huh? Let me spell it for you. J-O-B. It's what people do for money. What'd you ever do for yours? Oh, smart. I picked a family with a rich uncle. Sure, you can talk. You inherit a million dollars. You're smart. Well, let me tell you one thing, Susan. If Don't you th bother, honey. I've got something much more important to tell you. I'm not leaving you any money to live on. What? And I'm changing my will. I see. The half of my estate that you've been praying for will go to Pierce Carlton. 
if I should die. When do you perform the operation? After Pierce and I are married. In the meantime, if I should get hit by a truck... Yeah? Oh, darling, don't wish so hard. I'm really being very loyal to you. Yeah. Oh, well. What time is your lunch date with Robert? One o'clock. Good heavens, look at the time. I'll have to hurry. It takes me an hour to get my hair put up. Do you want some more coffee? Oh, I'd love it, but I can't spare a minute. Why didn't you tell me it was so late? It's your appointment, Angel. You, you should have... You don't want another cup? Oh, dear. I really need it. All right. Bring it in the bedroom. No cream or sugar. Yes, ma'am. Anything you say, ma'am. I aim to please. <laughs> That is, Captain Gerald Steele had motive and opportunity. You're only guessing, Mark. Well, the will's on file, isn't it? We got the story of the second cup of coffee from Gerald himself. Yeah, but the rest of the stuff, about the argument, about her changing the will. Pure speculation. The deductions of a mystery book writer. Mm. Now, what about Robert Ward, the stepbrother? He's about 15 years older than Susan, businessman. How's business? Well, we got a report from several banks that he's been trying to borrow money. They all turn him down. Uh-huh, that makes him an interesting suspect. Now, let's combine fact and fiction again and see what happened at lunch. Robert Ward told us that he'd reserved a private dining room for the occasion at the Swank Cafe Aurelia. Susan was very cheerful all through lunch. What time is your train, Susan? 7.10. Oh, it's only half past two now. I'm meeting Claire Ellis at three o'clock. Tea and gossip at her apartment. Oh, I knew I shouldn't have eaten so much. Susan... Yes, Robert. I've been waiting very patiently. What do you mean? You didn't ask me here to a private dining room to discuss my unimportant life. You're very clever. Thanks, darling. Now, what is it that you don't want your servants to overhear? I, uh, I need money. You? I know it comes as a shock, but the truth is I've, uh... How much, Robert? $100,000. Really? Of course, it'll be a loan, Susan. I'll pay it back in due time. I'll give you a note or a mortgage, whatever you like. Business is bad. Isn't it? I've had a very serious setback. My entire output of washing machine motors is defective. Oh, my. What's the poor housewife going to do? We know what's wrong, and we can correct it easily enough, but naturally, it can't be done without money. Naturally. I've never been without cash before, but I expanded recently, and that took all my liquid assets. <laughs> Even when you're in trouble, you talk like a bank statement. When did this delightful thing happen? Two weeks ago. Why didn't you come to me right away? Well, I didn't want to bother you. I'm a businessman, and naturally, my first call was at the banks. Naturally. Did they turn you down? They didn't consider me a good risk. Overexpansion. Oh, darling, you're as skinny as a toothpick. Susan, please don't be facetious. I'm in serious trouble. Oh. If I don't get that merchandise out of my factory, I'll go bankrupt. I won't even be able to pay my creditors. A hundred thousand dollars. Yes, it shouldn't mean anything to you. You can spare it. Oh, I can spare it. But tell me, Robert, dear, when did you ever do anything for me? Now, don't refuse me. You preached, called me a fool for not putting my money into a good, sound business. A wild, empty-headed fool. I tried to make you realize your responsibilities. Uncle Jeffrey left his money to us in good faith. It was our duty to protect it. I've still got mine. And I've got mine in factories, machinery, and merchandise. Now I'm asking you to help me liquidate it. No. Good Lord, Susan, how can you be so heartless? I've been practicing. But... Very well, I'm not going to beg you. Don't give up hope, dear. I've taken care of you in my will. Thanks to Uncle Jeffrey, you have no choice. Half of your estate must go to me. And half of your estate should go to me. But where is it? You can look for it after I'm dead. Oh, what in the name of thunder did I do with those things? What things? My pills, my box of pickup pills. Oh, here it is, my vest pocket. So you've come to that, huh? Just these last two weeks, doctor's prescription. I've been living in the devil's own basement, tired and depressed. What do they do for you? They give me a pickup, that's all. Get the tired feeling out of my system, clear my head. Perfectly harmless. Hmm, sounds interesting. Would you like one? Why not? I had a big night, and I've got a bigger day ahead of me. <laughs> One pill will keep you going for hours. Flip it into the back of your mouth and wash it down with water. After you, darling. Very well. I never take chances. Well, here's to you. <sighs> How soon before it starts functioning? Very soon. 
And now I think we ought to go, Susan. I don't want you to be late for your appointment with Claire Ellis. <laughs> well, it's a possibility, Cap. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. So is a trip to the moon. Uh, uh, you better stick to writing mystery books, Mark. If you make a mistake, nobody burns. Except maybe your publisher. Did Robert Ward take a pickup pill while you were grilling him three days ago? Now, wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me he had a box full of atropine pills when he met Susan Steele? Maybe. And that he passed them off as pickup pills? Maybe. But according to your own speculation, he took one of those pills himself. Now, why didn't it kill him? You might have had one in that box that was harmless. Huh? You know, a real pickup pill. Sure, sure. Put that in your next bookmark. It'll read fine. I will. But for the time being, you won't mind if I keep it a secret from the district attorney, will you? No, no, I don't mind. <laughs> Shall we go on? Go ahead. I'm on 24-hour duty. Well, the next stop that Susan Steele made was Claire Ellis's apartment. Now, what do we know about Claire? Steele expects to marry. And Claire's in love with him. Hmm. Now let's see what we can get out of the situation in which two women in love with the same man meet for tea a few hours before one of them dies on a train, the victim of murder by slow poison. I'll get the tea things, Susan. They're in the kitchen. Oh, there's no rush, Claire. I'm not meeting Pierce until five. The lovely romantic orchid room. <laughs> I told the sweet boy I must have orchids on our wedding day. Slews and slews of them. <laughs> Susan, you know why I asked you here? Of course. To plead with me. We used to be good friends. Used to be? I'm sorry to hear that, honey. Susan, don't marry Pierce Carlton. <laughs> he doesn't love you, Susan. <laughs> Pierce and I were practically engaged when I introduced him to you. Why did you make a play for him? You had a husband. I was smitten. You were smitten. Believe me, darling, I've been living in a delayed paradise for three whole months. You've never loved anyone but yourself, and the only reason you went after Pierce was because he was mine. He was a conquest. Does it make any difference? You'll never be able to keep him, Susan. <laughs> Pierce is in some kind of trouble. You have money. Did he tell you all about it? Uh, well, he told me. Doesn't that prove something? Well, what is it, Susan? What's wrong with Pierce? It's confidential, dear. Between sweethearts. I'll get the tea if you still want it. Oh, I want it. I'm a glutton for punishment. I hope you won't have to take much more of it. Ever. Why not? Hello, and don't keep me waiting. Oh, it's you. Of course, Gerald. Are you surprised to hear I'm still breathing? Where's Claire? Oh, she's downstairs sweeping the sidewalk. She pays off the back rent that way. I'd like to talk to her, please. Oh, she can't be disturbed. Now look here, Susan. But I can give her a message. Ask her to call me back. No love and kisses? Not yet. I was only thinking we might go for a walk in the park. A walk? How thrilling. Gerald, darling, when did you give up driving? Oh, nuts. <laughs> <laughs> You might have held that phone for me, Susan. Who called? Pierce. He simply had to tell me how much he loved me. Claire, dear, watch your manners. Trays were meant to be put down, not dropped. I'm sorry. And those exquisite ice cream cakes. You almost ruined them. That one's for you, Susan. Thanks, dear, for remembering that I adore blueberries. I never forget a lot of things. <laughs> Motive and opportunity. Love and ice cream cake. Eh, hey, Mark? Well, that's how it looks on paper, Cap. You think Claire Ellis buried the atropine in the cake? Oh, she did. She's darn clever. But uh, I don't know anybody who chews ice cream. If she did. Now, how do you figure out the business about that phone call? Well, Claire Ellis told us that Susan had received a call from Pierce. Go on. Pierce denied it. But Gerald admitted that he phoned Claire and spoke to Susan. Mm -hmm. Claire didn't know about the call, therefore Susan told her it was from Pierce Carlton. Q-E-D. Whoops, not yet, Cap. We've still got to prove a murderer. Now, what about Pierce Carlton? He's in the stock brokerage business with his father. Good, solid family background, old stock. Mm, that doesn't keep him from being a playboy, does it? I'm not interested in what he does, Mark, only in what he did four days ago. And in what he did before that. That goes without saying, my boys are checking. I think they're going to find that he's in a mess. A money mess. Anything's possible with you around. Okay. What happened the day we spoke to Claire Ellis? Your eyes popped. You saw a beautiful woman. Could be, but she was upset. Every time you mentioned Pierce Carlton, she had jitters. Why? 
Somebody told me she's in love with the guy. I told you, Cap. I oh, did. sure, I knew I couldn't have gotten it from the facts. She kept saying over and over that Pierce was innocent. He had no reason for killing Susan. Cap, that girl knows something. So does everybody else in this case, except me. About Pierce Carlton, I mean. And I'm sure she didn't know it the day Susan was killed. Who told her? I don't know. What? Mark, did I hear right? Did you say you don't know? Uh, let's, uh, let's go on to item number four. Susan and Pierce at the orchid room. Dinner before train time. Soft lights, orchids on the table. A perfect setting for romance. Darling, darling, six weeks, six long weeks without you. <laughs> You'll get used to it. Don't laugh at me, please. I'm going to miss you terribly. There's a lot of excitement in Reno and cowboys. Yes, how can you say that to me? Don't you like cowboys? I like you better. How was Gerald this morning? Oh, why talk about him? Why not? He's human. What's the matter with you? You'd rather talk about everyone but us. <laughs> it's a wonder you don't ask me about Claire. You know, I saw her this afternoon, too. Or don't you have to ask me about her? You never could take kidding, could you? Oh, I didn't realize. Pierce will be married just as soon as I can get back from Reno. Have some more wine, Susan. You'll be waiting for me at the station. I don't want to come back to New York and be alone for a minute. Suppose I'm not waiting. But you've got to be. Why? Because I'm depending on you. I'm going through a divorce for you. For me? I thought it was because Gerald ate too much. Pierce, would this come under the head of what you call kidding? Put your head on my shoulder and I'll, uh, I'll tell you a secret. I'd rather look you straight in the eye. I've been doing a lot of thinking. Yes? I've come to the conclusion that Gerald is a nice guy. What does that mean? You ought to stick with him. You know, till death do you part. You didn't think so last night. I wasn't thinking last night, honey. The whole process started this afternoon. I woke up and there was a vision of a wedding bell. It scared the wits out of me. You're out of luck, Pierce. I'm not letting you out of your promise. Look, Susan, be sensible. Marriage and I were never meant for each other. I'm just not the marrying kind. No? Put your head on my shoulder and I'll tell you a secret. I'd rather just keep sitting beside you. Do you remember a certain crying jag that you had on a couple of weeks ago? Susan, I've never been drunk in my life. You were that night. And you told me a whole lot of things that you're going to regret in just about a minute. Suppose you tell them right back to me now. You lost a lot of money on a gambling boat before I met you. Huh? You paid off in IOUs. And when the gambler got tired of waiting for the cash, he threatened to see Papa. That's when you became a thief. Good Lord, Susan, what are you talking about? You took bonds out of your father's safe. He's got so many of them, you were sure they'd never be missed. I told you that? Your conscience was bothering you. <laughs> Bet you didn't know you had one. It's a sense you haven't. No, dear. I might really like meeting your father, telling him about those bonds. Eh? Yeah. I'm so glad you'll be waiting for me when I get back from Reno. Yeah. Come to think of it, not every woman wants to marry a thief. Oh, I'm lucky, huh? All right, let's celebrate with a drink. Friends? What else? You hold all the aces. <laughs> then we'll drink to that. Oh, no. Don't waste it that way. What's wrong? Let's lock arms. Then I'll drink out of your glass and you'll drink out of mine. Why, of course. Just like real sweethearts. Yes, dear. There's nothing like good old sparkling burgundy for launching a new life. Properly. There it is, Cap. The last episode. And you finish it with the old switch trick. The atropine pill in Pierce Carlton's glass. <laughs> I'm surprised at your mark. It's corny. Well, it happens to be true. Poison or no poison. Found out about it only this afternoon. You don't say. Who told you? Waiter in the orchid room. He saw them lock arms. And he remembered for ten bucks. What? You give me the name of that guy. I'll have him brought in here and I'll Easy book him. Easy. Oh. Hello, Captain McNair talking, homicide. That's all right, Finley. Go ahead. Uh, what? Are you sure? Mm hmm. Okay. Uh, check in at headquarters and file a report. I'll take care of the rest. What uh, sign of the horoscope were you born under, Mark? I don't know. Why? Well, you're either very smart or very lucky. Pierce Carlton lost $80,000 on Jimmy Bryson's gambling boat four months ago. Uh-huh. Uh, Finley just got it from Bryson himself. 
The uh, debt's been paid. That's how it is, Cap. When you go by character, you can't go wrong. Maybe I ought to have a little more respect for you, eh? Well, just read my books and I'll be happy. Yeah. Now, let's see. We've got four suspects. Gerald Steele, the husband, who was going to be left holding the empty bag. And who was still in the will for half of the fortune. Right. Mm -hmm. Robert Ward, the stepbrother who needed money and was turned down. He's in the will for the other half. My money's on him. Uh, Maybe. Claire Ellis, the lovesick rival, and Pierce Carlton, who didn't want to get married but who talked too much to Susan. Every one of them had motive and opportunity. What does your imagination advise us to do now? Uh, I got an idea, Cap. Hmm? Can you get me a sample of Susan Steele's handwriting? Yeah, her signature's on her will. I've got a copy of it over there in the case file. All right, let's get the best handwriting man you've got, and then you and I will go to work catching a murderer. Mm -hmm. Does your imagination tell you where? Of course. At my apartment. Mark, if this works, I'll buy you a new hat, Mm. and I'll eat your old one. And you. I'm supposed to be all alone, Cap. Uh, Gerald Steele? Yes? Uh, this is Mark Tent. Are you free to talk? What kind of a question is that? You'll understand. I was the last one to see your wife alive. So I read in the papers. You're also a friend of the police. <laughs> Only when it's convenient. For example, I didn't tell them that Susan gave me a note before she died. A what? Uh, there's a name in it, a murderer's name. Look here, Ken, what's that got to do with me? It's for sale, Gerald. I had nothing to do with Susan's death. Oh, of course, but who's going to believe it? Does that note give my name? Is is that what Susan's done to me? I'll be in my apartment until 7.10, Gerald. Uh, you're going to inherit a lot of money. I'm sure you'll want a partner to help you enjoy it. You certainly got your nerve with you, Mark. I've also got you for protection, Cap. Now we'll just do a repeat performance on Robert Ward. And uh, then we'll uh, go down the line, Claire Ellis and Pierce Carlton. One of them's liable to bite. Stay in that other room, Cap, and don't wait for gunfire. Don't worry about me, kid. Mm. Yes, yes, I heard you the first time. Hello, Miss Ellis. Come right in. Uh, Would you mind if I called you Claire? I want that letter, Mr. Kent. Uh, You wouldn't mind. And I thought this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. All I want from you is that letter. I've got a gun in my handbag and I'm not afraid to use it. I didn't think you would be. How much money did you bring? I didn't bring any. Well, Mr. Kent? I've got the answer, lady. And I'll take the handbag, too. I didn't kill Susan. Now, please, give me a chance to explain. Sure, sure. Come on. No, no. Pierce told Susan that he wasn't going to marry her. And I know she put his name on that letter. You don't have to protect that guy anymore. He told me the whole story the day after Susan died about her threat and why she threatened him. I made him tell me. Yeah, let's go. No, 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 please. Hmm? Somebody wants to come in here, Cam. Another one? Uh, Here's a magazine. Take Claire into that other room and read the advertisements to him. Yeah, come on, you. When that guy works in a case, you never know what's going to pop next. Coming. Oh. Get out of my way, Ken. Uh... With pleasure, but I'd be glad to do it, even if you didn't have a gun. Mr. Ward? Are you alone? Uh, now that you're here, practically. I don't trust you. Put up your hands and walk toward that other room. Oh, you're kidding, aren't you? Move along. I'm not going to waste any time on you. All right, but since when do blackmailers work with an audience? Just walk directly in front of me and into that room. I'm in. (laughs) You're a bigger fool than I thought, Mr. Kent. You should have protected yourself with a lie. Well, we, uh... All make mistakes, Mr. Warren. You've made your last one. I'm going to kill you. Don't you want that letter? I'll find it later, or I'll burn your apartment out of existence. I've got a right to my share of Susan's estate, and the law won't take it away from me now. So it was you who killed her? Of course. I needed money for my business, and she refused to lend it to me, the fool. No intelligence is she to know when I was prepared for every emergency. Yes, I sort of had that figured out. This box of pills. Pickup pills. Mm. A wonderful tonic. Unfortunately for Susan, the one I let her pick was atropine. Uh, don't look now, Mr. Ward, but there's a man behind you. <laughs> Drop that gun. Grab it. Captain McNair. Yeah, with bracelets you can't buy at Tiffany's. You uh, should have looked when I told you, Mr. Ward. Well, sure. Well, Mark, it gets me how you figured this whole thing out. Ah, uh, I'm a dreamer. Uh, Would you uh, like to take care of my old hat now? Your old hat? What do you expect me to do with it? 
You said you were going to eat it, didn't you? Oh, oh yeah. But I said I'd buy you a new one first. Well, a deal's a deal, but uh, I hope you won't mind waiting. I uh, no, I won't mind. <laughs> And so closes tonight's Crime Club book, Death at 710, based on a story by H.F.S. Moore. Stedman Coles did the radio adaptation. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Raymond Edward Johnson played the part of Mark Kent. Helen Shields was Susan Ward Steele. Cameron Pudon was Captain McNair. Ted Osborne played Gerald Steele. Eleanor Phelps was Claire Ellis. King Calder was Pierce Carlton. And Reese Taylor was heard as Robert Ward. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello. I hope I hadn't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very exciting story of a night that was made for fun and remade for murder. It's called Coney Island Nocturne. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there's a new crime club book available this week... And every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. the crime club. I'm the librarian. Coney Island Nocturne. Yes, we have a story for you. Come right over. Ah, you're here. Good. Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is, Coney Island Nocturne. The very absorbing story of fingers that were nailed by death. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. When Mike Donahue brought Helen O'Malley to Coney Island for an evening of fun, he had only the best intentions. Naturally, he was an officer of the law, a detective. And she was his fiancée. But three hours later, they stood in the middle of a crowded, noisy carnival street. They were faced with a crisis of catastrophic proportions. Mike, I'm afraid I'll never understand you. How many times have I told you never to keep your wallet in your hip pocket? Yeah. If you were just another palooka who didn't know any better, then, well, all right. But you're a member of the pickpocket squad. You're supposed to know. Yeah. Haven't you got anything to say? How much money have you got on you? Enough to get us home. Helen, you're not going to tell the boys at the station no, house. No, dear. I still expect to marry you someday. I want congratulations, not sympathy. Yeah, well... Hey, Mike. Uh, hmm? Who was that? Look over there, honey, and you'll see a character. Hiya, Mike. I never thought I'd be glad to see you. Benny Gould. You recognize me, don't you? Look me over, pal. I've done a 60-day stretch in a workhouse, and I ain't a bit tired. <laughs> what are you doing down here, Benny? I thought your territory was Times Square. I got a job. I'm going straight, Mike. You don't say. Yep. Got fed up looking through bars. So now I'm a barker for a show up the street. Hey, who's the uh, tomato? Helen O'Malley, chipmunk. Do you consider me fruit or vegetable? Huh? Oh, <laughs> It's a riot, Mike. Is it uh, permanent? Put your hands behind your head, Benny. What? I'm going to frisk you. Now, do you want to put him up, or do I have to coach you? I put him up. You can't got nothing on me. I'm on a level now, Mike. You're an old-time pickpocket, Benny. You know where you cops make a label stick. Once a crook, always a crook. Mike, he wouldn't have your wallet. Maybe not, Helen. But this dip can pick the whiskers off a sleeping cat and get away with it. Okay, Benny. Thanks. Come on, Helen. Hey, wait a minute. 
Was she kidding about your wallet? You're blocking traffic. Come on, you don't have to be ashamed to tell me about it. I used to be in the business. Uh, you wouldn't be giving it to us now, would you? Look, I know every dip on the island. Give me a chance, maybe I'll get your wallet back for you. Why, Chipmunk? Because I'm a good citizen, that's why. All right, Benny, let's go. Hey, what is this, a pinch? You were going to take me to the wallet, weren't you? i got to find it first, Mike. Suppose we do that together, huh? Uh-uh. Now, I ain't putting my finger on nobody. If you want your property, then you'll wait till I nab the guy that's got it, and then I'll bring it to you. Don't argue, Mike. Be practical. That's what I say, sister. I'm doing him a favor. But how is it done, Chipmunk? Coney Island's a big place. Well, I contact a few of the dips, and they spread the word around, that's all. Okay, Benny. It's going to take time, Mike. Uh, meet me at the beach at the end of the boardwalk in a couple hours. Eleven o'clock. And don't follow me. We won't. Mike wants his wallet, and I want Mike to be happy. We'll meet you on the beach at 11 o'clock. Boardwalk and... Oh, I think we ought to adopt Benny, don't you? It was his suggestion. Oh, we're not exactly alone, Helen. Are you going to worry about that girl all night? Well, she might be watching us. She's fast asleep. Besides, she's a good 30 feet away. Come on, my bashful Romeo. Give me a... Hmm? It's only me, Mike. I didn't want to keep you waiting. Benny, don't you ever blow your horn when you come to a crossing? Blow my... Oh, I get it. Well, I figured it didn't mean nothing. See, there ain't no moon out. Have you got the wallet? Not yet, pal. You said 11 o'clock, and it's almost half past. Okay, but Coney Island's got a lot of depths, and it's spread out all over. you got to be patient, Mike. How much longer? Listen, i got a couple of dozen guys working right now. Stick around for a little while. You ain't got nothing to lose with that tomato. I'll see you later. Where are you going? My boss gets worried when he don't know what I'm doing. So long. Now, Mike, where were we? What do you mean, Helen? When we were so rudely interrupted with a report about nothing. Oh, uh, let's go home, huh? But, Mike... Well, it's a long trip, honey, and I've got to be at the station house at 8 o'clock in the morning. But your wallet... Then he can send it to me. He knows where. What was that? Thunder, baby. We'll have to run. I hope it pours. Help me All up. All right, come on. I hope it pours for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, let's go. Wait a minute. We can't leave that girl sleeping there on the beach. No. No, oh, I'm going to wake her up. Oh, of course. Oh, don't be unreasonable, Helen. There's going to be a storm. How would you like to get drenched? Why oh, wait for a storm? You can dampen my spirits. Uh oh. What's the matter? It's raining. Already? I just felt a drop on my nose. Let's get out of here, Mike. Wait a minute, dear. Oh, excuse me, lady. I think you'd better. Uh, miss. Miss. Why don't you just yell in her ear? I don't think it would do any good, Helen. Well, try it and find out. I just felt another drop. You just can't wake up the dead by making a lot of noise. Huh? Mike, she isn't. She is, Helen. From head to foot. The poor kid. And to think we were sitting only 30 feet away on the same beach. Well, she was dead before we got here, Helen. I'll never forgive myself, Mike, the way I talked about her. But if it hadn't been for that storm that never broke... I... Mike, I feel terrible. Well, here's something to keep you busy. Her handbag? Yeah, look through it. She might have some identification. All right. I should get to a call box, you know. The local police might have hear about this. I'm not staying here alone. I don't know what there is about the dead that scares Are people, Are you sure she was murdered, Mike? Her skull was crushed with a sandbag. I can't believe a little thing like that could kill anybody. Well, this little thing weighs about ten pounds, honey, and it's packed solid. Well, Mike. What's the matter? Look. Your wallet. Well, I'll be... It was in her handbag. Give it to me. Of all things, that girl, a pickpocket. 20, 25, 30, It sort of shatters your faith in people, doesn't it? 40, so young and so pretty. 40, 40, 40. It's all here, What's Helen? all here? My money. Oh, that's good. Well, aren't you glad? I'm too busy wondering about human nature. Well, postpone it until we get a line on the girl. Come on, keep looking in her handbag. Mike, darling, you may be a detective, but... Then I'll look. That's your job. Oh, dear, a pickpocket. Mike, what kind of people murder pickpockets? All kinds. Well, I mean, pickpockets are the lowest kind of crooks, the bottom of the underworld. They don't work in mobs, do they? Sometimes. Hmm. Maggie Blake. What's that? A name on this identification card. A pickpocket with a... It doesn't make sense, Mike. It never does, honey, until you know what it's all about. Do you? No, but I'm going to find out. That's nice. Where do we start? First, we head to a call box. Get the homicide squad working. As long as we do it together, dear. And after that, we're going to Josie Johnson's Palace of Joy. We're going where? Read it. 
It's on this business card I found in Maggie Blake's handbag. Oh. Well, as long as they advertise, it should be all right, shouldn't it? Helen, what's wrong with you? You'll never know, Mike, what I thought you were talking about. Oh, it's you. I'm glad to see you again. Where have you been keeping yourself? I went out for a walk, Josie. You're a liar. Hey, now look. I said you're a liar. What are you going to do about it? We're, uh... We're doing pretty good business, Josie. So what? Suckers like the show we give them. I give them. You're only window dressing like a husband should be. But you're not even good window dressing. Uh, put that bottle back. I haven't had a drink all night, Josie. Put it back and lock that drawer. Oh, just one. There's the key on top of the desk. Use it. Between you and me, I don't care if you drink yourself into pink elephants. But you talk when you're drunk. And that's bad for me. Oh, I don't know why I've got to take it from you. Stop any time you want. There's a bed at the bottom of the ocean. Now, give me that key. I started this business. It was my idea to set up the show. That was so long ago, you've died a hundred times since. Where have you been for the last three hours? I told you. Just walking around, huh? Inhaling the fresh Coney Island air. I got tired sitting around the office watching you run you things. You said you were going out front for a couple of minutes to look around. So I went for a walk. What's the difference? Came back and you weren't here, so I went out again. How's uh, Maggie Blake? What? Don't look so dumb. You were out with her, weren't you? No. Pete, this is Josie you're talking to, your wife. I've known you for a long time. I haven't seen the girl, I tell you. You, you want me to lay you off, and I, I... Was she here? Are you kidding? Well, didn't she even bring in the take? Are you calling me a cheat? No, no, wait, wait, Josie, wait a minute. You you know I don't think you're a doubler, but Maggie always comes in a few times like the others, and she's pretty regular. She was too busy tonight. Not with me. Shut up, Pete. You're through making a monkey out of me. Josie, you're all wrong. Everybody on the island's talking about you and Maggie. I'm telling you for the last time, I don't like it. I don't like people feeling sorry for me. Why don't you give her the air? Because she knows too much. Uh, Palace of Joy. Josie Johnson talking. Uh, This is Bunny. I got a message for Pete. What is it? Tell him I can't find Maggie Blake. That's all. That's enough, Benny. Nice going, Pete. When did you decide to use Benny as a stooge? What do you mean, Joe? What do you take me for, a two-year-old? You think I start believing because Benny calls up and says you've had him looking for Maggie? Is that what he just told you? You cheap, chiseled sneak. (laughs) Now get out of here. Go out front and help take tickets. I'm sorry you did that, Joe. Go on, go on. I get sick looking at you. You've been having things your own way too long, baby. Look out you don't drop dead one of these days. You're very funny, Pete. Yeah, yeah. I'm a real comedian, but don't laugh too hard. You're liable to fall out of this world. Should be an office here, Helen. Another door besides the main entrance from the street. Should bees don't count. So this is the Palace of Joy. Who's crazy, Mike? The world? I've got no time to think about it now. Oh, excuse me. The pickpocket squad has to solve a murder first. Lights can wait. I tell you, Maggie Blake, it's something to do with this place. Just because you found that business card in her handbag. Maybe. You're driving without lights, darling. Business cards don't prove... Say, Mike. Hmm? There's Benny. Where? Talking to that man by that puppet stage. Well, that's funny. I was looking over there only a minute ago. I didn't see anyone. It could be magic, you know. Ah, this must be the place he works in. And maybe that's Josie Johnson he's talking to. Come on, we'll ask him a few questions about Maggie Blake. Anything you say, dear, you're the law. But who would come here to see a puppet show? This isn't exactly a playground for kids. Oh, are you beginning to get ideas, too? It just hit me, all of a sudden. Maybe the shows they put on here are not for kids. You know. I've been around, sweetheart. What? Concentrate on Benny and his partner. They've seen us and they've stopped talking. Hiya, Mike. Hey, how'd you and the doll find out about me in the palace? You've been uh, asking questions? We found a card in the storm, Benny. Storm? 
What you talking about, Mike? There ain't been no storm. Who's this guy, Benny? Give me a chance to introduce you to him. Pete, this is Mike Donahue, a deck from Times Square. I'm pleased to meet you. Pickpocket squad. The name's his girlfriend. Yeah. Well, I hope you enjoy yourselves. I'll be seeing you. Just a minute. I've seen you before someplace. Were you over in the lineup at police headquarters? Who, me? What's your full name? Pete. Peter Blake. Mike. Peter Blake, huh? Any relation to Maggie? Yeah. Yeah, she's my niece. But she's not in trouble, is she, Mr. Donahue? Not anymore. Benny, where do I find Josie Johnson? The boy? Mm-hmm. I don't get it, Mike. You're acting just like a cop on the prowl. You recognize all the signs, don't you? Get Josie Johnson. The boss ain't here. Benny, you want me to be nice to you? I'm telling the truth, Mike. I came back looking for the boss myself. Pete told That's me. That's right, Mr. Donahue. Now, now, would you mind? I'd, I'd like to know about my niece. She's been murdered, Mr. Blake. She... Murdered? Yeah. You're kidding, Mike. Not that cute little kid that used oh, to... Maggie. Take Maggie. it easy, Pete. That's not going to get you no price. Oh, but why? Why should anybody kill Maggie? She never... Mr. Donahue, where is she? At the morgue by now. Would you like to tell me what she never did? I'm going to claim her body. I'll see you later if you're still here. Mike, you're not letting him go, are you? Why not, Helen? But he didn't even ask how his niece was killed. I noticed it. I noticed the tears, too. They were the kind you find on a crocodile. So, why didn't you hold him? Darling, a policeman doesn't hold everybody. Does he, Benny? Well, pick on me, Mike. I don't know nothing about it. Sure. Okay, so don't... Give me the eye like I was ready for the wagon. I'm on your side, ain't I? I'm trying to get your wallet back for you, ain't I? Keep trying, Benny. Okay, I'll go out and contact some more depths. Stick around, I'll let you know what comes up. Mike, why didn't you tell him you've got the wallet? Then Benny would have stuck around, too. And I think we ought to be alone. Here, with all these people? They won't pay any attention to us. They're too busy having fun. Well, we're going to get busy, too. What do you mean? How did Benny and Pete get to this puppet stage without my seeing them? Magic? Maybe. But I've got a hunch. We find out how, and we'll find out why and who killed Maggie Blake. Oh, you're back again? What's the idea, sneaking in through that alley door? There's a dick out front, Josie. Yeah? He was asking for you. Benny and I played dumb. We didn't tell him you were here in the office. What was he asking for me for? Murder. Huh? Maggie Blake. You killed her, Josie. Have you gone crazy? <laughs> now, wait a minute, I've been Pete. waiting a long time, baby. You shouldn't have done it. You're going to have to leave town now. We'll see about that. That was some act you put on before. Getting hot because I was out with Maggie. But you knew I wasn't, didn't you, Josie? You knew she was dead. You were ne knew exactly where she was because you'd left her Hello, there. Express. I want the city editor. You please. thought I was sweet on her. Well, sure I was. I was nuts about her. But you didn't have to kill her. She was going to get married. Yeah, yeah, she found herself a boyfriend, a good, clean kid. She was going to quit the racket. She told me this afternoon, Josie. City editor, this is Josie Johnson. I own the Palace of Joy. I've just been to... All right, I'll wait. I wasn't going to tell you about it. I was going to let her get away first. I was going to make sure she lived to get married, but Shut you... Shut up, Pete. Hello? Yeah, Josie Johnson. I've just been told that one of my employees was murdered. Maggie Blake. Uh-huh. Uh, on the beach? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Well, it checks, don't it, Angel? She was slugged with a sandbag, Pete. How soon are you going, Josie? Gone where? Away. You're not waiting for the cops, are you? I didn't kill her. That dick out front thinks you did. He asked for you. Yeah, and you told him I wasn't here. You want him to think I'd taken a powder. Why don't you? I'll give you enough dough to get out of the country. You give me? This is my show now. Meet the new boss. You don't say. Yeah, I do. <laughs> That's. For the new boss, Pete. Why, you red-headed... What's that? Well, come on, open up! The detective Mike ah. Donahue. Who told him about that door behind the puppet stage? I'm not waiting to find out. So long, Josie, and good burning to you. Not as long as you're alive, Pete. Don't run so fast, baby. You'll go through the wall. Open that door and let's get out of here. I'm glad you built that other door solid. For 
for a louse. She used to have good ideas. Look around before you go into that alley. It's clear. You got the keys. Come on, come on. Have you got him? I got him. Okay, give him to me. I'll lock this door on the outside. Boy, whoever put that door up... Mike, you're it. wonderful. Hmm? Tell that to my commissioner. There was a man and woman in here. We heard the voices. Locked. They didn't go out this way. You said there was something behind that puppet stage. But why an office? What kind of a business that would they... That door be... over there. It's the only way out. Mike, is there something in this palace of joy besides uh, uh, joy? Well? A flight of steps going down the cellar. Are we going down that flight? Yeah. Here's the light switch. Oh, I'd feel a lot safer, Mike, if there were more than two of us. Let's not think about that now. Come on, follow me. Mike. Stop worrying, Helen. There's nobody down here. How can you be so sure? All these boxes piled rows up to the ceiling. Suppose those two people are behind one of these rows. They're not waiting to see the whites of our eyes, honey. If they were down here, they... Uh, wait a minute. I'd rather go, Mike. Sandbag. Just like the one Maggie Blake was killed with. What difference does it make? There's a puppet stage upstairs. Why can't they keep an extra sand? Oh. Oh. I see what you mean. Thanks. You're almost as slow as I am. Sandbags are used to hold down the curtain. The one on the beach had to come from here. But there are other puppet shows at Coney Island. But only one palace of joy that Maggie Blake was connected with. We met her uncle upstairs, remember? Yes, dear. Uh, shall we go now? Not yet. There must be some way that man or woman got out. Let's turn this corner. I'm sure we won't find prosperity. <gasps> those men. Hmm? All those men standing against the wall. What's the matter with you, Helen? Can't you see they're only dummies? I don't care that they are. I'm not taking another step. All right, stay here. With pleasure. Those filthy, horrible-looking things. Yeah, I can tell you exactly what they are. Helen, where are you? Sitting down, Mike, behind the pile of boxes. Well, listen, these are training dominies. The kind they uh, old-time pickpockets use to, to teach newcomers. Come over here and I'll show you the lights that flash on when the student is clumsy. Hmm. Palace of Joy, huh? Hmm. Josie Johnson's running a school for pickpockets. That means that Benny is Figure one of the... Figure it out for yourself, Cupcake. Hmm? My, do you look surprised. Who are you? Josie Johnson. Now, turn around, Mike, and I'll take your pretty 38 out of your pretty holster. Uh-uh. Just keep your hands up high. Where's Helen, the girl that was She's down here? She's resting. She collided with the butt of my gun, and it uh, knocked her out. Why did you do it? I got jealous. You're uh, such a handsome guy for a cop. You know all about me, eh? <laughs> Not all, Cupcake. Give me time. I've only just met you. I'm going to go look for Helen. Not without my permission. Now, listen, she might be barely hurt. She'll recover in time for the wedding. How would you like to be a hero? You make a practice of hitting women on the head. Mike, I'm trying to get you a medal. I know who killed Maggie Blake. Yeah? I guess it was somebody else, wasn't it? It was. And if you'll go quietly, I'll take you right to him. Where? He's in my apartment. And he's dying to meet you. <laughs> Go ahead, Cupcake. Turn the knob. How about the key, Josie? I never lock my door. I'm a free trader. Okay. Forward, Mike. I'll be right behind you. Loaded to the hilt. You're so persuasive. You'll admit I've got a way about me. Yeah, so I see. Hmm. Is that the guy who's dying to meet me? That's him. Sprawled out over that table drunk again. Pete. Hey, Pete. Say, that's Maggie Blake's uncle. What? Who told you that? He did. Well, he'll tell you differently. That's Pete Johnson, my husband. Wake him up. Well, I'll get him to sit up first. <clears throat> A knife in his chest. Pete! You can't hear you, Josie. He's dead. Killed himself. Yeah. He couldn't take the rap. He must have done it just before we came in. He's still got his fingers around the knife. Will you stop kidding me? Uh what do you mean? Your initials are on the handle. J.J. So what? The knife was on that table and he took it. Josie, you ought to know what happens right after a person dies. He's dead, so? His body relaxes. If Pete killed himself, he wouldn't be holding on to the knife. Huh? You catch on fast, don't you? Pete's fingers were wrapped around that knife after he was killed. You're not going to say I did it, Mike. Who else? You brought me here to arrest Pete for murder. But you knew he was already dead. Set up to look like suicide. You're raving, mister. That was going to be your alibi. Pete couldn't take the rap. Your own words, Josie. Yeah. 
Well? Huh. How many bullets do I get? I ought to give them all to you. Both guns. That means I get a hero's funeral. Turn around and walk to that wall. I get it in the back, huh? Gangster style. That wall, Mike. All right. But remember, no practice shots. You're pretty cool for tamale. Death in the line of duty. It makes great newspaper copy. Turn your face to the wall. Now, just stand there and don't move and don't look. So long, cupcake. Hey, what's the idea? Josie, you'll never get out of New York. You know that. Well, and she told me she never locks her door. It's all right, Helen. Everything's all right now. Mike, what hit me? The butt of a gun. Next time, you stick close to me. Uh, who did? Josie Johnson. She locked me in her apartment. Oh. Lucky for me, there was a window facing a street. You should have heard me yell. It's Josie Johnson. Mike, did you say she? Mm-hmm. Her glamorous redhead. Shh. Mike. Shh. Somebody's down here. The redhead? I don't know. These boxes are in the way. Can you get up without screaming? If you help me. All right, then. Easy now. Oh. Oh. Ooh. I made it. Come on. On your toes. No more talk. If it's Josie, she's got two guns. One of them is mine. Going someplace, Benny? Uh, Look out, Mike. He's got a gun under his You'll coat. You'll get a chance to use it, will you, Benny? I got my hand. Where's the gun? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that was you and a dog, Mike. I wouldn't pull no gun on you. But you did. That's a lot of money you packed into that suitcase. Do you expect to spend it in one lifetime? You gotta listen to me, Mike. I don't got it, pal, but I'll be glad to. Look, I found out that Josie and Pete was operating a pickpocket school. When the kids was ready, they used to send them out to dip. Tell me about the money. Well, the kids used to bring in the whole take to Josie. She'd give them a cut and put the rest of it in that hole behind that hunk of concrete. How does a barker find out about such things, Benny? I heard Josie and Pete talking. And you knew exactly where to go for the money. You gotta listen to me, Mike. I ain't no killer. Come on, let's take a walk. No, wait, I don't I don't want that dough. I, I, I was just gonna take it because, well, you know, it was dead, and I, I figured... You should have made sure Pete was dead before you left him. What? It's not so easy to find the heart with a knife. Sometimes you're missed by a fraction of an inch, and you wind up in the electric chair. What are you giving me, Mike? Pete Johnson, otherwise known as Peter Blake, famous uncle. He ain't dead. He is now... But a lot of people heard his dying statement. Would you like to know what it was? You're kidding me. Don't look around, Benny. There's no way out of this cellar except through You're me. You're kidding me, you dirty copy. You're kidding me. Let's go, Weasel. The show's over. And you put on a pretty good one. It's too bad for you it didn't click. First part of going to Coney Island, the ride home in the subway. Yeah. Oh, well, Benny's confession sort of makes it worthwhile. Imagine that chipmunk having the whole thing planned from the beginning. Yeah. Picking your pocket and then asking us to meet him on the beach where he'd left Maggie Blake's dead body. What a character. And all for a few measly dollars. Thirty thousand. I even thought he'd get away with it. You'd suspect Josie and Pete Johnson of Maggie's murder and he'd be... Mike, you didn't tell me how he got to Pete to kill him. I guess I'll have to, will I? Well, he followed them to their apartment after they left the office. Yes. Then he phoned Josie and told her to help him frame Pete. She came back to the palace looking for me. Well, the rest is history. Yes, but Mike, what made you suspect Benny? Two things, sweetheart. Josie had a chance to kill me and didn't. And Benny going for the money in the wall. Uh, can I go to sleep now, dear? One more thing. What happened to Josie? She was picked up. Now, darling... All right, honey. Mike. Hmm? Is this your wallet? Where'd you get it? Out of your hip pocket. For a member of the pickpocket squad, you are about the easiest pickings I've ever known. Good night, dear. And so closes tonight's story, Coney Island Nocturne. Stedman Coles wrote the radio script. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Walter Kinsella played Mike Donahue. Joan Alexander was Helen O'Malley. Jean Ellen was heard as Josie Johnson. Bill Quinn was Peter Johnson. And Joseph Julian was Benny Gould. Oh, I beg your pardon. 
Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very exciting story of a sparkle that bloomed into murder. It's called Death Deals a Diamond. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there is a new Crime Club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting... Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Death deals a diamond. Yes, we have that story for you. Come right over. Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is. Death Deals a Diamond. The very exciting story of a brilliant play that was finessed by murder. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. Hal Hampton had been in the diamond business. Taking without paying. And then one day he heard a judge say... Five years in the state prison. And Hal Hampton was no longer in the diamond business. Our story begins early one evening, five years and three weeks later. Hal was in his room at a midtown hotel, trying to forget the past and wondering what to do about the future, when there came a knock, knock, knocking at the door. Not expecting anyone, he opened it anyway. Hello, Hal. Uh so what's the big idea? Don't argue with me, sweetheart. I might get nervous and shoot. What do you want? Ask me in first. Oh, come on. Be a gentleman. Well, there's not much I can do about it, is there? Would you mind if we left the door open just a little bit? Company outside? I like cross ventilation. Okay. Behave yourself and it won't be in you. What's your name? Myra Keats. Don't look so hard. You've never met me before. I wasn't exactly looking at your eyes, honey. Who sent you here? I work for the Lawless Detective Agency. You don't say. No wisecracks. The boss's name happens to be Sam Lawless. All right, Myra, what's this all about? I want the diamonds you stole from Randy's jewelry store. What? A half a million dollars worth. And don't tell me you didn't take them. Now, look, I just finished a five-year stretch. I've just been out three weeks. I know all about it. But I'm talking about yesterday when you walked out of Mr. Randy's office with a tray full of diamonds. Who told you that? Mr. Randy. Yeah? Why didn't he yell for the police? He couldn't at the time. No, he'd rather not. He wants his diamonds, and he's willing to pay $25,000 to get them. Go on, Myra. You're beginning to fascinate me. Mr. Randy doesn't want publicity, that's all. He's got a high-class trade. So I see. Well, Mr. Hampton? It just occurred to me that I'm feeling fine. I've got nothing to worry about. I'm glad to hear that, pal. What? Oh. Is that the cross-ventilation? Mm-hmm. Sam Lawless, the boss. With a gun, no less. Well, two guns are better than one. Shut up, Hal. You're still an amateur, Myra. You should have had this guy hanging on the ropes by now. You didn't give me a chance, Sam. He's only a crook, and Mr. Randy's giving him a break. Twenty-five grand instead of twenty years in jail. <laughs> Shut up, or I'll give you the gun across the kisser. Oh, you're a tough guy, huh? Listen, you ex-con. Sam. Okay, baby. I got plenty of time to draw blood. Let's search the room. You take that chest of drawers, and I'll pull the bed apart. Just a couple of amateurs, huh? This is only the beginning, pal. Okay, let me know when you're through and I'll tell you where else to look. Sam, come here. You find them, baby? Just come over here and take a look at what was under a pile of handkerchiefs. Yeah. 
So you don't hide things in a chest of drawers, do you, Hal? Where'd that diamond come from? Look at him, Myra. He's surprised. You're framing me. You just planted that stone in there. You tell us where you put the others, or we'll plant a stone over your head. Now listen to me. The others, Mr. Hampton, where are they? Look around for yourself. You've got a knack for finding things. Oh, he won't cooperate, Myra. Well, there's only one thing to do. Here, put these handcuffs on him. With pleasure. Now, wait a minute. Now, don't be a problem, child. I wouldn't like to spank the life out of you. But you're going to anyway. Not yet. First, we'll take a trip to my office. Mr. Randy is waiting for you with a lot of bad news. No, no, Mr. Hampton, there's no need to be so upset. Get these cuffs off me, Mr. Randy. Sam, the man is very uncomfortable. Maybe he'll talk faster. Sorry, Mr. Hampton, I've done my best. Now, about those diamonds you stole from me. Oh, nuts. Please be more expressive. We know your reputation for slickness and charm, the most renowned diamond thief since the great raffle. Thanks for the plug. Do I take a bow? Unfortunately, I didn't know you yesterday when I let you into my store and into my office where I keep my greatest treasures. Sure, sure. Please don't deny that you were there, Mr. Hampton. I've already done that. I showed you a tray full of diamonds, and you walked out with it while I was in the safe getting another. <laughs> Very well. Myra, will you ask Mr. Brown to come in here? Of course, Mr. Randy. Mr. Brown? We've not missed other room, Mr. Randy. Well, look for him. All right. And now, Mr. Hampton, just in case you're wondering, Mr. Brown is one of my salesmen. He waited on you just before he turned you over to me. Oh, you've got the whole team out, haven't you? Except the police. And I'll call them if you refuse to do business with me. $25,000 worth? That was my offer. Grab it, Hal. Don't be a sucker. Oh, uh, by the way, what does Sam get out of this deal? Oh, a small service charge. Plus a very handsome reward of $5,000. Uh-huh. 30000 just to get back your own merchandise? The insurance company ought to build you a monument, Randy. Shall we talk about diamonds, Mr. Hampton? You talk. I'm going. Where to, Hal? Oh. <laughs> Sam, that gun's beginning to look like a double feature. I hope it doesn't bore you, pal. Oh, uh, excuse me, gentlemen. Come in, Brown. I was walking up and down in the hallway. It's so much cooler than in the... Oh, my. Handcuffs. Yeah, it seems to be the latest style, Brownie. Brownie? Now, look here, young man. I don't like that. Why, Mr. Randy... This young man, he's the diamond thief. Mr. Hampton denies that he was in my store, Brown. He does. But that's ridiculous. I waited on you, Mr. Hampton. And I couldn't do a thing to please you. Ah, go on. I bet you didn't even try, Brownie. I was forced to ask Mr. Randy to take over. Then you and he went into his office. The next thing I knew, Mr. Randy was asking about you. He'd been robbed, and you had disappeared. Does that settle it, Mr. Hampton? Only from your angle, Randy, but you'll never get away with it. You prefer to be stubborn. Very well, Sam, take over. Right. I'll get the truth out of him. I'm sure you will. Come along, Brown. We must get back to the store. Uh, yes, sir. Myra, I want you and Sam to see that Mr. Hampton doesn't leave without my consent. He won't, Mr. Randy. Will he, Sam? I don't want to be disturbed, baby. All right. Now, Hal, it's just you and me. You want to talk while you've still got a mouth? Look, why don't you give me a break? I've just done five years. <laughs> get these cuffs off me. Don't be sore, pal. I'm only doing my duty. I promised Mr. Randy I'd get the truth out of you. And I've never welched on a promise to a client yet. Well, Sam? It's no go, Myra. You won't open up? Nope. Why'd you quit? Listen, you can't beat an unconscious guy. That guy in the next room is out cold. Why don't you use some water on him? I've been told it works miracles. You're a pretty cold baby, Myra. I don't like crooks. Yeah? Well, I'm not so sure Hal's the crook in this case. What? No guy can take the beating I just gave him and keep his mouth shut. Not even for a half a million in diamonds? I almost killed him, Myra. You heard him yelling. I didn't hear him yell diamonds, Sam. I tell you, he's innocent. That goes okay with hearts and flowers. But we've got $5,000 tied up in a confession from hell. What makes you so anxious to get that confession? Well, I've been told a girl can get a pretty good mink coat for half of $5,000. That's all? 
Maybe if I shop around, I can get a mink coat and a pair of shoes. That confession wouldn't be tied up with a double cross, would it, baby? What do you mean? You found that diamond in Hal's room, in the chest of drawers. So? A very peculiar place for a diamond that wasn't planted. Hold your horses, Sam. Hal Hampton was one of the smartest con men in the business before he went to jail, and he's still smart. He wouldn't keep stolen property where it could be found. You uh, get your ideas late in life, don't you? I get them when they count, honey. You, uh... You palmed that stone, didn't you? You're crazy. You had it on you all the time. And when you went to that chest of drawers, you just parked it under the handkerchiefs. You're getting crazier by the word. You've got the rest of that fortune, too, baby. Do tell. And who gave it to me? Randy, maybe. For safekeeping? Yeah? Yeah. While Hal Hampton was being set up for 20 years. Oh, get yourself locked up where it's good and quiet. You're becoming a menace. I've got a better idea. What you've got, we're going to keep. That'll teach Randy never to trust anybody. Would you, uh, double-cross a paying client? Fifty percent, baby, of half a million in stones. Come on, take me to them. I'm dying for a split. You, uh, better close that door, Sam. What for? Mr. Hampton may not be as unconscious as you think. Okay. Now. Now. Hey, put down that gun, Myra. Give me one good reason, Sam. What are you going to do? Nothing. I just want to see your apartment again. And you're going to take me there. Eh? What for? Diamonds, dear. You know what you said about me. Except this is with reverse English. Oh. Hal. Mm. Watch me. It's Myra. Come on. Sit up. Let me get at that guy. Get these cuffs off me. They are off, honey. What? I took them off. Oh. Thanks a half million. Was it before or after I died? I don't blame you for being sore at me. I was all wrong about you, sweetheart. Uh Um... I mean it. You didn't steal those diamonds. Oh, no. Please believe me. I even convinced Sam you didn't. Did it, uh... Did it take much convincing? A little. And, uh... You did it off for me... Do you mind? You're so handsome. No, I don't mind. Come here, baby. (laughs) See what I mean, Hal? I see. Not bad. Now, if you could only sound as good as you taste... Hal! This would be paradise. You low-down heel. I should have let Sam kill you. And rub out a possibility? You're no good to me at all. I try to help you. I try to get you out of a hole. That you got me into. I didn't put that diamond under your handkerchief. It wasn't on my laundry list, Blue Eyes. I didn't put it there. Now, do you want to get out of this frame, or don't you? I do, Myra, but not with your help. You're going to get it, whether you like it or not. Now, listen. Mr. Andy and Sam Lawless had a meeting three days ago. The first of a series, I suppose. Sam didn't tell me what it was about. But I've got a hunch that you and Diamonds were on the agenda. Keep going, Myra. Randy's business hasn't been all it's cracked up to be. A lot of stock and a few customers, and you know how a man sees red. Uh Uh-huh. And you think he's shifting stock to collect insurance? I'm not to be quoted, Hal. I'll keep it a state secret. Now, the Diamonds. I'm not sure. But Randy's too smart to stow them where they might be found. But uh, Sam isn't, huh? Don't count your chickens before you can buy them. Sam Lawless is very smart. But he doesn't know I suspect him, and he might be just a wee bit careless. Mm Mm-hmm. And the logical place for that wee bit of carelessness? I don't know. Okay. We'll start with his apartment. You show me where. Oh, I guess we're too late, Hal. Sam's gone. Yeah. Well... No use turning the doorknob, sweetie. Sam never leaves his door unlocked. Never? Well, let's say hardly ever. I don't like it, Hal. Something's wrong. Oh, living room looks all right. Well, the lights are on. Um, would, uh, would that room over there be the bedroom? Hal? Okay, okay, just a point of information. Let's go look, then the next time you're asked, you'll know. Thanks. You're so educational. Well, let it... Holy smoke. <sighs> Sam. Stay where you are, baby. Sam, on the floor. How is he, Hal? He was shot through the head. Oh? Is he dead? Don't you know, Myra? What? What were you doing while I was sleeping off that beating in Sam's office? I was... Hal, did I ever call you a heel? I think you did. Then you're a double heel if you think I killed him. 
In the first place, what for? A sparkling motive, honey. You're wrong. I don't know where the diamonds are, and I was only guessing about Sam. And in the second place, I haven't got wings. Not the heavenly kind, anyway. You were unconscious only about ten minutes, and I brought you two. That leaves me out. Could I get here to Sam's apartment, kill him, and then get back to Sam's office in, in ten minutes? You could, if, uh, if I was unconscious, say, uh, half an hour. But you... Company. I'll take it, Myra. Hello? What? Uh, let me speak to Myra Keats, please. Why not? For you, Myra. Sounds like Randy. Oh? And he asked for me? Maybe he knows what he's doing, huh? Maybe. Hello? Myra, was that Mr. Hampton who answered the phone? Yes. What's he doing in Sam's apartment? I brought him here. Why? I distinctly remember asking you to keep him in Sam's office. And I distinctly remember changing my mind. Perhaps you'll learn that I don't like to have my orders countermanded, Miss Keats. Perhaps I will, Mr. Randy, but not tonight. Oh, I see. Will you tell Mr. Lawless that if he wants to do business with me, he'll have to get rid of you. Do you understand? He gets rid of you or I get rid of him. You hear that, Hal? I heard it. He didn't even ask for Sam. Maybe he didn't throw him the right cue. What? There's nothing like a prearranged argument to make the case more binding. Five years in prison have done things to your mind, haven't they? Uh-huh. Doesn't trust anybody. All right. Then I'll prove to you I had nothing to do with Sam's death or with Randy's phone call. Wait for me. Here? Here. <laughs> I wonder what you'd look like without a gun. I'm going to see Randy with it. When I'm through with him, you'll be calling me lovey-dovey. Long distance. Don't kid yourself. And, Hal, don't try to use that phone to tip off Randy. I'm going to pay him a visit. Well, to tell you the truth... It's been disconnected. You're powerful, honey. But how are you going to keep me here without a key? I have that, too. And don't ask me where I got it. A gentleman never does. Goodbye, darling. Oh, no. Myra, Myra, don't be a fool. I believe you. Myra, I believe you. Now, let me out. Baby, I don't want you to do anything I'll be sorry for. <laughs> yoo -hoo. Listen, mister, are you trying to flirt with me? Got any objections? What'll the natives think? I'll tell them it's just an across-the-courtship. Oh, a comedian. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't pull that window down. Why not? You got something better to offer? What's your name? Cookie. And I ain't even taken the trouble to ask you yours. It's Hal Hampton, Cookie, and I'm in trouble. Natch? A fellow that you who's the nice girls across the court. Cookie. Cookie, wouldn't you like to help me out of a fix? Oh, so now it comes to a proposition. I guess all you men are alike. No, please, please. I really need help. Yeah? Of the nature of what kind? Now, look, I I'm trapped in this apartment, see? Will you help me? Oh, all right. What must I do that will not compromise me with my reputation? Come to this apartment and bring a hairpin with you. A hairpin? What for? So you can pass it through the keyhole, then I'll use it to unlock the door. Is that all you want me to do? <sighs> One thing at a time, baby. After I'm out, I, uh, I promise to pay you a visit in person. Oh. Well, why didn't you say that in the first place? Tall, handsome, and mysterious. I'll be right over. <laughs> Imagine opening a door with a hairpin. Honest, Mr. Hampton, I'll never get over it. Well, you keep thinking about it, Cookie, while I use your phone, huh? I read about such things in books, but I... Uh, excuse me, mister, you got ideas about calling another girl? Oh, no, I wouldn't do a thing like that to you, baby. Well, then you're a gentleman. Because after all, if it wasn't for me and now, my hold it, hairpin... Hold it, baby, will you? Hello, Randy's jewelry store. Who is this? Mr. Brown, sir. Is there anything I can do? Uh, this is Hal Hampton. Let me talk to oh, Mr... Mr. Hampton. Would you like to speak to Mr. Randy? Yeah. Well, he was here only a few minutes ago. He went out with Miss Keats. Oh, where to? Uh, he mentioned his apartment, sir. Uh-huh. Okay, meet me there right away. Aye. But what should I do with this store? I'll tell you some other time. Randy needs you at his apartment. Really? He said nothing to me. How could he, Brownie? He didn't know he was going to be set up for a murder. I'll get there as fast as you can. Are you going, Mr. Hampton? Uh, yeah, I'm afraid I'll have to, Cookie. Do you mind? Well, I was sort of building myself up. I thought you were going to... You know. Well... Uh... Not quite, baby. But um, I'll be back someday, and uh, then you and I will get together. Yeah? Uh huh. And uh, you can draw me a nice big diagram. Oh, 
Oh, uh, Mr. Hampton. Oh, Brownie, you got here in record time. Your message was so full of foreboding, I, I had to rush. All right, all right. Take a minute to catch your breath. Oh, no. If Mr. Randy's in danger, I... Well, we must get to him immediately. Well, you're strictly loyal, aren't you? I've been associated with him for 20 years, and I've been very happy. Is that why you lied about my having been at the store? Mr. Hampton, you've tricked me. You said Mr. Randy's life was in danger. So I did. Well, the boss doesn't answer and the door's locked. How's your shoulder, Brownie? Yeah, except for a little rheumatism now and then. I never complain. Well, you're going to help me break down the store. Break it down? Oh, no, Mr. Hampton. I couldn't do that. Well, don't tell me you've got scruples, old man. Come on, now. Here. Oh, Mr. Randy will never forgive me. Once more, Brownie. Uh, oh. Well, you've done it, Mr. Hampton. If Mr. Randy should ever speak to you about it... I don't it, think he will, Brownie. Oh, please don't mention that I... Mr. Randy. On the floor. Uh-huh. With a bullseye in his chest. Oh, good heavens. Is he... Yes, Brownie, he is. Please, Mr. Hampton. I... I'm afraid I'm going to faint. Oh, stop it, Brownie. Don't pass out now. I've never seen a dead man before. One who'd been shot. Well, look, Mr. Hampton. He's still holding the gun. Do you think he... it was suicide? Maybe. Hmm. There's a note on the table. Let's see what it says. I don't know why Mr. Randy should have committed suicide... He was leading such a full life. Typewritten note, Brownie. Listen, it's addressed to the police. It'll be discovered that a half million in diamonds have disappeared from my store. This theft was arranged between Sam Lawless and myself for the purpose of defrauding the insurance company. I entrusted the diamonds to Mr. Lawless's keeping, but he deceived me. Now I'm left with nothing. There's no other course for me to take. Hmm. What do you think, Brownie? Well, yeah. I can't believe it, Mr. Hampton. He was my employer for 20 years. The note's a phony, pal. What? Brandy was murdered. Oh, no. The safety catch is on this gun. Is on? Uh, but what does that mean? A man can't kill himself and then put the safety catch on. I, I don't quite understand. Somebody's a child of habit, Brownie. Well, there's only one thing to do. How would you like to play detective? I? Sit down, Brownie, and I'll tell you exactly what to do and where to begin. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is Mr. Brown. Is that my fault? Mr. Randy's assistant. Oh, what do you want? I think you and I should meet someplace for a very long talk, Miss Keats. Why, Mr. Brown, have you been taking lessons? I've just come from Mr. Randy's apartment. Uh-huh. I was very much surprised to find Mr. Randy's body there and a suicide note. What? What are you talking about? I took the suicide note. You see, Miss Keats, I don't want the police to be misled by it. Mr. Randy did not commit suicide. Now, wait a minute, Brown. I've got a little catching up to do. You shot and killed my employer. And I'm prepared to tell the police why. What is this cutie, a hold-up? I happen to know that you and Mr. Randy planned the disappearance of those diamonds. And that Mr. Randy entrusted them to you for safekeeping. Mm -hmm. Until Mr. Hampton had been forced to confess and had been sent to prison. Who gave you all this valuable information, Brown? Uh, Mr. Randy had a weakness for keeping memoranda about his deals. The frailty of human nature, you know. He was not a very trusting soul. What am I supposed to do? Well, uh, for a consideration of half the diamonds, I'll turn over the memorandum to you and replace the suicide note. You name the place and the time, Mr. Brown. Mr. Randy's office at 11.30 sharp. And bring my share of the diamonds. All right, Angel. I'll try not to keep you waiting. <laughs> It's 12 o'clock, Mr. Hampton. Uh, midnight. Brownie, are you sure you told her everything? Exactly as you laid it out for me. I did not rearrange one word. Okay. All we can do is wait. Well, suppose she doesn't come. What? Shh, shh, Is that the front door? Yes. And she's here. Now, remember, be tough. I'll do the best I can, Mr. Hampton. I'll be behind those drapes, listening to every word. Oh, I hope my courage doesn't fail me. Oh, Miss Keats. All right, Brown. Uh, may I see the diamonds, please? Wouldn't you rather look at this? A gun. Surprise? You're going to kill me. Oh, I should have known that I couldn't trust a murderer. Let me see that suicide note and that memorandum. Why, I, I haven't got them with me. Brownie, you did a lot of talking on the phone. I'm going to give you exactly one minute to prove what you said. Those papers are at my home. Now, if, if you'll come with me. 
Oh, you must have been a cute baby, Brown. But not as cute as you were, I bet. Huh? Don't turn around, Myra. I'm loaded, too. Why, you double-crossing little weasel. Just put the gun on the table and don't call my friend any names. Thanks, honey. You know, this is the nicest present I've had since I met you. Why, you... You didn't have a gun at all. I have one now, baby. You dirty double Don't be so beautiful. You just learned something. Hindsight isn't always better than foresight. Ah, shall we talk now? You're a heel. While I've been chasing all over town looking for you, you've been busy with a double cross. Brownie tells me you've been chasing around with Randy. What? You came here to get him, didn't you? Well, yes, but he never gave me the chance. Is that so? You went to Mr. Randy's apartment with him, Miss Keats. I saw you leave. But you also saw Randy come back, didn't you, Brownie? I did not. Listen, Hal, this guy's lying. When Randy and I got outside, there was a cop in front of the store. Randy didn't say anything to him about my gun, but he ducked back into the store. And that was the last I saw of him. Shall we believe it, Brownie? Of course not. Well, she's as guilty as... as, as well, she's just too guilty for words. You two make quite a team, don't you? Two pitchers and one catcher. Oh, why don't you be sensible, Miss Keats? We know you're guilty. You have the jewels. And you committed two murders to keep them. You can't possibly get away. He's right, Mara. He's never been so right in his life. Yeah. Take a look at this suicide note. You'll see what I mean. And you had it all the time. Read it, honey. Yeah. It will be discovered that... Hal, this note mentions Sam. Mm Mm-hmm. And now, Brownie, tell her that Randy never kept a memorandum about his crooked deals. And tell her why. Well, that part of it, Mr. Hampton, was your suggestion. Sure. Where else would it come from? Hal, if I only had that gun now for one second... You'd commit murder, baby, and that'd be very foolish. Because then, uh... Brownie wouldn't get lonesome in a death house. What? What did you say, Mr. Hampton? Let me break it down for you. You killed Sam Lawless and Mr. Randy. Hal, you mean he... Him? Yes, darling, he. And all he wanted was to keep the diamonds Randy let him hold for a while. Now, look here, Mr. Hampton. Perhaps you don't realize what you're saying, You're the but... trusted employee, the man who could take orders. Now, uh, shall we go to your apartment and uh, see if it sparkles? Hmm? Very well. If you must be convinced... Ah, uh, get your hand out of your pocket, Mr. Brown. Uh, yes, uh, with this. Oh! 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 Hell, you shot him. Only in the gun hand, baby. From now on and... Uh, until death do him part, his uh, aim won't be so good. So, uh, Brownie had those diamonds after all, just as you said. Were you doubtful, Myra? Well, to tell you the truth, Hal, I... But why did he kill Sam? To frame you. Me? I thought you were it. I was. Until Brownie heard Sam accuse you, remember? In Sam's office while I was in the other room, unconscious. But how... Now, don't argue with me. It's in his confession. Randy sent him back with a message. And he listened at the door. Wow. So did I. What? I wasn't quite as unconscious as you and Sam thought. Oh. Then you heard Sam accuse me of palming that stone. The one I found in your chest of drawers. And I believed him. But I uh, know better now. Yeah? That's in Brownie's confession, too. He came while I was out. He knew his way around, didn't he? Yeah, but he didn't know when to stop talking. He should never have mentioned two murders. But there were two, Hal. Mm-hmm. But he only knew about one. That is, uh, he should have known only about one. Well, didn't you tell him about Sam? No. Did you? Uh-uh. Not a word. Hal. Hmm? You were once a pretty famous diamond thief. So? Do you think you'll ever go back to it? Oh, no, dear. Not after I spent five years in prison breaking stones. Hal. Yeah? I'm so glad I met you tonight. Oh. Prove it. Hmm? Prove it. If, uh, you know what I mean. And, uh, I do hope you do. And so closes tonight's story, Death Deals a Diamond. Stedman Coles wrote the radio script. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Larry Haynes played the part of Hal Hampton. Charlotte Lawrence was Myra Keats. Maurice Franklin was Brown. King Calder was her to Sam Lawless. Reese Taylor played Randy. And Joan Tompkins was Cookie. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. 
Yes. Come over a week from tonight. Good. We have a very unusual story of a circus lion that was trained for murder. It's called Serenade Macabre. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there's a new Crime Club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Serenade Macabre. Yes, we have that story for you. Come right over. Ah, you're here. Good. Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is. Serenade Macabre. The very exciting story of a circus in which the last performance was given by death. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It is two o'clock in the morning and on the outskirts of the town where the tents have been set up and the red and gold wagons moored, the circus is asleep. A succession of shadows in the moonlight. Quiet, peaceful except for the occasional roar of protest that comes from the throat of Sultan, the untrained lion that Victor Parnell had vowed he would break. <coughs> and except for the movements of two people, Louise Parnell and Roy Turner. Come on, come on. There's the training tent. Roy. We'll never have to worry about Victor again when Sultan gets through with him tomorrow morning. <coughs> What's the matter? Nothing. I... Drop the bottle of glue. Did it break? No. God. Now listen, kid. You gotta pull yourself together. We'll never get another chance. I can't help it, Roy. I'm frightened. There's nothing to be afraid of. What if we should get caught? What if somebody should see us? I tell you, there's nothing to be afraid of. Jim Hartness, the night watchman. He doesn't get to this point till three o'clock. Well, suppose he should decide to change. For Pete's sake, will you relax? I'm the owner of the circus. I set up the schedule for him. Oh, oh I hate that beast. <laughs> it's gonna be our best friend tomorrow. Come on, we're only about ten feet in the tent. The whole job won't take more than a couple of minutes. You know, it's murder, Roy. So? The idea of having Victor ripped to pieces by a lion. You want to get rid of him, don't you? I could ask him again to give me a divorce. Maybe if I keep after him. He... Duck into the tent. Roy. Roy, that's... Get in there. That's Jim Hartman. Quiet. You said he wouldn't be here until three o'clock. He's going to see us, and he's going to tell Victor. Oh, he mustn't Will see you? us. If you've got to kill him, he mustn't see us. That's all right, kid. He didn't look in. Maybe he saw us. No, Maybe he recognized you and decided not to. Roy, let's forget about it. Are you out of your mind? Please. I I've got a feeling it's not going to work out. Do you want to marry me? Oh, you know I do. Then let's not forget about it. Give me the key to the training kit. The key, Louise. There's no other way. Not if we're going to get married, babe. All right. Hold the flashlight. I took this off his key ring while he was asleep. Mm. Good thing he was drunk tonight. Swing the light around. Ah, yeah, there's the chair. Now we get to work with the saw. The police are going to know it's murder, Roy. No chair comes apart in a lion trainer's hand, not even when it's pawed. Yeah, one leg off. Now we go to work on leg number two. They, they've got to be strong. Mm. The police will suspect me, Roy. They'll suspect Tom Doyle. He hasn't got a key to this cage. She was mad enough to steal it. Victor gave him the whip this afternoon for not feeding the cats on time. Oh, I... 
Ha, oh, this is simple, kid. Two legs and a gluing job to go, and by noon tomorrow... <laughs> Ah, you hear that, babe? That sultan telling you that by noon tomorrow you'll be a widow. Here's your wagon, Louise. I'm turning off here. All right, Roy. I'll bury the saw and the bottle of glue under the wagon that Tom Doyle's in. And we got nothing to worry about. I hope you're right. I love you very much. Yeah. I don't have to tell you how I feel about you. Good night, Luscious. Good night. Shut up, you ugly beast. Shut up. Oh, good heavens. We're on the line, Louise. Victor. What would you expect to find? The Maharaja, the circus? I thought you were asleep. I was. Put the light on. I'm tired. I want to go to bed. And I feel like talking. Well, Louise, will I have to get up and put the light on, or will you do it? I'll do it. That's better. Now, come here. Victor, whatever it is you want to say, can't it wait? You never ask Roy Turner to wait, do you? Of course, he's the boss. The guy who inherited a circus and doesn't know what to do with it. So he keeps busy going after my wife. Please. Did he tell you tonight how beautiful you are? I didn't see him. <laughs> I heard Sultan kicking up a row, so I went down to see what's the matter. <laughs> Stop it, will you? I'm telling you the truth. Well, what's the matter, Louise? You're usually a lot calmer than this. Well, I'm sick and tired of having you suspect every move I make. Since when? You can't turn your back on me without... <laughs> oh, shut up, shut up! <laughs> Is Sultan getting on your nerves, too? I can't stand him all day and all night. Cat never sleeps. Victor, I want you to get rid of him. Sure. Send him back to the jungle. Kill him. Do anything but get rid of him. He cost me a small fortune, Louise. I don't care. You've got other lions. Well, he'll be great for my new act. You'll never break him, Victor. That's one cat that'll never take orders from you. And I say he will. You're wrong. You've been trying for weeks and you... L- listen, Victor. Kill him tomorrow morning. The first thing tomorrow morning. I want him for my new act, Louise. Don't do any more work on him. Don't don't get into that training cage with him again. Uh huh. This is a new twist from you. I've never asked you to quit breaking a cat before, but this time I know it can't be done. Are you afraid of what might happen to me? He'll kill you one of these days. That shouldn't bother you. I don't want you to die. Well, that calls for a celebration. And a kiss. No, Victor. Why not? Please, leave me alone. I always told you you had a beautiful mouth. Let me go. Let me Let's go. Let's see how it looks when it's <laughs> bleeding. Now, turn out that light and go to bed. I've got a big day tomorrow with Sultan. Hmm. It doesn't seem to bother you this morning, Louise. I'm getting used to him. Doesn't take long when you start hoping, does it? I warned you, if you ever hit me Tell again... Tell that to Sultan. He might decide to help you. <laughs> yes, who is it? It's me, Mr. Parnell, Jim Hartman. What do you want? The boss wants to know if you're going to work in that line today. Just a minute. Mr. Turner sent me to ask you if you were going... Why? To... Oh, I don't know, Mr. Parnell. He didn't tell me. Morning, Mrs. Parnell. Good morning, Jim. And that cat was howling all night, sort of gave me the willies. He ain't like the other cats. He will be. Tell Roy Turner I'll go to work when I'm ready. Okay. And tell him I don't want anybody in the training tent when I'm working. You going to tackle that lion all alone, Mr. Parnell? Oh, Roy can be there if he wants to. And Louise, of course. But Mr. Turner don't know nothing about lions, sir. Why, if that big fella should get frisky... You heard what I said, Jim. Now, go ahead and do it. Okay. I'm only the night watchman. But if I was in that training cage with that cat, I'd want a lot of people all around with long sticks. (laughs) Yes, sir, all around. He's right, Victor. I'm running my own show, Louise. Now, finish the coffee and let's get out of here. In a minute. Now. You can put your face on later. Roy won't mind seeing you without makeup. I want you to stop talking about him. (laughs) Here's the gun, baby. Yeah. (laughs) Too bad it's not loaded with real bullets, huh? 
instead of blanks? It's too bad. But maybe it won't make any difference to you. <laughs> You can take orders like the rest of them, can't you, Roy? Ah, this is your department, Victor. If you don't want anybody around when you're working, it's okay with me. But you're a darn fool. It's an old habit, pal. <laughs> Listen to him. He thinks he's still the king. Well, we're going to show him he isn't. Aren't we, Louise? We? Oh, uh, sure. You're still my wife, aren't you? She's not going in that cage with you, Victor. Here's the key, baby. Open it up. No. All right, then. I'll open it up. I'm ready, dear. Come on. Get out of here, Louise. I'll take care of this lunatic. <laughs> Put down that whip, Victor. Sure, right across Are the you set... Are you Put it down. You're going into that cage alone. No. no. Alone, Victor. And that's where you're going to stay. I got your keys. Let me out of here, Roy. That cat will kill me. Louise, get in the Sultan's tent and open the cage door to the tunnel. Roy. Go on before somebody looks in here. Louise, don't do it. You and Roy weren't here last night. You spoiled something. Roy, he knows. The key was not where I keep it on the ring. Let me out, would you? I was only kidding about asking you to come in here with me. I wasn't going in get myself, out, Louise. Louise, you're wasting time. Louise, Louise, I'll give you a divorce. You can marry Roy. I'll do anything you want. Just let me out of here. I don't believe you, Victor. I don't believe Good you. Good grief, Louise. Victor, just you and me now. Roy. Roy, you've got to listen. In a couple of minutes, it'll be just you and Sultan. Grab that chair. I'm going to open the trap door. Roy, I'll listen to reason. Don't open that trap door. Uh, it, yeah, I made it about the divorce. Grab the chair, Victor. Close it. Give me a break. I'll never bother you and Louise Better again. Better get set for company, Victor. Your friends should be here any second. Yeah, battle cry of freedom. He's in the tunnel, and the trap door's open. Goodbye, Victor. The chair. Maybe I can hold him off. Maybe I can drive him back into the tunnel. Can you keep him there? You and Louise spoiled something in here last night. I don't know what it is, but... <laughs> Sawdust. I saw the legs off the chair. He broke the chair. Roy! Roy! Get help! Help! <laughs> That's the, that's the whole story, Captain Williams. The chair broke in Victor's hand, and before Louise and I realized what had happened, Sultan had knocked Victor down. Go ahead, Mr. Turner. Oh, it was the most horrible thing I ever saw, that animal tearing at Victor as if he... Oh, no, I'm sorry, Louise, but the police want the facts. All of them, Mr. Turner. What did you and Mrs. Parnell do? while the lion was working on her husband. Well, there wasn't much we could do, Captain. Louise and I were alone in the training tent. Louise had a gun, but it was loaded with blank cartridges. Alone, huh? I thought lion trainers never got into a cage unless there was a lot of protection around. Well, Victor uh, didn't like crowds. Is that so? That's pretty unusual for a circus performer. Well, he didn't like him when he was breaking a cat. You can ask anybody outside this office, all the people working for me. I will, Mr. Turner, when I get around to them. How did you get that animal off, Mr. Parnell? I uh, opened the trap door of the tunnel, and Louise fired the blanks in her gun. The noise frightened something. No real bullets? Lions are expensive, Captain Williams. But lion trainers aren't, huh? Sultan was my husband's property, Captain. Victor made the rules, and I kept them. Uh-huh. Are you feeling better now, Mrs. Parnell? A little. Good. I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, Who uh, fixed it for that lion to kill your husband? I can't be sure, Captain, but I think it was... Yes? Go on, Louise. The police and I have a right to know who you suspect. Well, I haven't any proof, but I... I... Yeah? Roy, I think it was Tom Doyle who sawed that chair and glued the legs on again. Oh, the man uh, who's been feeding the lion? Yes. You remember what happened yesterday afternoon? Uh, Victor beat him up. With his whip. And all because Tom didn't feed the cats on time. Oh, but Louise, that's no reason for murder. I'm not accusing him, Roy. But late last night, Victor came back to the wagon drunk. He'd gone to town after the show. Oh, yeah. What's that uh, got to do with Tom Doyle, Mrs. Parnell? You see, Captain, there's only one key to the training cage, and Victor always kept it on a ring in his pocket. Yes? He, he was very superstitious about training the cats. He felt that 
that anyone else in that cage at any time might bring bad luck. That's right, Captain. There's a bug we couldn't shake out of his head. Just keep going, Mrs. Parnell. Well, when Victor came back from town, he was very drunk. But he was also very upset. He'd lost the keys. He had them this morning, didn't he? Yes. I found them last night outside the training tent. Oh? Victor was raving mad because he'd lost them, and I had to go out and look for them. As I got near the training tent, I saw Tom Doyle sneaking away around the tent. Then I found the keys. Well, Louise, are you sure it was Tom Doyle? Yes, Roy. He was carrying something under one arm. A saw? I couldn't tell, Captain. But I looked inside the tent. Everything was in order. Do you think Tom Doyle swiped those keys? Please, Captain, I'm not trying to build up a case against the man. I'm only telling you what I saw. Uh, come in. Excuse me, Captain. What is it, Ralph? One of the boys dug up these two items, sir. Hmm. I saw in a bottle of glue. They were buried under a wagon that three guys live in. Which three guys, Ralph? Joe Smith, Pete Frenzy, and Tom Doyle. Where's Tom Doyle? Him and the other two are in the wagon. Under guard. All right, we'll go have a talk with him. I'd uh, like to go with you, Captain. Sure, come along, Mr. Turner. You want to join the party, too, Mrs. Parnell? Oh, I don't think you ought to, Louise. Why don't you go to your bungalow wagon and lay down? All right, Roy. Oh, uh, by the way, Mr. Turner, when I got to the scene of the murder, I found you and Mrs. Parnell in the training cage with the body of her husband. Huh? For sure. We thought he might still be alive. How'd you get in if Mr. Parnell had the only key? We gave it to me. Just in case. Uh -huh. Well, okay. Let's go, Ralph. You can come along, Mr. Turner, if you still want to. Uh, but remember, you listen while I ask the questions. Well, Roy... I told you there was nothing to worry about, babe. But that Captain Williams, did he believe us? He didn't believe Tom Doyle, kid. The perfect fall guy. Roy... Yeah, the Lummox had no alibi for last night, so they took him away. Then we're in the clear? Without breaks. Come here, Luscious. Why not? You gave a perfect performance for Captain Williams. How about giving one for me? Thank heavens I don't have to convince you. Don't kid yourself, Toots. When it comes to love, I want all the convincing you can give. Oh, darling. Hmm. How is that? Great. As a sample... Now. Don't rush me, dear. It's been only three hours since I became a widow. Well, babe, you even look better. Uh, we'll have to be very careful, Roy. What do you mean? No marriage until we're far away from this town. Oh, I had that figured out, too, Louise. So that you have to have nothing to worry about with me. What's this? Partnership agreement. I'm giving you a 50% interest in the circus. Roy. Uh, don't, don't crowd me yet, honey. I'm not through. What? You get my 50% too if I should die. Oh, you darling. <laughs> I don't need all this insurance. I, I wouldn't want it without you. Hey, here's the catch, sweetheart. I don't expect to die. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> idiot. Now, come here. How about some more convincing? Oh, okay. <laughs> come on, come on, Louise. I'm waiting. Not now, Roy. What's the matter? Listen. What for? That whistling. I, I can't stand it, Roy. Ever since last night when uh, Jim Harkness passed the training. Will you I'm, snap out I'm of it? I'm be sure he didn't see us. He didn't tell Captain Williams, did he? I just can't seem to get it out of my mind. R Roy, we'll have to do something about now, Jim. Now, wait, wait, wait a minute. He's been with the circus for years. I practically inherited... Well, I don't want him around. Okay. But believe me, kid, you're making a big fuss about... Come in. What do you want, Jim? Answer me when I talk to you. I uh, noticed the Sultan stopped complaining after he chewed up Victor. We ain't heard a peep out of him since. Get out of here, Jim. Well, that ain't a nice way to talk to a business associate, ma'am. Business associate? Shut up, what? Louise. What do you mean, Jim? She knows what I mean, Roy. I'm Mr. Turner to you. Not anymore, Roy. I'm not working for you anymore. You quit? I'm tired of being a night watchman. For a guy like me that used to be a star tumbler keeping tabs on a bunch of tents and animals. It ain't dignified, Roy. I'm retiring. What's that got to do with me? You're going to make my retirement worthwhile. 
for you and Louise. Jim, what do you want? Louise, I told you to shut up. Now, don't get mad at her, Roy. She's only trying to keep the rope off her neck. <gasps> Tom Doyle ain't no killer. But I can tell the police who is. Now, look here, Jim. If you got me bluffing to I do... I have seen you and Louise in the training tent last night and uh, heard you working with a saw. Roy. You don't know what you're talking about, Jim. Maybe the uh, cops would say different, huh? You can't prove it, you dirty black mirror. It'll be your word against ours. Yeah, but whose word's going to count more? I seen where you buried the saw and glue, Roy. Why don't you tell that to the police this morning? Oh, with the police here? What are you driving at? <laughs> I'm a night watchman. I work all night, and I'm supposed to sleep all day. I ain't seen the police yet. Didn't they question you? Well, I wasn't in my bunk all day. I, I just got back from a snooze in the park. <laughs> you, uh... See what I mean? He's got us, Roy. Let's find out how much he wants. Well, you don't have to ask me twice. Fifty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand? I want a nice, comfortable retirement, Roy, and I want to start today. <laughs> Think it over, but don't take too long. <laughs> You set up the perfect crime, didn't you? Tom Doyle was going to take the rap for us. Well, Roy, is he? Well, for Pete's sake, will you leave me alone? You've been pounding at me for an hour. I can't think. All I want you to tell me is what are we going to do? I don't know. Have you got $50,000 for Jim Parker? I Parkman? told you, Have Louis. you or haven't you? Suppose I have. Are you going to give it to him? Do you want me to? I don't want him to go to the police. It's about all the cash I have, Louise, if I give it I home. don't want him to go to the police. He'll be flat broke. We won't be able to pay salaries. There'll be plenty of cash coming in. But not enough to pay off, Louise. We'll be stranded. Would you rather swing? Uh. Um, maybe it'll never come to that. Oh, don't kid yourself. If Jim goes to the police, we're through. We can't alibi ourselves out of his story, and we'll never get a chance to call him a blackmailer. <laughs> Why call him anything? Oh, what's the matter with you? Does $50,000 mean so much to you? Keeps us in business, Angel. Well, it won't keep us together. Oh, Roy, darling, we want to be together, don't we? Oh, sure, We want to get married like other people in love. We... We committed a murder to get that, Roy. And we won't lose it, kid. We'll never get there if we take chances now. I, uh, wasn't thinking of taking chances, Louise. Then you'll give him the money? No. Roy! I got other ideas that'll save us 50000 and still take care of Jim Harkness. No. That's right. You want Captain Williams back here? Let him come. Are you crazy? Another murder at this circus, Roy, while Tom Doyle's in prison. What happens to the case against him? Nothing. What I got in mind won't be murder, officially. Oh? Oh, baby, you're gorgeous when your eyes sparkle. Tell me what you've got in mind. Uh, come here, real close, huh? Uh, Jim's a pretty old guy. So? So he gets dizzy when he looks down from a height... So dizzy he falls down and gets all smashed at the bottom of a cliff. Over by the river? How'd you guess? That's good, Roy. But how do we get him there? <laughs> we'll pull him with a 50,000 buck magnet. I don't know what you mean. Oh, you don't? Well, then I'll have to tell you because, kid, you're going to set the traps. <laughs> Jim, wake up. Wake up. Hey, what's uh, <clears throat> Louise. Where are the other men who belong in this wagon? Yeah, they're out working. I was catching some wind. I don't want them to find me talking to you. How soon are they coming back? I never know. Sometimes they knock off for a swig. That can be any time. How about the money? Uh, you'll have to wait until tonight. Yeah? Roy's got most of it now, but... He's counting on the ticket sale to make up the difference. I want a full 50000 Louise. You'll get it, you dirty blackmailer. Meet me in the park at the top of the hill. What hill? Haven't you ever been in this town before? Now, this is the first time old man Turner never played this circuit when he ran the show. Oh. Well, there's a hill just outside of town, a public park on top. Be there at 9 o'clock. Well, why up there, Louise? Because Roy doesn't want to be seen talking to you. Will you be there? Yeah. Okay, so will I. But if you got any notions, Louise... Don't be a fool. I'm not going to kill you. 
Roy and I could do that any night if we wanted to. You're a night watchman. There's nobody around when you work. Mm, so you thought of that, huh? Well? It's a date, Louise. And then, goodbye. He's on time, all right, Louise. Yeah, give me that package. You got everything straight? Yes, yes. I want to open the package and I'll suggest that bench over there. He doesn't know about the cliff. Now, remember, keep his back to me. I'll remember. But when I rush him, get out of the way. I don't want to push you over the cliff, no, too. He's pretty close, Roy. Better get behind the tree. No, no more talk. Jim? Uh, yeah. Everything all set, Louise? Yeah. Here's the package. It's got $50,000 in it. Is it all here? You can count it if you don't believe me. <laughs> You wouldn't lie to me, would you? Uh, open the package on that bench. It won't take you long to count it. Come on, I've got a flashlight. Well, Jim? I'll do that when I get back to my bunk. Jim, <laughs> you can save yourself a lot of time. There's no money in that package, just a wad of newspapers. A trap, There's huh? a cliff behind you, Jim. You're going to have an accident. Look out, you don't have one first. He's got a gun, Roy. I'll take it away from him. No. I got nothing to lose, have I, Jim? Stay away from me, Roy. I'll kill you. Go ahead. I'm not staying away. I'm going to throw you off the cliff. Maybe, but you're not making me back one off. One more step, Jim. You're a step. murderer anyhow, and nobody's going to punish me for killing a murderer. <laughs> Your gun's jammed. No. Goodbye, Jim. Huh. No! Boy. Wait! Help! Oh. Help your hand, Louise! Oh. oh, it's too bad, Louise. You had your hand on his sweater and you couldn't hold him. Oh. Roy. Roy shouldn't have rushed at me, Louise. He should have remembered I used to be a tumbler. Well, it's a bad break for me. I just lost $50,000. I'm back again, Mrs. Parnell. Come in, Captain Williams. This has been a week of tragedy, hasn't it? My husband's murder and Roy's death last night. <laughs> it's surprising I've still got my sanity. Let me see your hands. My what? Your hands. I don't see what that's got to do with anything. How did you break that fingernail? Now, see here, Captain Williams. I'll tell you. It got caught in Roy Turner's sweater when you pushed him off the cliff last night. Have you gone out of your mind? We found the part of the nail that belongs on the finger, Mrs. Parnell. And here's something else we found. Just read it without putting your fingers on it. It's the carbon copy of a partnership agreement between you and Roy Turner. And it gives you his share of the business after his death. Roy gave this to me without my asking for it. We were going to be married. Yeah. Well, we're not holding Tom Doyle anymore. We've got you. And the worst that can happen to you is that you'll be tried for one murder and be executed once. And so closes tonight's story, Serenade Macabre. Stedman Coles wrote the radio script. Roger Bauer produced and directed Raymond Edward Johnson played Roy Turner. Joan Tompkins was Louise Parnell. Cameron Prudhomme was Jim Harkness. King Calder was heard as Victor Parnell. Joe Latham was Captain Williams. And Brad Barker was the Lion Sultan. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. Yes, we have the very exciting story of a man who tried to cheat life and was cheated out of it. It's called The Self-Made Corpse. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there is a new crime club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. <laughs> This program came from New York. Stay tuned now for thrilling adventure broadcast Johnny Madero, Pier 23, which follows in just a moment. This is the Mutual Broadcast.
Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. The self-made corpse. Yes, we have that story for you. Come right over. Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is. The self-made corpse. The very unusual story of a plan for living in which the architect was death. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It was late one evening, and Skippy Parker, the hat check girl of the Chickadee Club, was at her station in the cloakroom when a small, timid-looking man came into the spacious lobby of the club and walked over to her. Excuse me, miss. My name is Andrew Mitchell. That's nice. Uh, Here's something for you. A half a dollar? Well, it's all I can afford at the moment. Uh, Please take it. All right. But what do I have to do for it? Uh, Just tell me where I can find Mr. Spade's diamond. What? He owns this place, doesn't he? So I've been told. And he's one of the most successful gang leaders in the country, uh, an empire builder. Andrew, you wouldn't be crazy, would you? Oh, no, no, no. Then why do you want to see Spade? Well, it's uh, business. Uh, Very important and very private. Uh Uh-uh. Here's your money back. But why? Go home to your padded cell. You don't believe me, do you? Traffic, I I don't see it. Very well, I'll find Mr. Diamond without your help. And I'll tell him that you refuse to cooperate. But don't forget to mention my name. It's Skippy Parker. I won't forget, Miss Parker, but you'll regret it. I'm going to have you rubbed out. Well... <laughs> so young and so beautiful, but your manners are bad. I'm going inside to look for Mr. Diamond. <laughs> Every night a new nut. Oh, well. Waiter. 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 Where's the riot, mister? Uh, Waiter, this check you left on my table a few minutes ago, I just looked at it. Thanks. Uh, You're welcome. But don't you think you've made a mistake? Yeah? I had four small glasses of rye and ginger ale and two cups of black coffee without sugar. And you're charging me $16. There's a $3 cover charge if you're here at 10 o'clock. Oh? There's a $5 cover charge if you're still here at midnight. But that's an outrage. Go fight City Hall. It's the rule of the house. I won't pay it. Oh... A red. I'm not a red. I'm a fine, upstanding citizen, and I'm not going to be charged just for sitting at a table. Stand on your head and we'll pay you. I I had to sit here all this time. Don't you understand? All me and the boss wants is $16. I haven't got it. Hmm? Hmm? I've got a job that pays me $62 a week. I've had it for 30 years. And when I started, I was getting only $12. You're in trouble, mister. What am I going to do? You want to take my advice? Yes. Kill yourself. What? Nobody ever gets out of here without paying a check. But I... I came here looking for Spade's diamond, and I... Uh, what's the matter, Joe? This guy's full of liquid, boss, and no dough. Okay, I'll take care of him. Go on back to your beach. With pleasure. I want to explain my predicament, sir, if you'll just give me a chance. What predicament? Uh, you're tearing up the check. Sure, you're the great Andrew Mitchell. Great? Oh, I'm, I'm just a teller in an out-of-town bank, and... How did you know my name? I've got spies. Of course, your spade's diamond. How do you do? Oh, you don't look at all like your pictures in the newspaper. Your eyes and your... Oh, what's the matter? Oh, you're you're squeezing my my hand too hard. Oh, Oh. I'm sorry. Sometimes I don't know my own strength. (laughs) Uh, No broken bones. Oh, well, uh, I don't think so. Good. Uh, Skippy Parker, the hat check girl, said you wanted to see me. Oh, Then she's redeemed herself. I'm so glad a girl of her youth and beauty. She said that you uh, got a business that concerns a half a million dollars in cash. Oh, well, I really haven't got it, sir. You see... Have I been sizing you up for nothing? Uh, No, no, no. Uh, The money belongs to the... Oh, well, this is no place to discuss private matters, Mr. Diamond. All these people with the ears. Okay. Uh, We'll go into my office. Uh, Will we be alone? Like in a grave. Come on. It's one flight up. And it's soundproof. Mm -hmm. 
Go ahead, Andy. Step right in. <laughs> Thank you, Spades. If Leona, th that's my wife, should only hear someone call me Andy instead of Andrew, she she'd have a... Spades. Yeah? You said we were going to be alone. We are. Just relax. Uh, but those four men against the wall. I bought a director's. They never talk. Oh, are, are they gangsters too? Andy, watch your language. Well, I didn't mean to be disrespectful, gentlemen. Oh, it's quite all right. Now, the business you came to see me about. Oh, yes. Uh, but first now, I want you to know that I've never done a dishonest thing in my life. No. And I wouldn't be doing it now if it weren't for the fact that I'm... Yeah? Well, I'm bitter. Oh. I've been cheated out of my proper station at the bank. Uh, we gotta listen, fellas. He's that kind of a guy. After 30 years of loyal service, last week the office of assistant cashier became vacant. Mr. Fenimore died. And I was next in line for the job. Who do you think got it? You tell me. That young man from Princeton, Griswold Griffith. Oh, that's tough, Andy. Well, what do you want us to do about it? Well, I've got a plan that'll punish that bank. And I've got it on this piece of paper. Yeah? Uh, what's this? Uh, a layout spades. Oh. Now, the bank occupies the entire street floor of a small office building at the corner of Smith and Luden Streets in uh, my town. Uh, um. Now, the main entrance to the bank is on Luden Street. That's right over here, see? Oh, yeah. Now, but over here on Smith Street, there's an entrance to the office building into a tiny vestibule. And uh, would this line over here be another door to the bank? Uh, yes, uh, an entrance through the vestibule. I see. Oh, and uh, what's this box over here? That's the elevator to the offices upstairs. Oh. Now, mind you, those offices have nothing to do with the bank. I get it. And uh, these two lines running between the bank wall and the elevator? Uh, that's a short, narrow corridor that leads to a stairway behind the elevator. Oh. And uh, every weekday, what happens? Well, every weekday at exactly four o'clock, the entrance to the building is locked by the bank guard. No one can come in or go out for ten minutes. Why? At exactly three minutes after four, the money box is wheeled out of the bank by three men, including me. You don't say. Uh, where does it go from there? Uh, into the elevator, of course. We take it down to the basement and lock the money box in the vault. And there's a half a million in cash riding that elevator? At least. How many guards uh, with guns, I mean? Uh, only one. It should be very simple, Spades. Cops outside? No. You and your men could go in the building before that Smith Street door is locked by the bank guard. Stay on one of the upper floors until the money box is wheeled out of the bank. And then... The boys come down the stairs and do the job. Yes. Uh, how big is that money box? About four feet high and about three feet wide. It's oh. uh, built like a safe. Ah, uh, you can't move fast with a thing like that, Andy. Well, now, wait. I've thought of that, too. Yeah? Smith Street is quite deserted at that hour. And if you forced me and the others into the elevator, it would be quite a simple matter to bind and gag us. I, uh... Hey, everything's a simple matter to you, huh? Uh, how much do you expect for your trouble? Well, I thought 20% wouldn't be too much. 20? And you'd take 10 uh, okay, Andy, we'll case out the place and let you know. Uh, may I know when? When we're ready. Now, go downstairs and tell Joe to give you a drink. Plain ginger ale. Uh, what? But spades... I, I said plain ginger ale, pal. From now on, you'll have to be careful what you drink. I don't want you talking at the wrong time. And, uh, to the wrong people. <laughs> What? Who's calling me? Up here, Andy. It's me, Joe. What? Good heavens. What are you doing on that cloud? I'm serving drinks. Come on up. You can have all you want. But, but I have no money. Are you kidding? You're rich. Oh, of course. Who else is there? Skippy Parker. With a brand new dress made out of hat checks. She's gorgeous, Andy. She wants to see you. I'm coming right up. Hello, Andy. Skippy. How'd you get away from your wife? Joe said you were gorgeous. Oh, you're magnificent, Skippy. The most beautiful girl I've ever seen. I love you, darling. What did you tell your wife? I don't have to tell you on anything. I'm the boss now. I, I do as I please. That's the way it should be, Andy. Yeah, I, I rule with, with a nine hand. 
And she obeys. Oh, wonderful. Oh, where's Joe? He jumped over to that other cloud to get some champagne. Oh, well, call him back. Huh? Uh, oh, I'm not allowed to drink champagne. He's not going to charge you for it. You're rich now. I want ginger ale. What's the difference? They taste the same. Well, well ginger ale doesn't make me talk. Call him back, Skippy. Is he coming? He can't hear me. <laughs> you'll drink champagne and you'll talk and you'll talk and you'll drink champagne. Uh, if you say so. You're so lovely. I, I, I've got to do as you say. Then give me a kiss. Oh, all right. Andrew. But, Skippy, did you hear something? Just a funny sound. Andrew, why don't you answer me? That's the only. I'll have to hide. Answer me, you fool. Don't you know you can't get away from me? I'd better go, Skippy. You're still afraid of her. No, no, I, I'm the boss. Uh, but she gets very angry, and I... G goodbye, Skippy. Andrew, Andrew, wake uh, up. What's the matter uh, with you? Uh, oh, uh, stop uh, moaning and get uh, up. I'm uh, not going to stand here all evening wasting my time with you. Uh, oh, for oh. pity's sakes, close your mouth. Uh, I'm sorry, dear. I'm, I must have been very tired. Mm, best thing you do is sleep every night before dinner, and in the only good chair we have in this disgraceful living room. Thirty years in one position and you're still sleeping. Oh, uh, I'm hungry, Leona. Is dinner ready? Tired, hungry. Uh, you didn't complain the other night when you came home at four o'clock in the morning. Oh, I told you yesterday I met an old friend of mine in New York. Well, what were you doing in New York? That's what I want to know. I, I was in, empiring about a car. You were doing what? I'm thinking of buying a car, Leona. It, it was going to be a surprise, but... Well... Have you gone out of your mind? I may even give up my job and take a trip to California or Europe. That depends on how I feel when the time for decision comes. Good heaven. Well, aren't you going to ask me how I could do all these things on $62 a week? I didn't realize what was happening to you. Oh, good Lord. I'm perfectly sane, Leona. I've been playing it smart, that's all. What? Every day I, I put aside a part of my allowance, my lunch and cigarette money. And when I had enough, I, I began to gamble. Oh, no. Oh, yes. My luck was very good, and I bet the whole thing on a sure thing. Oh, no. When it comes in, I'm going to be rich. Very rich, Leona. Don't touch that phone, Leona. I I'll answer that. Hello? Uh, Andrew Mitchell speaking. How are you, Andy? Uh, oh. Spades Diamond, pal. We've cased out the bank. My boys will be there tomorrow. So soon? What's the matter? Are you getting pains in your spine? Uh, no, but but, but I, I didn't think... Tomorrow, Andy, and no slip-ups. That money box goes into the vestibule at three minutes after four. Understand? I understand. I won't be there, but six of my boys will. And they've got orders to come back with that money box. Yes? That's the idea. We're going to get along all right, Andy. Just keep on saying yes. Uh, yes? Uh, but when do we... Uh... I mean about the, uh, you know what? Tomorrow night at my office, Chickadee Club. <laughs> You're a greedy little guy, aren't you? Well, after all... You'll get your cut. Be here at nine o'clock. Who was it, Andrew? Huh? Who were you talking to, and what did you mean by you know what? It's none of your business, Leona. What? You heard me. Now you go put my dinner on the table. I'm hungry. <laughs> Yes? I'm John Graham, Detective Graham. Oh, well, come in. You don't have to stand out there where all the neighbors can see you. You're not afraid of neighbors, are you? I certainly am not, but... Oh, this business at the bank this afternoon, and Andrew right in the midst of it. Was he? Well, he was one of the men who wheeled that money box into the vestibule, and he was bound and gagged, too, like the others, and left to suffocate in that elevator. I understand he was pretty upset about a promotion he didn't get. What? Who told you that? What if he spent at the bank, Mrs. Mitchell? Well, why shouldn't he have been upset? He gave 30 years of his life to that organization. But when the time came for the bank to show its appreciation... Where's your husband? Now, see here, Detective Graham. I'd like to ask him a few questions. Will you take me to him? Three hours of police headquarters as if he were a common criminal. Why, he was so exhausted when he came home, he was a complete 
physical and nervous wreck. But he came home, didn't he? Well, am I supposed to thank you for that? I'm tired too, Mrs. Mitchell. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait in the living room, please. I'll get Andrew for you. Where is he? He's upstairs. Poor thing was even too exhausted to have dinner. He went right to bed. Uh Uh-huh. Just hope he isn't asleep. I'd hate to wake him. Yeah. Detective Graham, I ask you to wait in the living room. I feel like climbing stairs. Oh, very well. There's a rumor around headquarters that the robbery might have been an inside job. What? As my wife would say, it was just too perfect for words. Oh. There were no mistakes. We're looking for the man who might have tipped off the gang about how things are done at the bank. Andrew? Maybe. Oh, of all the ridiculous things I've ever heard. Andrew and gangsters. It's oh. happened before. We're checking everybody. Uh, oh, here's our room. And when you see the man I've been married to for 27 years... You... Good heaven. Uh-huh. I thought you said he was sleeping. Well, he told me he was going up to bed. That bed hasn't been slept in, Mrs. Mitchell. I don't understand. I didn't see him leave the house. Unless he's in the... Uh... <clears throat> Andrew! Andrew, there's a man here to see you. Which is his closet, Mrs. Mitchell? That one near you. Now, he didn't run away, Detective Graham. He couldn't. Are all his clothes here? He only has two suits, and he's wearing one. Now, look, Detective Graham, I want you to tell me the truth. Did you come here to arrest my husband? No, but now I'm wondering if it wouldn't be a good idea. a lot of money, Andy. $55,000. Oh, I can't believe it's paid. All mine. You want to run your fingers through it again? <laughs> well, go oh. ahead. We don't mind if you're happy. Oh. Do we, oh. fellas? <laughs> <laughs> that means they don't mind, Andy. Oh, does it? It's delicious. For the first time in my life, I'm going to live... Oh, I'm grateful to you, Spades. I'll never forget you. Sure, the poor man's best friend. Uh, why don't you go downstairs and start celebrating? I, I can have a drink now. Sure, have a dozen. The Chickadee Club likes to make a buck, too. Well, I'm afraid I, I won't be able to do it tonight. Well, why not? You see, Leona thinks I'm in bed. And if she should find out that I'm not... To... Listen to this guy, fellas. He's afraid of a woman. <laughs> uh, that means you're killing them, Andy. I uh, don't have to be afraid of anyone now. Do I? That's the spirit. Tell Joe to get you some of that champagne I keep for my special customers. Champagne? Yeah, well, don't you like it? Uh, I don't know. I, I've never... Oh, for pity's sake. Now, what's the matter? I didn't thank you for this traveling bag you you, you loaned me. Oh, that's all? I, I couldn't have taken the money without it. I'll return it tomorrow, Spades. Don't bother. I'm not going anyplace. Oh, well, <clears throat> good night, gentlemen. Give me the cloakroom, baby. Skippy, Andy's on his way down. That's the idea, honey. We don't want him to get lonesome. Whoopee! Oh, Andy, darling. <laughs> I'm feeling good, Skippy. I'm having the most wonderful time I ever had in my life. But you're making so much noise. Am I? I'm sorry, dear. I'll be very quiet from now on. Have another drink. Shh, you're very quiet. Oh, my, the bottle's empty. Andy, do you realize we finished a whole bottle of champagne? Huh? Well, I've got to get more. Lots of champagne. Hey, Joe. Andy. Huh? Shh, very quiet. Joe. Hmm? What do you want? Huh? Well, where did you come from? You called me, didn't you? Oh, Joe. Uh, that's right. Uh, we want another bottle of champagne. You think I care? Nice fellow, that Joe. I'm going to leave him a big tip, a whole dollar. Oh, no. Oh, I can spare it. I'm rich now. I can afford to be generous. With me, too, Andy? Oh, don't look at me like that, Skippy. Why not? You're too beautiful. You make my... You make my head spin. I'm crazy about you, darling. You mean that? Do I look like the kind of girl who says things she doesn't mean? <laughs> I never thought it would happen to me. What's the matter? A young beautiful girl falling in love with me. Uh, look, Andy, you don't have to get so upset about it. There are plenty of guys around. No, no, no. I, I want you to love me. Well, what's better? But I've got no right to love you. Darling, don't be a jerk. Oh, you, do, you, you don't understand. I'm really mad about you. But I'm, I'm, I'm not yet, well, eventually I, I've got to become something that... What are you talking about? You won't tell anybody. Is it something awful, dear? It's you? worse than that. Someday I'll... I'll have to become a fugitive. 
from your wife? No, from the... Po- Skippy, where's my traveling bag? I uh, checked it for you in the cloakroom. Oh, yes, that's right. I'm going to see if it's still there. Oh, my head, I, I can't get up. Then don't. Oh, I've got to see about, about my... About my... That's all, Cookie. And now Mama's going to make an honest man out of you. Andrew Mitchell, don't you dare go upstairs. What? Leona, I thought you were asleep. Uh, do you know what time it is? The house is dark. I, I thought Get you were... Get into that living room. D- don't you push me, Leona. I'll push you. It's ten minutes after five, and you're going to tell me where you've been? Yes. And why you stole out of this house like a thief after you told me you were going to bed. But don't turn that light on. I told you not to turn that light on. <gasps> Andrew. Well, what of it? I, I, I had a fight with Joe. He threw me out of the club. It was closing time, and I... Get me a drink of water. I'll do nothing of the kind, you gangster. Got me drunk on champagne. Took my traveling bag. Quit her job and disappeared. Joe wouldn't tell me where. He wouldn't tell me where Spades lived either. Gangster. My money was in that bag. $55,000. The money I was going to buy a car with. The money that was going to set me up for the rest of my life. The money you won gambling, and get, get me a drink of water. Detective Graham was here last night. The money that... Uh, who? A detective from police headquarters. He wanted to ask you some questions. Why did he come here? The police have decided the bank robbery was an inside job. But why did he come here? I answered all their questions at headquarters just the afternoon. I was there for three hours. Oh, why did you do it, Andrew? Why did you help those gangsters rob the bank? Shut up, you fool. I won't shut up. You never won any money gambling. You were going to buy a car. You were going to give up your job and go to Europe. Listen, Leona. But you knew where the money was coming from, didn't you? Those gangsters were going to give it to you. Your share of the bank's money. Leona, if you don't keep your voice down, I'll... You get away from that phone. I'm calling the police. If you try to stop me, Andrew Mitchell... I'll stop you. Go. I'll stop you. Go, please. I can't breathe. You're not sending me to prison. You're not going to lock me up for the rest of my life. Not you, Leona. Not as long as I live. Number, please. Number, please. Leona. 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 Come in. Spades. What do you want? I've got to see you, Mr. Diamond. Get out of here, you bum. If you want a hand out ass for outside the club, don't come barging into my office. You wouldn't talk to me outside in the dorm and wouldn't let me follow you in. Take care of them, fellas. No, no, wait. I'm in trouble. I need help. The $55,000 you gave me last night. Hey, it's Andy. I walked all the way from Belfort all day, and then I had to steal in through the surface entrance. No one saw me. It was dark. It's a... Yeah, well, you should have phoned me that you were coming. I would have put out the plush carpet for you. I'm sorry, Mr. Diamond. You dumb cluck. The first time you get your hands on real dough, you act like a football player with butter on his fingers. Why, what do you mean? I know what Skippy did to you last night. Joe told me all about it. Oh. And he told me what he had to do to get you out of the joint. We don't like riots around here, Andy. Well, that doesn't solve any problems now, Mr. Diamond. I've got to leave the country. Okay. You want me to get you a passport? What good will that do without money? Can't you let me have, say, $25,000? Huh? You hear that, fellas? <laughs> that means you're nuts, Andy. Oh, please listen to me. This morning when I came home, Leona was waiting for me. We had a quarrel. And I... I strangled her. What? She was very nasty. And I had to kill her. Now you've got to help me. Yeah. We don't want the cops picking you up. Well, Leona's body won't be found for several days. I, I could be in South America by then. It wouldn't take them long to make you talk. And once you start talking, brother... Okay, come with me. Oh, thanks, Mr. Diamond. <laughs> He's a gentleman, isn't he, fellas? <laughs> that means they like you, pal. Go ahead, Andy. Down there? What are you afraid of? It's only my private storage room. Are they going to? Naturally. They're your friends. Don't you trust them? Well, uh, I... Uh, I think I'll forget all about the money. Give him a hand, fella. No. Oh. 
I should have warned you about that top step. It's bad. Uh, I'm sorry you had to take such a fall. You told him to push me, Mr. Diamond. Huh? Mr. Diamond, I promise if the police catch me, I'll never tell them about you. I'll be better off with you out of the country. Oh. Uh, you recognize that box over there? Huh? The money box? Without the combination. That leaves a nice big hole for you to breathe through. For me to... Spades, what are you going to do? Not me, chum. You. Get in there. No. Give him a hand, fella. No. No, give, give me a chance. I haven't done anything to you. Please. No. I couldn't figure out how to get rid of that but thing. Please. Please listen to me, Spades. I never hurt a soul in my life. Let me go. Close the door, fellas, and get some rope. For heaven's sakes, what am I going to do? You see what I mean, pal? All the air you want. Inhale. Oh. Two, no. three, no. four. Exhale. No. Two, three, four. Oh. Yeah. No. <laughs> I don't want to die, Spades. Please, please let me live. I'll do anything you want me to. I'll go any place you say. You're going, Andy. I'll bet you've never been out this far. Can you see the moon? Shines differently outside the three-mile limit. Doesn't it, fellas? <laughs> that means it does, Andy. Look, Spades, you're a big man. How can I hurt you? I'm insignificant. I could walk along any street in the world and not be recognized by the police. I look like... Only like so many other little insignificant people. Just let me go. I'll get out of the country somehow. You'll never hear from me again. Nobody will ever hear from me again. Spades, will you do it? Please, please. I don't want to die, Spades. Okay, fellas. Please, please. No, no, not now. Not now. No! Let's go home, fellas. The ocean air makes me sleepy. And so closes tonight's story, The Self-Made Corpse. Oh, are you wondering what happened to Spades Diamond and his gang? Well, they died in the electric chair, of course. After Skippy was arrested with the money, she told the police about the murder of Andrew. Stedman Coles wrote the radio script. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Bill Smith played Andrew Mitchell. Arthur Vinton was Spades Diamond. Irene Hubbard was Leona Mitchell. Joan Tompkins was heard as Skippy Barker. Bill Quinn was Joe, and Barry Thompson was Detective John Graham. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very unusual story of a baseball that captured a gang of thieves. It's called A Pitch in Time. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there is a new crime club book available this week, and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. This program came from New York. Stay tuned now for the thrilling adventure broadcast, Johnny Madero, Pier 23, which follows in just a moment. This is the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. A pitch in time. Yes, we have that story for you. Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is. A pitch in time. The very unusual story of a baseball game that was held up by foul play. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. Hank Harper was young and handsome. And he trusted everyone. And just why he became a policeman, no one in Spencertown could understand. 
And after the initial surprise was over, no one cared. It was a beautiful Sunday afternoon. Just the right kind of a day for the annual baseball game between the police and the firemen. And rookie Hank Harper was on his way to the ballpark with the equipment for the police team. It was one of his jobs to get it there. The other one was that of a pitcher. As Hank's jalopy dribbled through town, the back seat loaded with baseball equipment and the front seat loaded with Hank and Mabel, his girlfriend, a small drama was taking place in the aforesaid front seat. I would still like to know what makes you think you're a pitcher. Well, all the boys in the force think so. I've been practicing with the team for two months. That doesn't answer my question, Hank Harper. Sergeant Keith said I got the best fastball he ever seen. Huh, what does he know? He's the manager and the coach. Why, if he don't know about baseball and pitchers, he then... He doesn't know about pitchers. Yeah, what about my curves and my control? What curves? Inside and out. I know how to make them break, Mabel. There's no such thing like a curve in baseball, Hank. What? It's an optical illusion. Why, oh, you're kidding, honey. Do you know what a curve is? Why, sure. It's part of a circle. Can you make a baseball go around like a circle? It ain't done that way, Mabel. Oh, so you admit it. Now, wait a minute. I'll explain it to you. Don't even try. I'm convinced that there's no such thing like a curve in baseball. What are you stopping here for? Let's get out. I'm going to show you. Show me what? Now, let's see. I need a pitcher's glove, a ball, and a catcher's mitt. You're not going to pitch to me, Hank Harper. Okay, I got him. Let's go, Mabel. Are you serious? Well, sure I'm serious. I'm going to prove to you that there is a curve in baseball. And also why Sergeant Keith is putting the honor of the police department on my natural pitching ability. Not with my face, you're not. Who said anything about your face? A pitcher needs a catcher, doesn't he? Well, certainly. I'm going to ask that guy standing over there in the open lot. Oh, no. Why not? He's got nothing to do. Come on, push out. All right, but if he catches like I think you pitch... You're going to find out a few things about me, Mabel. Mm-hmm. And about baseball, too. Hank, remember, we got to get to the ballpark. Oh, there's lots of time, honey. A couple of hours. The team needs the equipment. They might want to practice. They ain't even there yet. You know, Mabel, this ain't such a bad idea. Besides showing you what you don't know about baseball... I'll be warming up for the game. What do you do when you get to the ballpark? I'll watch the firemen practicing. That's a good way to get a line and watch what with their hitting. You'll find that out after the game starts. Hank, wait. What's the matter? That man. There's something awful strange about him. Yeah? I don't see nothing strange. Why is he standing so close to the back entrance of the bank? On Sunday, too. Maybe he likes it there because it's in the shade. Well, why doesn't he go to the park and sit under a tree? Some people don't like the park. I used to know a guy who got sick every time he played pool. Now, what's that got to do with what I'm talking about? A lot, Mabel. The guy was allergic to green. And you know something? What? It was years before he found it out. Oh, I don't care, Hank. That man over there is up to no good. There you go. Thinking everybody is a crook just because I'm a cop. You know that isn't true. He looks like any other respectable citizen to me. Um, hey, you. Yeah? You doing anything in particular? Nothing. Why? How'd you like to catch a few? Meaning what, mister? My girl here says there ain't no curve in baseball. <laughs> well, I guess she ought to know. She don't. She even says I ain't no pitcher. Well, now, that's tough, ain't it? Here, come on, I'll convince her. Here, take this catcher's mitt. What for? He wants to see how much he can miss it by. I got no time. You'll be doing me a big favor, bud. Sure, you might even warm him up for the game. Game? What game? The cops versus the firemen. I'm pitching. For, uh... What side? The cops. Oh, well, why didn't you say so in the first place? Give me that mitt, pal. You can pitch to me for the next half hour. What did I tell you, Mabel? He's a nice guy. He just don't like the sunlight. team on the field practicing? That's a good question, Chief. When I find the answer, I'll break his neck. Well, 
Hank Hopper hasn't showed up with the equipment. I phoned his home. He left an hour and 15 minutes ago. I phoned Mabel's home. Who's Mabel? Uh, she's his girlfriend. My wife brought them together. You don't say. Oh, yeah. They're a very fine couple, sir. We're hoping that someday... They'll... Bear me the details, Hart. I'm sorry, Chief. 20,000 people from all over the county waiting to see us play, and you talk about romance. The police department, without a bat, without a glove to catch a ball with. Without a ball, sir. Is it any wonder we can't nab that Benedict gang of bank robbers? We can't even come into a ballpark fully prepared. There's only one way I can figure it out, said Mark. It... My words, Keith, there's going to be a shake-up one of these days. It'll be more than a shake-up, it'll be an eruption. Yes, sir, but as I, I was saying... I want that Benedict gang put behind bars and I want it done fast. Sick and tired of having these hoodlums make a monkey out of me. Six bank robberies in two months. Three of them repeat. Uh, will you step over here, Chief? Where? Uh, the public address system. There's a lot of people in the stands that'd like to hear you. No, Keith, no speeches now. I'm not in the mood. Some other time, maybe. Well, then, can I say a few words in Hank Harper's behalf? Can you? Uh, he, he's a fine boy, and he's going to have a good record someday. He's still a rookie, you know. I know. I've known him and his family for many years. The only way I can figure out is not being here. He, well, he, he had an accident with the car. Well, be that as it may, we can't afford to wait. We'll have to swallow our pride. Well, if you say so, Chief. Sergeant, ask the uh, firemen if they have any equipment to spare. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, temporarily, of course, so my boys can practice. Uh, I'll do that, sir, but uh, it won't do any good. What? We need more than equipment, Chief. We need a pitcher. What did you say? Hank Harper's my only hope. Now, if he shows up in time... If! Sergeant Keith, don't tell me you built our team around one pitcher. Oh, no, no. I had three pitchers, but uh, two of them can't work today. Oh, are they tired? Well, Prescott was injured last night, arresting two burglars. And Larson has a sore back. And I have a... Come with me, Sergeant. Uh, where, Chief? The locker room. What are we going to do there? Pray, Sergeant. Get down on our knees and pray for rain. Joe's tree, <laughs> Some control, eh, Mabel? Uh, oh, are you speaking to me, Hank? Uh, honey, you ain't been watching. No, mm, I'm too busy thinking. How am I going to convince you if you don't watch? What are you thinking about? A mm, couple of things. Uh, for one, what time is it? Mm, one fifteen. Sergeant Keith said to be at the ballpark by one thirty. We got fifteen minutes to go. Oh, well, that gives me time to talk about the other thing. What other thing? Is Joe a lookout or isn't he? A lookout. Look out for what? For somebody who might be transacting illegal business in that bank. Oh, now listen, Mabel. I was only thinking about it, dear. Does Joe look like a crook to you? He does. Now look, honey, I'm a cop. I should know a crook when I see one. Take a good look at Joe. Oh, the guy's okay, Mabel. You can take it from me. All right, Hank, I'll take it from you. But you'll happen to have to take it from the chief if you should happen to be wrong, which I know you happen to be. Hey, hey. Oh, come on, Joe. Stand back, Mabel. I'm going to give him my fastball now. I need room for the wind-up. And there's another thing, you Hank. You shouldn't do that, Mabel. If Joe isn't a crook, why was he hanging around the back door to this bank? In this open lot? On Sunday? A guy's got a right to spend Sunday where he likes, Mabel. But why here? Why not some other lot? If he likes open lots? That's his business. I can't walk up to a guy and ask him if he's a crook. You've got to catch him first. I didn't ask you to ask him, Hank. Then what's all the talk about? Bang on the front door of the bank. If the watchman inside is conscious, he'll look through the glass to see who's banging. If he isn't, he won't. Will that make you happy, chicken? It might make you a hero. Okay, I'll do it. After this next pitch. Why not now? Just one more pitch. Hey, you ready, Joe? Let her ride, Hank. My lightning ball right down the middle. For... <gasps> Hank! I beamed him. Ooh. It got to wait me. Come on. He's lying so still. Keep your fingers crossed that I manslaughter, Mabel. Oh, gee. Is he dead? He's still breathing. Joe. Joe. He's not listening, Hank. Joe. Oh, Joe. We'd better get him to a hospital, Mabel. I think he's hurt bad. I'll phone for an ambulance. No, we'll take him to the car. Time is of the essence. But, Hank, what about the equipment and the game? A man's life is in danger. It's a cop to help the needy and the suffering. Gee, a nice guy like Joe and such a good catcher. I wonder what could have happened to my control. (laughs) 
Yeah. All right, Mason. Keep the alarm going citywide. The chief wants Hank Harper here if you have to bring him in a wagon. Nothing yet, Keith? Not a word, Chief. Not even a mention. Not even the hospitals? No place, sir. Well? I'm sick, sir. Very sick. You're a healthy man compared to me, Sergeant. Well, what can we do now? Ten minutes to game time, and here we are, holed up in the locker room, afraid to show our faces in public. And me, a public official. It isn't right, Sergeant, that a rookie should do this to me. His father was my best friend. I persuaded that boy to join the force. I, I brought him into the team. It was in my own house that he and Mabel... You know something, Chief? I thought I did. Once. We prayed for nothing. It ain't gonna rain. No. Well, perhaps we expected too much. We can't always count on providence, you know. I'm beginning to find that out, sir. We gotta learn to do a few things for ourselves. Yes. Oh, well... Where do we go from here? I wish I knew, sir. I'm a practical man, Sergeant. I know that by nightfall, the mayor will have me on the carpet. Yes. Not to mention the budget committee. They won't like the idea of equipment bought and paid for, but never used. And we'll have to give the customers out there back their money. It's a tragedy, Keith. And to think Hank Harper did this to you, it's unbelievable. Did you have to mention his name? Uh, I only... Did it in passing, sir. Don't you think I feel sick enough? Let me tell you something, Sergeant. When I get my hands on that boy, I'm not going to break him out of the department. You're not? I'm going to break him in half. Wait, this might be it, sir. Maybe they've located him. Hello, Sergeant Keith talking. Yes? Yes? You don't say. You don't say. You don't say. He doesn't say what, Keith. All right, all right, I'll tell him. Well? That was Sergeant Danaher reporting a robbery. Well, what about Hank Har What robbery? Oh, the bank on Prospect Avenue, next to the open lot. Two men bound and gagged the watchman and uh, burned a hole in the vault and walked off with a hundred thousand dollars. Just like that? The watchman says they were on the job for two or three hours. Yeah. Any orders, sir? Yes. Call up the zoo and tell them to reserve a cage for me. That Benedict gang has made a monkey out of me again. What's the verdict, Doctor? There won't be any, Mr. Harper, if you don't give me a chance to examine this man. That's all right. Take all the time you need. Thank you. You're welcome. Hank. Uh, what is it, Mabel? We gotta go. I gotta find out about Joe first. He's sleeping and there's nothing you can do to wake him up. It's my duty to stick around. Suppose he comes to and find out he's in a hospital with strange faces all around him. But the game, Hank. There's still plenty of time. Look, it's only 1.15 by my watch. That clock on the wall says 3.20, dear. Hmm? Holy smoke, my watch stopped. So have you. Well, Mr. Pitcher, it's only 20 minutes after game time. That's all right. The sergeant's probably got lost in a press card pitch until I get there. Who's catching? Riley. Without a mitt? Riley's tough. Um, what did you say? Pardon me for being so blunt, darling, but all the equipment is in your car. There's no game without the equipment. There's not even a team. Mabel, one of us will have to go. Sure, but which one? Well, Mr. Harper... Shh, the doctor. Uh, how is he, Doc? Not too good, I'm afraid. That's what I said from the start. There's no skull fracture, but there is severe concussion. Does that mean he'll have to stay here? At least a week, miss. Probably, too. Oh, how nice. Mabel. Now, Hank, you don't want Joe wandering around the streets, do you? You'd, you'd never see him again. Yeah. Joe's really a nice guy, ain't he? Yeah, and such a good catcher. You never can tell when he might need a little catching himself. Yeah. There's just one more thing, Mr. Harper. Something else, Doc? A little matter of detail. I'll have to file a report on this case. That's all right. Go ahead. How was this man injured? I beamed him. You what? I hit him in the head with a baseball. I see. Hank, I think we better be going. Goodbye, Doctor. I think you had better stay until I notify the police. Here's where you're busted, darling. Why the police? Assault and battery with intent to kill. That's a felony, Mr. Harper. Me? But I'm a cop myself. Impossible. Well, sure. Here's the proof. Look. Machine. My credentials? Unbelievable. 
Well, in that case, you injured this man in the line of duty. No, Doctor, in the line of a wild pitch. I still can't understand what happened to my control. Oh, look, Mabel, it's Joe. He's coming too. But where's he going? That's the question. Joe. Joe, can you hear me? It's me, your pitching pal, Hank Harper. Mike. Mike. He doesn't know who I am. He thinks I'm Mike. Oh, Joe. Let him talk, Hank. He's trying to say something. But, Mabel, I've got to straighten him out. You already have. Mike, be there. Be there. Hank, quick. Ask him where. Where, Joe? You know. 1492. 1492. He's getting historical. 1492 Columbus Avenue. Third floor. That's it, Hank. Mabel, you stick here with him. I'll see you later. Are you going there alone? Of course. Somebody's got to tell Joe's family what happened to him. Might as well be me, the guy who's responsible. Who's there? Hank Harper. I want to see Mike. Yeah? He don't live here no more. Well, that's funny. Joe said this was the place. What about Joe? Are you Mike? No, I'm Red. What about Joe? He's in the hospital. In the hospital? Hey, hear that, Mike? Yeah, I heard it. Come in, Mr. Harper. We'd like to hear more. What hospital? The downtown. Come on, I'll take you there. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I've still got a couple of questions. But Joe's hurt and he's asking for you. How'd he get hurt? I beamed him with a baseball. Oh, you did, huh? For nothing? It was in the open lot next to the bank. Me and my girl Mabel were passing by and I asked Joe if he'd catch a few. Well, I'll be. How do you like that, Mike? While me and you were sweating it up, up playing baseball with a guy and a gal. Hey, that's bad, Mike. I said shut up, Red. Yeah, but after... Shut up. Okay, Mike, I'm through talking. You fellas don't get along, do you? Oh, we manage. Oh, Joe's a swell guy. There ought to be more harmony between his brothers. Brothers? Sure, there's plenty of harmony, Hank. Once in a while we get mad, but we're only human. So you bean Joe and put him in the hospital, huh? I hope you don't hold it against me, fellas. Relax, pal. The best thing that ever happened to our brother. He's been needing a rest for a long time. He didn't look tired of me. I know, I know. It never shows on him. But inside, you know. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people are like that. They look fine, and all of a sudden... They're leading the parade. Yeah. Sometimes an accident is the best thing that can happen to a guy. You're telling me... Oh, uh, excuse me, Mike. There's a couple of $20 bills on the floor. Where? Uh, here, under the table. I'll get them for you. You're getting careless, Red. Uh, th- th- they must have slipped through my fingers, boss, when I picked up the pile. Uh, here's your money, Mike. Oh, thanks, pal. Now, uh, how about something to drink? Uh, later, after we get back from the hospital. You, uh, you worried about Joe? The doc said he was hurt bad. But he's in good hands, ain't he? Well, sure. So why worry? Get the glasses, Red. Sure, right away. Sit down, Hank. You're one of the family now. Thanks, fellas. Make yourself at home. Like you might be spending the rest of your life here. This is how they got in, Chief. The back door. I don't care how they got in, Sergeant Keith. I want to know why they got away. Why? I'm asking you, Sergeant. This makes robbery number seven for that Benedict gang. Oh, are you sure it was them? I recognize the trademark. Oh, to be sure. Well, anyway, they did one good thing for us. Did they? They gave us an excuse to postpone the game. That's going to help me a lot in my career, Sergeant. Well, it gives us another chance, sir. Let's get back to my car. Yes, sir. I want every house, every cellar, every dive searched. Send out a nationwide alarm. I want that Benedict gang. I'll do that, sir. Don't waste another minute. No, sir, I'll... Bless my soul, look. What now, Sergeant? That baseball on the ground, Chief. (laughs) Sergeant Keith, can I persuade you to think of crime for a change just to make me happy? That's what I'm doing, sir. Well, then, let's get... In in a minute, sir. This baseball belongs to us. What? It's got the seal of the police department on it. Sergeant, is it possible... I'm afraid it is, Chief. It's our equipment, and Hank Harper was in charge of it. Well, I only hope he is, sir. I mean, I'll have to change my opinion of that boy. He's a hero. He gave up the pleasure of pitching a baseball game to do his duty. 
I wouldn't be surprised if he took the Benedict gang single-handed. Did he? Then whose blood is that on the ground? Blood? Where's the nearest hospital? The downtown, sir. It's a couple of blocks from here. Let's hurry. If that boy is there... He's got to be there. No, that's not what I mean. That gang of bank robbers has got to be there. Come on, Sergeant. It's three o'clock in the morning. Shut up, Red. Huh? I said shut up. Oh, I didn't say nothing, Mike. I don't like your singing. And Hank don't like it either. Do you, Hank? I've heard worse. You, you see, he likes me to have fun. Shut up. Okay. Have another drink, Hank. Uh, no more, Mike. I've got to get back to the hospital. Mabel won't know what happened to me. Well, what's a girl between friends? I don't talk that way about Mabel, and I don't let nobody else talk. My that... tongue slipped. Don't you uh, like our company, Hank? Why, well, sure I do, but... Okay, okay, then have another drink. Throw my bread. Uh, right away, Mike. But uh, I've had enough, honest. I've Either you a... drink with us or you don't. If you drink, you're a pal. If you don't... Now, listen, Mike, really, Well, I... Hank, which one are you? We finished the whole bottle, didn't we? Friend or enemy? Ain't you fellas anxious to see Joe? Joe. Shut up, Red. But, Mike, I was only asking him if it, that's what I... Uh-uh. Company, Red. Uh, I'll see who it is. Wait a minute, you lug. Find out first. Well, that's what I meant, Mike. Uh, what do you want? Is Hank Harper in there? Mabel. That's Mabel. What do I do now, Mike? You, uh, you sure that's Mabel, Hank? Am I sure? The sweetest voice in the world. Okay, Red. Let her in. Right. Well, what are you boys playing? Freeze out? I hope you ain't mad about my not coming right back to the hospital, honey. Me mad? When you're keeping such good company? Hey, that's some tomato, Mike. Mm, such nice people. Who are your friends, Hank? Well, uh, that's Mike and that's Red. This is Mabel. Wow, what a cookie. Look out, Red. You don't break your teeth on it. Yeah. <laughs> a slugger, too. Sit down, Red. Huh? Sit down. Oh, okay, Mike. Hey, but but the gal should have a drink, too. She will. Uh, where'd you get this address, Mabel? From Joe. He talked in his sleep. Uh-huh. Anybody else get it? The doctor. How about the cops, baby? I got it, Mike. Hey, Mike, what goes? Why talk about the cops? Shut up, Red. Well, I was only asking... Don't about... ask... Oh. What's the pitch, Hank? The pitch? What are you looking for? I told you. Joe asked for you, and I came to take you to the hospital. That story's no good, pal. Say, what are you guys anyway? Why didn't you drink the stuff I gave you? Why? Echo should be heard, but not seen. All right, it's no good. The worst liquor I ever tasted. So you pretended to go through the bottle with us, huh? And when you thought I wasn't looking, you dumped your whiskey out of the window. Is that what he did, Mike? First, you tried to get us to go to the hospital so your mom could come in here and clean us off. Me? What's he talking about, Mabel? You better listen to him, honey. I think you're about to learn something. When that didn't work, you thought you'd drink us under the table. You should have kept your eyes open, bud. You would have seen me spill my drink every time you spilled yours. Where's the money, Mike? What money, Mabel? The wad they took out of the bank while you were pitching to Joe. A hundred thousand dollars. You mean them and Joe... Crooks, darling. What I've been saying right along. Those two twenty dollar bills and... Well, well, I'll be... Don't move, Harper. Get your hand away from your coat. Now listen, Red. You better do as he says, Hank. There were a couple of killers and they got the right tools for the job. Yeah. What a dope. That should have been my line, darling. Frisk him, Red. Yeah, right away, Mike. Hey, look, Mike. Huh? A service holster. This guy ain't no crook. He's a cop. Well, welcome. Get some rope, Red. Oh, we, we gonna tie him up and leave him here? We gonna tie him up and set fire to the apartment. Yeah, <laughs> that's much better. I must be getting soft. Oh, well, Red. Yeah? Before you go, there's something I want you to do for me. Oh, uh, well, what? Give me that gun. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, oh, hey. Get them up, you. Hey, Mike, cops, more cops. Sergeant Keith. And the chief. Good work, Keith. You shot the gun right out of his hand. I told you we'd take them alive, chief. Get the guns, Hank. These boys are through shooting for a while. My, how pretty they look with their hands up. Almost like gentlemen. Where's the money, Mike? Look for it. It's uh, in the closet, you chief. Double, double crosser. I'll get you for this raid. Hey, don't, don't, don't let him hit me. Don't let him hit me. I'm turning state's evidence. I'll see that he's a good boy, Red. Here's a couple of bracelets for you, Mike. And here's a couple for you, too, Red. Uh, for me, Sergeant? But uh, 
I'm going to sing. Sure, sure. But you won't mind if we keep you in a cage for a while, will you? Well, <laughs> you got to do your duty, don't you? Get going. Well, congratulations, Harper. I'll see that you get a citation for this. Thanks, Chief. The most successful rookie we've ever had on our police force. Thanks, Chief. But there's uh, one thing I'd like to explain. Well, what is it, my boy? About why I didn't show up at the game. You see, Mabel made the remark that there's no such thing like a curve in baseball. And then she said I couldn't pitch, so the first chance I got... Are you apologizing? The game has been postponed for one week. After what you just did, you can pitch for me any time. Any time? How about in the game? Well, of course. Why, you're the man of the hour. You just captured the Benedict gang, including Mike Benedict himself. Me? Was that the... Mike and Red and Joe, too? Hank, darling. Joe, too? And him such a good catcher. Over here, Hank. Hello, Mabel. Oh, you did a great job, darling. Every pitch came from the heart. I could see it. They knocked me out of the box, chicken. Oh, now, that's nothing to cry about. I I heard it happens to professionals, too. But the firemen, I don't understand it. You don't understand what? What happened to it, Mabel? What happened to my control? And so closes tonight's story, A Pitch in Time. Stedman Coles wrote the radio script, Roger Bauer produced and directed. Walter Kinsella played Hank Harper, Ann Thomas was Mabel, Cameron Prudhomme was the chief of police, King Calder played Mike, Bill Smith was Sergeant Keith, Earl George was Red, and Barry Thompson the doctor. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very exciting story of a gypsy caravan that didn't move until it got set for murder. It's called The Gypsy Sings of Death. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there's a new crime club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we look for you next week... Oh, yes. Here is something important. Today, there is a crisis in our country's school system. Schools are understaffed, classrooms are crowded, and buildings and equipment inadequate and deteriorating. The teacher's morale is at its lowest point in history. Many are leaving the school system. The main victims of this sorry state of affairs are the children of this nation. 28 million of them. And the nation itself. It is the duty of Americans to see that these conditions are corrected. You can do it by joining and working with local groups, such as your parent-teacher organizations. Look them up in your locality and become a part of them. Only through the organized efforts of these groups can you guarantee your child the kind of education he's entitled to. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. kept you waiting. Yes, this is a crime club. I'm the librarian. The gypsy sings of death. Yes, we have that story for you. Come right over. Good. 
Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is. The Gypsy Sings of Death. The very unusual story of an old gypsy custom that led to custom-made murder. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It was early evening all over New York. But in the time for getting atmosphere of the caravan, a gypsy nightclub, time had stopped for Toby Randolph as she reached across the table for the hand of Paul Palmer, the well-known Broadway columnist and man of her dreams. <sighs> What's the matter, Toby? Got a pain? Oh, Paul, darling. I'm so glad you brought me to this place. Uh-huh. Mm, it's like the open country. The campfire... Sweet, intoxicating music of guitars in the night. What guitars? <laughs> Flap your wings, honey. You're taking off. Oh, shut up. And I thought you loved me. Well, live and learn. Just try living for a change. Marriage in a house in the country, eh? What's wrong with that? Yeah. I bet many a family was launched in this place. Dan Harrigan, the bride's best friend. Who's Dan Harrigan? The guy who owns his den of delusion and false promise. Well, you don't say. Maybe I should meet him. Is he a gypsy? No, dear. He's not even a human being. Oh. That's life, Angel. One disappointment after another. Oh, get over it. The blessings of you. But don't look now, Toby. There's another blessing coming this way. And she's gorgeous. What? Good evening. May I sit down? Why not? Thank you. I am Fatima. I must read the leaves in your teacup. Oh, a fortune teller. How about reading mine? I will do it only for the gentleman. Will you permit me, sir? How can I refuse? It is well that you do not. Your cup, please. So, you're working for Dan Harrigan, eh? Ah. Uh. You must be the new one. I haven't seen you around here before. I'm still here, Paul. Huh? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, Fatima, what about this mess in the teacup? I see adventure for you. Much excitement and great danger. Any particulars? I see a festival. The festival of Zoroaster. You will be there. Who's going to take me? You will go. And you will meet Hakim, the king of the gypsy tribe. And Dagma, the beautiful daughter of his third wife. Mm. And you will meet Kismet, the medium who communicates with the spirits of the departed. Beware of him. He's bad, eh? He will be jealous of you, but there is another who will hate you to the death. Who? Oh. I cannot see him. The leaves have become confused. Like I've been since I met Paul. That is all. I must go now. No, wait a minute, Fatima. You can't leave me with an unknown enemy. Suppose I met him face to face. Please, no more. Oh, the lady wants to go. But she told me... Oh. Hello, Dan. There's no story in her for your daily column. Not with you around, eh? But uh, let's be polite. Uh, Toby Randolph, this is Dan Harrigan. Really? Yeah. Come on, Fatima. We'll be late for the festival. Yes, Dan. So long, Paul. Drop in again sometime. I'm always glad to see you. Oh. <laughs> well, darling, there goes your gypsy love song. In swing time. Angel, don't you want that slave bracelet? What slave bracelet? Right there on the table. Must have slipped off your arm. Not off mine, dearest. Uh -huh. Then it must be Fatima's. Get that hunting look out of your eyes, Paul. The Festival of Sorraster. That gang of gypsies she found in my teacup. Let's order some more tea and drown them. Let's not, sweetheart. Let's find out about the festival and see what they look like. My columns bursting with curiosity. Hakim, it is time for the festival to begin. And we're not there. We stay in this house, Dagmar, until Fatima returns. Until Fatima returns. Ah, Kismet, you speak. What is the good word from the spirit? I was not communicating with him. I think only of Fatima and how she keeps her father, the king of the tribe, waiting. I am her father, and I do not mind. It is not right, Hakim, when there is no reason. She's working for Dan Harrigan. That 
flea on the back of a dog. Well spoken, my friend. But in this world, business comes before festival. If she has not forgotten us for Dan Harrigan. <laughs> Dagmar, foolish daughter of my third wife. What tickles your nose now? Kismet. He's jealous of every man that looks at Fatima. She's my betrothed. On her wrist is my bracelet. I want my future wife to be like the sky on a cloudless day. Can the daughter of my flesh and blood be otherwise? That can happen, Hakim. We've been here in New York too long. Yes. I hear Dagmar agrees with you. Sometimes, Hakim, I feel we shall never see the open sky again. You have only to look up. Hakim! Here we prosper. And here we stay. I have gone to great pains to settle my tribe. And you, Kismet. Has not your spiritualist business put you in the income tax class? I can find the same spirits in Philadelphia and Cleveland and as far west as Chicago. But it is not for me alone. No. Even now, on the night of the festival, the people of our tribe are grumbling. They want to move, Hakim. They say you are getting old and too tired to be our king. Father. Ah, Fatima. Father, I did not mean to be late. But Dan Harrigan... What has he done to you? Silence, Kismet. Now, Fatima, you may tell us about Dan Harrigan. He has gone to the festival, Father. Oh? He's going to make trouble if we do not pack and move tonight. I see. He will not let you forget that you are working for him. I'm frightened, Father. By the lightning that never strikes twice, I begin to understand. This grumbling among my people, Dan Harrigan's work. Grumbling? Have you not heard? The people are saying that... <laughs> Quiet, Dagmar. It is serious business. But kiss me. Fatima is not wearing your bracelet of betrothal. She's not? She is not. Fatima, where is that priceless token of my love? I gave it to a stranger. You gave it to a... Oh, Rimba, what is the meaning of this? I could not help myself, Kismet. Betrothed to a stranger? And with my bracelet? What is the name of this foul dog, Fatima? Paul Palmer. Every day he writes about people in the newspaper. I will cut his heart out. I will squeeze him in my hands. And... Uh, well... The problems of being a king. Fatima, is he handsome, this Paul Palmer? Yes, Dagmar. He's almost beautiful. <laughs> Close your foolish mouth, daughter of my third wife. We are going to the festival now. It is a moment of solemn consideration. <laughs> This is wonderful. Imagine living all your life and never seeing a show like this. You're looking at my column for tomorrow, Toby. And you're still looking for Fatima. How'd you guess? Oh, darling, can't we forget her and enjoy this festival by ourselves? That brace is burning a hole in my pocket. That's not the only thing that's burning, Paul. Huh? You, dear. But I'm the patient type. I'd make such a good wife. <laughs> Look out, Paul. Oh, hey. Uh, sorry, my friend. Why don't you look where you're going? Or at least go where you're looking. It is my fault. I have so many unhappy thoughts my eyes do not care to see. Ah. She's beautiful. Mm, he knows all the right words. I like him, Paul. Paul? With a palmer hanging on. Say, uh, maybe you can tell me where I can find Fatima. Paul Palmer? Arimpa, it is he. Paul, he's got a knife. A murderer of my love life. Hey, wait a minute. Enough, I am Kismet, the medium whose spirit you have destroyed. Now I will show you. Oh, no, you won't. Drop that knife first. I will kill you. Oh, foolish man, do you think you can hold my wrist forever? Paul, trip him. Do something. I can't, Toby. This guy's built like a rock. Get help. Where? Everybody's standing around Kismet. watching this. Not Kismet. everybody, thank the Lord. Kismet, you fool. What are you doing? Do not interfere, Fatima. Stop it. Leave him alone. Fatima. You slapped me. You have disgraced me before the tribe. I will have you expelled. You have disgraced me before the tribe. Phew. What's that bruiser got against me? Oh, the music. Shall we dance, Paul? All I want to know is... It will not be too painful. Mm -hmm. Well... We will dance. Um, do you mind, Toby? Go ahead, sucker. But before you take that first step, make sure she's not going to waltz you into a casket. You're so nice, Paul. 
And you dance like a real prince. Thanks for the promotion. What's cooking, Fatima? Cooking? With a bracelet. You didn't leave that trinket with me as a token of your undying love. But I did. Oh, now, wait a minute. I want you to keep it forever. There are easier ways of getting into my column, Fatima. You do me a great injustice, Paul. How about coming across? What? With the truth, baby. The thing that can stand up and be counted. I do not know what you mean. All right, then. We'll call it a night. So long. No, please. I, I cannot talk now. Why not? Dan Harrigan is watching us. Where? Do not turn around. He must not know we're talking about him. Okay, then. We'll waltz out of here. Please. I'm not allowed to leave. Uh-huh. Do not force me. No one is allowed to leave before the ritual. Uh-huh. The ritual of Zoroaster should begin very soon. Be patient, please. When it is over, I will tell you the whole story. I haven't got that much time. Come on. <laughs> now, watch this. Dagmar. I've seen worse. <laughs> She's my sister, Paul. Oh, <laughs> glad to meet the family. She's not a blood relation, but I love her very much. Uh, what's that? She is the daughter of my father's third wife. She's my stepsister. <laughs> did she bring that goggle with her? Oh, you did not lie, Fatima. He is almost beautiful. So has been talked behind my back. Eh? Could I have one dance with him? Of course, Dagmar. I will come back after the ritual. Oh, hey, wait. <laughs> she can't do this to me. Is it so unpleasant, dear? I'm a busy man, Dagmar. Look at me. Have I not many things to recommend me? I've got other things to do besides, uh, um, you certainly have. We will dance now, huh? Oh, well, I'm only human. I found you at last. Welcome, Paul Pavel. I receive you as a new member of the tribe. Who is this, Dagmar? Another member of the family? I am Hakim, the father of Fatima, king of the tribe. Okay. Do I call your majesty or just Pop? <laughs> it's good. A man with humor is fit to be prince. <laughs> now I must acquaint you with the custom of my people. As long as you don't use a knife. A betrothed never dances with another girl until after the wedding ceremony. I'll make a note of it, Your Majesty. Ah, it is about to begin. The ritual of Zoroaster. I must go now. So sorry. But we will meet when it is no more, future son-in-law. And we will make plans for your wedding. Tell me, uh, Dagmar, is the king all right? Oh, yes. Then why did he call me future son-in-law? You are betrothed to Fatima. Uh, uh, me? You accepted her bracelet, did you not? I did not. Prince Paul Pavel. <laughs> I'd better find Toby and get out of here. I... Hey. What's the idea? The lights have been turned out. The ritual begins in total darkness, Paul. A sacred moment has arrived. No one may leave. What happens if somebody tries? No one ever tries. It is forbidden by the laws. <gasps> Don't try to hold me, Dagmar. Get your arms off my neck. Dagmar! Good Lord. Hey, hey! Somebody put up those lights. Shh. Put those lights up and be quick about it, will you? I've got a corpse around my neck. <laughs> Toby, am I glad to see you. Oh. oh, that girl. Somebody pushed a knife into her back while the lights were out. Who? I'm, I don't know. But I'm, I'm going out for the police, Paul. Oh, I'm not going anywhere, my friend. Kismet. Murderer. What? He's talking to me, honey. You have desecrated the ritual of Zoroaster. People of the tribe of Hakim, why did he do it? He didn't. Why did this stranger come among us to darken our lives with murder? Paul, oh, we've got to stop him. He's inciting that mob to riot. Change that label to manslaughter, Toby. We were happy people. We lived in peace. We loved one another. And then came this stranger. And with him came death. Shall we let our once gay Dagmar go on the This is it, honey. Give my regards to Broadway. I had a great column. What is it that goes on here? There, look. Hakim. Dagmar is dead. Dagmar. Oh, once happy daughter of my third wife. What has the curse of Harrigan done to you? Harrigan? He is the knife in the back of my tribe. Dan Harrigan did not kill Dagmar. It was this man, this foreigner. Enough, Kismet. I forbid you to offend the future prince of the house of Hakim. Yes, Hakim. Paul, was he talking about you? 
Yeah. The women will prepare Dagmar for burial. Come with me, Paul, my son. Where to, Pop? My throne room. You will be safe there. And we shall be able to talk about things that matter. You will come in after me, Paul. Naturally. The king always goes first. Well, we made it. Let's give three cheers for Alma Mater. Paul, who is this woman? Toby Randolph. One of the common people. Hmm. But she's all right, Pop. She hates Dan Harrigan. Oh. She's going to be very useful to us. Mm-hmm. Well, she's very beautiful. Uh, but that can wait. Paul, my son, uh, did you kill Dagmar? Me? That is enough. By the sacred names of my ancestors, Dan Harrigan has trapped for the last time. Are you sure he did it, Pop? How can it be otherwise? He threatened to destroy me. What's he got against you? Wise men make foolish mistakes. Let us talk about your wedding. Uh, now? It will take place tomorrow. Uh, but, but we only just became engaged. Paul, what wedding is he talking about? <laughs> uh, Toby, uh, there's an old gypsy custom that if you take a bracelet... And you did. Yes, Angel. And now I'm a man with a betrothal on his hand. You don't have to go through with it. Tell it to him. Oh, uh, by the way, Hockey... Which way, my son? Where's Fatima? Ah, you're impatient. She didn't come to the rescue of her future husband when Kismet was whipping the crown. Hakim, the evil one is still with us. Kismet, I give you warning. When you speak of a future prince... Fatima is no more. What? She's gone. Dan Harrigan, too. What? It is impossible. The daughter of my own flesh and blood would not deceive. I have looked everywhere, Hakim. Listen, a future father... Be calm, my son. I will fix. Come with me, Kismet. We will look together. Now, Toby, we get out of here. Through that window. And if I ever see a gypsy again... You you... will, but first we're going to Dan Harrigan's apartment. Are you out of your mind? I write a column, honey, and the two things Broadway likes to know. Murder and what for? (gasps) Hello, my blushing bride. Imagine finding you here. In a strange man's apartment. Imagine it, Toby. I'm too tired. Where is he, Fatima? Dan Harrigan is not here. Sure. I'm not joking. I've not seen him since the festival. Uh Uh-huh. You will go now? I will not go now. By the dagger in Dagmar, I'll wait for the truth. She's told it, Paul. She has? I just looked in the other room. That was nice of you, Toby. Don't you think I'd make the perfect wife? (laughs) Now, Fatima. I will tell you nothing. All right, that's too bad. Toby, phone the police headquarters. Tell them we got Dagmar's killer. All right, Paul. No, wait. I did not kill Dagmar. That's the old refrain, Cookie. I will tell you why I'm here. I'm waiting for Dan Harrigan. I knew you weren't waiting for a bus. He killed Dagmar. My father would not move his tribe out of New York. And Dan Harrigan said he would destroy him. So he daggered Dagmar. Yes. I saw it with my own eyes. With both of them? You do not believe me. You wonder why I did not give a scream or set my people on Dan Harrigan. You little gypsy mind reader. I could not open my mouth. And then it was too late. He was gone. And you were screaming. Why was Dan so anxious to get you and your crowd out of the room? He has a shipment for delivery to other cities. Now, that's what I call a lead. We do not know what it is. Believe me, Paul. He has been using our caravan for eight months to make these deliveries. We do not know what or why. And I'll bet nobody's even bothered to ask, eh? He would not tell us. And we did it because he paid well. Then we began to think... He's making criminals out of us. So you decided to settle down and Dagmar was killed. It was a good plan for Dan Harrigan. We're gypsies. When there is death among us, we cannot go to the police like other people. We must bury our dead and run away. With an extra husband. I'm sorry, Paul, if I've deceived you. But I thought perhaps you would frighten Dan Harrigan away from us. Yeah. Well, Fatima, there's only one thing wrong with your story. Yes? I don't believe it. What? Tell me. Tell me what was in those shipments, and maybe I'll change my mind. We don't care if you don't, Paul. What? what? She's not going to tell you. How'd you get in here, Dan? I'm Superman. I walk through walls. Is there a back door to this apartment? You don't think I'd live without one, do you? Or without that gun, either. That's a great comfort when you run out of ideas. 
Come on, Fatima. We're going out for some air. No. Don't be foolish, baby. You either walk out with me or the boys from the morgue will carry you out. Paul. I can't help you, honey. That gun's got me outnumbered. Very well done, Eric. I will go with you. Sorry, Paul. You know how gypsies are. They've got to keep moving. Yeah. Uh, just one more thing. Don't write about those shipments she told you about. You'll never be able to prove them. Come on, Toby. We're going after them. I... Toby, where are you? Hey, Toby! Uh, well, I'll be a press agent. Toby, wake up! Mm-hmm. <laughs> For Pete's sake, get up! Don't you realize you're sleeping in a murderer's bed? <laughs> Paul, you don't really think Dan Harrigan would have brought Fatima here to his own gypsy nightclub. I'm not thinking, Toby. I'm just looking. 2,255, 2,256, 20... Excuse me, Mr. Snyder. Can you tell us where... Now, don't I... bother me. Can't you see I'm counting the day's receipt? Uh, yes, but I... 2,157... You're cheating, but... bud. You were up to 2,200 before. Uh, was I? Now, look what you've done. You made me lose my count. What do you want? Dan Harrigan, that's all. Well, he isn't here and he isn't going to be. He called me up and said he was taking a long vacation. We don't doubt it, but did he say where? I'm not his confidential secretary, miss. Now, where was I? 2,257. Uh, oh, thank you. But we'd much rather tell you where you should be. Uh, of course. 2,358, 2,350. Well, what now, Paul? Just don't look. There's an apparition coming through the door. Hmm? Greetings, oh. my friends. Uh, did he say that to us, Paul? It seems so, honey. Let me check. Uh, hello, Kismet. I am so happy to see you again. He did, Toby. Are you looking for Dan Harrigan, too? He's gone out of town. With our Fatima? Yours, pal. I give you a quit claim deed right now. You are my friend. And I can speak to you from my heart. Does the garlic come from your heart, too? Do not believe what you hear about Dan Harrigan. He did not go out of New York. That man over there told us What does he know? It... He's only a man. But I know Dan Harrigan did not go out of New York. What makes you so sure? He has a shipment. What kind? Who can tell? Every time it is something else. Can you give us a hint? Do you want to help me find my Fatima? Of course. <laughs> Anything that will keep your hand off that knife. Then we must find Dan Harrigan. Come with me. Where? My Temple of Shadows, where I communicate with the spirits. Can you make them talk? Talk? <laughs> Paul, you are my long-lost friend, but I am sorry for you. Hand me a crying towel. A woman like that. No sense. Paul, you will sit over here. With my hands on the table? That is not my business. You, foolish woman, you will sit over here. You like me, don't you? As the saying goes, I can take it or leave it. Now. Now. What, Kismet? We will have a seance. I will reach out for the spirit of Dagmar. Oh, why her? Poor Dagmar was evicted from this life before her time. She cannot enter the blessings of Osmuth until her murderer has been paid for his crime. Therefore, I will ask her, where is Dan Harrigan? Why didn't you think of this before? The spirit did not move me. <laughs> well, it's moving me. I'm going home. No one goes without Kismet's consent. You just convinced me. Now put that knife away. A spirit without two witnesses. Woman, what is wrong with you? Well, you see, Kismet, it's like this. When I was a little girl, I, I proceed was... with a seance. I shall put myself in a trance. Can't you do it at the table? Please, I am the medium. It must be done on my throne. Only from here can I reach the spirits. Boy, if that guy isn't phony number one, the world's champ. Ah! Good heavens, is that what these mediums call a trance? Phone the police, Toby. I'm afraid we've seen something new in spirit calling. What do you mean, Paul? Paul, what are you talking about? Uh, don't touch that chair. What's the matter with it? I don't know yet. Give me a minute. What are you doing? Just moving the body. What? Uh-huh. He's dead. And there's the thing that killed him. A needle? Yeah. Stuck into the upholstery under the headrest. And it jabbed him in the back of the neck. But how... Poison, darling. Something new in petty point. Oh. Let's go, honey. Yes. There's a phone in the reception room. We'll phone the police. <laughs> what? What's that? There's someone behind those wall drapes. You are right. Someone is behind the drapes. Me. Why, it's Hakim. My future father-in-law. Did you expect to cut something with that knife, Majesty? Your throat, my son. Not tonight, Pop. 
I got a gun in my pocket, and the law says when you shoot in self-defense, you shoot in self-defense. You're lying. Do you think you can deceive Hakim? You hear that? I just released the safety catch. Would you like to hear a shot? No, no, no. I, I, I dropped the knife. I hate to bother you, Toby. You pick it up for me? No trouble at all, dear. There. I told you I'll make an excellent wife. Yeah. Well, Hakim, now I'm the boss for real. You uh, have no pistol? No pistol. That noise you heard was just two of my fingernails rubbing noses. See? You are clever, Paul. But you would not be so clever if I were not here. But uh, I was trapped, and so... Sure. Now, tell me the story behind your killings. Dagmar and Kismet were traitors. They did not like the rest for life I ordered for them. They wanted to move on, the open road. Isn't that what gypsies were made for? They were made to obey their king. But they plotted against me. They poisoned the minds of my people. It was them or abdication. And you made sure it was them. What could I do, clever one? What does an old king do when his castle is not in order? Not what you did, Pop. These days he quits. These days. These are days, my friends. What about those shipments you made for Dan Harrigan? You know about them, too. Well... I want particulars. Of course. Then Harrigan and his tribe would steal. And Hakim and his tribe delivered the merchandise to places in other cities. What merchandise? Mm, whatever it suited then Harrigan and his tribe to steal. Sometimes fur, sometimes whiskey, sometimes even automobiles. You were some distributor, weren't you? Hakim, I've got a surprise for you. You will let me go? No. I'm going to hand you over to the cops. In one piece. <laughs> Paul, I'll never forget that look on Dan Harrigan's face when he was brought into police headquarters and saw us there. Yeah. Well, that look on Fatima's face. Imagine that girl telling us she saw Dan Harrigan kill Dagmar. Yeah. When she saw Hakeem, her own father, do it. Yeah. Not that I've got any sympathy for Harrigan. But she had no right to point the finger at him. She should have said nothing if she wanted to save her father. Yeah. Oh, well, like father, like daughter. <laughs> and that was the girl you were going to marry, dear. Yeah. What's that? Uh, oh, look, Soby, i got to get this column out. I've only got 15 minutes of press time. Of course, dear. Well, here's a lead for that column. Dead duck makes deadline. Uh, but, huh? Good night, you worm. And so closes tonight's story, The Gypsy Sings of Death. Stedman Coles wrote the radio script. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Chet Stratton played the part of Paul Palmer. Virginia Dwyer was Toby Randolph. Stefan Schnabel was Hakim. Peter Capel played Kismet. Inga Adams was Fatima. Gloria Stenyi was Dagmar. And Barry Thompson was the man. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very unusual story of a going concern that went for murder. It's called a deed indeed. In the meantime? Well, in the meantime, there's a new crime club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we look for you next week. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Death swims at midnight. Yes, we have that story for you. Come right over. Ah, you're 
are here. Good. Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is. Death Swims at Midnight. The very exciting story of a singular beach where the tide goes out and murder comes in. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. Bill Desmond, the famous private detective, and his pint-sized assistant, Maxie Davis, have gone to the resort town of Marbell for a rest. To Maxie's disgust, Bill has dragged him out of bed at seven in the morning to go for a swim. As they stand at the edge of the boardwalk, looking out over the ocean, Maxie blinks his sleepy eyes and then turns to glare at his boss. You mean you expect me to go in there? Why, sure, Maxie. A swim before breakfast is good for the health. For a fish, yeah. Me, I should have stood in bed. Oh, you'll change your mind when you hit that water. Aye, look at how blue it is. How calm. Mm-hmm. And who knows how cold. I do, gentlemen. What? what? Huh? I do. <laughs> yep, the water's cold. Cold as death. Uh, excuse me, but... Uh... Kind of scared you, eh? Well, didn't mean to. Name's Atkins. Fuzzy Atkins, they call me. I live in that shack on the old fishing pier. I see. Weren't uh, thinking of doing some fishing, were you? I know. Uh, not this morning. Too bad. Ain't many goes fishing these days. Nope. They got other things to do. Well, uh, yes. Uh, excuse us, Fuzzy. We are going for a swim. Go right ahead. But don't forget, the water's cold these days. Very cold. Hmm. Encouraging little fellow, isn't he, Maxie? Yeah, look, though, maybe he's right. The water does look kind of chilly. Uh, let's go back to our hotel. Oh, nonsense. We're going for a swim. Come on. <sighs> okay. Here, yeah, we'll get down these stairs to the beach. Uh-huh. I still don't see why we couldn't have come down here later. At least we would have had company. We have company, Maxie. Uh, hmm? Where? Over there. That girl. Oh. Ah. She looks rather interesting, doesn't she? She looks like a dame. There are dames, Maxie, and dames. Yeah, and there's trouble and more trouble. Come on, Bill, let's head for the other end of the beach. And pass that up? Not me. Come on, let's visit. But, Bill, let... Uh... Oh, okay. Say, what's she doing? Digging in the sand? I don't know. She looks rather old to be making mud pies. Hello. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry if I startled you. Well, uh, <clears throat> how's the water this morning? It's okay, I guess. Hmm. Nice uh, beach you have here. It's getting kind of crowded. Is it? I didn't notice. That's funny. Those eyes of yours have been noticing everything else. Well, there's nothing like exercise to the eyes, I always say. Just be careful they don't get too much. I hear that makes them turn black. Oh, does it? Yeah. Just to give them a rest, I'm going to get out of here. So long. <laughs> That's the neatest brush off you ever get. Mm. Too bad, too. I've always wanted to teach a guy like that how to uh, swim. Uh, something tells me she don't need no lessons. Maybe not. Well, let's get into the water, eh? Um, it's uh, kind of nice here on the sand, Bill. What do you say we squat here for a while? Yeah, all right. Up, uh, watch where you sit down, Maxie. Huh? There's quite a bit of tar on the beach. Oh, yeah. Well, here's a nice spot. Guess I'll just... Hey! What's the matter, Maxie? What's the matter? <laughs> What's the idea of putting your foot under me? Put my foot under you? Not me. Oh, I cut it out, will you, Bill? <laughs> Who do you think you're kidding? But on the level, I swear I didn't. Well, that's funny. Uh... Wait a minute. Maybe there's something... Hey! It wasn't your foot. It... It... It's someone else's. What? Yeah, let me see. Maxie, there's someone under the sand. Quick, help me shovel it to one side. Right. Yeah, I don't know just where, but if the feet are down here, I think... Ah, there we are. Holy smoke! It's a dame. Is she sleeping? Yes. The long, long sleep of death. Did you phone the car in the Maxie? Yeah, Bill, he'll be right down. Good. Say, uh, Bill, have you figured out what caused the death? Well, there's a nasty bruise on her head, but I'd say she drowned. Drowned? But how did she get under the sand? The how, Maxie, is not so important as the why. Howdy. 
Howdy, gentlemen. Notice you're digging from up on the pier. Ain't after clams, are you? Uh, not exactly, Fuzzy. Here, take a look at what we dug up. Oh. You know, I ain't seen a clam like that for a long time. <laughs> no, sir. Not like that. Yeah, come on, let's stop that. Huh? Who is this girl? Hmm. Appears to me like Mrs. Dale. Joan Dale. Yep, that's who it is. She's got the big bungalow right opposite my shack on the pier. I see. Uh, Fuzzy, did you see that girl who was on the beach when we got here? Yep, sure did. That was Carol Carson. Got the bungalow on the other side of Mrs. Dale. She, uh... <laughs> she left you in a hurry, didn't she? Yeah, she did. Hey, you don't think that that Carson I thing was... I don't think anything yet, Maxie. Uh, Fuzzy, we expect the coroner here any minute. Will you watch the body until he arrives? Yep, sure will. Good. Come on, Maxie. I want to have a look at Mrs. Dale's bungalow. Hey, this is quite a layout, huh, Bill? Yes, Maxie, it's uh, quite cozy. Cozy is right. With a joint like this, even I could learn how to like the beach. Uh, what are you looking for? I don't know. We'll just poke around, see what we can. Ah. What is it? This desk, Maxie. Well, what about it? I don't see a thing. Take a look at the blotter. Well, so I'm looking. All I see is a lot of numbers. Exactly. It's almost as though someone has been practicing arithmetic. Mm-hmm. And yet there are no papers on the desk. None in the drawers and... And let me see. No. Nothing in the waste paper basket either. Uh, maybe... Where are you going? Over the fireplace. Uh-huh. You find anything, Bill? Yes. Ashes, Maxie. Ashes. But not only a paper, of cloth, too. Cloth? Uh-huh. And to judge by some of the burnt threads, a coarse cloth. Hello? That you, Martin? I want to talk to you, but... Well, who are you? My name is Desmond, Bill Desmond. This is my assistant, Maxie Davis. Oh, you're the ones who discovered the body, aren't you? Yes. How'd you know? I just left the coroner. Oh, I see. I beg your pardon, but uh, the name Desmond is rather familiar. Familiar, he says. <laughs> Brother, you're looking at the best private op in the business. Oh, of course. Oh, uh, permit me to introduce myself. I'm Fulton Stokes, Mrs. Dale's attorney. Oh, yes. How do you All do? Right. Uh, Mr. Stokes, when you left the coroner, had he completed his examination of the body? Yes. He's of the opinion that Mrs. Dale drowned at some time around midnight last night. He thinks it was an accident. Oh? You disagree? Well, I don't know. Yet. Uh, tell me, who is this uh, Martin you called to when you first came in? Martin Dale, Joan's husband. Do you know where he is? Probably on his cruiser, which is anchored just offshore. Didn't he live here with his wife? Well, uh, no. You see, they'd had a bad quarrel. Joan had the idea that Martin married her for her money. I see. Do you know when they last saw each other? Not exactly, but, uh... She did have an appointment to see him on board his cruiser late last night. Late last night, eh? Maxie. Yeah? I think we'll take a little boat ride. All right, Maxie. Here's Dale's cruiser. Get on board and I'll follow. Now, okay. Up you go. Okay, I'm on. Now, give me a hand. Ah, that's it. Thanks. Hey, what do you two think you're doing? Get off or I'll throw you off. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, come on, Bill. Uh, no, Maxie, don't mind, Mr. Dale. He's just kidding. Kidding, huh? Okay, wise guy. If you ask for it, I'll just... Oh. 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 Gee, <laughs> he didn't last long, did he? Uh, no, Maxie. The trouble with him is he's big, but he's soft. Aren't you, Dale? Oh. Come on, now, come on. Up on your feet. Oh. <sighs> Well, what do you want? I, uh, I've got some bad news, Dale. Your wife is dead. Dead? Yes. She was drowned late last night. Tell me, when did you see her last? Uh, a couple of days ago. You're lying, Dale. Lying? Why, I ought to... What? Nothing. That's better. Your wife was aboard this boat late last night, wasn't she? Yes, I... I talked to her about a reconciliation. Mm-hmm. But she wasn't in the mood. She'd lost a lot of money gambling with Nick Verrill. Nick Verrill? 
Uh, who's he? Well, he runs the Pelican Club at the end of the boardwalk. Oh. Well, go on. I tried to convince my wife to let me come back. She wouldn't listen. Mm-hmm. I tried to kiss her, and she struggled, then jumped off the boat and swam for shore. That's all I know. That's all, eh? She had an ugly bruise on her head, Dale. I don't know anything about it. Maybe not. By the way, where can I get in touch with Nick Verrill? Well, from 8 p.m. on, you can find him at his club. Before that, he's usually with his girlfriend, Carol Carson. Carol Carson? Carson? Why, yes. Do you know her? Yeah. You might say she was a passing acquaintance, huh, Bill? Uh-huh. Uh, you know, Maxie, I think I'll pay her a visit this evening. Maybe we can get to be warm friends. <laughs> Nice view from the boardwalk, huh, Stokes? Hmm? Oh, Martin! What's wrong with your jaw? I had a visitor on my boat. A man by the name of Desmond. Kind of funny his knowing that Joan had an appointment with me last night. Oh, now, wait a minute, Martin. Joan's death occurred under peculiar circumstances. Desmond asked me some questions, and I answered them. Uh-huh. I got a couple of questions, too. Yes? As far as I know, the will Joan made after our marriage has never been changed. Is that right? Uh-huh. Now, according to the terms of that will, I inherit her estate. Go on. I'm a little short right now. I've been running into some bad luck at Nick Farrow's. How about an advance? Well? How much do you need? Five thousand dollars. Well, I, I guess I can let you have it. Good. Uh, just one thing, Martin. Yeah? If Joan was murdered, you'd be the leading suspect. So? Now, I'm not saying that you're guilty. But if you were tried and convicted, you wouldn't inherit a penny. I'd be out 5000 Why, I'm surprised at you for bringing that up. After all, you'd only be out 5000 As for me, I'd be out. Hello? Hello, Nick. Yeah? This is Martin Dale. Oh, I've been waiting for you to get in touch. Got that dough you owe me? Well, I've got five grand, Nick. Five grand? You told me you'd have it all by tonight. I know, but now that Joan's dead, I'll need a little more time. Sorry, Dale. Your time's up tonight. Either you pay off or else they'll shovel you in with your wife. But if you'll only wait, I'll... No, I've to... waited long enough. Now, look, Nick. Give me a break and I'll tell you something you should know. Okay? And I'm not making any promises, Dale. But spell it. Well, there's a private detective from here from New York. A fellow by the name of Bill Desmond. That's not news. I know, but, but he was out on my boat this morning, and from what he said, I think he's got something on Carol. Huh? He said that he was going to see her this evening. Oh. Well, Nick, do I get more time? Okay, Dale. If this tip turns out to be on the level, you can forget about tonight's deadline. <laughs> Getting kind of late, Nick. Aren't you going up the clock? What's the matter, Carol? Are you anxious to get rid of me? Of course not. Hey, what's wrong with you tonight? Nothing. Why? Well, you've been thoughtful all evening. So? I've been thoughtful. You're not usually when you're with me. So? I was just wondering if you were thinking of Joan Dale. Why should I be thinking of her? Oh, come on, Nick. You don't have to be cagey with me. I don't know what you're talking about. No, I saw you go into her bungalow last night. You know, you're way off base, baby. Now, look, Nick, I'm sort of mixed up in this thing, too, and I figured that... You expecting anyone, Carol? No. Okay, give me a minute to duck into the bedroom, then go see who it is. Right. Just a minute. Good evening. Oh, the boy with the athletic eyes. Yes, Desmond's the name. Bill to you. Well, good night, Bill. Uh, just a moment, Carol. Don't close the door until I'm inside. There we are. You get out of here. Oh, not yet, darling. Mmm, nice place you've got here. You know, I'm beginning to think that your friend Nick Vera's a fool. What do you mean? Well, a setup like this, a girl like you, I'd be hanged if I desert you every night just for business. If you don't mind, let's leave Nick out of this. Suits me. As a matter of fact, I picked my time in coming to visit you to be sure I'd avoid running into him. I see. I uh, figured we'd be more comfortable uh, 
Alone. What do you want? Hmm? Don't. I didn't do anything. I know, but I didn't like the way your hands were twitching. Oh, that. <laughs> That's nothing. I, uh, I guess I smoke too much. Yes, I guess you do. Suppose you cool off and tell me why you came here. Uh, okay. Uh, tell me, why did you bury Joan Dale's body in the sand? I didn't. Did it have anything to do with Nick Vero? I... Well, don't stare like that. Talk, I said... Uh... You shouldn't have hit him so hard, Nick. Shut up. But you shouldn't have hit him that way. I said shut up. That's the first time you ever hit me. Yeah. And it won't be the last time if you don't shut your trap. Help me tie this lug up. I'm going to feed him to the fishes. Oh, Fuzzy! Fuzzy! Yep, what is it? I- I've been looking high and low for my boss, Bill Desmond. Have you seen him? Nope, ain't seen hide and hair of him. Uh, Maybe he's gallivant. Uh, Wait a minute, Fuzzy. I thought I heard something. Huh? I didn't hear anything. Uh, there it is again. Uh, hey, you're right. Someone's crying for help. Sounds like it comes from under my pier. Come on. Okay. This way, under the boardwalk. Help. Sounds like it comes from right over there. Wait, I put on my flashlight. There we are. Holy Hannah, it's Bill. Yep, so it is. Crushed up like a bundle of wash. And the tide coming in, too. Help. It's okay now, Bill. Maxie? Yeah, and Fuzzy Atkins. I'll have you loosen. Just a second, Mr. Desmond. Just have to cut one more cord. There we are. Can uh, you get up, Bill? Yes, I I think so. Just give me your hand for a moment. Ah, thanks. Gee, I'm, I'm sure glad you're okay, Bill. Lucky Fuzzy and me heard you. Otherwise, you'd have been a goner. Yep. The old devil in the sea might have gotten another one. The old devil, Fuzzy? Yes, yeah, sure he. <laughs> Didn't believe in him much till I saw him get Mrs. Dale. You saw a devil get Mrs. Dale? Yep, sure did. I was up in my shack and I saw... Oh! Bill, you okay? Yes, Maxie. But Fuzzy's been hit. Is he hurt bad? He's dead, Maxie. Dead? Who do you think killed him? A devil, Maxie. A devil. Boy, what a layout this Pelican Club has. Look at all the suckers just begging to be taken to the cleaners. Yeah. Did you see Nick, Bill? Uh, no, Maxie. Let's try his private office. Right. Uh, Here it is. Mm-hmm. Better stand guard outside the door, Maxie. I don't want to be disturbed. Okay. Say, who do you think... Bill Desmond. Yes, Carol, what's the matter? You act as though you're looking at a ghost. Keep both hands on top of the table, darling. Well, you got me wrong, Bill. I wasn't going to pull a gun. Maybe not. But suppose you come around here, away from the desk. Okay. That's better. I suppose it must have handed you quite a laugh when Nick crept up behind me and let me have it. I didn't laugh, Bill. No? After he threw me under the pier, you might at least have gotten in touch with Maxie. No, I couldn't. Nick made me stick close to him till just a little while ago. As soon as he left, I called your hotel, but Maxie was out. Mm-hmm. You're fast on your feet, aren't you? You... You don't believe me? Who do I look like, little boy blue? It's the truth, Bill. Honest. Mm-hmm. Well, never mind that now. Where'd Nick go? I don't know. Now, look, Carl. I... I've got a bump on my head the size of an egg. My wrists and ankles are raw from the ropes cutting into them. I'm in no mood for stalling around. I'm afraid Nick will kill me. Well, now, don't worry. I won't tell him how I found out. Well... He... He went to see Stokes at his hotel, the Shore Plaza. Honest? Yes. Okay, sweetheart, I'll buy it. For your sake, I hope this isn't another sellout. You really expect to find Nick here, Bill? I don't know, Maxine. You don't know? Well, I do. I'll bet you that... Yes? Oh, oh, it's you, Desmond, and Mr. Davis. Oh, yes, Stokes. Tell me, is Nick Vera with you? Nick? Why, uh, uh, no. I told you, Bill. I knew she was lying. Quiet, Maxine. Okay. Do you mind if we come in for a few minutes, Stokes? Well, I'm sorry, Desmond, but I'm, I'm rather I'm busy. sorry, <laughs> too. I want in. Now that you're in, what do you want? Well, well, Nick Vero. Shame on you. 
A big boy like you hiding behind the door. Hmm? No wonder Stokes was so nervous. That gun of yours is almost as ugly looking as you. Close your big gap, Desmond, or I'll fill your teeth with lead. Until this half pint sidekick of yours to close that door. Do as he says, Maxie. Sure. That's better. Now, what did you want, Desmond? Oh, I want to talk to you about a number of things. For instance, why you cocked me earlier this evening and left me under the pier for fish bait? Me? <laughs> You're nuts. Oh, I don't think so, Nick. Tell me, did you really want me to end up like Mrs. Dale? Look, Desmond, if you think I killed Mrs. Dale, you're off your trolley. Yeah? Yeah. Carol Carson thought you might have had something to do with it. That's why she buried the body in the sand. Carol acts like a dumb little twist sometimes. For instance, she shouldn't have told you I was here. She, uh, she didn't. Maybe not. Well, Desmond, anything else you'd like to ask me before I go? Uh, no, Nick. But if I think of something, uh, I'll call on you. Yeah, yeah, do that. I'll give you a warm reception. Okay, you guys, just stay where you are. I'm leaving. Should we, uh, should we follow him, Bill? No, Maxie. That would play right into his hands. Stokes. Yes, Desmond? What did Nick want with you? Well, he came to see me about Mrs. Dale's gambling debt. It seems that she owed him about $50,000. Hmm. As much as that, eh? That's what he says. Now that she's dead and he can't collect it legally, he wanted me to pay it out of her estate. What did you tell him? Well, naturally, I told him that that was impossible. He didn't like that. I guess not. He told me I'd have to pay up or... or else he'd kill me. What's the matter with you, Bill? Hmm? Ever since we returned to our rooms, you've been pacing up and down like a stub bug. I thought you said you were going to undress and hit the hay. Yes, I know, Maxie, but I can't get this case out of my mind. The solution keeps eluding me. It does? <laughs> well, I think it's a cinch. Oh, you do, eh? Sure, look. Mrs. Dale probably drowned swimming in from her husband's boat. How about Fuzzy Atkins? Well, Nick was sore because Fuzzy helped pull you out of the water. Ah, no, Maxie, that won't wash. But who else could have killed him? That old devil in the sea he was babbling about? Hmm, that old devil in the sea. Wait. Maybe Fuzzy wasn't babbling. Huh? Yes. It could tie in with those ashes we found in Mrs. Dale's fireplace. Why, of course. Of course what? Maybe. Oh, see who it is, Maxie. Okay. Bill in, Maxie. Oh, Miss Carson. Uh, who's that? Carol? Yes, Bill. I've got to talk to you. Good Lord, what's happened? You look as though you've been through a meat grinder. Nick gave me a beating. Why, the dirty... He was sore because I told you he'd gone to Stokes. Well, I'm going to give him lots more to be sore about. Yes? Nick was in Joan Dale's bungalow last night. I don't know if he saw her, but he took some of her papers. How do you know? I saw her name on the envelope just before he put them in his desk. I see. Come on, Maxie. I want to take a peek into that desk. How are you making out, Bill? I think we'll be in Nick's office presently, Maxie. Unless I've lost all my skill with a skeleton key. There. That does it. Now, careful, Maxie, when you close the door. Okay. Now, the flashlight. That's it. Uh-huh. There's the desk. Hold the light on the top center drawer. Right. That's it. Hmm. This should be easy to force on the door. I'll just insert this near the lock and press down. Ah, that did it. Now to see what... Hey, someone put the lights on. Yeah, I did. Oh, you looking for something, Desmond? Well, if it is now a gentle friend, Nick. And his friend, the automatic. Yeah. The gun and me are good pals. It always does what I want. Desmond, I told you I'd give you a warm reception. Well, here it is. <laughs> That, Mr. Stokes, is what I call an entrance. Thanks. Not at all, Desmond. Glad to be of service. How is Nick, Maxie? I think he's going to make some undertaker very happy. Well, I don't think anyone will miss him. Now, uh, let's see what's in that desk drawer. Ah, oh, yes. As Mrs. Dale's papers all right. Uh, may I have them, Desmond? As her executive, I'll, uh, I'll need them to wind up her estate. Certainly. Oh, uh, by the way, may I have that gun? I'll turn it into the car and explain what happened. Oh, of course. Here. Thanks. Now, uh, would you mind taking off your shoes and socks? What? What's the matter with your billion nuts? No, Maxie. 
I just want to prove that Mr. Stokes is guilty of uh, murder. Hmm? Uh, uh, <clears throat> hey, what time is it, Maxie? <sighs> 7 a.m. Hey, what's the idea of setting the alarm clock? I've got a date at the beach with Carol Carson. Where the devil are my swim trunks? Wait a minute. I didn't get a chance to talk to you last night. Why did Stokes commit those murders? Well, he'd embezzled a good deal of Mrs. Dale's money. She'd been checking her accounts and discovered the discrepancies. That's why her desk bladder was full of figures. Oh, but how did he drown her in the ocean? He didn't. That is, in the ocean. He drowned her in her bathtub after first knocking her unconscious. Uh Uh-huh. Then he carried her under the boardwalk and the old fishing pier. I see. So Stokes was really the old devil of the sea that Fuzzy saw. Exactly. Now, where in blazes are those swim trunks? So how about Nick? Hmm? Oh, Nick. Well, when he was in Mrs. Dale's bungalow, he came across her papers with notations on Stokes' embezzlement. Mm -hmm. Then he went after Stokes, not for Mrs. Dale's gambling debt, but for blackmail. Oh, I get it. Uh, Now, one thing more, Bill. Why did you want Stokes to take off his shoes and socks? Well, if you remember, the beach was covered with spots of tar. Uh Uh-huh. When Stokes carried Mrs. Dale into the pier in the dark, he got tar all over his feet and legs. And that stuff is almost impossible to get off. Oh. When he got back to a bungalow, he tried cleaning it off with a towel. Then he burned the towel in the fireplace. I see. Now, if you'll excuse me, Maxie, I'll be off to meet Carol. Uh, oh, Bill. Now what? Um, uh, before you go, uh, don't you think you ought to put on your swim trunks? Hmm? Oh. Oh. And so closes tonight's story, Death Swims at Midnight. James Erthine wrote the radio script, Roger Bauer produced and directed. Arthur Vinton played the part of Bill Desmond... Murray Forbes was Maxie Davis. Elspeth Eric was Carol Carson. Ralph Camargo was heard as Fulton Stokes. Chuck Webster was Nick Verrill. Joe Latham played Fuzzy Atkins. And Barry Thompson was Martin Dale. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. This is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very absorbing story of a girl who was forced into a game of terror in which the dice were loaded with death. It's called Sometimes a Sucker Wins. In the meantime, well, in the meantime, there's a new crime club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we look for you next week. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the Crime Club. I'm the librarian. Fish for entree. Yes, we have that story for you. Come right over. Ah, you're here. Good. Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is. Fish for entree. The very unusual story of a fishing expedition that was foul with murder. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. Being the son of the local chief of police never kept Barney Crawford from doing anything that was normal. Example? Well, Barney loved to go fishing. It was late one bright sunny morning. 
and far out on the bay in a rowboat that was being rocked by the choppy water, Barney Crawford was holding a line, and Janice Turner, his fiancée, was just about holding her own. Mm, what a day. Yes. Why are they, Barney? Who, Janice? The fish. Oh. What's the matter, dear? You look green. I feel green. Well, why didn't you say so? I was trying to be very brave, Barney. Nonsense. I'll pull in my line and we'll get back to shore. Thank you, dear. I'll have it up in a... Wait a minute. I don't know if I can. Something's on to the catch. Can't you shake it loose? I'd rather not look at a fish right now. After sitting here all morning... Wow, it must be a whale. Look at the way the rod is bent. Would you mind if I didn't? Lucky I brought out the heavy equipment. Just a few more seconds, Janice, and I'll have him. I'll hold everything. I'm trying to, Barney. Easy does it. Easy. I've got to be careful he doesn't snap the rod. Uh, he's not fighting now. But when I get him to the surface, you'll see a battle. Some fish wait until that... Uh, uh, he's breaking water. <gasps> Don't look, Janice. It's a body. It's the body of a man. We're going back to shore and call my father. He'll want to know about this. Barney, take Janice away from here. This is no place I'm for... I'm not you. going, Chief. Now, see here, I'm Janice. I'm not going. You see what I mean, Dad? Well, she's your woman, son. Chief. Chief Crawford. Now, what is it, Bailey? The coroner's finished. He says the guy was killed by two bullets in the back of the neck. I saw that for myself. How long has he been dead? About three days. Three days, huh? Who was he? I didn't check him for identification, sir. I thought you might want All it. right, all right. I'll do it. Let's go. Janice, that was no invitation to us. But I'm accepting it anyhow, Barney. You have to see everything? Now, you make a list, Bailey. I'll check his pockets. Okay, Chief. You ready? Yep. Chewing gum. Some cigarettes. Toothpicks. It's all in this pocket. Now, let's see. Nothing in the other. Now, the inside pocket. With it. Hello, what's this? What? Barney, it's a dead fish. Here, Bailey, throw it back in the water. Okay, Chief. Now, let's see what else there is. Hmm, card. Press card. Dad, that fellow must have been a newspaper man. Uh you don't say. Well, what I mean is... Janice, take him away before he solves this case. Oh, now, look here, Dad. Now, look, I'm too busy. Three days in the water's washed up all the writing off this card and the name, too. Bailey. Yeah? What do you know about a newspaper man who disappeared three days ago? A newspaper man? Check with missing persons when you get back to headquarters. A newspaper man. There was a call a couple of days ago from a family of a certain Cal Foster. Cal Foster, the Daily Register reporter? That's the one, Barney. You know anything about him, Barney? Well, he was a byline writer, Dad. He was working on a series exposing rackets. Sure, I remember him. If that's the body of Cal Foster, then I've got a hunch. Yeah. All right, Bailey, get me pictures right away. I'm going to take one up to Sam Salver, the publisher of the Daily Register. Maybe he can tell us what we ought to know. Mr. Salover, do you recognize the man in this picture? Yes, why, well, certainly. That's Cal Forster, one of... The Chief Crawford, he looks dead. Well, he is. He was murdered. What? My son Barney and Miss Turner here fished him out of the bay this morning. Oh, good Lord, he was my best reporter. He was... Yes? You're going to find his killer, Chief Crawford. This is one crime that's not going to go unsolved. Name the one crime in this town we didn't clear up, Mr. Salah. I'm not going to argue with you. I want action. This paper's been fighting crime for months, exposing rackets, helping to bring criminals to justice. Well, we know all about it. Cal Foster was doing the job with my support. Every racket in this state involving... Dad, uh, would you mind if I ask Mr. Salah one question? Barney, now... Oh, just one, Dad. It might help you. All right. Thanks. Mr. Salover, what was Cal Foster working on three days ago? I don't know. But you're his publisher. Cal never talked about what he was going to write until he was ready to write it. Oh, then he was about to begin a new series, huh? I think so, but just what it was going to be... Well, this may sound strange to you, uh, Chief Crawford, but I seldom saw Cal. He did all his work away from the office. When he came in, it was to get my approval of something he wanted me to run. Last time I saw him was two weeks ago. What did he bring in then? The astrology racket. Mr. Salover. I'm sorry I busted in, Mr. Salover, but I just heard a rumor about Cal. Cal Foster. Is it true? Who are you, miss? I'm Ann Brewster. I run the woman's column for this paper. Cal Foster and I are engaged to be married. 
Anything else you'd like to know? Oh, maybe. Then you can send me a letter. I give out all kinds of advice and information. Now, Mr. Sowerby... And that's Chief of Police Crawford and those two people with Police? Him. And it's true, Cal's dead. They told me he was murdered. <gasps> murdered? Oh. Janice, see what you can do. Oh, don't be foolish, Barney. There's nothing anyone can do at a time like this. I... I was coming out of my office when I met one of the reporters. He told me he was going down to the bay, something about Cal having drowned. I didn't believe him. He was shot twice in the back of the neck. Now, would you know... Would I know what? Who killed him? Well, Chief, your guess is as good as mine. Cal was a racket buster. He exposed a lot of rackets. But... Yes, and that... Who are you? Janice Turner. I'm his, Barney's. Were you with the police? Well, I'm sort of engaged to... Excuse me. I'll keep my mouth shut from now on. See that you do. There's one thing I can tell you, Chief Crawford. What's that? Every gangster in this state was out to get Cal. I begged him to give up his job and go away with me. And... Cal wouldn't do it. Why, only four days ago... The last time I ever saw him, he, he was all set to break a new story, another racket. What about? He didn't tell me, Chief Crawford. But he did say it was going to be the biggest thing that ever hit this town. And he mentioned names. Oh? The first time he ever did it before publication. I think he was frightened. He didn't say so, but... Whose names did he mention, Miss Brewster? Tony Crawford, the gang leader, and Lon Fairbanks. The nightclub owner? Yes. But he didn't tell you uh, what he found out about them? I said he didn't. All right. I thought maybe you'd forget yourself and remember. Chief Crawford, do you think I've lied to you? I'll let you know when I'm ready. Come on, Barney. Janice. Uh, uh, there's just one question I'd like to ask Miss Brewster, Dad. She doesn't have to answer it unless I ask it, Barney. I'll take that chance. Uh, did Cal Foster keep any notes, or did he write from memory? He kept notes, but I never saw them. Thanks. I'm ready, Dad. Then we don't have to waste any more time, do we? Chief... Do you really think that girl was lying? Goodbye, Janice. Chief, I... It's a nice day. Now, why don't you and Barney take a walk in the park? Where are you going, Dad? Tony Croton. Well? Nothing doing now. You're going for a walk in the park. But, Dad, we found... Now, look, son, would you mind if I did a police job all by myself? Well, you're not being fair, Dad. Don't tell your mother. See you at dinner. Tony Croton doesn't turn out to be too tough. Yeah, maybe. What do you mean, Barney? We found Cal Forster's body, and we're going to find out who killed him. Oh? Have you got an idea? Mm-hmm. Those notes he kept. What was in them that made him dangerous enough to kill? Oh, darling, aren't you assuming too much? Am I? Cal Foster wasn't killed by someone who didn't know what he was going to write about. No? Whoever killed him must have had a motive. Cal, in one of his published stories, stepped on somebody's toes and... that and... somebody got mad and... Boom. Let's walk away from here. I've got a theory about that girl, Ann Brewster. You think she's that somebody? She knows. And that act she put in inside Mr. Salver's office. Your father didn't fall for it. Well, maybe he didn't. But I'd like to see those notes anyway. Come on, we're going to Cal Foster's apartment. Imagine the son of a police chief picking a lock. Janice, please. And with a hairpin, just like for a... For Pete's sake, will you lower your voice? The neighbors... Yes, dear, I'll shut up. Why, Barney, you did that job like an expert. Let's get inside. Oh, my. Somebody's been here. You think maybe it was a hurricane? At least. Now what do we do? Let's go for that walk in the park. No, let's not. Somebody was looking for those notes. It couldn't be that someone was looking for something else, could it, Barney? Hmm? I've just had a brand new idea. Suppose Cal Foster and his girlfriend, Ann Brewster... You don't like that girl, do you? Suppose they were running a cute little blackmail racket. Janice. Cal Foster dug up a lot of dirt about dirty people. Whoever paid off was left alone. Whoever didn't was plastered in a newspaper column. Is that why Ann Brewster told Dad about Tony Croton and Lon Fairbanks? Exactly. Fall guys, you know. And the real killers, the ones Cal and she have been blackmailing... Right on blackmailing, eh? Sure. Before we... Let's look for those notes. Now, if I wanted to hide some papers my life depended on, where would I put them? In your hat. Janice. All right, dear, torture yourself. Where would I... Of course. I'm so glad. In my hat. What? My top hat. Let's see if Cal Forst owned one. Oh, now listen, Barney, I was only kidding. After all, dear. After all, darling, look on the shelf in this closet. But it doesn't prove a thing. You're just saying that because you're licked. Now, if this lining comes out without any Barney. trouble... Well, dear... 
shut up. You don't have to be so proud of yourself. Here's a handful, darling. Well, after all, if it hadn't been for me... What did you say? A handful of papers, Janice. Look through them. I'll read these. What's the matter? Proof, right on this top page. The names of Tony Croton and Lon Fairbanks. What does it say about them? Engaged in a racket of international scope. Good heavens, what kind of a racket? I don't know yet. The pages are not in order. They're not even numbered. Oh, what a job we're going to have. Why don't we turn it over to your father? Later, later. Spread all your papers on the table. I'll do the same with mine. What good will that do? Come on, let's get moving. Just a minute, Barney. What now, darling? Here are some pages clipped together like a manuscript. Janice, do you know what this is? You want me to guess? It's a carbon copy of the first installment. What first installment? Cal Forster's is about the racket he was investigating. Oh! Then the story was ready for publication. You bet it was. And that's why he was murdered. But there's not a thing in here about the racket itself. Isn't there even a hint, a slight hint? Well, just a reference to a fishing expedition that just should start the nation. A fishing expedition? Barney? Yeah, I know what you're thinking. That fish dead found in Cal Forster's pocket. It meant something. Ridiculous, a freak. Well, just between you and me, I never heard of a fish getting lost. Cal Forster could have meant anything by a fishing expedition. It's a very common expression. Yeah, <gasps> hmm? very common. Huh? Barney. Don't tell me you're glad to see me. I won't believe it. Where did you come from? The bedroom. You ought to take a few lessons in snooping, pal. What? Lesson number one. When you break into somebody's apartment, always look in every room. You mean you're the yeah, one that... Yeah, me- I'm the guy that messed up this place. But you're the guy who found what I was looking for. And we're going to keep them, Mr. Croton. Oh, you know me, huh? I've seen your pictures in the papers. I look better in person, don't I? (laughs) Well, if you want my frank opinion... Table it. And do the same thing with those papers. Now listen, Tony. Do it, mister. Bonnie. Don't prompt me, Janice. I see that gun, too. All right. I'm clear. So am I. You don't mind if I say me, too, do you? That's your privilege, Mr. Croton. Thanks. Me, too. And now, me and the papers will take a walk. (laughs) What's so funny about it? I'd tell you if it'd do you any good, but I know it won't. Try it anyway. Okay. I get the evidence, and you get the works. Will you please be not quite so technical? I'm gonna kill you, baby. (gasps) You wanted a note, didn't you? Hey, mister, where are you going? Taking a walk. Get away from that door. Not to the door I want, Tony. The the light switch. Hey, get down, Travis. I'm going... Janice! 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 Darling! You feel better now? A little. The next time you tell me to get down... It's not my fault you hit your head against the table. It's not your head either. I'm sorry. Anyhow, you falling down saved our lives. Croton must have thought he killed you. You mean you let him get away? Now, look, dear, he had the gun. And I thought you had him tied up in the other room. And you, the son of a police chief. Maybe I'd better tell Dad about this. Well, it's about time. And when you get through talking to him... give me police headquarters. You can call up that man that publishes the Daily Register. What's his name? Sam Salover. Uh, hello, police headquarters. Let me talk to Chief Crawford, please. Uh, son, I'll wait. Now, Janice, what about Sam Salover? Tell him what Tony Croton did, and then tried to do to us. Make him splash it all over the front page. All right, dear. Uh, uh, hello? Uh-huh. He did, huh? Thanks. Goodbye. Dad went out a few minutes ago. He didn't say where. Well, of all... Why didn't you tell somebody at police headquarters what happened to us? Hmm? They're all policemen down there, you know. Oh, I didn't think of that. I'll call right back. Wait a minute. Of course, but will Tony Croton wait? He's getting away. Hey, wait a minute. This paper under the table. It must have... Well, it did, Janice. I'm tickled to death. Some of Cal Forster's notes must have dropped out of Tony's hand. I've got too much of a headache to care, Barney. Hmm, there's a woman in this case, Janice. A woman? Mm Mm-hmm. What's her name? Winnie Roberts. Oh. And here's something strange. After a name, Cal Forster typed in... Lon Fairbanks via Bayshore. Whatever that means. Lon Fairbanks. Let's go down to his nightclub and find out. Barney, the police in this town are still being paid. Come on, Janice, I've got an idea. And I've got a headache. But all right. Ah, 
back. Good evening, Monsieur Crawford. It is always a pleasure to welcome such a distinguished son of... I'm here too, Henri. Oh, but of course, Mademoiselle Turner. For you, I... Uh, step this way. One last thing, Henri. No? As but a matter what? of fact, we only stopped in to see Winnie Roberts. Winnie Roberts? Mm-hmm. Is it a reservation? No, it's an entertainer in the floor show. In the... Oh, but, Mademoiselle, there is no such lady in our floor show. Are you sure? How could I be otherwise? I know every charming lady in this establishment, and they are all charming. I see. Well, suppose we say hello to Lon Fairbanks, huh? Of course. You'll be most happy. You'll find him in the office. Thanks, Henry. You and your ideas. Bonnie Crawford, do you realize we've been on the go since this morning? Mm Mm-hmm. Has it occurred to you that I might be tired? Mm Mm-hmm. I'm so glad I feel so much better now. Come on, we're not going to be polite. Now, look here, Lon. Come in quick and shut the door. Stay right there, Janice, and don't move. You don't have to worry about that. I won't even look. He's dead, all right. Two bullet holes in the back of the neck. All right, Henry, all right. Now, never mind the hysterics. But, Chief Crawford, I cannot believe it. Uh, Monsieur Fairbanks... You said you didn't leave this club all evening. Oui, monsieur. How come you didn't hear the shots? But I have told you, it is possible the orchestra was playing. When that is going on, it is impossible to hear anything else. Sloppy excuse. I do not lie, monsieur. No, and you didn't see anyone going into this office either. I did not say that. What? You did not ask me. A very excited young lady inquired for Monsieur Fairbanks. I told her she marched into the office, exactly here. Oh, Chief. What is it, Janice? That sounds like it might have been Ann Brewster. Yeah. Say, Bailey. Yeah? Send out an alarm for Ann Brewster, columnist for the Daily Register. Do it right away. Right away, Chief. You go with him, Janice. Hmm? And take Barney with you. For Pete's sake, Dad. For my sake. This is not amateur night. Henri? Oui? Where does that back door lead to? Uh, That, monsieur, leads to a driveway. The door was used by Monsieur Fairbanks as a private entrance. Can we go out that way, Chief? Any way you like, Janice. All right, Barney. Why the back door? It's quicker, and I've got things to say to you that can't wait. What have I done? You don't listen to me. When I say... Hey, what's that over there? Delivery entrance to the club. Now, Janice... Let's walk toward the street. There's a man in that truck I don't want him to hear. You what? Barney Crawford... When I say to you that Ann Brewster knows who killed Cal Foster, I know what I'm talking about. Is that all you wanted to tell me? She killed him. What? She's Winnie Roberts. But, Jim... Don't uh... interrupt me. I've got a new theory. Oh, well. Ann Brewster, as Winnie Roberts, was mixed up in this racket that Cal Foster was investigating. Ann found out that Cal was ready to break the thing wide open, so she killed him. Lon Fairbanks, too? Of course. You heard what Henri said. A woman. Now we'll have to find the reason. For what? Why she killed Lon Fairbanks. Don't you know, Janice? Oh, how would I... These drivers! It's that truck wants to get to the street. Come on, let's get out of the way. Well, Barney, what do you think? <laughs> Darling, I know it smells bad here, but I'm talking to you. Fish. That's what that truck was unloading. Do you think I care? You should. You can build a brand new theory around that truck and the fish. What are you talking about? Winnie Roberts. Let's go for a drive. Where to? Bayshore, on a fishing expedition of our own. Barney, have you gone out of your mind? Not tonight, Janice. Let's get out. But this is the Bayshore Boat Club. Out, honey. All right. But since when does anyone live at a boat club? Anyone doesn't. But you said... Yes, dear. This is where Winnie Roberts is hiding out. I wish I knew what you were talking about. You will. Janice, darling, have you ever seen such a beautiful moon? I'm not in the mood. Why did you... Stop dragging me toward the water. Can I help it if I want you in a rowboat? Hmm? There's one side of the pier. Come on, let's get in. And forget all about life and people. Romance at a time like this. Oh, we've had a tough day, sweetheart. We should be looking for Ann Brewster, that killer. Oh, why worry about her? Because she's Winnie Roberts, and she knows all about the racket. Yeah, we're free. Now, down to the sea in a rowboat. Whatever that racket is, it must be something... I'm sure it is, dear. Something out of this world terrible. Of course. I don't get you at all, Bonnie. 
You spend the whole day digging for information. You almost get us killed by Tony Croton, and now all of a sudden you don't... That's me, honey. Unpredictable Bonnie. (laughs) Do you think I ought to stop talking, dear? I think you ought to look in back of you. Hmm? Just look. And then you can stop talking if you want to. Look at that moon again. Bonnie. Yes, dear? That yacht. It's Winnie Roberts. Beautiful, isn't she? Why didn't you tell me? I didn't know, Janice. I was just playing a hunch. You mean... Shh, shh, shh. You're pulling up alongside Winnie. You don't want to wake her up, do you? Bonnie, are you thinking of going on board? Why not? The lights are out. On this side, but all boats have two sides, darling. And on the other side... Shall we find out? No. All right, you stay here. I'll climb up this ladder and do this whole job myself. Bonnie, listen to Goodbye, me. Goodbye, dear. If I'm not back by morning, don't wait for me. By morning? That's right, sweetheart. Have breakfast. <laughs> How do you know that man on deck was sleeping? He was snoring. How do you know he wasn't fooling? Fish. Bonnie. We're getting close. What are you doing? I'm lighting a match. Look, Janice. Steel door. Bonnie, I'm frightened. Hold the match. I'm going to see if that door can be opened. For Pete's sake, Janice, what a time to cough. Oh, that odor of fish. Well, bring the match over here. Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> A light switch. If anyone should see that light, Barney, There's we're... no one down here. Come on, and watch your step. <laughs> Put a handkerchief over your nose. That smell's going to get worse. We're going into the hold of the ship. Oh, the things that happened to me. Barney. Yes? Are all those barrels loaded with fish? I don't know, but I... Yes, Janice, they are. Dead fish. And we've got nothing to worry about, have we? Not a thing. I'm so glad. But the next time anyone talks to me about fish, even lobster thermidor, I'll... Bonnie, what are you doing? Squeezing a fish. Oh, for heaven's sakes, do you have to? Uh-huh. Look what's popped into his mouth. Not now, please, dear. I'm too busy trying to stay conscious. It's a package, darling. See? Paper, oil skin, and... Look, a white powder. A what? A white powder, Janice. What Cal Forster meant by a fishing expedition that would startle the nation. I don't follow you, Barney. Well, this powder's a narcotic. Every fish down here is stuffed with one of these packages. I see. And Cal Foster was killed because he was about to expose a narcotics ring that Tony Croton was operating. Barney. We're on our way, Janice. The boat's moving. Yeah. <gasps> Tony Croton. Yeah. I thought I killed you two. But it's all the same now. What's a few hours among friends, huh? <laughs> Get in there. Tony, what would you look like without that gun, eh? Not so good. Get in. You too, sister. Oh. Company. You know Ann Brewster? Of course we do. <clears throat> well, Barney, what did I tell you? Yeah. You don't have to be so glum about it just because I happen to be right. Right about what, Miss Turner? You killed Cal Foster in Lawn Fairbanks. You're the mastermind of this racket and... Tell her she's crazy, Tony. Okay, then I'll tell her. I'm handcuffed to this chair. If you don't believe it, walk behind me. That's true, Miss Turner. Mr. Salver. Good evening. What did you find them, Tony? In the hold, boss, with the fish. With the fish? (laughs) What goes with fish? Wine. I wasn't expecting you, Mr. Crawford, but since you're here and I've gone to the trouble of getting this bottle from the other room... He's going to kill us. But not without kindness, my dear Anne. You murdered Cal. Naturally. He was treading on my toes. Come, let's have a drink, and then we'll go fishing. With them as bait, huh, Sam? Open the bottle, Tony. Sure. How did they get you on here, Ann? Mr. Salover did. He told me about the Winnie Roberts. I, like a fool, didn't go to the police. I was going to solve Cal's murder all by myself. Well, just as I thought. I was never quite sure how much you knew, Ann, about my business. Well, we know a lot now, Mr. Sullivan. Yes, Mr. Crawford, but what good will it do you? Well, you never can tell. Hey! I've got the gun now. Tony, you did with it. I didn't see him coming, Sam. You told me to open a bottle of wine. I had to put the gun down on the table. Don't be angry with him, Mr. Salivar. He might have holes in his pocket. Shut up, Miss Turner. Why, Mr. Salivar, every newspaper publisher invites comment from the people. Salivar? Give orders to your skipper to stop the boat. Of course. Hello? Salivar speaking. 
Full steam ahead. Barney, he's double-crossing us. What did you expect, Miss Turner? Give the order, Salivar. You're going with me, Mr. Crawford. And shooting me won't help you. I've got a dozen men above, not to mention... Give the order, Salivar. Police folks, Sam. My father's a great guy. Don't you think so, Janice? I certainly do, Barney. You never know what he's got figured out. He just doesn't talk, except to Mom. Home again, darling. Say goodnight to Barney. But why did Sam Salover kill Lon Fairbanks, too? He was clearing the decks. What? After Cal Forster found out what was going on, Salover got worried. He didn't know where Cal got the information. Then Tony Croton might have been next. He was. Salover was taking no chances. But how did he find out what Cal Forster knew, after all? Remember that carbon copy of the first installment? Yeah. Where was the original? Hmm? That's it, Barney. Cal Foster had given it to Sam Salover for publication. Hey, but didn't he know? Maybe he did. Maybe he wanted to see what Salover would do. <laughs> Who can tell? Yes. Anyway, he exposed the racket. Anne's going to write the whole series on the Foster's byline. And I thought... Yes, dear. But please don't think about it now. Barney's tired. <laughs> And so closes tonight's story, Fish for Entree. Stedman Coles wrote the radio script, Roger Bauer produced and directed, Walter Kinsella played Barney Crawford, Virginia Dwyer was Janice Turner, Bill Smith was Chief Crawford, Reese Taylor was heard as Sam Salover, Julie Stevens was Ann Brewster, Paul Hammond played Tony Croton, and Barry Thompson was Henri. Oh, uh, I beg your pardon. Hello? I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very intriguing story of a two-time that was double quick with murder. It's called A Frame for Murder. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there is a new Crime Club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. This program came from New York. Be sure to stay tuned now for that mystery pack broadcast, Quiet Please, which follows in just a moment. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mutual Broadcasting System presents... Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian... Cowhide. Yes, we have that story for you. Come right over. Ah, you're here. Good. Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is. Cowhide. The very intriguing story of a suitcase that was packed with murder. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It was early afternoon, 
and the customer's room in the brokerage offices on the second floor of a midtown office building was crowded, as usual. Harold Phillips, a middle-aged clerk, crossed the large room, nervously adjusting his tie, and stopped outside the office of Mark Baldwin, the manager. Come in. Excuse me, Mr. Baldwin. Oh, Phillips. Come in, come in, please. Thank you, sir. You sent for me, Mr. Baldwin. Come here, Phillips. I hope nothing is wrong, sir. My books... Sit down. I've always been very careful, sir. I never let a page go without checking and rechecking. Phillips, you've been with this company for 30 years. Yes, sir. Have you ever thought of leaving us? Leaving? Why, no, sir. Not once in 30 years? Well, I... (laughs) Please don't hold it against me, sir. There were times when I thought I might do better somewhere else, but... Yes? I realized that I couldn't, and I stopped thinking about it. It's been 15 years since I... Good for you, Phillips. I guess we can trust you. Uh, What? Open that suitcase on my desk. Uh, Yes, sir. Good heavens. Securities. A half a million dollars worth. And they're all negotiable. But I... Well, look here, Mr. Baldwin, if you're accusing me... Hmm? What are you talking about? If you're accusing me of having packed that suitcase... Phillips. You don't know me, sir. You've been the manager of this office less than a year. But I have a record of excellent service. You can ask the gentleman in the main office if you want to. Phillips, don't be an idiot. I'm not accusing you. But the suitcase... It's going to our Los Angeles office. Oh. You're going to take it there. I? Naturally. You're the only one I can trust with it. But such transfers are usually made by... I know all about it. Now, you'll leave tonight on the 9 o'clock train. I've reserved a drawing room for you. Yes, sir. You'll be careful, of course. You won't leave that drawing room for one minute. But, Mr. Baldwin... I said not for one minute, Phillips. And as for your meals... I'll make arrangements. That's the idea. Uh, One more thing, Phillips. Yes, sir. You are not to discuss this matter with anyone. Not with anyone including the members of your own family. But Los Angeles, Mr. Baldwin, how can I explain that to Doris, my daughter? Don't. But I'm going away for a long time, for two weeks, perhaps. Think up a good excuse. Only you, I, and the manager of the Los Angeles office know about this transfer. We want nothing to happen to that suitcase or to you. Yes, sir. In other words, Mr. Phillips, we don't want you killed. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your consideration. Yes. yes I'll, I'll go home and pack uh, after closing time, of course. And will I take the suitcase home with me? No, you stop back here on your way to the train and I'll give it to you. Would uh, 8 o'clock be all right? Fine. But be prompt. The train leaves at 9. Well, I won't be late. And uh, now, Mr. Baldwin, if I may say so... Yes? Thank you for your confidence in me. <laughs> Oh, in here, Doris, my room. Oh, did you eat? Uh, scrambled eggs. You would. Every time I come home late from work, you... you... Say, what's going on here? I'm just packing. Walking out on me? Only for a little while, dear. What? Yes, Mr. Baldwin has uh, given me a two weeks vacation. Oh? Uh, with pay, of course. Oh, now don't stare at me like a frightened little girl. Dad, where are you going? Uh, Aunt Martha's. That sister of mine has been after me to pay her a visit. But you had two weeks vacation not three months ago. Well, Mr. Baldwin wants me to have another one. Why? As a bonus for my good work. Thirty years on one job. Why not cash? He's only the manager of a branch office, dear. Now stop worrying. You get wrinkles. Dad... He's not sending you away because of something that happened this afternoon. What do you mean, Doris? Well, you... You didn't get sick. Oh, no. Those headaches you used to complain about. Oh, I haven't had one since... Well, I know you've been seeing the doctor. Oh? I didn't say anything because you didn't. I I thought if you didn't want me to know... (laughs) There's no keeping a secret from you, is there? (laughs) Well, everything's all right. My blood pressure's down. Yes, but this afternoon... A mild attack, nothing serious... But Mr. Baldwin happened to notice it, and, well, he's very fond of me and the kind who appreciates loyalty. Dad, why won't you give up your job? Give it up? 
Well, what would I do? Must you do anything? I'm making enough for both of us. Oh, nonsense, dear. You're, you're going to be married someday. Oh, sure. Don't you think so? First, I've got to find a man. What's wrong with the men you know now? Oh, why talk about them? Listen, Dad, you've been working long enough. And I'm going to keep right on working. Uh... Goodbye, dear. I'll see you in two weeks. Oh, no, you don't. I'm going to station with you. Haven't you a date for tonight? I'll call it off. You'll do nothing of the kind. Dad. Why? Oh, I'm sorry, dear. I didn't mean to lose my temper. It's all right. I, well, you see, treating me like an invalid. I just wanted to see you off, Dad. It isn't necessary. You've got a date. Keep it. Oh, goodbye, darling. Goodbye. Take good care of yourself. <laughs> Hello. I'd like to see Mr. Kenneth Badger. I'm Ken Badger. Are you the private detective? Well, so they say. But, oh, all right, take a look at this newspaper. For free? Read it. Now, look, miss, Read I... Read the headline, please. You've got a way about you. Okay. Brokerage clerk disappears with half a million. Harold Phillips for 30 years a clerk in the brokerage offices of... How am I doing, kid? Do I pass the literacy test? My name's Doris. Mm, my favorite name. Harold Phillips is my father. Mm-hmm. Well, you... what'd you say? Mr. Badger, I'm desperate. A good-looking girl like you. My father didn't steal those securities. What a shame. I know he didn't. And you're going to find him and prove that he didn't. I am? Yes. Uh, will you? Now, listen, honey. There comes a time in every man's life when he's got to say no. This is my time. But you don't know my father. Is that bad? He's not a thief. He's the most honest, the, the most conscientious. Oh, somebody told you about my weakness, huh? Well, you'd only try to understand. Dad's been with that company for 30 years, mm -hmm. handling money and securities every day. If he wanted to steal, he could have done it in dribs and drabs, fixing the books. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to wait until yesterday to take a half a million at one time. Maybe he didn't get the idea until yesterday. Oh, please, Mr. Oh, cut it out, will you? I can't. Will you please cut it out? I'm not going to be carried away by a flood. All right. All right, Mr. Badger. You don't have to take this case. But I'll tell you what I really think. Over a cup of coffee? When I came home from work last night, Dad was packing. There's a nice little restaurant down the street. Come on. Listen to me. Dad said that Mr. Baldwin, the manager of his office, had given him a two weeks vacation. He was going to spend it with Aunt Martha at her place in the country. I, I phoned Aunt Martha this morning. Dad wasn't there. No. Mr. Badger, my father wouldn't lie to me. Something happened to him last night. What do you think? He might have been kidnapped or, or murdered. What? Mr. Baldwin's got those securities. That's why he told Dad he could go away. And then last night his dad was going to the station. Wait a minute. Why did you phone Aunt Martha this morning? Dad hasn't been feeling well. I, I was worried. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you a break, baby. Oh? Only because I like you. But there's one condition. What? From now on, it's Ken. Uh, yes, Ken. Okay, Doris. I'm going down to the brokerage office to see what Mr. Baldwin looks like. Oh, I'm going with you. You are? I am. That's what I said. You are. <laughs> Now, you stay here, Doris. Oh, but Ken, here, I... Here, baby. I want Baldwin all to myself. Well. I've got a special interest in international pigs, so... So long, honey. I'll see you later. Come in. One Badger, what are you doing here? Inspector Hopkins. My old friend. I asked you a question, Ken. I've been retained. By whom? Doris Phillips, the daughter of... Well, Inspector, don't I get a knockdown? Eh, if it'll make you happy. <laughs> I'm talking about those two nice people over there. Walter Conrad, the assistant manager, and that's Joyce Lipton, Mark Baldwin's private secretary. How do you do? How, How do, do you do? do? Joyce Lipton. Say, haven't we, uh... Have we? Oh, I'm pretty sure of it, but, uh, where? Now, see here, Ken, I'm conducting an investigation. Oh, you're a hard man, Inspector. All the pretty women... State your business and get out of here. Well, since you put it so politely, I'm looking for Mark Baldwin. That's good, so am I. What? Anything else, Ken? Now, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. 
Are you saying that Baldwin and Phillips... That seems to be his pet theory, Mr. Badger. Shut up, Conrad. All you have to do is answer questions. And all you have to do, Inspector, is to ask them. Intelligent ones. You're looking for trouble, aren't you? Just because Mr. Baldwin didn't come to the office today doesn't mean that he and Phillips took those securities. He didn't show up at his hotel all night, either. That can mean anything, Inspector. Well, somehow do you do, huh? Mr. Conrad. Are you butting in, Ken? Just for a couple of questions, Inspector. Mr. Conrad, when was the last time you saw Mark Baldwin? When I left the office yesterday, about six o'clock. And you, Joyce? Seven o'clock. Mr. Baldwin wanted me to stay for some last-minute dictation. Hmm... Dictation, Mr. Badger. Oh, yes. Uh, Anybody see him after that? We've been all through that, Ken. My client wants to know, Inspector. Well, I don't know who saw him afterwards. I left at 7 o'clock. I don't suppose you realize how ridiculous this is, do you? Now, see here, Conrad. All these questions about Mr. Baldwin. If he had a part in this robbery, do you think he'd be fool enough to disappear? It's been done before, mister. Mark Baldwin wouldn't take half a million dollars to share with a clerk. Is uh, that your opinion, too, Miss Lipton? I have no opinion. And I just can't believe that either Mr. Baldwin or Mr. Phillips could have, could have done such a thing. Yes. Now, Mr. Conrad, let me tell you something about who takes and who shares. Hey, Inspector. Ken, if you don't stop butting Take in... Take a look over here. I uh, think you'll be my friend again. Huh? What did you find? I always travel with my nose close to the carpet. My dog taught me that trick. Listen, Ken. Down here. What? Huh? Tell me what they look like to you. Hmm... Blood stains that somebody tried to wash out. That's funny. That's what they look like to me. They form a line from the desk to the coat closet. What do we do now, Inspector? I'll let you know. <coughs> yeah. This is one thing I didn't expect. Would you say he's dead? I don't say anything when the coroner gets here, Ken. Mr. Conrad, who's that man? Baldwin or Phillips? That. That's Mr. Baldwin. No, no, Doris, you can't come in I've got to know what's going on, Ken I told you, I'll tell you later Why did all those men come here, those policemen and and the men with the cameras? They're holding a convention Somebody's been murdered Oh, my lord Dad No, Mr. Baldwin Right, all right. I'm still working for you. Can you know what they're going to think? Just keep looking at those quotations. I'll be out as soon as I can. <sighs> Stabbed in the back, huh? Died between 8 and 9 o'clock last night. What's that, Inspector? You still here? Between 8 and 9 o'clock last night, huh? That's about when Baldwin was murdered, according to the coroner. Holy smoke, then the old guy's innocent. Sure. I'm not kidding. Phillips didn't do it. His daughter told me he took an 8 o'clock train last night. Yeah? Where was he going? To the country to see his sister, Aunt Martha. So it's Aunt Martha. Oh, all right. So I'm gone for the girl, but... Did did he get there? Did he... Oh. All right, you win, Inspector. You've got logic. Yeah, stick around, sonny boy. I'm giving free lessons today. Now, Mr. Conrad, you get first crack at the truth. I've told you everything I know, Inspector. I haven't asked you everything. What was kept in that safe? Oh, bond securities, cash. Who knew the combination? Mr. Baldwin, myself. You too, Miss Lipton? I never went to that safe unless it was open. Did you know the combination? Of course not. Look here, Inspector, what are you driving at? Somebody gave Harold Phillips those securities. Somebody did nothing of the kind. Phillips knew the combination of that safe. A clerk? He was our oldest employee. We felt that we could trust him. Whoever dreamed that he would... I'll take that, Miss Lipton. But it might be company business, Inspector. Yeah, it might. Hello? Yeah, Hopkins talking. Hmm, you don't say. Good. Perfect. Tell Detective Riley to hop on a plane right away. Yeah, I know he's with homicide. We want Phillips for murder. Well, they picked him up in Chicago on a train with two suitcases. What's the matter, kid? No comments from the lovelorn? What about the securities? That's the next episode. Tomorrow morning at police headquarters. What do you mean? The suitcase wasn't loaded with clothing and personal effects, and it wasn't loaded with securities either. Huh? It was loaded, Ken, with newspapers. All right, Phillips, let's forget everything you've told me so far. But I've told you the truth, Inspector Hopkins. Yeah. Well, now tell me a few lies. I don't know what to say to you. 
I didn't kill Mr. Baldwin. I didn't steal any securities. You didn't load that suitcase with newspapers, either. No. Baldwin did that, huh? And then he stabbed himself in the back. He was alive when I left him at 8.20 the other night. He uh, wasn't in the closet? I told you he was alive, sitting at his desk. Where are the securities, Phillips? I thought they were in the suitcase. Uh... Now, listen to me, Inspector. Mr. Baldwin told me to deliver the securities to our Los Angeles office. He didn't want anyone to know. Where are they, mister? He wouldn't even let me tell Doris where I was going. I had to lie to her about a two-weeks vacation that I was going to spend with my sister Martha. Phillips, I... You've got to believe me, Inspector. I saw the securities in the afternoon. They were in that suitcase. But Mr. Baldwin wouldn't let me take it home. Yeah. I met him that evening at the office, his office... And he handed me the suitcase, locked, and a and train ticket. One way? Yes, he said the manager of the Los Angeles office would give me a return ticket. <laughs> you, you've got to believe me, Inspector. Come on, Phillips. Let's start from the beginning. Now, you knew Baldwin was working late, so you went to the office and killed him. No. You opened the safe and took the securities. Then you took a train for Chicago with a load of newspapers. No, I didn't. Just in case you got picked up. You figured we might take you for a poor sucker who was being framed. That's exactly what I am, but you won't... Hold be... everything, Phillips. Yeah? Uh-huh. What did he say? Yeah, that's what I thought. All right, Dempsey. Phillips, we've just had Los Angeles on the phone. Oh, well, then the manager out there has told you that... He didn't I... tell me. He spoke to my assistant. Well, what's the difference? You know I'm innocent. He was expecting no security. No, mister. What? Well, but there must be some mistake. Mr. Baldwin told me... Sit down, Phillips. Have a cigarette. And then talk. Ken? Coffee with tears, honey? It's a bad combination. Did you get Inspector Hopkins? Yes, Doris. When can I see my father? Will you promise not to turn on the faucets? Ken? You can see him any time. He's just been booked. Oh. Murder in the first degree, without a confession. He didn't do it, Ken. The inspector also told me a lot of other things. He didn't do it, things Ken. Things your father told him. Doris. Yes? Your father knew he wasn't going to Aunt Martha's. What? He was going to California on orders from Baldwin. But he, he told me he... What time is it? A quarter past four. But Come Ken... Come on, let's get out of here. Are we going down to the prison? Nope. We're going to find out more about a certain security transfer. And about a certain gal with red hair and blue eyes in a way that's very tantalizing. No, Mr. Badger, I've never been there. Well, then, how, how about or the... Or there either. Okay, Joyce. Can't blame a guy for trying, can you? I can. North wind blew me right out of my... Say, have you heard the latest about Phillips? No. He's going to be indicted for murder. Oh, for pity's sake, then. He is guilty, after all. Only indicted, baby. He's still got an alibi. Really? He claims Baldwin sent him to Los Angeles for those securities. Los Angeles? You mean our office out there? Mm Mm-hmm. A sort of transfer. Who told you about it? My bosom pal and crony, Inspector Hopkins. Oh. If, uh, If a transfer had been arranged... Would there be a record of it? Of course. In the form of correspondence? Possibly. Well, now we're talking the same language. Where's the correspondence? It's in those files. I mean the letters he dictated when he asked you to stay late. Oh, they're in my stenographic notebook. Still there, huh? I I didn't type them up. Uh Uh-oh. That's not being a good secretary, Joyce. Why don't you mind your own business? Okay, I'll just take the book and let Inspector Hopkins mind his business. Well, I was going to type them up, but Mr. Baldwin told me to go home. And then the next morning... Well, I don't have to tell you about the next morning, do I? Aren't you glad? There's nothing in that book about transfer of securities. Nothing? What do you mean? Well, it might be in code, you know, $10,000 a word spelled backwards. Well, I don't think so, because... I know. I'll uh, I'll take the book down to police headquarters. Why? Well, they've got some of the best typists and code busters in the world. Oh, Miss Lipton. Hello, yes. Conrad. Oh. What are you doing in this office? Just talking to a lady. You talk to no one but me, understand? (laughs) So you've been promoted, huh? I'm in charge here now, and I don't want snoopers around. The the reason? This is a private office. If you have any business, the customer's room is open every day from ten to three. Now, get out. Conrad, did you ever get a massage? 
You wouldn't dare. Oh, I would. But why waste it on you? You hoodlum. Miss Lipton, the next yes. time such characters come in here, I'll... Well, Ken, what did you find out? That's what I'm going to find out, Doris. The counts. What do you mean? You go back to your apartment and wait for my call. Uh, and you? Police headquarters. And wish us luck. <coughs> Hello. Ken? For Pete's sake, Doris, where have you been? Don't be angry, dear. I told you to go back to your apartment and wait for my call. I did, but you didn't call for three hours, and then I had an idea. Where are you now? In a drugstore. Oh, that's nice. Tell them to set up one for me, too. A double model Ken, with a... Ken, you don't understand. This drugstore is in the building my father works in. The brokerage offices are on the second floor. What got you there? A terrific idea. Now I need help. What's the matter? How soon can you get here? Fifteen minutes. What's the matter, Doris? I'll tell you when I see you. But hurry. <laughs> All right, kid, you just leave him to me. I'll take care of him. Don't be rough with him, Ken. He's not young. Uh Uh-huh. So you went out and got a detective, huh? What's this about you refusing to answer questions, mister? I got a right to, ain't I, when they come from her? She's only a civilian, like me. What's your name? Joseph. Now, look, officer. Do you know Harold Phillips? Sure I do. Seen him lots of times when he was working late in the brokerage office. Did you see him the night of the murder? I ain't talking to you, lady. (sighs) All right, then you'll talk to me. Sure I seen him. I took him up in the elevator. What time? Now, listen, you. All right, all right. Tell him. It was 8.15, and I brought him down again at exactly 8.30. You talk like radio time, pal. I got it on my mind. Another detective asked me them same questions about an hour ago. Showed him the book. What book? That's what I wanted to see, Ken. The book everybody must sign when they come in and go out of an office building after 6 o'clock. Did you... Did you think of that all by yourself? <laughs> all of a sudden. Where's the book, Joseph? Right here. And that's where Mr. Phillips signed it. Darling. Hey, are you talking to me? Not tonight, Joseph. You go right up and down your elevator. Come on, Doris. That does it, Ken. That proves Dad's innocent. And you thought of that all by yourself? Dad wouldn't have signed that book if he were going to steal or commit murder. He wouldn't have used the elevator. And I went to school and paid for a license. What are you talking about? Just thinking out loud about how good I am. Will you do me one favor? Oh, you know I will. Then go home. What? And stay there. And don't move until you hear from me. Hiya, Cookie. Do you mind mind if I come in? Oh, you have the nicest way of asking. I didn't mean to push you. An old habit I picked up in the subway. What do you want? Well, well, it's a nice place. You, uh, you live here alone? Now, listen, Mr. Badger. Joyce, when will you learn to call me, Ken? I'll be at the office at 9 o'clock in the morning. Now, if you have anything... I have. Your stenographic notebook. Oh. Did the police get anything out of it? Mm-hmm. A murderer. Really? You're pretty cute, baby. Huh. What did Phillips have to do with my notebook? Fingerprints? On my notebook? You're not working on all cylinders, Cookie. They were your fingerprints. I'm afraid I don't follow you, Mr. Badger. You don't have to. I'll follow you. Huh. Why? Oh, I knew I met you somewhere before. But I don't recognize the gun. I let you pull a fast one on me, didn't I? <laughs> I have a lot of fun, Ken. Because you're going to be a dead duck in about two minutes. Annie Joyce, the confidence gal. How long do they keep you in stir? A year and two months. Yep. You've come a long way in the last eight years, baby. From swindling to murder. Well, now wait a minute. You don't have to be so impatient. This gun doesn't shoot with the safety catch on. It's all right with me if it doesn't shoot at all. Tell me, uh, how did you get Baldwin to turn his back for the knife? I didn't. He was kissing me when I killed him. Oh, you're just the woman for me. Phillips had gone out with a loaded suitcase, and Mark and I were going to wait until he'd been arrested and sent to jail, and then... You were going to split a half a million. That's right. But you decided why wait and why split. I'm selfish that way. Yeah, but you're going to wait, Cookie, for a quick burn. Well, you won't be around to see it. I'm not so sure of that, Mitch. Oh, Stop oh. that gun. She doesn't have to, Inspector. It just changed hands. Well... <laughs> Did I do all right, Inspector? For once in your life, when you came in here, I was afraid you was going to close that door with a snap lock on it. Inspector, you don't think much of me, do you? You want the truth. No, just skip it. Man. 
imagine hiding those securities under a rug? Yeah, and such a nice rug, too. A half a million dollars worth in her apartment. And me stepping on it all the time. Um, Ken. Yes, dear? How well did you know her? Doris, I told you, I... I saw her in a courtroom eight years ago. And you remembered her for so long? <laughs> I've got a weakness for redheads. No, I'm not a redhead. Oh, that can be remedied. <laughs> Would it make you happy? Mm, all over. Oh. <laughs> hey, take it easy. Your, your father's asleep on that chair. I suppose he wakes up and... And? and? Well, I suppose he does. Dad won't mind. Will you? Well. Well, will you? Oh, but Dad. I can't wait all night, Doris. I've got to go to bed. And so closes tonight's story, Cowhide. Stedman Coles wrote the radio script. Roger Bauer produced and directed... Bill Quinn played Ken Badger. Joan Tompkins was Doris Phillips. Cameron Prudhomme was Harold Phillips. Eleanor Phelps played Joyce Lipton. Joe Latham was Inspector Hopkins. And Murray Forbes was Walter Conrad. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very intriguing story of a decision that almost cost a man's life. It's called Sentence of Death. In the meantime, well, in the meantime, there is a new Crime Club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we look for you next week. Oh, yes. And another thing. Traffic accidents have been increasing at an alarming rate. Avoid them by respecting the rights of your neighbor on the road and by being sure that you and the car you are driving are in good condition. This program came from New York. Stay tuned now for another mutual favorite. Quiet, please. Follows in just a moment. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Broadcasting System presents... Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting... Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Sentence of death. Yes, we have that story for you. Come right over. Ah, you're here. Good. Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is, Sentence of Death. The very intriguing story of a conflict that proved that justice was not blind. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. Paul Remsen was elected to the Supreme Court bench by the people of his county in November. He was sworn in in January. And by April, he was already one of the most popular judges in the county. It was late afternoon. Court had adjourned for the day, and Judge Remsen was in chambers, putting some papers into his briefcase. Homework, he called it. When Senior Judge Graham Palmer walked in and sat down in the chair alongside Judge Remsen's desk. Uh, What's the matter, Graham? I'm glad you're still here, Paul. Have you heard the news about Sam Howard? Why, no. He had a stroke. Oh, good Lord. How bad was it? The doctor believes he'll be all right, but he'll have to rest a long time. Naturally, the longer the better. Yes, but in the meantime, we have the problem of what to do with Sam's calendar. I phoned Allerton County to send us a judge, but 
Well, nothing doing until the middle of next week. Well, now, if there's any part of Sam's work you'd like me to take over... There is, Paul. A matter that's scheduled for tomorrow morning. Of course. What is it? The People versus Martin Rivers. Martin Rivers. Oh. I know how you feel about such matters, and I do it myself, Paul, but the governor's appointed me to a special board of inquiry. I know, I know. We start hearings the first thing in the morning. Uh, Yes. Graham, I... I don't know if it's in me to send a man to his death. Even if the law says you must? But it's capital punishment, Graham. I've always been against it. But it's the law, my friend. And you've taken an oath to uphold it. Yes, but... Martin Rivers was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. The sentence of death is mandatory under the laws of this state. I know that, Graham. It's our duty to impose that sentence, whether we like it or not, until the law is changed. Uh... Give me a chance to think about it, will you? Of course. And if you should find that you can't go through with it... I'll resign from the bench. Nonsense. We need you. No, Graham. I'll either do it or quit. Paul? Uh, Yes, uh, yes, Martha. Hello, darling. (laughs) <laughs> Did you have an exciting day in court? Uh, yes, yes. Pretty exciting. A big day, too, if those bulges in your briefcase mean anything. Homework? Maybe. Maybe. You sound like a very tired judge. Uh, let's go into the living room, Martha. I'd like to sit down. You're worried about something, Paul? Yes. What is it? Tomorrow morning, I've got to sentence a man to die. You? But you didn't have a murder case. It's Judge Howard's case. Howard's sick and Graham Palmer's going to be tied up with that special board of inquiry, so... Oh. Martha, I don't know if I can do it. Why? Send a man to his death. Tell him when and how he's going to die. Is this the man who was convicted last week? Martin Rivers? Yes, And you're worried about him. Now, look, Martha, He killed another man in cold blood, dear. His victim never had a chance to defend himself. I know. But the state gave Martin Rivers every chance to defend himself. Martha... Didn't it? He was given a fair trial and convicted. Now, there's nothing for you to be concerned about. No, no. Nothing except my conscience. I order a man's death, and then I have to live with myself. But, Paul, the man was a professional gangster. Heaven knows how many other people he's killed. Don't you think he should be punished? Yes, I do. Send him away to prison for life. Take away all his rights and liberties. But what right have we got to take a life we didn't create? What right did Martin Rivers have? Well, he lived by another code, the underworld, the law of the jungle. Take what you want, kill or be killed. You don't mean that, Paul. No, no, I guess I don't. No one has the right to kill, no matter what his code might be. But where does that leave me? What do I do? It's very simple. You have a sworn duty. Yes. Maybe I took on more than I can handle. What do you mean? Becoming a judge, deciding for other people. Oh, I I don't know. I'm too confused right now to even guess what it's all about. Of course, dear. Why don't you go upstairs and lie down for a while? No, no. Then I won't be ready for an hour. And a little rest will do you good. I couldn't rest, Martha. Well, try it anyway. I'll call you when dinner's Uh, ready. Listen, dear, I Go ahead now. All great men have to make important decisions, Mr. Justice Ramson. You're no exception. Paul. Hmm? Oh, what is it, Martha? Stop thinking about Martin Rivers and finish your... I can't, Martha. How can you feel pity for a cold-blooded killer? Pity for Martin Rivers? As far as I'm concerned, he's finished. But he's a man, a human being. And I cannot pronounce a sentence of death. I cannot do it. But... Very well. What's the alternative? I'll have to resign from the bench. Paul. I know what the judgeship means to you. Mm -hmm. 
I know how hard you work to be elected. Please, please, Martha. How can you think so little of your life? Or of mine? Don't you realize you'll be called a quitter? Uh, Martha, I... I don't know anything anymore. I'm going out for a walk. Do you mind? No, dear. I don't mind. I've got to work myself out of this dilemma. I've got to know what I'm going to do, and I've got to know tonight. Judge Paul Remsen walked for a long time without giving a thought to where he was going. Then, as he went across Main Street, he had an idea. He got on a bus, and ten minutes later, he was entering a small cigar store in one of the less pretentious neighborhoods. Yes? Oh, uh, what can I do for you, sir? Uh, let me uh, have one of those cigars, please. Uh, right you are, sir. Uh, nice weather we're having, isn't it? Yes. I always say give me the spring. Not too cold, not too hot. It's better for business, too. Yes. Yeah, that'll be 30 cents. Thank you. Yeah, not too cold, not too hot. Uh, anything else, sir? Are you Mr. Herrick? Yeah, that's me. Say... I thought you looked familiar. You wouldn't be a Judge Remsen, would you? Yes. Well, what do you know? <laughs> yeah, I was one of the majority that put you in office. Uh, Mr. Herrick, <laughs> you were the foreman of the jury that convicted Martin Rivers of murder in the first degree. Yes, sir. That no good gangster. Uh, he's coming up for sentence in the morning. The uh, death penalty. That's what the law says. Uh, yes, I know. How do you feel about sending a man to his death? How? I'd like to know. <laughs> That's a funny question, Judge. Uh, coming from a judge. Uh, forget that I'm a judge. We're talking man to man. I uh, don't get this, Judge. Tomorrow morning, a human being will be sentenced to die. In anywhere from six weeks to six months, depending on whether he appeals to a higher court. He'll be dead. Yes. Yeah. You're partly responsible for doing that to him. Oh, now, wait a minute. Are you trying to make me feel like a murderer? Oh, no, no, you're not a murderer, but do you feel now, a week after the trial, that you had a right to condemn another man to death? He was a killer. All right, but suppose, Mr. Herrick, you'd met Martin Rivers right after he'd committed the murder. Would you have killed him? Say, what are you after? Would you or wouldn't you? Judge, would you mind Please, telling me... Please, Mr. Herrick, I've got to know. Okay. The answer is no. I wouldn't have killed him. Uh, that is, uh, not unless he tried to kill me. Oh, but he didn't try. Now, look, Judge, I don't know what this is all about, but I'm a member of society, a decent law-abiding citizen, and I pay taxes to see that lawbreakers like Martin Rivers get what's coming to them. I don't want him around. Well, life imprisonment would have done the same thing, Mr. Harris. No, not to my way of thinking. The fellow that killer shot didn't get a life sentence. He's dead. Now, maybe he was no good either. But that's got nothing to do with us. The law says that anyone who premeditates murder is a... What am I doing telling you about the law? <laughs> oh, that's rich. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Judge, but it, it just struck me funny, that's all. Me telling a judge about the law. Mr. Herrick, it may not be as funny as you think. All right. You want to know how I feel? I think I can tell you. I've got no regrets about Martin Rivers or any other killer that's got to die. When I took the oath as a juror, I promised to keep an open mind and to bring in a verdict based on the evidence. Yes. That's exactly what I did. And I voted guilty on the first ballot. Now then, does that answer your question, Judge? Yes. Thank you. Good night. Yeah, good night, Judge. Uh, drop in again sometime. I promise I won't start telling you about the law. <laughs> Me telling the judge about the law. <laughs> uh, good evening. Hello, uh, Dr. Benjamin. Paul, Paul Remsen. Uh, forgive me, I didn't recognize you. Uh, that street lamp behind you and my old eyes. Uh, come in, won't you? Thank you. Uh, uh, how have you been, Doctor? Oh, as well as an old man can be. But you, Paul, I'm proud of you. Oh, thank you. Uh, come into my study. I was just in the midst of writing Sunday's sermon. Oh? Uh, but that can wait. A sermon can always wait. So few people take it seriously. So, 
Make yourself comfortable, Paul. Yes, thank you. It's been weeks since we had a real visit. Being a judge keeps you pretty busy, doesn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, does it also leave you uh, no time for happiness? Hmm? You seem depressed, my boy. More uh, confused than depressed, Dr. Benjamin. Mm, tell me about it. I, uh... I've been given an assignment. A man's life. A criminal. He was found guilty of murder. I see. Oh, it's my duty to sentence him tomorrow morning. But I... You find that you can't do it? I can't make up my mind. Well, it's difficult. I know it's my duty to pronounce that sentence. The man committed murder, cold-blooded, premeditated murder, and the law is explicit. But still, I can't get it out of my mind that in sentencing that man tomorrow, I'll be sentencing myself. Why? My... Principles, the code of a lifetime. What right have I got to order the death of another man? Well, the law gives you that right, Paul. As a man, Pastor? Do you uh, want me to answer that? Uh, no, no, it's something I'll have to decide for myself. Then why did you come to me? I, uh, I want to talk. And I don't know where I can talk more freely than before you. I want to expose both sides of the case to myself in words that I can hear. There are two sides, Doctor. You know that. Well, there may be. Now, I'm a judge. I took an oath to uphold the law. The whole body of law, including the criminal code, the code of crime and punishment. By man unto men. Yes. But where did that law come from? Yes. It came from the Bible. Our whole concept of criminal law is based on the premise of an eye for an eye, a life for a life. Yes, that's true, Paul, unfortunately. But there's a higher law, a moral law. And that, too, comes from the Bible, my son. Yes. Thou shalt not kill. That's what I mean, Dr. Benjamin. Which law do I follow? Oh, I, I can't answer that, Paul. I'm a minister. My way of living is different from yours. I've taken an oath, too. But it's an oath to uphold the laws of God. If I had chosen another way of life, perhaps the laws of man would be more important to me than the word of God. I, I don't know. But I admire you greatly. You have mercy in your heart for a man who had no mercy. Mm -hmm. That's good, my son. Whatever you do, whatever decision you make, I'm sure you won't be less of a man. Oh, I'm sorry I can't do more to help you, Paul. But your soul is your own. No one can keep it for you while you're on this earth. I know. Thanks, Doctor. No, no, no. No thanks to me, son. Well, I uh, think I'll be going now. There's one more stop I've got to make. It might be the last. <laughs> What do you want? Excuse me, I'm sorry to trouble you at this hour. What do you want? I'm Judge Remsen of the County Supreme Court. I'd like to come in for a moment, if I may. Judge Remsen of the Supreme Court, but I... Please, Mrs. Dover. Oh, sure, sure, come in. I'm sorry, you see, I wasn't expecting you, and the house is in an awful mess. Oh, uh, please don't apologize to me. My daughter Mary went out and left everything for me to clean up. She always helps me, but tonight she... Judge, what do you want? Your son, Frank, was killed by Martin Rivers four months ago. You've come here to talk about Frank? No. I've got to sentence Martin Rivers to die. Oh, to die? Mother of... Well, do you think I ought to say no? Oh, you can't stop it, Mrs. Dover. The law makes it compulsory. If I don't do it, another judge will. He killed my boy. If... You could say no. If you could stop the sentencing, would you do it? You're asking me, Frank's mother? I'm trying to make up my own mind, and I must know how you feel. I... Oh, 
What good will it do me if that man dies? Will it bring back my son? Will it help me to sleep at night? Is that, uh, is that how you really feel? Well, will it? You would keep him alive, wouldn't you, if you could? Let him live? If you could. Well, why didn't he let Frank live? He killed him. But... Uh... All right, all right. Frank was no good. He told lies. He beat people. He was a gangster with a gun in his pocket. He slept all day and all night he was out. To... Oh, no, I... Oh, Lord. <laughs> I'm... I'm sorry, Mrs. Dover. Oh, well, maybe he was a thief, too, but for that you don't deserve to die, to be murdered. No one has a right to kill. No one, Mrs. Dover. Is that what you really feel? I... Oh, how can I say what I feel, Judge? I brought up two children. One's gone. One night he said to me, so long, Mama. And he went out. And the police came and told me he was dead, a bullet. How do I feel now, Judge? Oh, who can say when there's so much pain? But do you want revenge? Do you want Martin Rivers to pay with his life for what he did to your son? Martin Rivers, he doesn't mean anything to me, whether he lives or dies. I don't hate him, though. He killed my Frank, but I don't hate him. I'm sorry for people that kill. That's how I feel when I'm not mixed up. I've lost my boy, but... Oh, no, no. I don't want to kill. I think that's how most of us feel when we're not mixed up. Good night, ma'am. You've been a great help. Judge Paul Remsen went home and he went to bed. But he didn't sleep. All night the words he had heard, the opinions expressed by the different people, kept running through his mind. He couldn't sleep. The sentence is mandatory, Paul. It's our duty to impose that sentence until the law is changed. He was given a fair trial and convicted. That's more than the man he killed, God, Paul. He was a killer, Judge. I pay taxes to see that killers like Martin Rivers get what's coming to them. I did my duty as a juror and a citizen. My duty. Yes, Paul. An eye for an eye, a life for a life. But there's a higher law, a moral law. And that too comes from the Bible. Thou shalt not kill. Oh, what good will it do me if that man dies? I've lost my boy, but I don't want to kill. That's how I feel when I'm not mixed up. Your career. Now you want to throw it away because of some silly notion. How can you think so little of your life? You'll be called a quitter. It's your duty, Paul. The law, Judge. Our duty. Your duty, dear. Duty? Duty? What am I going to do? What? Well, Paul. I, uh, I don't know yet, Martha. Are you going to court this morning? Uh, yes. Well, that's something. It may be the last time. I'm going with you. Martha. Don't you think I should go? I'd rather you wouldn't. It's my problem. And mine? I promise not to interfere, Paul. Whatever you do will be all right with me. Will it? Don't you believe me? You understand, then? I think so. I hope so, dear. Now, let's go downstairs and have some breakfast. Uh, uh come in. Excuse me, Judge. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, what is it, Henry? I just looked in to see if everything was all right with you, Judge. It's pretty near 11 o'clock. Hmm? Oh, uh, uh, come in, come in, Henry. Uh, close the door. Yes. The courtroom's kind of crowded with lawyers waiting for things to get started, Your Honor. Uh, yes. Not that I give a hoot and holler about them, but we are now behind schedule, and that, that means we finish up late this afternoon. Uh, uh, did you see Mrs. Remsen out there? Oh, yes. Right in the first row with the spectators. Uh, do you want me to send her in here? Huh. Where's Martin Rivers? Ah? Uh? Martin Rivers. Well, they've got him in the detention room. He's he's waiting, too. Uh, well... Of course, he's in no hurry. <laughs> What's the matter, Judge? You worried about him? It's about him. And about me, too. Yeah. I sort of figured it was that business that was keeping you in chambers so long. Henry, 
How long have you been a clerk in this courtroom? Well, pretty near 40 years. Uh, you've seen many judges and many murderers. You've heard the sentence of death pronounced many times. Enough. Have you ever thought how you would feel if you had to pronounce that sentence? Uh-huh. Could you do it? Well, maybe not so long as I was me. I see. But if I was a judge, it, it wouldn't make any difference. Oh? Why not? Well, a judge isn't a man, Your Honor. He, he isn't human. Oh, uh, Henry, is uh, this something new? Well, no, sir. It's as old as history. A judge has got no right to be human. And that means he's got no right to work with his heart. I see what you mean, but where would you draw the line between the man and the judge? That black robe you're wearing, that does it. Hmm? When you put on that black robe and go out there into the courtroom and get up on that bench, you stop being a man. You become that robe, the law, the symbol everybody respects or is afraid of. Hmm. Why do people have to stand up when the judge comes into this courtroom? The, uh... A symbol? The black robe? It isn't because they respect the man that's wearing that robe. Maybe they do and maybe they don't. That's a personal matter. But they stand up for the robe. They've got to. It's the will of the people. The black robe. And that's how you've got to look at it, Judge. There's nothing personal in what you do when you're wearing that robe. Why? Because you're not in it. Uh, what's that? Not you as, as Paul Remsen. What's in that robe is a book that was written down at the state capitol a long time ago. The law. That's the will of the people too, Your Honor. But a man must be sentenced to death. Did he sentence another guy to death? Yes. And did he execute that sentence? Yes, but... Well, then there's no two ways about it. The book says he's got to die. And the book says the robe's got to tell him so. That, that's all there is to it. Yes, I know, but is it right? Is it? Well, ask the book and the robe. Uh, book and the robe? Well, <clears throat> Judge, are, are you ready? Ready? Yes, I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> Uh, the, the, uh, the clerk will call the business of the day. People versus Martin Rivers. Bring the prisoner to the bar. Uh, would the counsel for this man like to say a few words? No. But the court realizes that counsel cannot say anything to affect sentence. But, Martin, I would like to say a few words to you. Uh, what, uh, Martin, I'm about to say isn't easy for me. I hope you'll realize that. And I hope you'll do me a personal service, and yourself, too. There's a chaplain at the state prison, a fine, understanding man. I've known him for a long time. Let him counsel you. Let him talk to you. And please, Martin, listen to him. He can do you a lot of good. He'll give you peace. Peace of mind and perhaps peace in your heart. What is it, Judge? Simon from the bench? Trying to soften me up? <laughs> okay, give me the works and let's get out of here. I know it's coming to me, and there's nothing you can do to change it. So throw the book at me. <laughs> Wise guy. Martin Rivers, you have been convicted by a jury of murder in the first degree. The sentence of this court is that you shall be delivered into the custody of the sheriff of this county at once and by him delivered into the custody of the warden of the state prison, where one night during the week of May 14th you shall be put to death in the manner prescribed by the laws of this state. And may God have mercy on your soul. And may God 
Have mercy on my soul. So closes tonight's story, Sentence of Death. Stedman Coles wrote the radio script. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Raymond Edward Johnson played the part of Judge Paul Ransom. And the cast included Helen Shields, Maurice Franklin, Irene Hubbard, Bill Smith, Ed Latimer, and Murray Forbes. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is a crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very exciting story of a nightmare that was as real as murder. It's called Cupid Can Be Deadly. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there is a new crime club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we look for you next week. Oh, yes. Here's something important. The horrible suffering and tragedy of a cancer death can be avoided in many instances. The American Cancer Society wants you to know that of all the people who die of cancer, it is possible to save from 30 to 50 percent. Protect yourself by getting a free booklet which tells of the seven danger signals and many other important facts on cancer. Address your request for this information to the American Cancer Society, New York for New York. The American Cancer Society, New York for New York. This program came from New York. Stay tuned now for another mutual favorite, Quiet, Please, which follows in just a moment. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System presents Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Cupid can be deadly. Yes, we have that story for you. Come right over. the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is. Cupid can be deadly. The very unusual story of a dream that was made of the stuff that killed. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. The house in the hills of Westchester was big and rambling, like a medieval castle. And it was owned by the beautiful and temperamental Linda Barry, the celebrated actress. It was late Saturday night, and Paul Palmer, a Broadway columnist and one of the weekend guests, came quickly down the stairs. And as he made the right angle turn toward the library, he met Professor Caldwell, a psychologist, and another one of the guests. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Palmer, I didn't hear you coming. I'll walk on my toes. Have you seen Toby? Toby? Miss Randolph. Oh, yes. Uh, No, I haven't seen her in quite a while. Uh, Where can that girl be? Have you looked in her room? Just now. Well, I'm going out for a drive with Sam Winslow. That phony private detective? I'll look around outside if I should see Miss Randolph. Yeah, tell her about me. Well, of course. In the meantime, you might ask Miss Barry. Where is she? In the library. Now, if you don't mind. I don't. Thank you. I asked Mr. Winslow to be ready in ten minutes. It's almost that now. Good luck, Mr. Palmer. (sighs) Why don't I stay home for a change? Paul. Uh, Linda, have you seen... Yes? What's the idea of the gun? You'll find out. Ah, the lady's mad. You've got no idea how mad, honey. You're sizzling. Don't be clever. I can't help it. Give me the gun. No. Give it to me. Uh, You can sizzle without it. You had no right to do that, Paul. Oh, it's done. Shall we go before an arbitration board? You... 
you keyhole peeper. <laughs> oh. oh, a big one for my column. Linda Berry slaps a guest in her own house. And who was that guest? Your Broadway reporter. That ought to make me the toast of the world. You can go home now, anytime you want. Wait a minute. I haven't got time. We'll give it to you. Who was going to get that bullet? Take your hand off that door, Paul. Was it going to be your manager and half a heartthrob, Wally Brooks? Paul? Ah, then it was for the other half a heartthrob, Sam Winslow. No. You'll have to suck me again, honey. You're not leaving this room until... Oh, <laughs> the lady's smiling. <laughs> oh, you're such a fool. Don't tell the guys in the other papers. That bullet was for your girlfriend, Toby Randolph. <laughs> It's no use trying to talk me out of it, Wally. I'm going to get away from this place as soon as I can find Paul. All right, Toby. You want to go, you can go. But why? I don't like it here. Meaning me? <laughs> no. The house? No. Professor Caldwell's been lecturing you about the mine. He doesn't bother me, Wally. Then it must be on account of Sam Winslow. Well... That no good for He's I... not the reason, Wally. Oh? I can handle him. Hmm. Say, you're not running away from Linda, are you? I am. But why? I don't like the way she creeps up on me. That's too bad, honey. Huh? See what I mean? Walking in the garden, arm in arm. What a rosy picture. What's this all about, Linda? I'll bet you couldn't find such a beautiful setting anywhere. Even the moon is perfect tonight. What on earth are you talking about? Excuse me, Wally. I'm not sticking around to find You're out. You're sticking around, Toby. Hey! And you want to find out how I really feel about you? Let go of my hair! Linda! You're not going to leave this place alive! Don't let go of her, Linda! You take out of this, Wally! Oh. Get her out of my hair. She's killing me. I said let go of her, Linda. Let go. You're breaking my fingers. I'll break them, Linda, if you don't get your hands off. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let go of me. Now. Thanks, Wally. Now I'll give her a sample of my brand. No, you don't. But she got me from behind. I don't care how she got you. But I want to know why. Well, Linda, why? Nobody's making a fool out of me. Nobody has to. What's that? That's enough. Just let me get at her. I'll show her how to pull hair. Stop right? it. That goes for both of you. Listen, Wally, any time we need a referee... Shut up, Toby. And stand over by that tree. What about her? I'll take care of her. All right, Linda. How was Toby making a fool out of you? She wouldn't leave you alone. What? From the minute she got here with Paul, she's been trying to get her claws into you. And you left Are her. you nuts? You didn't do a thing to stop her. I've been watching you. Both of you. You are nuts. It took you a long time to find out, Wally. Shut up, Toby. And stay that way until I got this thing settled. Now, Linda, since when do I have to sign the book every time I look at another girl? Mm-hmm. If you only look. There's nothing between Toby and me. She's got Paul, and from what I know, she's completely satisfied. Am I right, Toby? You're right. Yeah. But you are not completely satisfied with me, Linda, are you? I never said I was. Well, you never had to. We've been engaged for exactly one year. How many protégés have you had in that year? Don't be low, dear. Five. And now it's that cheap, chiseling Sam Winslow, a private detective, the worst of the lot. I like to help people. Sure, but why are they always men? Coincidence. Oh, cut it out, will you? You're not talking to someone behind a bib? Darling, I didn't know you were jealous. I'm not. I've never said a thing to you. Third party here. Can we wait? No, I don't care who's listening. I'm fed up and I'm... Yes? Yes, and you can get yourself another manager, too. The less I see of you, the better. You're raving. Uh, we'll see about that. Come on, Toby, let's find Paul and get out of here. I'm on our way. Just a minute, Wally. You're not walking out on me. Save your breath. I said you're not, dear. Listen. When there's any air to be given, I give it. And, Wally, I'm not giving you the air yet. You don't seem to get the idea, Linda. I happen to like you, darling. Enough to marry you tomorrow. <laughs> you either marry me tomorrow, or you go to prison. Uh, what's that? I'll repeat it for you. Slowly. What have you got up your sleeve? The ace of trumps, and it's been there for a long time. Okay. Show it. You're a thief, Wally. What? And I'm the only one who could keep you out of jail. You'd better start explaining, Linda. All right. If you don't mind the crowd. Well, let Toby hear it. You've been forging my name to checks. Have I? $70,000 worth. You know my signature, and you've been doing a perfect job. Where are those checks? 
You see them in court. I see them now. <laughs> Where are they, Linda? Oh, stop it. You're twisting my arm. Come on, baby, produce. You'll never get them, Wally. You could kill me, but you'll never get those checks. Well, it's about time, Professor. What kept you? I didn't realize you were waiting, Mr. Winslow. You said ten minutes, didn't we? I've been sitting in this car for twenty. I'm sorry, but I met Mr. Palmer and... He was agitated about the disappearance of his lady friend, so I thought... Tried some psychology. Well, yeah. not, not quite. I looked around for her just to be helpful. You're the type, aren't you? Well... Yeah. Okay, let's go for that drive. Mr. Winslow, would you mind if we didn't? What's the idea? Well, it's rather late, and I can talk to you here just as well. Okay. It's about... Well, I think you know. Me and Linda. Yes. You don't approve. Miss Barry is my patient. Her welfare is my concern. I'm not good for it, huh? I think you ought to leave at once. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was only trying to relieve a delicate situation. Miss Barry and Mr. Brooks are engaged to be married. I read that in Paul Palmer's column a year ago. They should be married, Mr. Winslow. But as long as you're in the picture... Stop right there, pal. If Linda wants to wash me out, she can do it any time. Well... The fact is, she wants me in. So uh, that's where I stay. Would you marry her? <laughs> you won't. You don't love her. No, I'm not exactly indifferent to her charms, Professor. She has a lot of money. Now you catch on fast, don't you? Suppose I were to tell her that. You want to live, don't you? Mr. Winslow, are you... You want to go right on psychologizing dames for big fat fees? You can't do that when you're dead. You're not threatening me, young man. I know Miss Barry has given you money. And I know that she's made you the beneficiary of one of her largest life insurance policies. You know a lot, pal. I also know that you've been poisoning her mind against Mr. Brooks. But you'll never get another chance. When I get through telling Miss Barry the truth about you... Nice speech, Professor. Now take a deep breath. What? Hold it. Hold it. It might have to last you a lifetime. <laughs> Here's your room, Toby. Good night. I'll see you in the morning. Paul, I don't know why I listened to you. After what Linda said and did to me tonight... She's a crackpot, but she's loaded with material. At least two columns out of one weekend. All right. But I don't like the idea of sleeping in her house. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> What's the matter to me? Don't ask me now. Just let me in. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, I'll get in my bathroom. Won't you please hurry? I'm doing the best I can. Even getting into a bathrobe takes time. All right. Oh, Paul, darling. What's the matter? I had the most awful dream. What? I dreamed I was Cupid riding a black horse. Toby, do you realize it's only five o'clock in the morning? I couldn't sleep a wink after that. Every time I closed my eyes, there was that black horse. And Linda. Oh, my aching life. It was terrible. I was sitting on the horse and I kept shooting arrows into her heart. Yeah, yeah. Poisoned arrows. Every time I took one out of the quiver, I dipped it into a bottle of cyanide that was tied around the horse's neck. Go, go back to bed, sugar. What you need is some sleep. But I can't. Darling. Oh, I... you've got to help me. <sighs> Let's go down to the living room. But, honey, why? That's where the dream took place. You expect to find a black horse down there? I don't know what I expect to find. But if you don't come with me... Get that look out of your eyes, Angel. Paul, I'm desperate. I've never been so upset before. Now, take my arm, Cupid. We're off to catch a dream. I wouldn't bother you ordinarily. <laughs> Sometimes I wish you would. A hunting we will go. A hunting we will go. Uh, watch your step the stairs. Thanks. If I could only be as calm as you. My arm would feel fine. Hmm? You're digging your nails into it, oh. and it's not even responsible for your dream. I'm sorry. Huh? I'll bet you are. But I am. You never liked this arm anyway. Now, tell me the truth. Paul, that light. Where? Under the living room door. Okay, okay. So you're crazy about my arm. Stay here. Oh. Do you want to get knocked down by a horse? Going with you. <gasps> Good Lord. Linda, on the floor, with an arrow in her chest. <laughs> Thank you. 
I killed her, Paul. Don't try to tell me I didn't. You didn't. Oh, what's the use? You'd say anything to make me feel good. Now, listen, honey. I'm a killer, and no amount of coaxing is going to convince me that I'm not. But dreams don't make murderers. How do you know I was dreaming? You said so. Maybe that's what I thought, but actually... Goodbye, Paul. It's been nice knowing you. Where are you going? The police will have to know about this, and I'm going to phone them. No, you're not. Put it down, Toby. I've got to give myself up. Okay, then I'll put it down. (laughs) Sorry. Your hand was in the way. Now, you'll do me one favor. Don't tell anyone about your dream. We're going to have the police in on this, aren't we? Sure, but not until I've got you straightened out. Come on. Where? Out for a walk. Let somebody else find... Good morning. Huh? Ah, Professor Caldwell. Up bright and early, aren't we? I always say there's nothing like the country air to... Good heavens. Behind you, Miss Barry. We found her that way. An arrow in her chest. Hi. Her pulse. Mr. Palmer, do you realize she's been murdered? I'm beginning to. Who did this? We don't know. I did, Professor. Toby, you, Miss Randolph. You'd better send for the police. I'll tell them everything. Well, as long as you've gone this far, why not tell it to Professor Caldwell? He's a psychologist. Is this a problem in psychology? She had a dream. It was more than that, Paul. I saw the whole thing. The living room, Linda, and I was shooting arrows into her heart. But you were riding on a black horse. Professor, do you see a black horse in this room? Very, very interesting. She was also dressed up as Cupid. She was? Forget it. Hmm. Miss Randolph, you had a dream in which you saw yourself as Cupid murdering Miss Barry? So I thought. But there was no romantic conflict between you and Miss Barry? Who said there wasn't? Toby, for Pete's sake. Let her talk, Mr. Palmer. She'll hang herself. We'll see about that. Go on, Miss Randolph. Last night, Linda accused me of trying to take Wally Brooks away from her. We had a hair-pulling match. Amazing. The most unusual dream coincidence I've ever heard of. Professor... Don't be alarmed, Mr. Palmer. This young lady is quite innocent. You mean it couldn't have happened as I told it? Certainly not. You're not Cupid and there's no horse. But... Yes? Well, on the other hand, Miss Barry is dead. There is an arrow through her heart. This young lady is quite innocent. You mean it couldn't have happened as I told it? Certainly not. You're not Cupid and there's no horse. But... Yes? Well, on the other hand, Miss Barry is dead. There is an arrow through her heart. That can only mean that if you're guilty, Miss Randolph, then you must be a somnambulist. Oh, good Lord. But now, Toby. Paul, as a child, I used to walk in my sleep regularly. You don't care what you do to yourself. Listen, Professor, I've got an idea. I'm afraid we need one, Mr. Palmer. If you hypnotize Toby, we could really find out what she did last night, couldn't we? We could. All right. Then hypnotize. Sit down, Toby. We're going to work. But, Paul, I told you... I want to know the truth. And I've got it. You mean I don't have to be hypnotized? No. All you've got to do is remember what happened after Linda pulled your hair last night. She... She... What you told me just before you went to your room. Wally said he was through, and she... Of course. She accused Wally of forging her name to checks. Mr. Palmer, do you realize what you're saying? I'm saying what Toby said Linda said. And she was there. Come on. We'll ask Wally. Don't, uh, knock yourselves out, Kitty. Sam. Yeah. I'll bet she never expected to die that way off stage. How long have you been here, Sam? Not long enough to embarrass anybody. Why? What made you come down? It's only six o'clock. I get restless sometimes. Why? You've got a reputation for waking up with a dinner bell. Oh, you think it was me, huh? It could have been, Mr. Winslow. Oh, we're going to hear from the professor. Mr. Palmer, this man is the beneficiary of a $50,000 insurance policy taken out by Miss Barry. Well, I'll be... Not anymore, Toby. Okay, Sam. You tell me. I uh, had influence with the babe. I was her type. That's not telling me, pal. She hired me to find out where a doe was going. Checks she didn't remember signing. Then she took a shine to me. What was I going to do? Now, listen, Sam. That's exactly what I did. After I found out who was signing those checks with Linda's Johanna Hancock. It was her boyfriend, Wally Brooks. I know all about that. Great. Now, here's something you don't know. Where's Wally? What? His room's next to mine. I heard him going out about ten minutes ago. That's what woke me up. That's ridiculous. Mr. Brooks has a car in the garage, and we heard no car. There it is, Professor. <laughs> well, what do you say, Paul? They'll send for the police. They know all the answers. <laughs> Oh, well, how about some breakfast, Toby? No, thanks, Paul. It'll be an hour before we hit New York, and I... Oh, look, 
There's a nice quiet place just around the next intersection. The food's good. I don't feel like eating, Paul. What's the matter with you? Why didn't you let me tell the police about my dream? Oh, it's that dream again. I killed Linda. Listen, honey, the police know how to analyze a crime, and they suspect Wally. Just because he disappeared. He didn't take a thing that belonged to him, not even his socks. It doesn't prove he's a murderer. He's been forging Linda's name to checks, and she found him out. He wouldn't have killed her for that. She was ready to marry now, him. Now, listen, honey. I won't. Wally's not a killer. And I don't believe he was ever a thief. But the police found the checks. Oh, what's the use? You've made up your mind to cheat the law, and you don't care who dies, as long as it isn't me. You don't know what you're talking about. And I'm going to prove it once and for all. If you only could. We'll turn around, and then we'll hit right for police headquarters. Why? In your dream, Cupid was dipping the arrows into a bottle of cyanide. Yes? So far, there's been no mention of cyanide by the police or the coroner. I'm going to insist on a lab test of the arrow point. Fair enough. Yeah. But while that's being done, Angel, you keep your mouth shut about that dream. Understand? That's a very unusual request, Mr. Palmer. I'm an unusual guy, Captain. Yeah? You read my column? Sometimes. And you want to know how I work. I do a thorough job on everything and everybody. Yeah? Captain, it wouldn't take much of your time to do a lab test on that arrow. Please. Why should you be interested, Miss Randolph? I... Well, you see... Frankly, I don't. Paul, I'm going to tell him. Colby. I can't live with it anymore. I've got to talk. You've done too much already. Let's get out of here. Now, wait a minute. She's got to talk, and I'm here to listen. Go ahead, lady. I think I killed Linda Berry. Uh-huh. Paul and Professor Caldwell have been trying to tell me I couldn't have done it. But I know different. Sure. Here's a pencil and some paper. You write it down. Nothing doing, Captain. Now, you stay out of this, Mr. Palmer. But you don't understand. You can't take a confession from her. You wait outside. Oh, for Pete's sake, why don't you listen? Outside, mister. All right. But you'll never convict her. She claims there was cyanide on the tip of the arrow. There was. What? Here's the coroner's report. You want to read it? Good Lord, but she only dreamed about it. Now, listen, you. If you make one more attempt to influence this lady, I'll... I've got to use that phone. Are you getting out of here? Yes, yes, but let me call Professor Caldwell, the psychologist. He's an expert on dreams. Call him from the other room. Okay. But hold up that confession until he gets here, will you? The other room, mister. Now, here's the door. (laughs) Thanks for the assist, Captain. I never would have made it without your help. Hurry up, hurry up. Hello? Now, Professor Caldwell, yes? this is Paul Palmer. Oh, Mr. Palmer, I'm so glad you phoned. How soon can you get here? No, I can't. I want you but to... you must. Mr. Brooks came in a few minutes ago. What? And without a word of warning, he began to beat up Mr. Winslow. If you don't get out here as soon as you can, there'll be another murder in this house. Wally? He came back? Please, Mr. Palmer, as soon as you can. It'll take me at least 15 minutes. That won't do any good. It'll have to. Now, listen, Professor. Don't let Wally get away. I wanted to meet a certain captain of the police with a first-hand story of why he disappeared. Is that you, Mr. Palmer? It's me, Professor. Where's Wally? You said you'd be here in 15 minutes. It's more than half an hour since you called. I had a flat. Where's Wally Brooks? We took him up to his room about a half an hour ago. You... You took him up. He means we dragged him up. Sam, what are you doing on your feet? <laughs> but, Professor, you told me... It was me... phenomenal, Mr. Palmer. I went back to the living room after I spoke to you, and there was... I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, I was standing, and while he wasn't... But I thought that So he... it seemed, pal. He took me by surprise, but all I had to get over was one punch. And when that was settled... Okay, let's go up and have a talk with him. If he's conscious. Ah, uh-huh, Sam, don't flatter yourself. You don't hit that hard. <laughs> My pal. Not by any stretch of the imagination. Oh. Uh, Professor, would you say that Sam is human? Definitely not. A species of two-legged animal. If I had my way, I... Which you haven't. Okay, we'll settle this later. Uh, listen, Wally... Hey, what do you know? The guy came, too. Not so as you can notice it. Well, we left him on the bed. If he didn't come, too, how'd he get in that chair? Come here, Professor. What seems to be wrong, Mr. Palmer? Check him. I've got an idea he's Dead? Dead? Mr. Winslow. Now, don't look at me. I couldn't have killed him with one punch. I don't hit that hard. He is dead, Mr. Palmer. Now, wait a minute. Shut up, Sam. How can a guy tell without a stethoscope? Mr. Brooks has no pulse, and there's no action in his heart that I can hear. Let's call a doctor. I am a doctor, Mr. Winslow. My specialty happens to be psychology, but that doesn't mean that I Never mind that, Professor. I know what killed Wally. What's that? Poison. From this tiny bottle. Bottle? But I I don't see it. He's clutching it in his hand and... (laughs) He's got a grip on it I can't break. Leave him alone, pal. The guy committed suicide. I want the cops to find that bottle in his hand. But I've got to know whether it contains cyanide. 
Come on, Professor. You should know how to flex muscles. I'm afraid it would be impossible in this case, Mr. Palmer. Why? Obviously, rigor mortis is set in. I, I'm not giving up. If that bottle contain, contains cyanide, then... Uh, what did you say, Professor? Rigor mortis, Mr. Palmer. The rigidity of the muscles that occurs after death. Yeah. Sam, close that door. What's the idea? Close it. I want to ask the Professor a few questions with no way out. Okay. You've got me guessing, pal. Mr. Palmer, what is the meaning of this? I'll let you know, Professor. Sam, get on that phone. Call the Medical Society of New York. What? Don't look so dumb. Ask them if they got a member by the name of Professor Caldwell. Uh, what's your name, Professor? You're very clever, Mr. Palmer. It's about time. <laughs> but it didn't take you long to get that gun out of your pocket, did it? Does it matter? Why did you kill Linda? She made a startling discovery. The checks were forged? They weren't forged, Mr. Palmer. Now, look. Oh, no. No, I see what you mean. <laughs> she signed them herself while she was under your influence. Hey, what goes with this guy? An electric chair, Sam. He's a phony psychologist, and Linda was one of his patients. Each time she came to his office, he got her just in the right mood to be hypnotized. Then he'd tell her to write a check and sign it. Uh, they were all made out to cash, weren't they, Professor? Of course. And she cast them for me while she was in that uh, right mood. But why did you kill her? I told you. Can't that... you figure it out, pal? She accused Wally. I suppose she had the guy arrested. You think DA is a dumb? No. They investigate everybody. And what did they find out? This guy's a phony doctor. Yeah. Remind me to like you the next time we meet. Thanks. Now, Professor, about Toby. You hypnotized her, too. And you induced her to have that dream. <laughs> why? The young lady was a perfect subject after her quarrel with Miss Barry. But how did you get to her? I took her to the door of the room and I saw her go in. She came out later. The poor child was very disturbed. Naturally, she needed attention. Dirty hypocrite. Take it easy, Paul. It's done. Yeah. You, uh... You changed your mind about Toby, Professor, when Wally disappeared... When he came back, you set him up as the perfect suicide. It's quite simple. Such an easy way out. No trial, no investigation. The suspect committed suicide. Q-E-D. Q-E-D. Well, yeah. So that's why you tried to get rid of me, Professor. I think I'll go now, gentlemen. You didn't want a private detective around while you were fixing a murder and a framer. Goodbye, Mr. Winslow. You even tried to put the framer on me. You know, Professor, that makes me mad. Really? Would you like me to put you out of your misery? I'm standing here by the door, Professor. If you want to get out, you'll have to come through me. You insist on being a fool, don't you? No, Professor. Mr. Palmer. Present. You shouldn't have forgotten about me, not even for a minute. Bad psychology. Oh, Paul, I'll take the gun. I'll take it, Sam. One more twist. <laughs> That's all mine. Now, Professor... I have nothing to say to you, Mr. Palmer. He doesn't like me, Sam. Oh, I'm sick about it. Do you think I ought to kill myself? You're a hard nut to crack, chum. Okay, you take one arm and I'll take the other. We'll give this guy a lift down to police headquarters that won't be exactly psychological. Hunting we will go. Hunting we will Paul. go. Yeah? Yes, Toby? How did you decide that Professor Caldwell was the murderer? He said rigor mortis. Yes, that's what you told me before, but how did you really decide? Well, he couldn't have been dead more than half an hour. Rigor mortis takes from six to eight hours to set in. Any doctor knows that. Any real doctor. But what made Wally so rigid? Hypnotism. Hmm? Did you ever see people hypnotized? Several times, but of course. Their bodies become so rigid they couldn't even be bent. There you have it. Thanks, I don't want it. Death doesn't relax those muscles. They stay that way. I still don't want it. Mm. You're hard to please, young lady. <laughs> what do you want? Would you really like to know? Mm. Sure. I want something to eat. I'm hungry. <laughs> So closes tonight's story, Cupid Can Be Deadly. Stedman Coles wrote the radio script, Roger Bauer produced and directed, 
Sidney Smith played the part of Paul Palmer. Virginia Dwyer was Toby Randolph. Cameron Prudhomme was Professor Caldwell. Helen Shields played Linda Barry. Larry Haynes was Sam Winslow. And Sherling Oliver was heard as Wally Brooks. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is a crime club. I'm the librarian. Next week? I'm sorry, we won't be here next week. No, this is the last program in the current series. Yes, we're sorry too. Well, of course there'll be something here next week. Racket smashers. Yes. At the same time and over most of these same stations. You'll be listening? Fine. I'll tell them to look for you. This program came from New York. This is the last broadcast in the current Crime Club series. In its place, the Mutual Broadcasting System will present the exciting real-life crime drama, Racket Smashers. Don't fail to tune in at this time next week over most of these stations for the true criminal cases of Racket Smashers. Stay tuned now for another mutual favorite, Quiet, Please, which follows in just a moment. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations, the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs> 